One interesting fact about digital marketing is that it has become a crucial part of modern business strategies. With companies spending billions of dollars on digital advertising each year, this trend is driven by the growing use of mobile devices, social media platforms and online shopping, changing how consumers interact with brands and make purchase decisions. Digital marketing can be a valuable tool for businesses looking to reach new customers, increase sales and establish their brand online. Therefore, businesses must have a solid digital marketing presence to stay competitive and effectively reach their target audience. Digital marketing is a rapidly growing field and many career opportunities are available for those with the necessary skills and experience. The most common roles in digital marketing include digital marketing manager, social media manager, SEO specialist, content marketing manager and email marketing specialist. It offers many more exciting career opportunities for those passionate about using digital channels to drive business growth. In the United States, the basic salary is about $130,394 per year, whereas in India, it is around 10 lakhs per annum. If you want to boost your career in the field of digital marketing and looking for online bootcamp training and certifications from prestigious universities, then take up the Purdue Digital Marketing Bootcamp by Simply Learn in collaboration with the Purdue University by gaining the most in-demand skills in the field and mastering digital marketing tools and practices. For more details, check out the link in the description box below. With that in mind, hey guys, welcome to this Digital Marketing Bootcamp by Simply Learn. We'll start this bootcamp by understanding digital marketing in 5 minutes. Following that, we'll take you through the top 10 reasons to learn digital marketing. Then, we'll move on to get a brief understanding of digital marketing and the customer life cycles. We'll also understand the types of digital marketing. Then, we'll move on to topics like SEO, how to rank number one on Google, and how to create your Google business profile. Then, we'll learn about Google Ads Bootcamps, followed by Email Marketing, Social Media Marketing and Facebook Ads Bootcamp. Next up, we'll know what content marketing is, advancing Google Analytics and digital marketing tools. We'll conclude this digital marketing bootcamp by discussing the essential interview questions and answers of digital marketing to help every individual crack an interview. So let's start this video with what is digital marketing. Meet Joey, a digital marketer. He works as the head of digital marketing for Amazon. But how did Joey get here? A few years ago, Joey began to see a large number of opportunities popping up in the field of digital marketing. To begin his entry into the field, he needed to understand what exactly digital marketing was and what was so great about it. First, Joey learned that digital marketing was a form of marketing through which you could advertise to people digitally. Digital marketing leveraged different channels like search engines, websites, social media platforms, emails, and mobile applications. It would give marketers the opportunity to interact with and understand their audience better and to increase the trust in their brand. Digital marketing would also show marketers advertisements to people based on their actions and preferences on the internet, while being less expensive than traditional forms of advertising. After understanding the main concepts of digital marketing, Joey realized there was more to digital marketing than he initially thought. There were also many types of digital marketing, types like content marketing, search engine optimization, pay-per-click, social media marketing, email marketing, and affiliate marketing. And once he understood those types, he set up a digital marketing campaign for his uncle's e-commerce website. Let's have a look at what he came up with. First, Joey created content like blogs, videos, infographics, and case studies so that he could generate audience interest in the brand's products or services. This was content marketing. Next, he needed his audience to actually see his content. The first step was to create content on specific search keywords that were relevant to the target audience. Joey would make optimizations on the website and have credible websites linking back to the content. And lo and behold, the website began ranking on the first page of the search results. By continuous optimizations, Joey would continue to improve the ranking and ultimately make the website rank at the first position. This was SEO, 
for search engine optimization, and Joey could do all of this without spending a single penny. He could also drive traffic to the website with advertisements. But for this, he would have to pay a certain fee each time the ads were clicked. He could have text ads that show up in search engine results, image ads and video ads that show up in websites, and much more. This was possible with the help of PPC, or pay-per-click. However, Joey wasn't done yet. To reach a larger audience, he needed to tap into social media platforms. He would use social media platforms like LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram to advertise the brand's content. He would use these platforms to advertise the brand's products or services with posts, images, videos, and more to bring out the brand's story and engage with the brand's audience, who spend a lot of time on social media. Like PPC, he could use the platform to advertise the brand's products or services with text, image, and video ads, which needed to be paid for. That's social media marketing. Joey realized that a large amount of the audience weren't visiting the brand's website a second time, he needed to keep them engaged, nurture them, to make sure they purchased the product. For this, he would send them emails that helped them better understand the products they visited on the website and assist them in the buying process. He would also send emails to advertise his products or services to potential customers, that is, with email marketing. And finally, although Joey was able to grow the brand's funnel, he wanted more traffic from third-party websites. This could be achieved with affiliate marketing, Affiliates would promote the brand or product to their audiences for a fee with the help of email signups, registrations, conversions, subscriptions, etc. After setting all of this up, Joey had the hardest part of the process to get through, the wait. Now, as we wait for the results, let's take a break and look at a quiz. Which one of the following forms of marketing involves engaging and nurturing your audience to make sure they buy your products or services? A. SEO B. PPC, C, email marketing, D, affiliate marketing. Let us know your answer in the comment section below for a chance to win an Amazon voucher. Now, let's see what happens at the end of Joey's wait. Although Joey had worked really hard on each of these forms of digital marketing, he only had moderate success. That's when Joey realized he had to gain more knowledge and experience. So he decided to get certified and get ahead in his career with the help of Simply Learn. He took up Simply Learn's digital marketing certification and got the skills and training he needed to become an expert digital marketer. And now, you know where he is. You too can do the same and grow in your career by clicking on the top right corner. And with that, we've given you an introduction to all the major concepts of digital marketing. Digital marketing plays an essential role in most businesses today. This has led to an increase in the demand for digital marketing professionals. Because of this, many people are interested in learning about digital marketing. It is becoming one of the essential skills that you can have. If you learn how to use it, you can make a difference in your marketing capabilities. Hey everyone, I am Tushar Badiwal. Welcome to Simply Learn's YouTube channel. In this video, we will discuss the top 10 reasons to learn digital marketing. But before we begin, if you enjoy watching tech-related content, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and hitting that bell icon to stay tuned. So without any further delay, let's get started. Easy to start a career A career in digital marketing is an easy one to start. The field is growing rapidly and there is a demand for professionals who can care the digital assets of a company. With this in mind, it is easy to find a position even with no specific degree. It is also easy to find further training in digital marketing as a lot of free and paid resources are available. A technical and creative field both technical and creative skills are necessary for digital marketing. It has a lot of subfield, hence it requires a unique skill set and knowledge of the latest technology. For example, a social media marketing professional should know how to run a successful campaign. Digital marketing is a perfect career option for those who are interested in both the creative and technical fields. Highly paid Digital marketing is one of the most popular and trending industries. There is a vast demand for digital marketing professionals. As a result, digital marketing roles are also very well paid. Your expertise could help you gain better roles within your organization, which could improve your salary. According to Goldman Sachs report, digital marketing scope in the Indian internet industry alone is expected to reach US 160 billion by 2025, which shows the extent of digital marketing in India and the job demand for digital marketing. According to Glassdoor, a digital marketing manager earns around 7 lakh in India and he/she can earn roughly 1 lakh 23 thousand 
dollars in the US. Become an entrepreneur. As a digital marketer, you will be familiar with wide range of online tools and platforms. You can start a blog or website where you can list your products or if you have expertise in some field, you can also create your own digital products and sell them online. Also, you can start your own freelancing business where you can offer various services to the clients. All aspiring entrepreneurs need to embrace digital marketing and even the old ones need to adapt in order to grow. Career Growth There are a lot of digital marketing professionals around but very few are skilled. The demand for digital marketing skills will increase in the near future due to digital economy's rapid growth. Many individuals are starting their online businesses and almost every new company starts with an online presence. Hence, it's a perfect chance for individuals who are looking to make a career in digital marketing. The next reason is versatility. Digital marketing offers a variety of career options and a lifetime learning since there are so many aspects to it. For example, Suppose you worked in content marketing for 2 years and now you want to work in SEO. In that case, there is relatively little training you need, so it won't be that difficult to switch over. If you want to enter into some other domain, your digital marketing experience will always be valuable. Therefore, it is said that digital marketers can easily change jobs. The next major reason is more number of jobs. Several new jobs were created in the digital marketing field after COVID as most businesses came online. You will find many digital marketing job opportunities on LinkedIn every single day. Grandview Research reports that the global digital marketing software market size was USD 56 billion in 2021 and is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate CAGR of 19.1% from 2022 to 2030. The field of digital marketing is vast. However, digital marketing is also used in other areas such as blockchain. Blockchain provides trustworthy metrics for monitoring marketing campaigns in real time. It's also a good chance for digital marketers to discover other fields like blockchain. Time and cost effective. In the long term, digital marketing will save you a lot of time, effort and money. Traditional marketing is expensive and the cost keep rising. There are costs of printing ads, television ads, radio ads, and billboards. Digital marketing will give you more profits than traditional marketing if you know how to use it effectively. Furthermore, digital marketing requires less efforts. For example, you can reach global audience using your laptop sitting at home, while traditional marketing involves a lot of efforts. The next important reason is recession-proof job. Landing your dream job is a rarity for many in this job market. With the economy still struggling, businesses are cutting jobs left and right. So how you can make yourself recession proof? If you are creative and willing to learn, it can happen. There are many ways to make yourself more desirable to businesses and get job offers. However, one way is to become an expert in digital marketing. Digital marketing is the internet-based marketing of product and services using digital technologies, mainly on the internet. Marketing is an integral part of any business. With the ever-growing number of internet users, it is expected that more companies will use digital marketing extensively in the future. So now let's discuss the last and interesting reason, specialization. The field of digital marketing has a wide range of specializations. SEO, content marketing, influencer marketing, SEM and many other fall under digital marketing. An individual has a lot to explore. And once you explode, you can pick a digital marketing specialization according to your interest. Additionally, there is a wide variety of skills that you need to master under each of these categories. Now, let's see what digital marketing is. In simple words, digital marketing is the promotion of a product or a brand through one or more forms of electronic media such as internet, mobile phones, Google, search engine marketing, etc. It's a way to reach client on time and retain them with interactive marketing using digital technologies. Also, it is the most accessible, easy to use and contemporary method of promotion, which is also known as online marketing. Now let's have a look at the business models in digital marketing. B2B, which means business to business. B2B refers to business transaction between two companies. In the world of B2B, digital marketing is a crucial element. Through a digital market campaign, we can reach another company's decision maker. One of the best example is LinkedIn advertising, which many B2B companies use to target their potential customers. 
Next we have B2C which is business to consumer. B2C refers to business transactions between business to consumer. B2C digital marketing allows you to reach out directly to your potential customers using digital channels. As we know, millions of people are using internet and are active on digital channels. For example, using Facebook ads and Google ads, you can directly target consumers by their age group, interest, location, etc. And the final one is C2C, which is consumer to consumer. C2C refers to a business transaction between consumers. Nowadays, consumers are using social media platforms and intermediaries to market their products and services. As a result, they can reach a wider audience. For example, OLX serves as an intermediary by allowing individuals to list their products and services for sale and other individuals can purchase them. Now, let's look into digital marketing versus traditional marketing. Several new and old businesses are harnessing digital marketing and rethinking their marketing funnels in the age of digital marketing. A digital revolution has reshaped how we live, interact and conduct businesses. Traditional marketing seems to be losing its relevance in today's era of technology. Knowing which marketing method will work best for your business is essential. Traditional marketing methods such as printing material, radio and television are quickly becoming outdated. They are too expensive, ineffective and time consuming. However, digital marketing is the future of advertising. Now let's talk about a few reasons why digital marketing is a better choice than traditional marketing. Firstly, there is a global reach, a website that allows you to find a new market and trade globally for only a small investment. Lower cost, a properly planned and well-targeted digital marketing campaign can reach the right customers at a much lower cost than traditional marketing methods. The next benefit is analytics. Several tools are available to analyze and report on marketing data collected through digital channels and the data is precious to any business. Now we are on to our last benefit which is retargeting. Suppose we have a website that sells shoes and 100 people visit our website but only 2 purchase the item. With the help of digital marketing we can still target those 98 visitors and display our ads to them. Let's discuss the future of digital marketing. Grandview Research reports that the global digital marketing software market size was USD 56.52 billion in 2021 and is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate CAGR of 19.1% from 2022 to 2030. You have looked into the new digital marketing trends at some point if you are aspiring or experienced digital marketer. The best way to succeed in digital marketing is to keep up with current trends in the field. Now we will look at the two trending technologies that use digital marketing and are on the rise. Blockchain The data from digital advertising campaign can sometimes be inaccurate, so improvement can be difficult. Monitoring marketing campaigns in real time is achievable with blockchain for obtaining trustworthy metrics. Top brands such as Unilever are applying blockchain for improving digital advertising efficiency successfully. Augmented and Virtual Reality Starbucks, Nivea and Volkswagen all launched successfully AR and VR campaigns to better connect their brands and products to their customer. It is undeniable that these two technologies are booming and expected to grow massively in the next few years. The use of digital marketing in these technologies makes us aware the bright future of digital marketing. Now we have reached the most exciting and essential part of the video, every salary of a digital marketing manager. In the digital marketing industry, there is a huge demand for digital marketing managers and their salaries reflect that. Several factors determine the income a person can expect including experience, the size of your company, your location and your industry. Digital advertising has proven to be more convenient and effective than traditional advertising since most of your audience is online. As a result, digital marketing is growing and becoming more popular. A digital marketing manager plays a significant role in drawing revenue into the business and due to their highly result driven nature, their salaries are high. A digital marketing manager earns approximately 6,72,000 per year in India and in the US, he or she can earn roughly $75,000 per year. Okay, let's talk about the customer life cycle. So, we know why we want to do digital marketing. We want to know, we want, we know 
what the digital marketing channels are, because we just talked about them from SEO to social to affiliate to mobile to content to SEM. Okay, you have a lot of different digital marketing channels at your disposal. So now how do we go ahead and approach our customers? So that's what we're gonna talk about first. So we're gonna talk about different stages of the customer life cycle. Okay, and the first one is the awareness stage. So we need to get our customers aware of what we're selling or what we're promoting. Okay, so the awareness stage is really, what product does your brand offer? That's a question we wanna get out there and we wanna answer. Okay, what does a customer need your product? Or excuse me, why does a customer need your product? That's a question we wanna answer with digital marketing. Okay, what solution does your product provide? Okay, that's an answer to a question we want to make sure people understand. So these are questions that we wanna be able to answer in the form of digital marketing, whether that be mobile or content. Okay, so getting our information out there that answers these essential questions. And if we could do that, then somebody's gonna become aware of our product or service. Okay, so what product does our brand offer? Why does a customer need it? And what solution does it provide? Okay, those are some key questions that people tend to ask themselves when they look at a brand, okay? And when they look at a product, hey, do I really need this? Is it gonna help me in my life? Okay, and who, who is selling this? I mean, who is this brand? I mean, that's those are just things that run through people's mind intuitively that with the right messaging, the right channel, the right type of asset, the right targeted audience, you can quickly make somebody aware of your brand's product or service. In this stage, it's help potential customers discover your brand with the help of these different marketing channels. So in the awareness stage, you know, content is key. So it's, to me, if we have a website, we need a blog because if somebody does come to our blog from say organic search, SEO, then we can write about that product or service via a blog and, and talk to our customer talk directly to our targeted audience through that blog. And if we're not ranking organically, we can use paid search to promote it because paid search on Google, for example, basically we can be right at the top of the search results. And so somebody can actually see it when they do a search because we know millions of people use search on a daily basis. You could do social media marketing, okay? So you can publish that product or service on Facebook while you're building your community. And you can use affiliate marketing to help get the word out by using CJ.com as an example. Build up a sales force of people, these publishers that are gonna put your product or service out there. So to me, in the awareness stage, these are the, the digital marketing channels you could focus on. Now I will say one thing about display ads, display, is part of search engine marketing. You could use display because you can reach a large number of people. So even though it's listed here low priority, in the awareness stage, display ads mean that if you're on Google's display network, you could pick and choose your sites, your demographics, keywords, topics, and audience. You could focus on all those different demographics to really attract a large number of people. So low priority, but it's probably also good to focus on in the awareness stage. Okay, so content marketing, you must create a high quality content that people are searching for. Without content, it's hard to get found. And so to me, this is you know where the blog comes in. SEO, take that content, get it optimized. Okay, SEM, if we're not ranking organically, we can make sure we're at the top of the paid search results or the, the, the search results for a particular keyword we want to be found for. And then social media marketing, using different channels depending on the channel. If we're selling you know, training like Simply Learn does, you know, LinkedIn is a good platform for us. Okay, and then affiliate, you know, basically building up a nice network of publishers to get the word out. So these are all good channels that we could focus in on. So traffic sources may include paid, unpaid, social, referral, display, email, or direct. So they, they, they could come in the awareness stage from all different types of channels. Even though you're focused on content, I mean, you could still get traffic from mobile or email. So now that we got the word out via all these different marketing channels, there's that consideration stage. So you know, people are aware of us, now they're considering us. And that's kind of the next stage in the process. 
Okay, so a few essential questions to address on the consideration stage. Hey, what features make your product valuable to others? And how will I increase customer engagement towards my product? So those are answers to questions you wanna ask, okay? What features make your product valuable? You wanna basically separate yourself from the competition. Basically, that's what you're trying to answer, okay? So if you're promoting your product or service on paid search and other people are bidding on the same keyword, how are you gonna stand out? And then how will I increase customer engagement towards my product? So in, for example, if you're on Facebook, okay, and you're trying to get people over to your site to purchase your product, then how are you going to improve that engagement? You gotta create something really snazzy or really it's gonna be attention grabbing or something that's gonna get them to become aware of it, that's gonna separate your post from all the other posts that are in somebody's Facebook newsfeed. Okay, so you really have to work hard to really convince somebody to get their consideration towards your product or service. So in this stage, your customer considers your product, so help them understand how your product is valuable. Okay, to me, email works really good here because if you have a targeted audience, this gives you the opportunity to really answer these questions in that particular channel. Email, you could support that with a promotion. And display, I think display is a good option here too because even though you know people are trying to become aware, you know, you can really hone in and really get them to take that next step. Okay, with display, you can even do remarketing. So if somebody's been to your site because they're aware of your product, they're curious, you can cookie them and remarket to them via display. So display to me is a good, a good channel to use here. Okay, so you have email, mobile display, you know, SEM, these are all you know, good channels to use on the consideration stage, especially on search, because if somebody's looking for something and they're aware of your brand, then you have the good opportunity to get them to click on your ad, especially if you're offering a promotion and get them to convert. The goal here is to increase our engagement. So people are aware we're moving them further along the funnel. With email marketing, we have the opportunity to promote the product, by sending an email directly to our audience. So with this stage, plan your campaigns around welcoming emails, newsletters. We can talk about product descriptions, add ratings and reviews in the email. You know, we really just wanna encourage people to purchase the product. That's, we're trying to sway them over. So email is a good source to allow us to do that. So with mobile marketing, we can promote the products by sending relevant messages to our target audience. Display, again, retargeting, because we can retarget an audience that has been to our website, already did some research about our brand, our product or service, and now we're going to reach back out to them to sway them. So remember, we wanna encourage customers to buy a product by creating detailed articles about the product. That always helps, and that's content, okay? We wanna opt for a customer testimonial, okay? That helps sway people, and add some guest blogging. Okay, we can have ambassadors blog on our behalf or we can go out and blog on somebody else's site. Okay, so blogging works both ways. It's ways of, of showing yourself and telling people, hey, we know you're looking for this product. Here's why you wanna choose us. Okay, moving on from the consideration to the purchase stage. So they're aware of you, they're considering you, and now we're on to the purchase stage. So the questions we wanna really make sure we address here are, how are my prices compared to my competitors? And is my brand more credible than others? Okay, so they're considering you, but that price point, and it may not even be the price, it could be the shipping, for example. The price could be good, but the shipping cost could be high. So you really wanna do some due diligence and research on what your competitors are doing. Credibility, that goes back to the consideration stage and testimonials. You wanna make sure you have reviews and testimonials to really elevate what you're trying to tell customers and that that is, hey, I have a good brand, I have a good product, I have a good service, come buy my stuff, come buy my product and service. But you really need to support that claim, you just can't go out and say it. And so supporting that comes in the form of what other people say. And that could be reviews, that could be comments on a social media platform. It could be, you know, stars on say Yelp or Google My Business. You know, make sure you do 
your due diligence and make sure you get people to you know review you or provide testimonials because people are going to do their due diligence before they purchase especially if it's on google my business or yelp or TripAdvisor or whatever it is you're trying to sell they're going to be able to see those reviews and so do your due diligence to get the reviews you know if it is a negative review hey that's okay you can't please everyone you're going to get them that's the world we live in just make sure you show your upper hand and respond even to the negative as well as the positive reviews that you get. That actually bodes well to some people because, hey, it shows that I made a mistake and you're willing to correct it. And so people actually see that. That could be the tipping point to getting them to purchase. Say, look, hey, this brand really cares because they're really responding to people. They're not ignoring negativity. Okay, just those small things that can get people to change their mind. Now with the purchase stage, according to eConsultancy, 83% of the online audience require encouragement to complete a purchase. Encouragement, what does that mean? Well, it could mean providing a promo, giving them that extra incentive. You know, if you don't offer promo, consider it, especially on the email. And the example we looked at earlier, sending out an email means that if the promo is going to end at midnight, send that email out and tell people they have until midnight. And if they purchase today, you'll leave it, increase it to 20%. And email is a good channel for that. Mobile can reach a lot of people through SMS. Okay, social media, reaching people instantaneously. And then, you know, really with the purchase stage, it gives pro prospects an offer to help them make that purchase. So you have plenty of channels to choose from. In fact, most of these channels, the only one really that doesn't fit the instantaneous mode is SEO. But you can really focus on affiliate, even though that's a low priority here. You can really you know, coordinate with your publishers, who especially those publishers that have proven their worth and have sold your products in the past, you know, get them to help promote it and incentivize their audience. So let's move on from the purchase to the post purchase stage. So this is after somebody purchases. Okay, so some essential questions we want to be able to address here. So what additional product could my customer buy? Now that they're my customer, what else could I sell them? What, you know, without being too pushy, could if they buy a coat, well, a hat work or a pair of gloves or, you know, a blouse. You know, you want to be able to, you know, push a product on your customer, but think about how you can complement that purchases that purchasers or customers product and then how to improve the customer buying experience so again this goes back to you know what we just said about reviews get somebody to offer a review and if they don't give you a full complement of five stars they only give you three and a half stars then you know what that's great feedback because then you can learn from that and then the other question is, will the customer refer us to others? And if so, why? So that's definitely something you want to be able to address in the post-purchase stage. So let's take a look here. So with post-purchasing stage, you know, to me, email's at the top of this list because if somebody purchases something, you can send a nice thank you email because if they purchase, they're giving you their email in return because you're likely going to be sending them the receipt via email. So email to me is a nice channel you send in a nice message even you know social media you know you can thank your community for supporting you on this recent campaign that you ran you know even throw in an extra five or ten percent on a future purchase as a thank you and that's easily done on social media you know you could even post a blog you know promoting you know the success of a product and then offering a promotion okay so there's a lot of things you could be doing here on the post purchasing stage so to me even looking at content again you could even you know put a survey together you could even put a survey together for your affiliates okay you could even post a poll on facebook so it's just working in with these different channels to get some feedback about your product and service so with email, mobile, you can engage customers with follow-up emails or customer care content. You know, with mobile, if you have somebody's mobile number, hey, text them. A simple thank you goes a long way. You know, you can say, hey, look, if you're satisfied, 
let us know. Give us a call. You can even, in the EE mobile text message, you can put a link to a survey. Send emails to active subscribers. Give rewards for customer feedback. So if somebody does provide feedback, give them an extra 10% off. You know, you want to be able to reward loyalty. Loyalty comes in the form of a partnership. If you're giving somebody discounts and you have a good product or service, then they're going to recognize that. They're going to say, hey, look, I really like this product. And they're giving me 10%. I'm going to go ahead and purchase from these guys again. So give those discounts to those active customers. Or on the affiliate network, give referral opportunities to your customers. So if it's an affiliate publisher, hey, if they're getting people to your site, you know, reward them. Or if it's an email and you put a four to a friend, get an extra 10% off, it doesn't hurt because you're incentivizing people to help you sell your product. So with social display and content, use those banner ads or use that content that you display on social or the blog you're gonna write to give customers advice in order to maximize the value of the purchase. So again, you can use these platforms to also enhance uh, what they purchased. So hey, you just purchased this product, thank you very much. Did you know you could do this, this, and this with it? And so that's the idea of a post-purchase stage, is to maximize these channels to be able to answer those essential questions about what else could they purchase? You know, do they like, how do I be get these people to become loyal customers? Okay, so with the first purchase stage, if a customer has bought a pair of sports shoes, for example, running shoes, you can recommend cross product sale or cross sale. It could be a pair of shorts or a water bottle or an accessory with an exclusive discount. So that's another example of what you can do on the post-purchase stage. So when we want to go and promote our product or service using a campaign, we have different options. So there are different types of digital marketing channels that we could choose from. And let's just go through that list of digital marketing channels. And the first one is what I consider the king of them all, and that's SEO. So SEO stands for search engine optimization. There's search engine marketing, there's email marketing, affiliate marketing, social, content, mobile, and then we can get into subsets of each of these digital marketing channels. But really, we'll start with SEO because that's the king. And to me, that's basically increasing the quality and quantity of relevant organic traffic on the search engines, including Google. So depending on where you're located in the US market, Google tends or has a large market share. So you want your pages on your website to be found and clicked on organically. And so that means if somebody types in a keyword, you want that relevant page to show up first on Google so somebody can click on that link, okay? And we know that millions of people specifically in the US, but worldwide, you search on a daily basis. So if you're ranking for those relevant keywords, you can imagine how much traffic you can get. Okay, so that's SEO, okay? And here's an example. So you type in online shopping. Well, you can see the first listing here is a paid search ad. And we're gonna get to that in a minute. The second, organically, is Amazon, okay? So online shopping, you think maybe Walmart, you think maybe Alibaba, or you're thinking probably Amazon, okay? So no surprise, Amazon's ranking for the keyword online shopping. And so if somebody clicked on their listing, that's traffic for Amazon. Let's move on to search engine marketing, you know, known as SEM or pay per click or cost per click or PPC or CPC or sponsored search or Google ads. I mean, there's a lot of different names synonymous with SEM. So search engine marketing, is really just using paid ads on search engines. Just as we saw the previous example, if you wanna be found for a keyword, you don't have to worry about organic if you're willing to pay for it. You just bid on that keyword and voila, you have the opportunity to appear number one in the search results at the top of the page for that keyword. Now, when somebody clicks on it, you have to pay Google if it's Google you're advertising on, but that's the beauty of search engine marketing. You can bid on keywords and appear at the top of the search results for that keyword. Example here, if we go back to online shopping, well, myus.com is bidding on that keyword online shopping. So they're actually appearing above Amazon's organic listing. 
but that's what they want to do. They want to be found for that keyword. So if they're not ranking for it organically, well, they're bidding on it. And if somebody happened to click on that listing, then myus.com is going to pay Google something depending on what the cost per click is. And so that could be anywhere from one penny to a hundred dollars. It depends. It depends on the keyword. It depends on who else is bidding on the keyword. It depends on the location. It depends on the time of day. It depends on quality score. There's a lot of factors involved and regarding what you pay. However, the benefit of SEM is visibility and getting traffic to your website for keywords you're not found for. So that's why SEM is such a popular choice for a lot of companies. Okay, let's talk about digital marketing. That's a traditional type of digital marketing channel. It's been around a long time. You know, we all send emails on a daily basis and we probably all receive emails on a daily basis. Just an effective way to capture leads and convert them to customers. Because with email, you can personalize your emails and you can send your emails to a segmented audience. Okay, so if you have emails from females who are 35 years of age to 44 that live in, say, the southern part of the United States, you can segment that, send them an email, and cater that email directly to that audience. And of course, you can put some nice call to action in there, you can design it really snazzy, and you can track it just like you can any other digital marketing channel. So email is a very effective way to really reach a target audience because everybody for the most part has a functioning email account so basically here's an example of an email that could go out if you're selling a product and the product's promotion is about to end well you know get that email out to your target audience let them know hey you have until tonight to purchase the product and if you purchase it you're gonna get 30 percent off and you can put the coupon code right in there with a nice call to action and you can measure how many people click on that email go to that web page and purchase the product using that coupon code so that's an example of email marketing okay we have affiliate marketing so affiliate marketing is an effective way for digital marketers to basically create a sales force of people. So basically what you're doing is you're getting merchants to promote your products and services. And you're using usually a third party broker like Commission Junction or CJ.com as an example to introduce you, the, the person selling the product, the merchant with the affiliate. So that affiliate could likely be a merchant him or himself and they can basically be a good partner of yours by publishing your product or service on their website so that they can sell in order to get commissions so it's all based on a commission so you basically are going to use a third party affiliate like cj get all these affiliates to work for you they're going to promote your product or service if they do sell your product or service you're going to pay them a commission that's more or less how it works with affiliate marketing and you know with affiliate marketing to me it's a good way to you know really promote your product or service and you can pick and choose the affiliates or the publishers of whom you want to work with so here's an example of affiliate marketing at work okay you basically see a banner basically you could see earn up to 12 percent advertising fees with a trusted e-commerce leader Okay, so if somebody clicked on that and purchased, for example, or joined, you could pay off that commission. Okay, let's turn our attention to social media marketing. So social media marketing, you know, I would say it's fairly new. I mean, if I think about it, we're in 2019, and I remember talking about Facebook back in 2006. So you're talking about 13, 14, 15 years of social media. It's definitely evolved over the years. And... But the concept remains the same and involves creating different types of content depending on the platform okay so you could be on pinterest or instagram and be dealing with photos or you could be on twitter tweeting out certain characters up to a limit okay so it really depends on the social media platform uh, that really drives the type of content you're going to promote but we know social media can be effective because People use social media. I mean, Facebook is one of the more popular platforms. And if you want to get your product or service out there, you could certainly pay to have an ad on Facebook or 
you could just post your content organically. Okay, that's the beauty of social. Most of your social platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest and Instagram, they all have a paid form of advertising that you can use to promote your product or service. Or you can go the organic route and you know post content organically in hopes of driving traffic back to your website. So with social, you do have two options here, but social is interesting because there are a lot of different social media platforms out there. It really depends on your product or service, okay? So an example of social media marketing, especially on Facebook. With Facebook, you got mobile and desktop, and you obviously have the opportunity to post something organically and have that liked or commented on or shared, or you could post an ad and get that liked, commented or shared or clicked and have people go back to your website and fulfill the goal of what you want them to do. So moving on to content marketing. So content marketing is really an effective way of really distributing valuable content online. And when we talk about content marketing, you know, we're talking about different types of assets. So it could be simply text in the form of a blog post, or it could be a video, or it could be an, an infographic, or it could be an image, okay? There are lots of ways to create content these days, especially in digital marketing. And the great thing about content marketing is you're writing content for a targeted audience. So if you're trying to target an audience on, say, Instagram, then you know who your audience is and you know what the type of content you're going to post on there. So it could be in the form of a video or infographic or just a graphic. And so that's the beauty of content marketing, really putting yourself out there um, and depending on the platform, putting yourself out there with various types of content. So for example, if we look at YouTube, you can see this video here about digital marketing certified associate. Well, hey, you don't need to always write the content. You can produce the content in the form of a video and post it on YouTube. This is a form of content marketing. So that's content marketing. And then let's talk about mobile marketing. So content marketing, again, different types. But if we go now to mobile marketing, you can kind of segue from content to mobile because the only difference here is with mobile, it's strictly on mobile phone. It's not desktop. So mobile marketing is really a strategy on its own that helps you, the company, promoting your product or service to reach your target audience through a mobile device. And that includes tablets. And how you could do that is via messaging. You could do it via email or you could be do it via an app. Okay, so you have different ways of getting your content out there to people. Okay, so as an example, you can use basically SMS or instant messaging via mobile devices to promote your product or service. Here's another example of a mobile marketing via app install. And so you can even compound that by running a, say, Google ad as an example and running your Google ad on, say, just mobile. You could do a bit adjustment just for mobile and the goal could be app installs. Okay, so, and you can even do a mobile or app extension. So there's lots of ways to really promote your app or your product or your service via mobile marketing. Rachel is a baker who runs her own bakery. To expand her business, she decided to create an online presence by first setting up a blog. She began posting on her blog regularly. However, even after regularly posting on the blog, there were barely any visitors showing up. Deciding not to give up, Rachel began searching for a solution on the internet. That's when she came across SEO, or search engine optimization, a term she's never heard before. So, let's take a journey together and help her learn about SEO. Search engine optimization is a method that could improve the quality and quantity of the audience coming to Rachel's website from search engines. It could increase brand awareness, attract local customers, and build credibility and trust. And all of this is possible without having to spend a single penny. To bring visitors to her website, Rachel would have to take advantage of the two types of SEO, on-page and off-page SEO. Rachel first decides to tackle on-page SEO and get that sorted. 
on-page SEO involved Rachel optimizing her website, both in terms of content and the technical aspects, including the HTML source code, schema, meta tags, and more. She started off by using tools like Google AdWords, Allref, and SEMrush to identify popular search terms associated with the recipes she planned to publish on her blog. She began to look for search terms related to the broader area of baking, cooking, and related topics. Once she found these search terms, she began to incorporate them into her recipes. She started off by providing an introduction to the recipe. With this, she could provide an engaging beginning to her story, like how the dish reminded her of her childhood and enabled her to naturally include the search terms into the blog. She also included these keywords in the actual recipe as well. Additionally, she added pictures, videos, time lapses, and more to increase credibility and engagement for her content and subsequently persuading search engines to show her content to more people. After this, she moved to the website meta content that search engines display when her blog appears in search results. She optimized the meta tags, alt tags, header tags, and more. This completed the on-page aspect of SEO. Thanks to this, she saw a significant increase in the number of visitors coming to her page. Having done all she could on her web page, she now decides to explore what could be done off-page to improve her page's visibility on search engines. Off-page SEO involved Rachel doing things outside her site page to help increase its search engine rankings. Making optimizations outside the site would improve the site's popularity, relevance, trustworthiness, and authority. This is possible with the help of reputable websites vouching for your content with backlinks, social media marketing, guest blogging, linked, unlinked brand mentions, influencer marketing, and much more. Rachel also understood that for her content to reach people, she would have to promote it on social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as niche platforms like Quora, Reddit, and Medium. These could help her achieve greater reach for her website by sending stronger social signals to search engines, leading to the page being shown as highly relevant for related searches and audiences. And even after understanding and implementing all of this, Rachel had just scratched the surface of what was possible with SEO. Before we find out what she did next, let's have a look at a quiz. Which of the following is the most effective way to improve off-page SEO? One creating plenty of web pages of a content. Two, getting backlinks from relevant and authoritative sites. Three, acquiring backlinks through link buying. Four, none of the above. Let us know your answer in the comments section below for a chance to win an Amazon voucher. Now, let's go back to Rachel. Rachel decided to take up Simply Learn's digital marketing certification. With classes covering just about everything she needed to know about SEO, it was only a matter of time before Rachel began to implement her learnings on her website and see a massive uptick in the number of viewers coming to her website. In time, she could even earn money off the site by setting up an online shop. And with that, we've covered an introduction to the concepts of SEO and the possibilities it can open for you, either as a marketer or a business owner. Let's dive deep into types of SEO, that is, on-page SEO, off-page SEO, and technical SEO. We will start with on-page SEO. Optimizing a web page to gain visibility and rank high in search results and get relevant traffic is known as on-page SEO. Some on-page SEO techniques include optimizing content, adding attractive titles and meta descriptions, adding internal and external links on the web page, adding SSL certifications for the website, optimizing images for search results, etc. Next is off-page SEO. Actions taken outside the web page or a website to rank high in search results is known as off-page SEO. Some off-page SEO techniques include building backlinks, blogging and submitting articles on other websites, promoting content on social media, etc. And the last one is technical SEO. Optimizing technical elements of a website such that 
search engines can easily crawl and index the web pages is known as technical SEO. Some technical optimizations include reducing the page loading speed of a web page to a minimum, submitting sitemaps to search engines, have organized website structure as it informs search engines about the essential pages of the website, adding redirections for the deleted URLs or temporarily moving URLs, identify duplicate content and replace it with unique content. Greetings everyone, this is Rob Sanders from Simply Learn and today we're going to talk about keyword research. So what are we going to talk about when we talk about keyword research? We're going to talk about why we would do keyword research for SEO. We're going to talk about the types of keywords that we need to research. We're going to talk about some methodologies, best practices on how to do keyword research, some alternate suggestions. We're going to talk about keyword clustering, and then we're going to talk about some tools that you can use to do your keyword research. So let's start with the why we would do keyword research. So Jesse is planning to publish a blog of pizza recipes. So she was doing pizza recipes step by step, pizza recipes with sausage, homemade pizza toppings, pizza dough recipes, thin crust pizzas. She's doing a lot of different topics on pizza recipes. Well, what Jesse needs to do is understand what's going to drive traffic to these blog posts if she's writing about you know different topics around pizza recipes. So she's unsure how these blogs are going to drive traffic so she really needs to understand that hey you need to choose the right keywords to drive traffic so the question is if you're writing a blog post about recipes with sausages is pizza recipes with sausages or recipes for free the best keywords to use maybe maybe not so you need to take uh, care in choosing the keywords to align with your content so that's really the idea of why we would do keyword research because some of the issues with keywords that are poorly chosen are they could have low search volume for example you may choose a keyword that just a lot of people aren't using to search for or they can be highly competitive so if you choose a keyword that's very broad or popular it could be very competitive and take you a long time to be found for that keyword or you could just make the mistake of choosing a keyword that isn't aligned with your content or you can choose keywords but use them incorrectly with your content so these are some of the issues that you can encounter if you just go about choosing keywords randomly without due diligence without the proper research so low vo search volume will lead to less traffic high competition you may not even rank at all okay if somebody finds you for a keyword that's not relevant to the topic they're just going to leave the page and if you're not using the right keywords and or if you are using the right keywords and not using them correctly in the content then your pages may not even be found in organic search so you really have to take care in choosing the keywords to me that's the most important step with SEO is keyword research so we're going to talk about the types of keywords keyword research then. So we have short tail keywords and we have long tail keywords. So if you write a blog post about pizza recipes, well, what are you going to choose? A short tail or long tail? So let's talk about short tail keywords first. So short tail keywords are keywords that are usually three keywords in a phrase or shorter. In some cases, it may be two keywords in a phrase or shorter. So short tail keywords usually have high search volume, which means likely means higher competition. But what it also means, it could be lower conversions. Because short tail keywords, like for example, pizza recipes, could be considered a short tail keyword. But maybe somebody's looking for homemade pizza recipes or pizza recipes from their favorite Italian restaurant. So short tail keywords may not be as relevant. So if we compare it with long tail keywords, chances are you're going to have lower competition. That's one of the benefits, but you're also going to have lower search volume. But with longer tail keywords, the keyword is probably probably going to be more relevant with the content you're writing about. So therefore the conversion rates likely going to be higher. So that's really the difference between short tail keywords and long tail keywords. If you want to look at simplistically, short tail keywords are broad in nature. It's going to capture a lot of eyeballs, but those eyeballs may look at your content as not relevant. 
versus long tail keywords that may be very relevant, but not as many eyeballs on them. So short tail keywords, the characteristics, they're not as specific. Usually they're less than three words. They have high search volume and high competition. So if you just choose pizza recipes, could take you a while to rank for that keyword. But when you rank, you're gonna get the traffic. But again, it may not convert because the keyword is broad in nature. So pizza recipes is a short tail keyword that may not be exactly what you're writing about in your blog post. So it may draw a lot of traffic but the traffic may not do anything. So the longer tail keywords are very specific. They consist of more than three words in the search query. They have relatively low search volume and competition. So the chance of you ranking higher, faster for that long tail keyword is probably gonna be greater because not many other websites are trying to rank for that same keyword. And so the benefit of that is if you have, let's just say homemade pizza recipes with mushrooms, that's a long tail keyword but if somebody's looking for that type of pizza recipe then you know you're going to track the right traffic and chances are that traffic is going to engage or convert based on the type of conversion you have in place so an example would be homemade pizza dough recipes that'd be another example more than three keywords in the phrase very specific we're talking about homemade pizza dough recipes so we're not talking about just pizza recipes so it's a little bit more uh, specific in nature long longer tail. So these keywords are used for targeted pages, including blog posts. If you're writing a blog post specifically about pizza recipes with homemade dough, then this is the keyword you likely would want to use versus just pizza recipes. So let's look at an example between a short tail keyword and a long tail keyword. And to accentuate the differences, we're going to use Google's Keyword Planner tool. So Google's Keyword Planner tool is located in Google Ads. The Google Ads platform. And when you're in the Google Ads platform, you can simply click on tools and then keyword planner. And so what keyword planner allows us to do is get a sense of the type of volume that a particular keyword has. So what Google's keyword planner does is they show you the average monthly searches. This is the average monthly search volume of a keyword over the past 12 months. And so in this example, we're going to choose pizza recipes and homemade pizza dough recipes. So one short tail and one long tail. So we enter those keywords in, we're gonna click get results. And what Google's gonna do is it's going to show us the volume of those keywords. So for pizza recipe, we could see the average monthly search volume is 33,100 for pizza recipe. So note that pizza recipe and pizza recipes are closely related keywords. And so what Google does is they consider that a close variance. So meaning, if somebody types in pizza recipe, then they're also, in Google's eyes, looking for pizza recipes. So it's a close variance. And so for the keyword pizza recipe, which is short tail, we could see on average over the past 12 months, this keyword received 33,100 queries. And so if we hover over the graph, we could see basically the volume, the average volume per month. So here I could see for this particular keyword here, the volume per month is 33,000. And then I could see the actual volume over the past 12 months. And then for for the long tail keyword, I can see homemade pizza dough recipe. Again, close variance, homemade pizza dough recipes. I can see over the past 12 months what the search volume is for this. On average, it's 2,400. But I could see here in December, the volume went up to 3,600. But for example, in May, it was 1,900. So it's gonna fluctuate a bit over the past 12 months, but on average, it's about 2,400. So shorter tail, a lot of more volume, longer tail, not as much volume, but nonetheless, there is volume here. And so, these are the differences between a short tail and a longer tail. And so what Google's Keyword Planner also does is allow us to get a sense of what the competition is. And so here I can see the competition is low for both of these keywords. Fair enough. So we now know that if we want to optimize or choose the keyword homemade pizza dough recipe for our blog post, we know for ranked on page one of Google, even in the top spot, we can expect about 2,400 
2,400 search queries for that keyword. Now, whether you get all 2,400 clicks for that keyword remains to be seen. Chances are you're not gonna get all 2,400. You're gonna get a lion's share of those clicks, but you're going to at least get some volume on it. So even the longer tier keywords have a lot of promise because there is some search volume here for this keyword. How to do a proper keyword research. So we looked at Google's keyword planner tool in Google Ads and we typed in two keywords and we were able to get a sense of what the average volume is. So we definitely want to choose keywords based on the following factors. We want to choose it based on search volume. Search volume is a good indicator of the potential traffic we can obtain. So again for the keyword homemade pizza dough recipe we know that it averages 2400 a month and search volume again we may not get all 2400 but we're gonna get a lion's share of that we also need to look at competition and so Google's keyword planner gives us a high medium or low in terms of the competition but if you're somebody who wants to get a, a better sense of what the competition is and you should because competition is a key component in choosing keywords and so what I want to do is get a sense of how many people are actually optimizing for that keyword so Google's keyword planner tool is going to give me a low, medium, high. Really what I want to do is get a better sense of that numerically. So what I can do is go into Google's search and I can type in pizza recipes and I can see there's about 1 billion results. That's a lot of results. However, that means that every potential web page out there on the internet that mentions pizza recipes is going to be included in this number here. And so I want to get a better sense of who's optimizing for pizza recipes. So I'm going to put in the all in title syntax. And so what that is going to ask Google to do is tell me all the websites that have pizza recipes, the keyword pizza recipes in the title tag. So if I do all in title colon space, than pizza recipes, my result drops down to 336,000. So what that tells me is that there are 336,000 results with the keyword pizza recipes in the title tag. Now, if I want to focus in on my other keyword, if I choose uh, my other keyword was a longer tail keyword, homemade pizza dough recipe. So if I type that keyword in, the homemade pizza dough recipe or recipes remember close variants and I just click enter or type the keyword in and hit my enter key I'm gonna get 35 million results but again is that really an indicator of the type of competition I have no because every listing that mentions homemade pizza dough recipes is going to be included in the search results so I'm gonna type in my all in title colon space and then I'm gonna get a better sense of how many websites have the keyword homemade pizza dough recipes in the title tag and I get 2160 different results so here I can see the first result in the title tag homemade pizza dough recipe second one homemade pizza dough recipe so these are sites or web pages that have that keyword in the title tag so now I have a numerical number to work with and so the thing you have to understand about SEO specifically about keyword research is you need to do research on a few different keywords, not just one or two. So what we want to do is have a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is going to contain keywords that we can potentially want to optimize for, choose as keywords to optimize for SEO. And so my recommendation is you come up with a theme first. So the theme for us in this exercise is pizza recipes. And so that's our theme. So we chose the keyword pizza recipes. So the close variance here is pizza recipe. What was the volume? Well, we know the volume was 33,100 for pizza recipe. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna put that number in, in our volume column. What was the competition? Well, if we go back and type in pizza recipes, it was 683,000. So I'm gonna type in 683,000. What was our next keyword? Well, it was pizza or homemade pizza dough recipes. So if I go back, 
for this particular keyword is 2400. So I'm gonna put 2400 in under my volume column. And then what was my competition? Well, my competition was, I typed that keyword back in, 2160. So I'm gonna put 2160. So now I have an idea of what kind of volume and what kind of competition I have. Now, you wanna do this for a number of different keywords. And when you do it for a number of keywords, what you do want to do is obviously choose a relevant keyword that has high volume and low competition. So another way of saying it is the volume or ratio of volume to competition. And so basically what we could do is take volume divided by competition. And if I make that a percentage, I could see it's 0.35% is the ratio between volume and competition. If I do the same for my longer tail keyword, 2400 divided by 2160, I can see that 111%. So this just kind of proves the point that, yeah, I'm still gonna get some volume, but I have a better chance of ranking for this longer tier keyword, homemade pizza dough recipes. So you wanna be able to do that for a number of keywords and examine the volume, the competition, and the ratio between volume and competition for your themed keywords, in this case, pizza recipes. So relevancy, you wanna choose keywords that are very relevant to the content that you're writing. And then again, commercial intent, what keywords are gonna drive more conversions and revenue for the business. So when we talk about commercial intent, we're talking about, you know, are you choosing keywords that are going to get somebody to do what you want them to do? So we could say, you know, download pizza dough recipes. So if somebody's typing in the keyword, download pizza dough recipes, then chances are they're gonna find you, come to your site and take action by downloading that pizza dough recipe. So you wanna be able to also think about the intent of the keyword. Is it going to help you drive conversions and revenue if you're an e-commerce site? So search volume is the average monthly search volume made for a particular keyword and phrase. So we can get that number using Google's keyword planner tool in the Google Ads platform. We want to target keywords with high search volume that will help bring traffic to the website. We want volume, but we want to take into account seasonality as well. So that's where the Google's keyword planner tool comes in place because if we go back, again, we can just hover over and we can get a sense of any particular trend going on or seasonality. So for example, if I saw large growth in the winter months and not much volume growth in the summer months, then that might indicate to me that this keyword is more popular during the winter time. So pay attention to the graphs that, you know, the Keyword Planner tool gives you. Use them to your advantage to take into account seasonality. So a good example would be funny Halloween costumes. Well, we know that for Halloween, you're going to have a spike probably towards the end of September, all the way through October, and then it's going to drop after October 31st, which is Halloween. So that's an example. But in the case of pizza recipes, you know, you may find that more people are, are choosing to search for pizza recipes during maybe the summer months versus the winter months. So pay attention to seasonality. It will affect search volume. So competition, based on our example, it's one of the most important key metrics. You don't want to choose a keyword that's highly competitive because if it's competitive, then it's going to be harder to rank number one or even on page one of Google, depending on competitive it is. So high search volume, low competition. In other words, the ratio between the two is the ideal combination. So going back to the spreadsheet, recommend you have that spreadsheet handy. Put your theme in place, okay? Theme pizza recipes. We use Google's keyword planner tool to find the volume. We use the all in title syntax to find the competition. So we entered both of those numbers in and we get our ratio. And so when you have these numbers for a number of different keywords, you want to be able to choose that ratio of high volume, low competition, but always relevancy always trumps ratio. So always go with a keyword that is going to be relevant to your content. Don't choose a keyword that's not relevant. If you choose a keyword that's not relevant, it's not going to bode well for user engagement. So the difficulty of a keyword ranges from zero to 100 in Google's keyword tool. So it's going to be easy. It's going to be medium. It's going to be hard. 
But my recommendation is also to get the numerical factor and that's the all in title syntax. And again, relevancy is what drives the traffic to your website and keep the traffic there on your website. And also not only will it keep the traffic on your website, but hopefully get that traffic to engage and convert. So that's the key about relevancy. You always want to choose keywords that are relevant to your content, even if it's sacrificing volume. Relevancy, again, trumps volume and competition. So always choose relevant keywords first. So when you do that, you're always almost guaranteeing that at some point, somebody's going to find your content because somebody out there might be looking for it. And if they do, you're going to get found and then the engagement is going to be better. So understand your business, find keywords that are relevant to your business, and then focus on those keywords. That'll help you with getting the right traffic to your site. Always keep in mind the commercial intent so these keywords are more specific and result in conversion rate. For example, buying is a good commercial intent keyword. So if you really want somebody to come to your website and buy, then focus on those types of keywords. In the case of the pizza recipes, maybe it's download could be our commercial intent keyword. Again, there may be low search volume, but those are the type of keywords you want to focus on because that's the type of traffic you want to drive to your site. So some other examples of commercial intent keywords are discount, deal, your coupon, shipping. You don't, don't be afraid to use some of these keywords as part of your longer tail keyword phrase. Again, the volume may not be high, but the traffic quality is probably gonna be better. So keyword research is the foundation for SEO. So if you have chosen your keywords properly, then if you do get ranked for those keywords, then it's going to lead to better engagement with some conversions. And so when we talk about keywords, we also want to talk about our primary and secondary keywords. So every page should have at least a primary keyword and then a secondary keyword to work with. So primary keywords are really defining the nature of your content. The secondary keywords are relevant to the primary keyword. So why do we choose a primary and secondary keyword? Word because you may choose a keyword as a primary keyword that is relevant to the content but may not necessarily rank very high or have a lot of volume. That secondary keyword is also relevant to the primary keyword but also relevant to the content. And you may rank for that secondary keyword. So you always want to go with two keywords versus just one keyword. You want to give your, yourself a chance to rank for at least two different types of keywords of relevant nature. So for a web page, there can be several several secondary keywords, but only one primary keyword. So your primary keyword is always going to be relevant to the, your content. Secondary keywords can be relevant to the keyword, but, and you may have multiple secondary keywords, but it's also going to be related to the content and it gives you a better opportunity to be found between both the primary and secondary in search. Okay, so let's take a look at another example of how to use primary keywords and secondary keywords when choosing keywords. So if a primary keyword is healthy diet plan, remember healthy diet plan is directly related to the content. So that's what we're talking about. But these secondary keywords are also related to content and play off the primary keyword. And so what we want to do is go to cool Google's keyword planner tool and get an idea of the volume for healthy diet plan and then also the volume and competition for some of these secondary keywords like healthy diet for weight loss, healthy diet food, low carb diet, healthy meal plans and diet plan weight loss. So if I go in to Google's keyword planner and type those keywords in, I'm going to choose get results. And now here I could see healthy diet plan keyword on focusing on as my primary keyword has an average monthly search volume of 9,900. And then some of my secondary keywords, healthy diet foods, diet plan, weight loss, low carb diet, you know, Google will give me a number of different keywords to work with. So I'm going to look at the search volume of those as well. And so ideally what I want to do is be able to then look at the volume and then look at the competition. So healthy diet plan, if I go into my keyword analysis here. That's my theme. So that's my keyword. What's my volume for healthy diet plan? 9,900. What's my competition? So my competition is 74,700 and that's going 
going to give me a ratio of volume to competition of 13%. So that's what my content's about. That's a considered a short tail keyword because it has a lot of competition. And so my ratio is 13%. And what I want to do is I want to be able to put these other secondary keywords in here as well. Maybe even go to a little longer tail because I want to be able to find two key, or at least two keywords. I want to be able to find my primary keyword that's relevant to my content. And then I want to be able to find my secondary keyword, which is again related to the primary keyword, which is also related to the content. And so I want to be able to choose two keywords basically. And I want to choose two keywords that are relevant that have good ratio between volume and competition. So that's the whole idea again of how to do keyword research you, you want to be able to find your keywords use the tools available to you and get a sense of what the volume is what the competition is look at the ratio between the volume and competition and then based on the content choose that primary keyword and then again based on the keyword you chose choose some secondary keywords as well because you want to be found for not just one keyword but multiple keywords okay let's look at some alternative suggestions to keyword research so for doing keyword research, we want to take into account LSI keywords. We could take into account other platforms that host a lot of content like Quora or Reddit. We can use Google suggestions in the keyword search bar. We can use popular platforms like Wikipedia and we can use social media bookmarking like Reddit. So there are lots of suggestions that we can obtain from various sources. So let's start with LSI keywords and LSI stands for latent semantic insect indexing. And so basically what it is, it's just keywords that are linked to your primary keyword. And so when you're choosing keywords, you always want to choose that primary keyword and then secondary keywords that are similar to to the primary keyword. And usually those are LSI or latent semantic indexing type keywords. So they're used to drive relevant traffic to your page. So if you're focusing on one keyword, we wanna have other keywords that are similar to increase our visibility on the search engine result pages. So we could find latent semantic indexing right in search. So if we use the term healthy diet, if we go to Google search, for example, if I type in healthy diet in Google search, all I need to do is scroll to the bottom of the page and I can see searches related to healthy diet. So healthy diet menu, healthy diet essay, what does a healthy diet look like? Notice at the top Google's also giving me some other suggestions here. So they're saying low fat diet, veganism, gluten free diet. So there's lots of different suggestions right in Google search bar. So all of these are LSI related keywords. So if you're optimizing a page for healthy diet, Diet, then you could choose low fat diet as a secondary keyword. You can use gluten free diet as a secondary keyword. It really depends on what the content is, but you always want to support your content with as much LSI keywords as possible so you can be found for as many different keywords as possible in Google search. So it's important because if you have a blog that you know talks about Python, so how do the search engines know if the website Python is about the programming language? language or the snake. So Google, for example, uses LSI keywords to understand what the page is specifically focusing on. So if you're just focusing on Python and your content, you want to support that with LSI keywords. And so that will allow your web page to better communicate with Google also to have the visibility to show up on search. So they can certainly improve your search positioning and featured snippets as well. So if you have a keyword that answers a question, you could certainly be found for a featured snippet. For example, maybe, you know, healthy diet recipes. If I type that in, you could see here, there's a featured snippet. So if I'm talking about recipes, that's a keyword I may want to use. And if I use that, then Google has an opportunity to see what my content's about and place my information at the top in this featured snippet. You can also, again, see what some of the questions are being asked, what meals are good for weight loss, what is a good healthy diet plan. All of these can be keyword phrases that you can use. So the answers are right here in Google. So Quora is a great platform because Quora is a platform that people go and ask questions in a community responds with answers or responses.
to that particular question or topic. And so the great thing about Quora is it's a good is a good place for you to go to get some ideas about a specific topic. So if we're talking about healthy dieting, so we can find keywords with high search volume right in Quora. So the whole idea is you can look at, you know, the top five questions for a specific topic like healthy dieting and find relevant keywords to healthy dieting. So if you just type in that particular keyword in Quora, you're going to probably get some responses to questions or responses to somebody else's question and so if we take a look at core for example so if I just type in healthy dieting what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get some responses to the, the topic healthy dieting so what's the best diet for healthy living what are the top five tips for a healthy diet habit so all of these could be keyword phrases that you could take away with for your own content and so the benefit here is you're getting kind of an idea of which trending what people are talking about and if you use tips for a healthy diet habit for example and you optimize for that well again that could turn around and bode well for you because you could be featured in Google as a featured snippet at the top here you can also turn around and use LSI related keywords for healthy diet habits and you can simply just look for those LSI keywords right in Google remember at the bottom or at the top if I scroll down I could see some related LSI keywords words at the bottom. So right in Google as well, you could see in the Google search bar that Google provides some LSI related keywords to your query. So if I go back here and type in healthy diet recipes, I could see here Google suggesting some other related keywords. Healthy diet menu, healthy diet for men, healthy diet foods, healthy diet for women. So these are all LSI related keywords that you can use to support your primary keyword and the content you're writing about. So we've talked about LSI keywords, where to find them. So they're found right here. They can be found at the top of Google and they can be found at the bottom. You can also then go to Core as well and get some ideas for the types of questions that are being asked. So if you ask a question and use that as your keyword phrase, then again, you have an opportunity of showing up for a featured snippet in Google just by doing some additional research within Google itself or on Quora. So according to Google, the autocomplete predictions are automatically generated by Google's algorithm them without any human intervention. It's based on a number of factors, but the primary factor is how often past users have searched for a term. So Google collects all the keyword queries that somebody types in, and they're suggesting some of the most popular terms that people have typed in. So if I go back to Google, again, if I start to type in recipes, I could see some of the other queries that somebody else has typed in, or some of the most popular queries related to that topic. So if you enter the keyword healthy diet, Google's going to suggest multiple keyword suggestions that users have asked in the past. And you could certainly get the search volume of those keywords just by looking in Google itself. I could see for healthy diet recipes, billions of pages related to healthy diet recipes. I can also get the search volume by going into Google's keyword planner so if I type in healthy diet I'm gonna be able to see what my search volume is for that keyword and in addition I can see the seasonality of that particular keyword and in addition to that Google is gonna provide some other related keywords to my search query so if I'm looking for healthy diet Google is gonna suggest hey maybe you should choose healthy food or healthy eating or how to lose weight so those are all LSI related keywords that Google provides in the keyword plan which is built into the Google Ads platform. Another option for you is Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is a vast platform of content. So we could turn Wikipedia into our own asset and use it to our own advantage by finding relevant keywords in an easy fashion. So with Wikipedia, we can identify a list of keywords in the meta description itself. We could choose keywords from the first paragraph of Wikipedia that has many relevant keywords, or we could take a look at keywords from the Wikipedia content section. So we can also see additional pages like the see also section that gives relevant keywords that you're looking for. We can also look at the references section as they contain relevant keywords. So if we go to Wikipedia as an example and I type in healthy diet into Wikipedia. Here I can get it just in the first paragraph alone. I can see some additional keywords that I might 
choose to use, like micronutrients. I never knew that micronutrients was related to healthy diet, but Wikipedia is providing some information about what micronutrients is. And maybe I can use that as a keyword, an LSI related keyword to my content. So if I scroll down, I get the see also section. So it might give me some information, food information to consumers, for example, dietary guidelines. I can look at categories like dietetics and diets. I can also look at the references section so I can also see what information was provided like health effects of overweight and obesity. I can look at diet and physical activity. So all of these are related to my main keyword healthy diet. So the answers are right in here on the platform. They're just all over the page. So Wikipedia has an abundance of information. You just need to know where to look. So again, with Wikipedia, you can look no further than the first paragraph. You can look no further than the see also section, the references section, category section. There's lots of information right on the page itself to help you get ideas for keywords. So if you Google your keyword with Wikipedia term in the search query and get relevant keywords from the title tags in the SERP. So you can also do that as well. So if I type in healthy diet Wikipedia in search, I can also get some information here as well. So people also search for healthy food advantages or healthy food habits essay or information about healthy food. All of these are related to my keyword healthy diet. So again, another bit of information for you to choose or look to choose some additional keywords for. So Reddit, it's a popular community where people post content and discuss a variety of topics. So that's what Reddit is. So with the help of subreddits, an individual can find relevant keywords with, with high search volume. So in Reddit, there's an easy way to find out keywords. They have a keyword tool called Keywordit. So Keywordit gives the average monthly searches for a particular keyword. So if we type a word in Keyreddit and choose keywords from the auto-generated list, this tool will extract the keywords and give us those relevant terms with search volume. So if we go to the Keywordit and show an example of that, for example, healthy food, if I get keywords, I can see what keywords are relevant and the search volume of that keyword. So if I just type in healthy food, Keywordit tool is going to tell me some relevant keywords and what the volume is. So if you don't have the keyword planner tool in Google Ads available to you, this is a good alternative solution to finding keywords. So it's free. You just need to go to keyword.com, type in your keyword, click get keywords, and what it's gonna do is give you some relevant keywords related to your primary keyword with the search volume. Let's talk about keyword clustering now. So the whole idea about keyword clustering is to really take advantage of the keywords that we're optimizing for to gain higher ranking. So if we can cluster keywords together in a theme, and that theme of keywords is relevant to a specific page of a website, then we have a better opportunity to rank. So in other words, why do we have to target just one keyword when we can target many? So keep in mind, you know, LSI keywords, we want to group a bunch of keywords together that are similar for content. So for example, after some keyword research, you can thematically group keywords into a core topic. So for example, we can cluster these group of keywords together. Together. Like for example, what is SEO? How does SEO work? Intro to SEO, what are the basics of SEO? All of those are related to the core theme, what is SEO? Another cluster of keywords, for example, could be SEO techniques, SEO best practices, tips and tricks, website optimization, on-page SEO techniques, etc. So those are clusters of keywords, okay, that we can group together in themes. And if we group keywords together in themes, we can apply that to a particular content on our website. So the whole idea behind clustering keywords, it's going to provide more diversity, more of an opportunity for us to be found. So that's the whole idea behind clustering. So some ad additional steps. Remember, stay up to date on industry news. So brainstorm your ideas first and identify a list of keywords, i.e. a theme of keywords that you can cluster together. And then you could determine the keywords that your competitors are already ranking for. So for example, if we want to rank for the keyword SEO best practices, for example, we can use a tool called Keyword Moz. If I go to keyword, the Keyword Explorer tool in Moz and just type in SEO best practices, 
what it's going to do is it's going to give me some volume related to that particular keyword. But more importantly, what it's also going to do is it's going to show me what pages are already ranked for that particular keyword. So therefore I can get an, a sense of who is already ranking for that keyword. So here I can see Moz, Moz, Medium.com, Alexa.com. So I can get a sense of what web pages are ranked for a particular keyword or group of keywords I want to rank for myself. Greetings everyone, this is Rob Sanders and thank you for joining me. Today we're gonna talk about SEO tools. So let's get started. So if you're doing SEO and you're doing on-page and off-page SEO for an organization or a website, you're going to need some tools to help you. So you can't go at it alone, you can't do anything manually. You have to lean on tools to help you work more efficiently, help you gain an advantage. And so if you're doing SEO, you're gonna need tools Tools for keyword research. You're going to need tools to help you with the technical aspects related to SEO. You're going to have to use some tools for off-page SEO, including backlink monitoring and analysis. And then there's tools for helping you track where your keywords and pages rank. So there's tools for every element of SEO. And today we're going to take a look at some of the best tools out there on the market to help you do your job better. So let's start with the keyword research. So with keyword research, research tools, you can do your job a lot more efficiently finding the right relevant keywords. I mean, that's really key to SEO is finding keywords that are relevant to your business, product or service that you want to rank for. So you want to be able to choose keywords with high search volume and low competition. So where do you get those numbers? You get those from certain tools. You also want to get forecasts for certain targeted keywords. You want to be able to generate a list of latent semantic indexing type keywords keywords close to the keyword you're trying to target. You want to be able to select primary and secondary keywords wisely. So having a list of keywords with certain data points will help you do that. And you want to be able to identify the keywords that your competitors are also ranking for. So good keyword research tool will help you do all of those things. So what are some of the, the tools out there? Well, look no further than some of the free ones that Google offers like Google Trends. So Google Trends is a good tool that you can lean on. If so, if we look at Google Google Trends. All you need to do is trends.google.com. You could type in a keyword. I can look at the volume or interest of that keyword over time here. I'm looking at football versus American football and I could see how it's trending. Then I could see, you know, how it trends in specific regions of say the United States as my market. I can also look at other related queries similar to football or American football. And so Google Trends is a good tool, helps you look at the the volume, helps you look at what specific regions, helps you look at other keywords. You know, if you want, you can simply just do a keyword search or you can actually just see what's trending just by looking at the latest stories and insights. So we could see International Women's Day, you know, started to pick up steam, it's picking up more steam, etc. So it's certain keywords that tend to trend well and you could pick up on what those keywords are using Google Trends. Now, you could also use another Google tool called Google Keywords planner the only difference is this one's paid you need a Google Ads account so if we go into Google Ads hey you'll need to go to tools and you need to go to keyword planner but when you're in keyword planner you can find new keywords so if I type in for example you know online marketing and click get started what the keyword tool is going to do is give me the data that I need to do appropriate keyword research it's going to give me my keyword and similar keywords it's going to give me the average month and volume. And the great thing here is I can actually see the trend for that keyword over time just by clicking on this little bar graph. So for digital marketing, I could see what the trend is over time. I could see what the competition is. I could see, you know, if I'm going to bid on this keyword, I could see what the bidding range is. So more important, I could see the volume and I could see the competition. Here's my volume for this keyword over the last 12 months on average. And here's my competition. So Google's Keyword Planner gives gives you the necessary information you need to choose relevant keywords wisely. Now, there are other tools out there that are paid that help you look for 
relevant keywords like SEMrush or Keyword Finder. That's a freemium tool. So there are plenty of tools available to you. You know, another tool I use that's not listed here is Moz. So if you just type a keyword, let's just type in the same keyword like online marketing, for example. Okay, so what Moz is gonna do, it's gonna give me some volume. It's gonna give me some other keyword suggestions. Okay, it's gonna tell me how difficult that keyword is. And it's gonna tell me who else is ranking for that keyword. So it gives me, again, all the relative information I need, including competitive information. So you can use these two, these keyword tools. Moz is freemium, some are paid, some are free. There's plenty of tools out there, but these are the ones I would recommend for keyword research. Now let's turn our attention to technical SEO. So for technical SEO, you're gonna need to use some tools. There's no getting around that because you wanna be able to monitor how your website is performing. I mean, is it loading slow, for example? Does it have a lot of uh, issues with the website in terms of uh, server-side rendering, for example, or server response time? What about 404s and redirects? So you want to be able to gather a lot of the technical information that could aid or prohibit your site from ranking. So you want to be able to also, you know, look at what the bots are seeing and how they're viewing your website. So if Google goes to crawl your site, are they experiencing, you know, a slow server response time? Or are they experiencing pages not found? You also want to see if you have a sitemap. You know, what's the sitemap? Are these bots crawling your site or getting the pages from a sitemap? And again, you want to be able to lean on some of these tools to help you fix errors that you may encounter, like meta tags or 404s or canonicals. So you need a good tool to help you manage all that. And so I'm going to go back to Moz starting out. So if we go back to Moz, Moz is a good tool. It's an all-in-one. It's a great SEO platform. So if I go to Moz and I log into an account, I can just go to site crawl. And so what Moz is going to do, it's going to give me a lot of information about how Moz's bot is seeing my site. Okay. So if I go to the site crawl, I can look at all the particular critical uh, issues that I've experienced. So I could see four four errors, okay, redirects related to that. I could see meta descriptions, missing meta descriptions, duplicate content. So there's a lot of different issues that Moz is detecting for this particular site. And the great thing about Moz, and this is why I use Moz as my SEO platform, I don't work for Moz, I've just used them a long time, is if you do have issues, then they give you ways to fix it, the how to fix it section. So if I see missing description here, if I just click on review, I can get a more in-depth analysis as to what the issues are here. But I can also click on the why and how to fix, okay? And they're gonna give you some information about how this is impacting SEO and what you could do to fix the issue. They lay out the issues pretty prominently here. You can see for all the metadata issues I have, I have you know 142 total metadata issues. I have 10 title tag too longs. I have 122 missing meta descriptions. So they lay it out nicely here up the top so you can kind of get a sense of what to work on. And again, they prioritize it based on the severity of the issue. And then they break it down into several categories. For example, I just looked at metadata issues. You could see if I click on content issues, I have some duplicate content that Moz is recognizing or missing or valid H tags. So Moz does a really, really great job laying all, all the issues out for you to recognize. Okay, there's another tool that I like to use called Screaming Frog. It's a pay tool. So if we go look here, great thing I like about uh, a Screaming Frog, it will crawl your site and it will give you some a list of issues just like Moz does of, you know, what it sees in your site. Is it experiencing 404s, broken links? Are there any redirects it's picking up? Duplicate content, site maps, you know, their JavaScript issues, how does it see the site architecture? So it really does take a deep look at everything that could impact your website from ranking. Okay, there are other tools out there like, you know, Deep Crawl or WooRank. They're both paid. And so pay tools are really great as well. It just depends on, you know, your pricing structure, what your budget is. But really, when it comes to all these tools, they all more or less overlap and do the same thing. You just need to really rely on one of them to make sure that you're able to see what the issues are. Now, there's nothing wrong with using two of them just as a second reference point to see if both are picking up the same issue. And of course, I like to use Search 
Console. I always like to lean on Google Search Console because that is the source. So Search Console will also you know, give you some feedback on how Google's bot is crawling your site. So that's under the crawl error section here. So you can also you know, use Search Console to upload a sitemap. So that's a key to SEO. You want Google to be able to find your web pages quickly. So you can simply just uh, signify to Google where your sitemap is located. So the Search Console does a lot more, gives you some HTML improvements, gives you some backlinking, uh, and then the process of updating the Search Console user interface. So there's a new user interface that you can use with Google Search Console. The great thing is it's free and it has everything you need to know about your website and how it's affected by SEO, organic search. The only thing you have to do with Search Console is verify the site. But once you verify it, it has all the relevant information you need. So let's talk about backlink monitoring and analysis. Okay, so this is related to off-page SEO. So you're gonna need a good tool to help you monitor your website backlinks. And backlinks are simply just links from external sites pointing to your site and you need to keep an eye on what sites are linking to yours are they spammy related sites are they good or relevant sites or anything in between so you need to really be able to analyze what the good links are and what the bad links are pointing to your website you want to identify and disavow poor backlinks okay so you want to be able to recognize what sites are linking to yours that's actually hurting you from an SEO standpoint and you want to be able to do something about that okay you want to measure citation flow and trust flow you want to check the ratio of link distribution in terms of is it internal or external or you know what kind of sites are linking to my site are they you know social related are they pure content related and then you want to be able to track the number of do follow and no follow links you know how many links pointing to our site are actually telling Google and other bots not to follow the link or how many are actually allowing the bots to follow that link if a bot follows a link it's going to to pass what we call link juice. So you're gonna get credit for the backlink. If it's a no follow, you're not gonna get credit for the backlink. And we wanna be able to measure that. And so we wanna have tools that will help us do that. So what are some of those tools? Well, Hrefs is a good tool, it's a pain tool. Majestic is a freemium tool. Moz, again, Moz is the tool I use. SEMrush, and then again, I gotta mention Google Search Console. So let's take a look at some of these tools in terms of backlink monitoring and analysis. So let's start with Google Search Console again it's free you just have to verify your site and so if I go to Google Search Console I can look at links and I could see what external links I have pointing to my site okay so I could see I have 17,000 in this example pointing to the home page of this particular site okay so if I click on that I could see all the the top sites pointing to my home page now from an off-page SEO perspective do you want every backlink or external link pointing to your home page no so you want links pointing to internal pages so you want to be able to measure that so I could see what the top linking sites are and I could also see what the anchor text is so do I want my anchor text always to be my brand name no I want it to be you know keyword we're trying to target search console also gives you some internal links okay what are the top link pages for internal links so from an SEO perspective you always want to have a nice balance of internal linking so this report helps you understand what pages are getting links and are the links evenly spread so this is Google search console this is the links report this is totally free this is provided by Google all you have to do is verify your site now if we go over to Moz we type in a domain any domain so I just typed in simply learn okay Moz has some metrics that are important to off-page SEO including domain authority so the higher your domain authority the better off you are and so what helps a domain authority grow is how how many quality links are pointing to that domain and so here we could see over 7,500 linking domains to simply learn so what's important is we just don't want any site we want quality relevant sites pointing okay so we could see how many total inbound links and then how many ranking keywords we have okay so here Moz is gonna give me kind of an idea 
of what my domain authority has been over time. They're going to tell me the top followed links to the site. So they can tell me, you know, what are those links pointing to my site and what's the page authority of those sites. Okay, here I can get a nice graphical breakdown of the linking domains by domain authority. So you want pages with high domain authority pointing to your site. So here I can see 69 linking domains between 91 and 100. So that's really good. We want high relevant domains linking to our site. So just like Search Console, I could see the top anchor text being used. Okay, and I can see the top pages that have you know good page authority on the site. I could see following versus no follow on internal and external links. So this is just the overview. So Moz really, really does break down for you, you know, what those pages and linking domains are. So if I just click on linking domains, now I could get a detailed look for my homepage, what domains are pointing to our domain. So I could see Microsoft.com has a domain authority of 100, YouTube 99. And so not only does Moz provide you with the domains, it also provides you with their domain authority score and spam score. So you want to keep an eye on any particular site that has a high spam score. So having a site with a high spam score and a low domain authority will hurt your domain and page authority for that page. So Moz does a great job of breaking it out and this is for any page. It doesn't necessarily have to be the home page. Okay, if I take a look at another example here, Majestic. So Majestic, again, I can use a free version of the tool. They have their own metrics, citation flow, trust flow. So when they say trust flow, what's the link quality all about? Okay, citation flow, what's the link volume? And okay, they can get an idea of how many external backlinks are pointing to the site and what's the trend on that, referring domains. So Majestic does a really good job. Again, some of the same metrics that we could see here, except they go into detail about languages as well. So this is Majestic and you got Search Console. You got a lot of other tools. And then I'm gonna just revert back to Moz because you wanna be able to compare link profiles. If you're in a competitive space and you're doing off-page SEO, you know, Moz will help you compare how your site stands against maybe another competitive site or relevant site. So just doing this analysis, I can compare my domain authority, spam score, how many total links, you know, how many external followed links or external no followed links, a breakdown of linking domains. So it does a nice job of comparing one site versus another. That's going back to Moz and that's what you want. You want a good tool that's going to help you do that. I mean, there's other tools out there not listed like Bright Edge that will also help you compare linking profiles. So at the end of the day, if you're doing off-page SEO, you want to get a sense of what sites are linking to yours. Are they quality sites? Are they spammy? What anchor texts are they using? Are they no follow? Are they do follow? You know, are they top domains? How do you compare against your competitors? I mean, all these metrics are related to off-page SEO. So you want a good tool that's going to help you measure this. Okay, so let's talk about rank tracking. So when we do keyword research, we're looking for relevant keywords. We find our relevant keywords. We assign primary and secondary keywords to pages. We optimize those pages. We do off-page SEO and we're doing all this work for SEO. Okay, we want to be able to measure the fruits of our labor. We want to be able to measure how we perform for on and off-page SEO for the keywords we covet and the pages they're related to. And so that's where rank tracking comes into play. So we want to be able to track our website's ranking and not just our website, all the pages we've optimized. We want to be able to measure our click-through rates and impressions. We want to be able to track the ranking for both desktop and mobile for specific locations. And we want to identify top performing, gaining and losing keywords. So in other words, we want to look at trends. Is a keyword ranking? Is it going up in ranking? Is it going down in ranking? If it's going down in ranking, then you need to take action. So you need a tool, a good tool for rank tracking. So we can look no further than again, Google Search Console. It's free, it's right from the source. So let's take a look at what Google Search Console has to offer in terms of rank tracking. So if I go to Google Search Console and I put in a URL, what it's gonna do is it's going to give me, and this is the search queries report, it's gonna give me what queries people have used to actually type into google.com and it's gonna be able to tell me how many times my pages, show, pages showed up for that query. It could be more than one page, so that's an impression. And if I did receive an impression, meaning did 
did my page show up in the organic listing? Then did I get a click as a result? And so in this case, if I got 68 impressions and 10 clicks for keywords somebody typed in, that's a 14.7% click through rate. And so what Search Console will also do is say, hey, look, for that particular keyword, you appeared on average in position 4.1. So it gives you really good insight as to you know what people are typing in and how you're being found for those keywords. It breaks it down by pages, it breaks it down by country, breaks it down by device. So I could see, you know, mobile, I've had 899 impressions over the last three months on mobile, and I received 33 clicks as a result. My average position on mobile was 2.6. So Search Console does a really good job. Again, this is free information of providing you the actual keywords somebody's using on Google Search as a query and how many impressions you're receiving for that keyword, how many clicks, click the rate, and then average position. So in theory, the higher you are positioned on Google, the more clicks you're gonna receive. So if I'm not positioned properly for keyword, let's just say page two, then I'm probably not gonna receive as many clicks as I would like. So that's Search Console. There are other tools out there like Hrefs, again, does a good job of tracking AMZ Tracker. We look at Wincher. So there's some good tools out there. I'm just gonna show you another one again. I'm gonna go back to Moz, for example. So Moz has a tool called, so if I go back into the account, so Moz has a, a rankings tool that you can look at to see where your keywords are ranking. So if you've already chosen keywords and optimized pages for those keywords, then you want to be able to load those keywords into Moz. And so Moz allows you to do that. And so what Moz does, they do a crawl once a week and they'll be able to tell you where you rank for all your keywords. Are we moving up in the rankings? Are we moving down? How many keywords do we have ranked between positions one and three, 11 through 20, four through 10, 21 through 50? So we'll be able to see where our keywords rank. And so it gives you a breakdown here of nationally in the United States where this keyword is ranked and if it's moved up or down and for what URL is it ranked for. And so you can label so the keywords and, and this is what you want to look for in a good tool. You want to be able to organize your keywords and label them. So for all our branded keywords, we want to be able to label them branded because ideally you don't want to optimize for your brand keywords. So maybe Maybe we want to exclude our brand keywords and look at our non-brand keywords in terms of ranking. And so you can certainly add locations and look at specific locations. The whole idea between a good ranking tool is to be able to measure, you know, if a keyword is trending up or down. Okay, so I can simply look at a particular keyword and I can see the trend of that keyword. And then, you know, if a keyword's not ranking, then we want to wonder why it's not ranking. Well, is it difficult? Is it not ranking because of its difficulty? or can we do a better job of optimizing for that keyword? And so Moz also has a page optimization tool. So if you're not ranking for a keyword, you can flip over to the page optimization tool, then put in the keyword, put in the URL, and Moz will give you some idea as to what you can further do to, to optimize the page. Okay, so that's Moz. You know, this is Ahrefs. So you can see Ahrefs does the same thing. They provide you some visibility, average position, how much traffic, you know, where you're ranking in terms of positions one through three, four through 10, 11 through 50. And so you want to be able to get a sense of where my track keywords are trending. Are they trending up? Are they trending down? And the whole idea again, beyond a ranking tool is if you're trending down, you want to be able to address why it's trending down. So you want to start with on-page SEO. Can we do a better job of optimizing or off-page? Does that page need more backlinks? So that's why you need a backlink tool to support your ranking. And Ahrefs does offer up some competitor information as well. So you can see how your competitors are performing. So these are some good examples of ranking tools that you can take advantage of. Now, there are also a few important SEO tools that can be helpful in different ways. For example, if you're doing video. So there are some tools to help you measure how you're performing via video. For example, vidIQ. So let's take a look at vidIQ. So if I load in, say, video in YouTube, in this example, how to rank YouTube videos, I have a vidIQ extension loaded into my browser in Chrome. And so now I can get a good sense of how many views, the duration, the engagement rate, the like ratio, how many people shared it on Reddit. But further, I can look at how the video was 
is optimized. So they're telling me the title's too long here, maybe shorten it up, but we have tags, we have descriptions, we have cards, we have end screens. It's been shared on Facebook. It hasn't been shared on Twitter. Okay, it is public. We do have pinned comments and we do have hearted comments. And so this gives me an idea of how we did in terms of optimizing this particular video. Okay, so if we wanted to tweak it, we could tweak the title tag, make it a little bit shorter to help it rank better on YouTube. So you want to be able to use a tool like this because if you have videos, then you want those videos to rank. And so you can certainly watch this video on how to rank your YouTube videos. And in that video, we do allude to vidIQ. So you want to be able to use a tool like this because you know YouTube, it is a video portal, but it's the second largest search engine behind Google. So if you do have videos, you want to be able to rank for them and you want a tool that's going to help you measure and help you understand if you are ranking, if you're not ranking, why are you not ranking? Now for content optimization, there are tools you can use like SEO Site Checkup or Site Analyzer are some good tools. If you already have Moz as an example, just going back to Moz, as you already know, I use Moz a lot. So they have a page optimization so you could check the content and how you're optimized your content. So it's going to give me some good feedback on, you know, is your page title, meta description, are they in line? Okay, so it's going to give you some good feedback on that. You also have, again, I have to allude to Search Console. You can always look at a particular page in Search Console, see if it has any errors as well. So is it duplicated meta description? Is it a duplicated title? Title tag? Is it any pages missing title tags or meta descriptions? So when it comes to content, you can look at Search Console, you can lean on Moz, or you can lean on some of these other paid versions like Site Analyzer. When it comes to traffic and metrics, look no further than Google Analytics. There is a free version of Google Analytics as well as a paid version. So if I go into Google Analytics, it's going to tell me all of my website behavior. Okay, who's coming to my site, how they got to my site, how they behave once they went to my site and are they achieving the goals I set out for them to achieve via conversions and so you want to look at first in Google Analytics how much traffic you're getting so if I go to Google Analytics if I go to acquisition all traffic channels I should be able to see how much traffic organic search is driving over a period of time so I could see how many users how many sessions then if I click on landing pages I could see what landing page they went to so I could see the home page page over a particular time had over a thousand sessions. I can also see engagement from organic search. Are they bouncing? How many pages are they looking at in the session after they landed on a particular page? Are they staying on the site a long time? What's their duration? Or are they achieving any goals? So analytics will provide me all that information about how organic search as a channel is performing. The other thing about Google Analytics I like, and that goes back to the technical aspect of SEO and that's site speed. So if you go to behavior and you go to site speed overview, you'll be able to see how my pages are loading. What's the average load time? So they'll break it down for you by browser, by country, and by specific page. So if I look at page timings, I'll be able to see what page is loading slow, what page is loading quick compared to site average. And so the great thing about analytics is if I have a page that's loading slow compared to site average, they'll actually provide me with some suggestions. So if I go to site speed and speed suggestions, what they're going to do is they're going to have a link in the report that's going to allow me to click on it and I'm going to be able to see what suggestions they can provide. So when this report loads, I'll be able to see what the speed suggestions are for my pages. So here I could see the page. I could see what the average load time is of that page. So for example, this particular page is loading at six seconds. Ideally, we want to have, you know, three seconds or under maximum. So if I just click on this link here, they're giving me six page speed suggestions. So if I click on that, I'm going to go to another Google tool called Page Speed Insights. And then Page Speed Insights is going to run for both mobile and desktop for this particular page. And then this Page Speed Insights report is going to give me feedback as to what I need to do to speed up the load time of that page. So here you can see for desktop and mobile, they're going to give me some suggestions and opportunities. So reduce the server response time, properly size images, serve images in next gen formats. So all these will shave off time off my page load time. And so that's what's going to help me speed up the page load. And that's
that's page speed insights you can get to from the speed suggestions report and analytics so in theory the higher your page load time your chances of ranking on Google organic search diminish so Google wants pages that have very low page load time that load quickly so Google Analytics is a great tool for speed suggestions it's a great tool for finding out what the traffic is doing on your site how they're engaging and are they achieving goals now there are other tools out there from an organic perspective like keyword it that's a good keyword research tool for reddit so if you go to keyword it you'll be able to see from a reddit perspective what keywords are driving volume these are just the results but you can put any keyword in there and get the results of that keyword SEO is an important part of the marketing strategy. In case your website doesn't show up on the first page of the search engine, then you need to work on it. To solve all your SEO-related problems, we've come up with a solution. Welcome to Simply Learn's YouTube channel, and today we will be discussing the top 10 tips that every marketer needs to know. So let's get started and see the first step. The first step is voice search. Now, voice search will impact search queries in 2021, according to Dialogtech.com. In the United States of America, 55% of the households will have their own smart speaker by 2022. Well, that's a lot. So if you're planning to optimize your voice search, consider choosing wise keywords. Find out longer phrases that searchers use in daily life conversation. Voice search is a more suitable way for searching long and more natural sounding phrases. Creating detailed and relevant answers are essential when optimizing for voice search. So always remember to create persona based content. Next, create web pages that can answer FAQ use. Because when searchers ask a question, they begin their question with words like who, when, and what. However, there are many reasons for using voice search such as dictating text messages, looking for a video on YouTube, calling a person from your contact list, asking for directions, etc. According to Forbes, voice search drastically improves your user experience. Due to its extensive use, search engines such as Google are focusing on voice search optimization. Google's voice search shows websites on top that load quickly, in that case, you must always ensure that your website has a responsive design. Its images are optimized, the files are compressed, implementation of website caching is done properly to improve page speed, and finally, the last important point, your server's response time is reduced. Now, The second step in the process is the mobile optimization. Now, You must already know how important it is to make your site mobile friendly. For a better user experience. But did you also know that having a mobile friendly application impacts your search engine optimization? SEM Rush confirms that by the year 2025, approximately 70% of internet users will access the internet through mobile devices. Google's mobile friendly update has resulted in a big change in search rankings. With the help of Google's free mobile-friendly test, have a look at how effective your mobile website is. Also, take a peek at the mobile usability report in Google's Search Console. Now let's talk about tip number three, that is Google's eight principles. Google has confirmed that content quality is an essential factor for ranking on search engine result pages. But what does quality mean to Google? Well, content that fulfills the Google EAT principle will rank higher. EAT stands for expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. These elements will determine if a web page has a useful quality content. Google uses the combination of algorithms to deliver the best results for users. Google Panda is one of the famous algorithms of Google, which emphasizes delivering high-quality content. It removes web pages from the index that have low quality and duplicate content. Not just that, there is one more algorithm called RankBrain. RankBrain is a processing algorithm that uses machine learning to interpret search queries that users search on Google. 
whereas the searched query may not have the right keywords that were searched for. For example, when you're searching for chocolate cake recipes, you will also get results for chocolate truffle cake recipes on the search engine results page. Google Panda and RankBrain send bots to crawl each and every website, and as a result, shows high-quality content on the top of the search engine results page. Next is our tip number four, Featured Snippet. These results are featured on the top part of the page. Google programmatically chooses the best answer from the third-party website and displays it on the Featured Snippet. Here's what a Featured Snippet looks like. According to Ahrefs, for a specific search query, almost 99% of web pages shown in the Featured Snippet already rank on SERP's first page. Some of the ways to optimize featured snippets are organize your content in a structured way. Make sure one article answers many similar questions. Use eye-catching images. And the last point is to create answers with tables to drive clicks and write dedicated headings to answer featured snippets. Like, is red meat healthy? Suppose you want to create snippets. Plan on creating question-based questions along with the relevant keywords. For ideas, you can also look at the Google search function that is usually written in the blue color. And it reads out as people also ask. So now let's move to the fifth tip. Image optimization. According to SEM Rush, image optimization will play a prominent role in search. In case the images on your website aren't optimized, make sure to take care of them right now. Remember to use high-quality images, relevant images, and use a suitable label for your image file. Include images in your sitemap as it becomes easier for the bots to crawl. And finally, use alt tags as crawlers use it to classify the images. Alt text is displayed on the web page when an image fails to load on a user screen. It is also utilized by Google to drive meaning from images. A well-optimized image can improve your page ranking and increase the engagement on it. Image optimization can help your web page show up in the image carousels on search engines. Next, we have semantically related keywords. Semantic search will have become an important factor for ranking in the future. Semantic keywords are linked to the primary keywords. They drive relevant traffic on search engine result pages. A simple way to look for LSI keywords is on Google SERP. Semantic search can be performed wisely by writing content that targets the question that your target audience is looking for. Remember to optimize content for topic clusters instead of focusing solely on keywords. And finally, use structured data and pick your semantic keywords. This can also be done with the help of a comprehensive keyword tool. It finds out semantically related keywords. Next comes tip number seven, building quality links. Building quality links to your website is important if you are aiming to manage a successful and long-term SEO strategy. Building quality links cannot be ignored. In 2016, Google declared that building quality links are one of their top three ranking signals. Always opt for quality over quantity as building quality links to your content can give your product and category pages a boost in SERPs. Let me share a few effective strategies that will increase the number of links pointing to your website dramatically. The first one, earn backlinks from relevant and authoritative web pages. Next, promote your content regularly on social media. Opt for guest blogging and influencer marketing. Next, take advantage of social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and start your own page. Then participate in forums. To engage with your target audience, start your blog and attract your target audience with your valuable content. Finally, get listed in the high-quality link directories. This will help you build links from authoritative websites. Next, number eight is local search listings. Local SEO is the practice of optimizing a website in order to obtain traffic from location-based searching. 
It is the best way to market your products and services to local customers. According to Google, local results are based on relevance, distance, and prominence. These factors help Google to find the best match for your search. For this reason, it becomes important to have your NAP details accurate and consistent across the Internet. SEMrush confirms that local search listings will play a larger role in the SEO strategies. Suppose you want to know how to get your business in the local pack. Go to Google My Business page and create your own. For this, it is also important to have a strong backlink profile. Next, we have number nine. That is, improve the user experience. For the past few years, UX has become an important ranking factor for Google. However, more and more SEO specialists have gained an interest in UX. UX optimization is nothing more than focusing on the visitor. Consider the partnership of search engine optimization and user experience. This way, the search engine optimization focuses on search engines and user experience targets website visitors. So both share a common goal of giving users the best result. This is what the Content King app says about the user experience. Let me show you a few practices on how to effectively leverage UX designs to provide your site's SEO performance. Simplify your site's navigation. A good site architecture helps to gain traffic and utilize UX design to SEO-friendly layouts, which means make content easy to digest. Infused images and videos whenever possible. Use CTAS very wisely. And finally, optimize for site load speed. Optimize for mobile responsive design as more than 50% of all the traffic is now driven by mobile search in case your site isn't mobile responsive, you will notice poor engagement. And finally, we come to our tenth and last tip. That is using schema markup. According to search metrics, 36% of search keywords bring up at least one feature snippet that is derived from schema markup. Schema markup is microdata that every individual can add to his website in order to give an enhanced description to users on a search engine results page. In simple words, schema markup is used to define website content. Adding structured data will give your website a significant SEO boost and increase your rankings. Some of the schema markup examples are ratings and reviews, image thumbnails, product availability, and finally site links. Adding schema markup to your HTML is one of the ranking factors. Hello everyone, welcome to this new video by Simply Learn. Search engine optimization has been playing an essential role in the success of various businesses. For those who are still looking for growth in the industry and have search engine optimization, otherwise known as SEO, as their primary weapon, then yes, you are in the right place. This video on how to rank number one on Google will give you the best tips to get a higher ranking without spending a penny. But before we begin, subscribe to our channel Simply Learn and hit the bell icon to never miss any updates from Simply Learn. So before we begin, I have a question for you. The process of getting the quality and quantity of traffic to your website organically is known as search engine marketing, search engine optimization, search engine advertising, or none of the above? Let me know your answers in the comments section below. In this video, first, we will understand why it's essential to rank high in search engines. Next, we will have a look at the top five mantras on how to get ranked number one on Google search result pages. And while understanding this, we will put a light on why these success tips are important for getting a good ranking and how we can actually implement it. We will share some necessary tools to help you carry out the needed process. And stick to the end of this video to find out the one thing that can impact your business tenfold. So definitely, we're going to take a look at the best tips for ranking high on Google. But before that, it is necessary to understand why it's important to rank high on Google. Well, we are all aware that most of the businesses are shifting online nowadays. 
Ranking on search engines has become one of the most important aspects that define the success of a business. The data states that around 1.17 billion people across the globe use Google search, which is estimated to increase exponentially in the coming years. Moreover, Google has gained the trust of their users with their services over the years. This definitely makes the point of interest to understand why it's important to rank high on Google search. Ranking at the top of search engine result pages, also known as SERPs, allows a business to generate more traffic to their website and possibly get more leads, by which then they can get a chance to convert leads into customers, thereby boosting sales. It also helps in generating authenticity for your business. Well, not one or two. There are numerous reasons which makes SEO important. To know more about SEO, check the complete playlist on SEO. You can find the link to the playlist in the description box below. To gain expertise in search engine optimization, get certified as a skilled SEO professional with Simply Learn's Search Engine Optimization Training Course. You can check the course details from the link in the description box below. As we know how important it is to rank high on Google, so in the next 10 minutes, let's get to know the top five success mantras that will help you rank high in Google. So the fifth tip on our list is promote your content. Whether you are a business owner or a blogger, you definitely need to promote your content to get a good audience reach. By content here, we mean data on your website that can be products, services, or even a simple blog. To do this, find the relevant groups on the social media platforms like Facebook or Instagram and post your content with an excellent call to action context. Some blogging or article submission sites like Quora, Tumblr, and Hubpages may also prove helpful. Online forums and communities can be a good option to spread a word about your content with people having similar interests. Let's focus on our number four tip, internal linking. A good site architecture is always a happy bite for web crawlers. A website with good site architecture and internal linking helps web crawlers understand the website structure and helps them to crawl the site more effectively. The more the pages of your website are crawled, greater are the chances of getting indexed. If pages are successfully indexed, they get eligible for appearing in the search results. Let's move to our tip number three. Yes, it is backlink building. Any website linking to your website is a backlink for your website. Websites with more backlinks suggest to the search engine crawlers that that website has good content and is trustworthy and should be ranked higher on the search result pages. To get a backlink, the most important thing is to understand that the DA or the domain authority of the website for which you are looking for the backlink is greater than yours. Getting backlinks is somewhat entirely a gesture of goodwill. You can find a page relevant to your business and ask the website owner to add the link to your website to the page in a humble manner. You can create a better or updated version of some other web content, let the site owner know about it, and then ask for a backlink in a humble way. Yes, you can find some more relevant backlink building techniques in the video, How to Build Backlinks. Check out the link in the description box below. At number two, we have a tip which is of utmost importance to win a good position in the search results, on-page optimization. On-page optimization, or also known as on-page SEO, is a process in which we take essential measures to improve the website or web page's position in search engine rankings. On-page optimization is a vast concept that includes technical optimization of websites like server speed, page loading speed, removing page errors, submitting pages for indexing, and more. Maintaining a good website structure and improving it, adding internal and external links on the site, adding SEO-optimized images and video on the page, efficient use of keywords on the page and links, and much more. Get the detailed guide to learning on-page optimization by Simply Learn. Check the link in the description box below. And finally, the best tip we have is the most effective one, and the one that rules them all, which is keyword research. Keyword research is a process of identifying and implementing the relevant keywords for the content you tend to create. Proper keyword research may prove a boon to your business, but it also has the power to ruin your business. So be wise when selecting your keywords. Try choosing long tail keywords if you are new to the business, as these are easier to rank for. You can look at Google's auto-suggest feature to understand what people are looking for in your industry. 
be updated with what your competitors are doing. If something is working for your competitor, there are high chances that it may work for you as well. You can also take the help of various keyword research tools like Google's own Keyword Planner, Answer the Public Tool, Google Trends, and etc. These fantastic and 100% practical tips can drive your business to heights. Make sure you implement all these tips with more detailed attention, as SEO can make and break you. So, what, according to you, is the most effective way to grow your business online? Let us know in the comments below. Hello and welcome to the Simply Learn YouTube channel. In today's video, we are going to talk about Google Business Profile. You may remember Google Business Profile as Google My Business, but Google has changed the name. And I'll explain to you later the reasoning behind this change. We're going to be talking about what is Google Business Profile, what do you need to know about it, how do you use Google Business Profile as a small business, Yep, and we're going to discuss many other topics in relation to this as well. But before we start, let me introduce myself. I am Mark Kempman. I am your digital navigator for this video. If you like the video, click the like button. And if you want to subscribe to our, um, our channel, click the subscribe button below and you will get lots and lots of access to more videos and get notifications about when we publish new videos. So, Let's dig straight into it. Let me give you some facts about Google, which will tell you, which will show you that you cannot afford to miss out on what Google has to offer you. Did you know that Google was visited 89.3 billion times in the past month only? Yeah, Google holds over 90% market share in the search engine market. Google processes 99% thousand searches every second, which makes that a total of 8.5 billion searches every day. Yeah, also remember, 63% of those searches are done on a mobile phone. Now, Google Maps is a key part of your Google business profile. Did you know that there are over 5 billion downloads of the Google Maps app? And as a Fin to finalize these numbers, yeah, Google generated $146.92 billion in advertising revenue in 2020. So, do I need to convince you any further that Google has to be center stage of your marketing efforts? Let's talk how you can do this when you are a local small business. So, what are we going to be talking about? We will talk about what is Google Business Profile? How can you use Google Business Profile for your local marketing? Yeah, how do you get started with Google Business Profile? How can you use your Google Business Profile for your search engine optimization to get a higher ranking in your Google search engine results? And I'll finish off with a few pros and cons of the um, Google Business Profile. So are you ready? Let's first talk about what is Google Business Profile. It used to be called Google My Business. Google has renamed Google My Business to Google Business Profile to make it more simple, yeah, to bring more of the business profile management functions out of the Google My Business app directly into Google Search and the Google Map. Yep, so now the history of the name, it's currently called Google Business Profile. You may remember Google My Business, before that, it was Google Places. Before that, it was Google Plus Local. Remember those good old days? And when it officially started, it was just Google Local. But to keep things simple, it has now been renamed as Google Business Profile that you can access through the Google Search or through Google Maps. So how would you define it? Google Business Profile is a tool that enables you to manage and optimize your business profile on Google. Yeah, so you can create a free business profile on Google for your shop or your service area. So you can turn people who find you on Google Search and on Google Maps into new customers. And once you've created your Google business profile, you can then personalize it with photos, with offers, with posts, and many other things. And later in this presentation, I will show you how to do all this. 
So your business profile is Google's term for your Google business listing. Yeah, they appear in Google Maps and in the local results of Google Search. And that's very important. You can access it through Google Maps and Google Search in the local search results. And you can also see it on the right side of the search engine results page. So let me show you an example. If I open up a new frame and I search for Indian restaurant. Yep, then here you see the search results. Yep, you see restaurants and here you see a map where you can find those places. Yeah, so that is in the first place where your restaurant will show up. Yes, yeah, so if I go and click on one of the restaurants, I can get more details of different restaurants, but also more details about the restaurant that I picked. Yeah, and this is what you specify in Google My Business Profile. So I could also access them through the map. Yeah, so if I click on that, that opens up the same window with more details about the restaurant as specified in Google Business Profile. Now what is all in there? I'll share that with you in a minute. So that is the power of Google Business Profile. So how can you use this for your local marketing? Why is it good to use it to set up your business profile? Google has reported that 46% of all searches done on Google have a local intent. And that business location is the main piece of information sought by local searchers. Yeah, so it's the easiest way and the fastest way for you to show up in the search feed. So Google Business Profile gives you the ability to incorporate your search engine results into your marketing. And that is a huge advantage for local businesses. It's not just an ordinary business listing, but it's a robust tool that gives you benefits from appearing in the Google search results. So if I would summarize the benefits of Google Business Profile, they are as follows. They will give you customer engagement, they will help you highlighting your business in Google, you can gain insights from the people that visit your website, and you can optimize your online presence for local SEO. So let's dive into these a little bit deeper. Let's start with the customer engagement. So through Google Business Profile, customers and prospects can contact you. And in your business profile, you can specify your telephone number, your address and directions to your business. So people can contact you, they can find you and they can engage with you. Say for example, a potential lead comes across your business in the search results, but he wants something special. So how will he reach out to you directly from the search list? Google Business Profile has a messaging feature that lets you directly chat with potential customers who will find your profile on the search results page. It enables you to quickly answer questions in real time and help your current and potential customers. Google gives you the option to activate this. Yes, yeah, so when you activate it, users visiting your page will see a clickable message icon. On top of that, they can call you or you can add posts to your business profile to promote special offers or events and updates to keep your customers in the loop. You can also reply to public customer reviews to build trust with new returning customers. And of course, you can post answers to frequently asked questions by your customers. The second advantage is that Google Business Profile offers you the opportunity to highlight your business. Yeah, so it gives you a ton of opportunities to specify a lot of things about your business. When you sign up and sign in, you get to your dashboard and that's where you can add items like showcasing what makes your store special, show photos of your latest products and your store to stand out to customers who find your profile. 
Yeah, you show whether you offer options like a pickup or a delivery. You can give people who find you online a warm welcome with posts about discounts, new products, upcoming events. So lots of things that you can highlight about your business. Again, let me show you an example. If I go to Google and I search, for instance, for Disney Paris, yeah, you will see I find, or let's say Disneyland Paris. Yeah, so when I click here on Disneyland Paris, then here I get all the details. I can see the description, I can see the address, the rights that you can do, the hours of opening, you can see who is owned by, you see events that they have, there's questions and answers, there's reviews, yep, and there's more information, there's links to social media, so lots of stuff that you can find here as long as you specify that all on your dashboard when you highlight your business. So the third benefit is that you can gain a lot of insights with people or from people that visit your um, and that find you on Google. Yeah, so you can gain data about your target market and your local search performance. You can track your performance over a given time period and it will give you insights how people interact with your business on Google. You can check how often your profile has been viewed. You can use profile views insights to track how popular your business is with current and potential customers. Yeah, now obviously only the owner um, of the business profile can view the profile insights. You will get metrics like the queries people used to find your business, the number of unique visitors to your profile, number of unique customers who request directions to your business, the number of clicks on the call to action button on your business profile, number of clicks on the website link, number of unique conversations through messages, yeah, number of completed bookings by customers, a summary of all your interactions, number of views on products over a selected period, and if you are a restaurant, you can get food orders placed for pickup or delivery and you get a number of clicks on the menu content per user per day. So you gain a lot of knowledge about who, what and when people are accessing and finding you on, the, on Google. And finally, one of the biggest advantages that you can get with Google Business Profile is that it improves your local search rankings leading to a higher visibility of your business on the web. So when you search for a product or service on Google, the first three listings are usually Google Ads, yeah, followed by a map with the local three-pack, as we call this. And then you will see the organic search results. So let's show you an example of this local three-pack on Google. If I go to search, and I search for shoe shop near me. Yeah, I'm getting ads. Yeah, that's the first part. And then I'm getting three places. And here is your Google three pack, your local three pack with the map. And then I have the organic search results. Yes, yeah, so one of the biggest benefit, and then I get the search results. So for local businesses prior to this local pack, yeah, there were two main ways to show up on the first page of Google, through local pay-per-click and through local SEO. Now with the addition of this Google local pack, you now have three potential ways that you could show up on the first page of Google for relevant local searches. And that's something that cannot be ignored. Now, what is this local three pack? It consists of the top three local businesses based on the searcher's location. Yeah, the best part of it is that customers now end up at your shop's front without even having to visit your websites. 
So remember, this used to be a seven pack and it's now limited to only three local listings. Hence the title, the local three pack. Now, many, many businesses have been trying different SEO tricks to get into this special category of three listings. Yeah, but what most of them don't know is that by creating a Google business profile listing, you can significantly increase the chances of making it onto this list. Now, there's more that you can do to make it in this three pack. It's important to get reviews on your Google My Business profile. Yeah, so that helps you increase the chances of showing up in this local pack. And it's also good for your reputation which is very important for your business and Google will reward you for that with giving you higher search rankings. And additionally, all the SEO rules and guidelines that apply to standard search engine optimization, they apply to your local listing as well. So think about your keywords, your website SEO, getting backlinks, these will all contribute to your local search listing and whether or not you will appear in the three pack. Now also consider that paid advertising can help you in getting your business listed here. Yeah, through local search ads on Google, there is an opportunity for your business to serve a local pay-per-click ad in the three pack. Yep, and remember just a few tips in order to show up in the Google three pack with your pay-per-click ads. There's a few steps that you need to take. Yeah, enable local extensions or location extensions as we call them in Google ads. Bit the location and use, lo sorry, bit by location and use location targeting. And optimize your keywords to include your location as well. So having your business appear in the local three pack can help you tap into potential revenue opportunities as Google not only shows customers your business on Google Maps, but it also places it before organic search results. And let's look at the final topic before we go into a demo of Google Business Profile. Let's look at a bit more detail about how Google Business Profile can help you with your SEO and what you need to do to optimize it for SEO. There are three aspects in using Google Business Profile for SEO. You need to target your information by including your SEO keywords relevant to your business. You need to make sure you maintain information quality by ensuring all information is accurate, consistent and correct. And you need to build trust by engaging with your customers. So to achieve this, here is what you need to do. You need to verify your business. You need to fill out your profile completely. You need to make sure your profile information is and stays accurate. You must ensure that your NAP name, address, place is consistent across the web, which is very important. Yeah, your address is unique across all your places where you are on the web. You pick the most relevant categories for your business. Make sure that your pictures, your photos are of the highest quality. Focus on getting reviews. Create posts on your business profile to drive engagement with your customers. And when customers ask questions on your business profile, make sure you answer those questions. Yeah, here you see the importance when you fill in all the data of the various fields. You see the most important, yeah, there is name, address, phone number, website link. But don't forget the, all the other items as well. So for determining your local ranking, Google takes three factors into consideration. There's the relevance of your listing, is how well your business matches the user's search intent. And to increase the chances that your local business appears in the search results, you should feed Google with as much information as possible. Google will also look at the distance. 
Yeah, so the distance refers to how close your business location is to the location of the user who searches. And finally, prominence. Yeah, Google determines your local ranking by checking out how well known your business is and whether or not you have a good reputation. And to influence this reputation, you have off-site links and articles related to your business. They can really contribute to building your reputation online. So now that you've got all the details about Google Business Profile, let's have a look at how you set it up. And I'm going to show you how to sign into your Google Business account, how you can add your business, how you can enter your location, how you can fill in your contact information. I tell you about the process of verifying your business and then finally how you can customize your profile. So let's have a look at Google Business Profile. If I go to the Google Business Profile website, then I just go there by searching for Google Business Profile and click on the link that I see on the search results and then I get to this page. Yeah, a short summary of what your free business profile is all about, how you can access your dashboard if you've got a business profile. You see some benefits, free, easy, personalized, and then it gives you all the benefits that you get from having your business profile on Google. Yes, so that is one area where you can access, of course, your Google business profile. Now, the other area where you can access your Google business profile is to go to Google Maps. So if I go to Google Maps and I click here on Google Maps, this takes me to Google Maps. If I now want to go, for instance, to register my own business on Google Business Profile, let me show you how to do that. I can be on Google Maps, I can go to the place that I want to, um, to register, yeah, so, and I want that actually on Google Maps, so I don't want that here. I want to stay on Google Maps, so let's say Isis Lake South Cerny. There is where I have a lodge that I rent out. And if I go zoom in on that, yeah, and then here I can see it is this lodge. Yeah, and currently there's nothing on there. You see this house has no business profile. This one has. Yes, so this one has as well. So how can I register this lodge on Google Business Profile? Very simple, I can register it by right clicking on it. Yep, so I can get directions, what's here. I can say add your business. <clears throat> so if I click here on add your business, Guess where that takes me? It takes me to Google Business Profile and I'm now going into the setup under my Google account. Yeah, I'm going to the setup on Google My Business for this place. So the place name is Isis97 uh, Lodge. Okay, so I click enter and I'm gonna click continue. Now it talks to me, what is this place about? What kind of business type? Is it an online retail? Is it a local store or is it a service business? Let's say it is a local store. Customers can visit the business in person. Click on that and it takes me to the next screen. Yeah, so I'm going to go for an add, um, enter a business category. There's a whole load of uh, categories here. I can say just a lodge or I can say, um, what is it, a, um, a resort. Let's see if I can do that. A resort hotel yeah, or a resort place. I can just say a holiday sort of a home. Yeah, so let's call it a holiday home. And I'm gonna click next. Now it wants the business address. 
So the country in this case is not Malaysia, because that's where I am at the moment. So it takes my default address. It's in the United Kingdom. The street address is Isis Lake. And then it is, I need to put the address, 97 Isis Lake, Spine Road East. East. <clears throat> yeah, the post town is South Cerny, postcode GL75LT. So Spine Road East, which is the watermarks. Spine Road East. I don't mind to share this data with you because it's going to be public anyway, because people will be able to find this on the internet. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to click Next. <clears throat> what contact details do I want to show my customers? I want to show them the phone number and that could be 07545 and then 328999 is United Kingdom and I can also say I'm going to skip this step actually for now I'm going to skip this step. Put your business on the map. Yes, start connecting with your customers across Google all in one place. So here are the details that you've learned earlier in today's presentation. Get discovered, respond to review, manage your business details. Yep, and now I'm going to click, uh, do I want to get tips and alerts? I'm not interested in that. I just click continue. And here I am in my dashboard. Now, here comes the process of verification, which is an important element of Google Business Profile. Yeah, so we talked a bit about businesses using it for spam purposes. Yeah, so the verification is very important for Google. There are various ways that you can get verification. Google has made it fairly simple. You can verify through a, uh, through a phone number. You can also verify by getting a card sent to your physical business address. Your listing will not show on Google until you have verified your business. Okay, but for now I'm going to click next and I'm going to actually I'm going to click verify later because I don't want to do the verification yet. So now I can add business hours. I'm going to skip that. Yeah, remember we talked about messaging. I'm going to skip the messaging. And now I can add photos of my business. So let's grab a photo from the internet. Yep, so let's say Isis Lake South Cerny. And I'm going to go to images. So here is the park where you see images. So I am going to uh, take any random image. Let's say we'll take this image. Yep, I'm going to right click. I'm going to click Save Image As. And I'm going to do Isis Lodge 01. All right, so now I'm going to complete my profile. I'm going to add a photo. I'm going to select photo from the computer. I'm going to YouTube and then desktop. And here is the ISIS Lodge. Yep, there's the photo and I can obviously add a lot more photos. There's the next. Do I want to start advertising on Google Ads? I can actually claim a 400 pounds free advertising credit. Of course, that is really good what they do here just to get you to start using advertising. And then get a customer domain name for a website. I haven't got a website yet, but I'm not interested in that at the moment. Yeah, so remember your edits will be visible once you're verified. Right? So my listing will not be visible yet, but here is basically my listing list, business listing as it stands at the moment, but it is not publicly visible. But at least I have set up my business profile. Yeah, so now I'm in my dashboard. 
in Google um, My Business, I had to go into a separate app for this. But now I can actually edit it all through the search. So that is very useful. So here is edit profile, read reviews, read the messages, uh, add photos. What is the performance? Do we want to go advertising? All the things we discussed in our earlier session. So edit profile. And here I can get information about contact information, location information, hours of opening, my business name of my lodge, the opening date, contact information. Yes, so location I can specify here. So all the details that I need, and if I do this properly, is where it will show up in Google. And if I really got my reputation sorted and everything, I may show up in the Google 3 pack as well. So that is the process of setting up your Google business profile. So let's now look at an existing business profile. Let's switch my account. So I'm going to sign out of this account and I'm going to sign in again into my own account. So now I'm in my own Google account and I'm going to, I'm switching the Chrome. I say, no, just leave it as it is. Okay, well, we can do that. Yeah, so now I'm in my Google Chrome, my, my personal account, and I'm gonna show you an existing um, Google business profile that I have, which is for a website, for a, another house in Marrakesh, which is Riyadh Farasha. Yeah, so you see here, it is already on Google My Business, or sorry, it's already on Google Business Profile, but I haven't really populated it yet with information. Okay, so here you can see I can access this through the Google search to manage my profile. Yep, so I can edit the profile, I can read the reviews, all the things that I want to do. I can add an update, I can see the photos. Yep, so here I have access to it. And then here you see the side panel with a summary of all the things that you've done. Okay, I could also access this through Google Maps. Again, if I go to Google Maps, and I search in Google Maps for Riyadh Farasha, yeah, here, here it is, Riyadh Farasha, Der Prachala, it will take me, here's the basic details, in Google Maps, yeah, and it will take me here to Riyadh Farasha but it is empty, I haven't added any information in it yet. So I can now click here on manage my business profile or I can see where um, the, uh, all the details that I have added so far. I get some basic data, so 55 people viewed it this month Oops, and without actually having done any effort in optimizing it or populating it with information. So if I here click on manage your business profile, that takes me back to the Google search screen where I can add all the data. So let's add a photo. I can click here for add a photo or I can click here to add a photo. I'm clicking here, add a photo. I'm doing a photo, click here and then select photo or video. And that is from the YouTube desktop. It's here, Farasha01 is the photo that I'm going to add. <clears throat> yep, so now I can see the photo. Let's see if I can do, here you see the photo. Got it. Yeah, and of course I can add a lot more. I can do a logo, a cover, a video, photo of the interior. Here's the photo that I've done so far. So I can now go back to my business profile yeah, I think it will take a bit of time before the photo shows up on the, uh, on the profile. Yeah, so click add photo. Yeah, so the photos don't show up yet. Yeah, but that's how you can optimize 
your profile, making sure all the information is relevant. Yep, so that is basically all there is to managing your profile on, uh, on Google Business Profile. So remember, you can access it directly by searching for your business name in Google Search, or you can exit it, edit, um, access it directly by entering for searching for your business name on Google Maps. Both show the, uh, the results. And then they also give you access to your dashboard where you can add all the information that needs to be added. Yeah, performance, we talked about that as well. Yeah. So here you can check by month. You can see I've, uh, I've started the, um, the created the, pro, the, the business profile sort of the beginning of October. So here you can see, I can check from October to December, apply. So I see I had 18 business profile interactions. I can check people that called me, people that messaged me, the directions, people that look at website clicks, booking clicks. So you can get a lot of information of people that visited your business profile. <clears throat> okay, so that concludes the demo of the uh, Google Business Profile. And now let's go back to the slides to give you a summary of the Google Business Profile and the positives and the negatives of it. Okay, hope you found that useful. So let's finish today's presentation with a few more facts about the pros and the cons of your Google Business Profile. We talked about all the pros, all the benefits that you can get. Yeah, and to summarize, Google Business Profile can help you with reaching your customers. It can help you responding to customer interests. It can help you get, respond to customer feedbacks. Yep, and you can get into engagement with your customers. And most important of all, it can help you in a very easy way to get a presence on Google search results page without actually having a website. Yes, so it is an extremely powerful tool and it's a free tool for your business to get yourself an online presence where your customers can find you and where they can engage with you. But there are some cons as well. Yeah, I have to think hard about cons but as most things in digital marketing, one con you could say, yeah, it takes time. Yeah, of course you need to set up your business profile. Yeah, and it takes time to do that. It takes time to maintain this. But I don't see this a considerable serious drawback because people that are prepared to put the time and effort into it, they will be rewarded accordingly. One potential negative of Google Business Profile can be that fake businesses can use it as well because it's a free service. Yeah, and although you do, there is a verification process in the Google uh, Business Profile, yeah, there may be businesses who take advantage of this, um, of this free service. Yeah, so anyone can realistically set up a profile to promote their business. So there was an example a few years ago that fake locksmiths were committing fraud through local listings on Google Business Profile with bogus profiles. So while the majority of the profiles are genuine businesses trying to promote themselves in a very competitive world, there are some to see this as a feature and an opportunity for scams. Yeah, so people believe that reviews, photos, and verifying a business by mail would be enough to deter scammers. However, in this age of fake news, as well as misleading e-commerce reviews, Google must take action to constantly optimize their verification process of Google Business Profile. Welcome to today's session. I am Sachin Segel, and I'm here to talk about a very important tool, Google Ads. What is Google Ads? Google Ads is an online platform or an interface 
or a tool we can say or a software which is developed by Google to help the advertisers to run different kind of ads on different publishing sites or publishing platforms. If I make it more simple for you, suppose you are an advertiser and you sell a digital marketing course. So you know that the bulk of the traffic would come from Google because this is the most used search engine in the world. So when we type this, we see a lot of results here. And when we start a website, it is very difficult to rank organically or free or through the SEO on the very first few pages. With the help of Google Ads, in a very starting days, we can rank on the top like this, this, this or this advertiser. So these are the four top positions which right now is been given to the advertisers who are playing or who are running their ad using Google Ads. On a first page, we see seven of such ads, four on the top I've shown you and three on the bottom. So these are the maximum placements which we see on a Google search page. This is the first kind of ad which can be created under the Google Ads tool, which we would definitely going to learn today how to create such beautiful ad copy. Second ad, which generally we see on different sites, like if I'll open any new site, if I'll open any blog site, if I'll open a site like a speedtest.net, then you would see a beautiful banner or a responsive uh, ad like these, these and these, okay? How come I am able to say that these are ads? So if you just hover on this, this would say ads by Google, ads by Google. So a different advertiser, this is a Paramount, this is from GoDaddy and the publishing site which has been selected by these advertisers is speedtest.net. The third kind of ad, which we generally see on Google itself, but in a different colors and shape is called shopping ad. So if I just search, suppose I want black formal shoes, then the ad copy is changed. It is not like a text ad which we have seen earlier, though there is no text ad in this search, but we have just seen in the case of digital marketing course, but it is an ad. We can see from here. Okay. So this is called a shopping ad. Then if I go and if I'll open YouTube and if I'll search a term, maybe I'm in a search of email for beginners course. And if I just play any of the videos, a random one, and before the video plays are aap aap post kare do course kari do nahi 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 yaar nahi ka koi guarantee nahi de sakta aap wo din gaya so till we can skip after 5 to 6 seconds and sometimes we see a ad which streams but cannot be skipped so these are video ads which again created by this beautiful tool google ads one more ad mobile installation but i cannot show you as i am from the desktop though I would able to show you the screenshot of the same. Now coming to the part, why Google ad is so important. Okay, so I'll be just quick now because we have to be making the account today and also the campaign. Google ad is important in many ways because Google ad helps us to increase the visibility of our products, increase the visibility of our brand, because you can just imagine you were there on Google, but you were somewhere on sixth page or probably you know in the next pagination if i'll just go and uh, not beyond that there are the results but suppose you are you are on the sixth page so we can just assume that nobody goes beyond first or second i don't know if you go or not but i don't go okay and that's how the survey says 97 percent of people doesn't go beyond first to second page so that means we have to be on a first page 
if we really want to sell our products. So increasing that visibility of our brand would take time if we just keep waiting for SEO results to come or to give us the first page or a second page ranking. So for that reason, for our quick results, by making a relevant ad copy and by targeting the right keywords, we can increase our visibility, we can increase the brand awareness, we can increase the traffic. Okay. We can also use a beautiful way of retargeting or a remarketing where people are able to recall our brand or able to make their decisions if at a first time they were not actually taken. Suppose I say they went to my site or any of the sites, but in a very first time they have not given me a result. So for me as this website, the result is getting the lead form filled. This is a lead form and this is the page where we have reached and where, wherever you know you would see a relevant page connected to the particular ad, that page is called a landing page. Okay, so this landing page has a content. This landing page has an objective to get the form filled and this landing page has a CTA which is called a call to action. Okay, so for me as an advertiser or as a digital marketer or as a campaign manager of this brand DigiPerform, it's very important to get as many as people to this page. Plus, it is the most important part that I get a lot of form filled and a lot of CTA clicks or this call to action clicks. But every time I cannot assume I have to be realistic as well. If even hundred or thousand users have landed to my website from the ad, I cannot expect more than three to five percent conversions. Okay, so if I say suppose hundred users have reached my page today since morning so i can only expect three to five percent of leads or three to five users would have filled the data but when we talk about a remarketing then it is about retargeting those guys who have reached here but did not fill up the data or did not convert it or in the same case if i have taken them to the black formal shoe site they reached to the uh, landing page or a product page but did not bought the product so for that reason, we can always retarget them using the website data. So all these things are very important. Once we start learning Google Ads deeply, then you would know how these works like, you know, how the uh, functionality of, of these works like. Okay. So they are talking about the same thing. RLSA is retargeting list of search ads. We are able to target people who uh, have not converted. Okay. Who have not converted. Okay. Then it is also used for, uh, I think I have talked about branding. Now they're talking about how the strategies work like. So we generally work on the different bid uh, strategies, like how you pay to Google. So the most important one when it comes to Google search ad, this is called search ad or text ad is CPC. So CPC is cost per click. Okay, now I'm talking about a very important technical term, the very first technical term. Probably we have just talked uh, about the broadness of, of the Google Ads, how that is you know important to increase the branding, visibility, and traffic. We did talk about the remarketing a bit, but now I'm getting into the uh, campaign terms, which is going to be very important if you want to learn today how to create a search campaign or search ad. So the very first thing is bidding strategy. So we pay CPC or it is also called PPC when we are running this sort of an ad, which is called text ad. This means cost per click or pay per click. So when somebody clicks on this, clicks on this, clicks on this as a user, as a searcher, as a viewer, then only an advertiser would pay to Google. This is what PPC means, pay per click marketing. So advertiser is getting an advantage that till the time the ad has only been shown, he is not paying any penny to Google. But the moment a very first user comes and clicks on it, then the amount of certain bid value starts deducting from the advertiser's Google Ads account, which we certainly going to be creating 
for you guys as well in a while okay so you create a google ads account you put some money into it you start running the ad of different sort text ad banner ad video ad shopping ad and the moment somebody clicks or somebody watches a video or somebody takes any action on your ads then only you pay most of the times okay that is what the cpc strategy works like then also it is a very important part that we should know how we are measuring the results so in anywhere in the digital marketing if you talk from my experience i know we are only able to get better results or we are only able to get more conversions if we are just not running the ad we have to be first researching how the ads should be created we have to be working on the areas which should not be filled uh, which should not be left unfilled and it should be focused on the audience it should be focused on certain uh, parameters and after running the ad also it is very important to keep measuring the performance and optimizing optimizing and optimizing further or otherwise taking care in the next campaign okay so i think superficially we have talked about a lot of things uh, on a go why not just to get into the google ads now see how the account is created for free and then let's make a campaign first and we'll come back and we understand we'll try to understand some of the important things like you know there are metrics which we have to be seeing there are formats okay so formats i've already talked about okay so this is the text that i've already shown then there is a banner ad which i've shown you on the uh, you know speed test of net there is another kind of an ad image ad again you know you see on a different platforms like websites and apps then there is a app ad which i could not show you practically because i am logged in from my desktop so this was the fifth kind of an ad which i was talking about a mobile installation ad so this probably you see only on most of the time on a mobile because as an advertiser he would want that installation button as a cta should be directly placed under the ad so that if person searches for something on a mobile then the ad is directly showing them the installation button and the app can be downloaded into their mobile gadgets okay so now then there is a video ad which we already seen and a shopping ad i have already shown you okay then there is a another ad which is just a call only though it is again you know created by the google ads only we will see now coming to create the google ads okay so first of all creating the campaign we need to be having a google ads account that's a very first requirement so i'll just help you now how you create a google ads account for free by using your gmail id okay so we go to google let me just search for the here itself and we type google ads just ensure that you are logged in with any of your gmail id and then we see google ads on a the top then we just need to click this and once you reach to this page you have to click get started after get started probably in my case you would see a different screen because i have lot of accounts created lot of clients accounts are there but in your case it will show new google ads account like this so i will repeat my steps so that you are not confused so you go on google you type google ads you click google ads the very first result Uh, or either if it is not showing in your country in your location then you have to just find ads.google.com and you click get started okay the moment you click get started you would directly reach to this page okay that's why i just repeated my steps because i have been taken to some other page where my already created accounts were showing but in your case after just clicking get started it will directly going to take you to this page now here you have to ensure that you are not clicking anything why because this has brought us to the express mode express mode is more of the kind like automated or a smart mode which is created by google for uh, making the quick ads you know it is not going to be showing you all the exhaustive settings or 
uh, you know uh, advanced settings inside so for that reason what we do we go down we just you know i've just i've just scrolled down okay and then switch to expert mode okay i'll again repeat when we click this get started we reach to this page where it takes us to the smart or express mode where we don't have to be doing anything we scroll down and we click on a switch to expert mode once we click that then you would see few things which you have just seen in the ppt probably that what is your objective why you have come here we have come here to increase your sales leads website traffic and xyz things but because right now i'm just teaching you or just letting you know how the account is created then we can ignore these tabs for a moment of course in a while we'll talk about these as well so we'll just scroll down and we'll create an account without a campaign as i said we are going in a sequence so we are not creating the campaign first i am considering most of the users would not have the google ad account as of now so i am going that way so you create the account first without a campaign so when you click this then you see there are few basic questions been asked like from which country you are billing would be which time zone you want to follow or which currency you would be paying in okay once this is done just click submit okay just click submit once this is done congrats you're all done okay then you just need to click on explore your account and this takes you to the dashboard of this beautiful tool google ads from where we can start our journey of making the very first campaign okay so now let's again come back to the ppt because our account is created now before making the campaign what all things should be cleared let's discuss okay so you can create all these kind of campaigns or with all these goals inside the google ads which we have just learned how to be uh, creating the account okay how the account is created we can create the campaign to increase the sales we can uh, we can increase the leads by running the ads we can increase our website traffic we can work for the product branding or a consideration we can also work for brand awareness and app promotion okay these are the subdefined goals or predefined goals before we jump into the campaign making of a search or a display or a video okay i i hope this all these all are very much defined or self defined ones so i don't have to be you know telling you what is sales and what is branding and what is awareness but still if you feel so in a in a while i will just going to throw some light on it okay then setting up the ad group so i'll be just making all this practically with you so we don't again you know have to be understanding all this now coming to some of the metrics which you would see inside the campaign once that is created so let's just go back and see one of the ads from any of my clients so that we can learn better we are just open in a different tab okay so if i just have to show you probably i can just use right now the demo account of a simply learn where important metrics we can discuss which which has already been given in the ppt but of course i would just show you how they look like inside the campaigns or inside the google ads account so if we move to the dashboard when we have created and if we have already been running any campaigns and we want to see results or any of the metrics then what we do we go into all campaigns and from here we can see all sort of campaigns created in the past okay because i want to see only the results from the search campaigns because there are all kind of campaigns being created here like video campaigns and display and all so what i can do i can click this this law uh, a uh, navigation menu on the top left and then i can just select the search campaigns when this is selected 
only these search campaigns would be visible. Now, if I just go on any of the campaigns, suppose inside, then this breadcrumbs changes. Earlier, I was only in the all campaigns. Then I just selected search campaigns. And now inside the search campaigns, I have selected a specific campaign. Okay. So considering, suppose this was the campaign I have run in the January for any of my digital marketing sales. Okay. Or any of my product sales or any of my services lead generation XYZ objectives could have been. Okay. Now coming to the main part from the metrics point of view. So we see here that there are results being shown. Of course, because this is a demo account, so you don't see numbers. We can always change the dates. Like suppose I want to see the uh, result of last 30 days. So I would just go here and this would show these many impressions have come. Impressions like how many times the ad is just been seen. Okay. Impression means just how many times the ad been seen. Okay. Then it would show how many times the ad actually been clicked. Okay. How many times the ad been clicked? Assuming 100 times the impressions have come and two clicks have come. So the percentage, which is basically a ratio of a clicks to impression is called CTR, the click through rate, which is the next one. Clicks, impression and CTR. Okay. So click through rate is the ratio of impression to clicks. Your ad been shown 100 of times or 100 times probably, but only click today for three times. So your CTR is 3%. Your ad been shown 100 times, but been clicked seven times. So your CTR is 7%, which is a very good number. Okay. Anything around five to 10 is good. Okay. We don't get to see a lot of uh, clicks in our initial days because people do trust the brands which are already established, but Slowly, gradually, with the right branding, with the right awareness, our click rate increases, our CTR increases. Okay. Then comes your average CPC, which certainly you would see here as well. So average CPC is a price which you actually end up in paying for every click. Okay. So there is a bid value. Bid value means when you started to create your account or with a campaign of a search, then you decide for certain keywords that how much money you would pay for every click. Okay. That is called a bid price, which we certainly see here. Okay. And once you start getting the clicks after running your campaign, then the exact pricing being shown as a average CPC price. Okay. Then comes the cost. Cost is basically going to be your multiplication of number of clicks you've got with the average CPC you have paid. Suppose you have got 100 clicks today and for every click you paid 5 rupees. So 100 into 5 is going to be 500 or if you uh, understand by the dollars. So suppose for every click you have paid 1 USD. So for 100 clicks you will pay 100 USD by the end of a day. Okay, that is going to be your day cost or a average cost you have paid for particular ad on a particular day that is also understood by saying daily budget you have spent okay so if i have allotted that i would pay 900 rupees a day and 900 rupees a day in the average of the cpc if i would have probably 10 rupees so i will get 90 clicks okay because 90 clicks into 10 rupees for a click going to exhaust my 900 per day budget. If this would have been hundred dollars, then hundred clicks multiplied by one dollar will going to exhaust my hundred dollars per day. Okay. This is how Google calculates like for how much uh, budget you want to run the ad for and on various factors, your average cost per click is decided. Okay. This is the uh, understanding of all these terms cost per conversion and conversion depends that how your next step actually been designed. So by next step, I mean, suppose if I talk about this particular ad only a person clicks and person reaches here. Okay. So we can define the conversions like suppose hundred people have reached here on the landing page. This means hundred clicks would have happened. Okay. So the dashboard would say, 
thousand impressions, hundred clicks, one rupee, hundred rupee. Okay, one rupee being the average CPC, hundred clicks we have received, and we have spent hundred rupees. But it doesn't mean that all those hundred clicks which actually took the users to the landing page would have been converted. Okay, so when the conversion code is being placed on the confirmation page, which opens after the conversion happens or after the goal completes, so that actually tells us how many people got converted or how many people actually uh, fulfilled or completed our objective of goal, whatever it was, lead generation, sales, uh, download brochure, any of the subscriptions, any of the CTOs we talk about. Okay, so. Uh, talking about the numbers, suppose only three people or two people or two users have filled this data. Okay, so the numbers in my dashboard would be like thousand impressions have been shown, hundred clicks have come, means hundred people have reached to the landing page, but only two conversions have happened. Okay, and the cost for all the clicks would be like hundred rupees because average CPC was one rupee. Okay, so when the conversion is Two, then we can say that our conversion rate was 2%. Why? Because out of 100 clicks, I was only able to get two people across the confirmation page or across that CTA, which was a call to action of buy now, shop now, or sign up or download, whatever it was. That is called a conversions and conversion rate, 2%. Cost per conversion can only or also be divided like two conversions I've got in 100 rupees. So my cost per conversion would be 50 rupees. Okay. My average CPC is one. My clicks been 100. My impressions been 1000. My CTA been 10%. How? 100 divided by 1000 CTA 10%. I have a CPC one. Cost becomes 100 rupees. My conversions been two, that's why my conversion rate is two percent, and my cost per conversion comes like fifty. Why? Because I've got two conversions on the spent of hundred, that brings fifty rupees here. I hope this is clear. If I have to just demonstrate, just wait, so that this is basically you know uh, being captured in your heads with more clarity. So I'm just going to. use a normal example impressions the same numbers which i've just explained so that you know okay so this is cost per conversion suppose your ad received thousand impressions today 100 clicks have come so your ctr becomes 10 percent because that is how this is calculated clicks by impressions your average CPC was one rupee or it has been in dollars. So your cost would be hundred rupees or hundred dollars. You've got two conversions means two people or two users have uh, bought anything or have subscribed or have just you know completed that call to action. And the conversion rate for that reason would be two divided by hundred. So two percent. And cost per conversion in this case would be 50 rupees because you have paid 100 rupees for two conversions and in this case it would be 50 dollars. Just a hypothetical number. Do not be very much worried about the numbers okay, with the high placed. Okay, this would change certainly when we do the research of our keywords. <clears throat> okay. Now coming to the part how now these ads been created that's the most important part how we create a beautiful ad copies and all that okay so we go into the campaign making buy all campaign and then we click on a campaign we click on a new campaign Google Ads most of the time works slow nowadays, so you have to be a bit patient with this. And then we click on a create campaign without a goal guidance or we can always click website traffic lead sales. Okay, these all four can be created uh, for the Google Ads search campaign. You know, we can only use these four for the search ad because if I just click this, this will not allow me to create search ad. This only allows video ad. If I click this, this only allows 
display and video ad. This only allows mobile ad and this is for the local. So if I have to create a search ad like this or a text ad like this, so I have to be either creating through sales, leads or website or either without a guidance. So I'll just going to be teaching you all the settings inside so that you know the Google ads, uh, you know, search ad settings in advanced level. So I'm just taking without a rule. Then you click search ads. Our focus is just to create search ad. You can leave this part right now because your conversions are not being created. We'll do in maybe in the next session when we'll talk about the advanced settings and website visit is my premier goal. And suppose I'm running the ad for any of these sites, probably I'm running the ad for Let me just see if I can get the simply learn landing page. So additional marketing search, marketing, just a minute guys, yeah, additional marketing, course. Click on continue. And then the very first thing you see bidding, which we have just learned that we pay on a cost per click basis. So clicks. And you can always set up your bid limit that I do not want to pay more than suppose one rupee a click or two rupee a click or five rupee a click. Okay. And there is another thing which we have to be discussing before we talk about the bid limit. So let me just take you to the Keyword Planner. So this comes from here, Tool Settings, Keyword Planner, so that we get an overview that how much actually we should be paying for every keyword we are running the ad for. Suppose my keyword for which I want to run the ad is Digital Marketing Code. That is the premier keyword or the most searched keyword by which the ads of our competitors also are showing and also I want to show my ad for. Okay. So what I would do, I would just go into this beautiful tool and again repeat my steps. I can just go tool and settings, keyword planner, open in a right tab. Why? So that your existing campaign settings are not disturbed. Okay. You come here, you click this and you click discover new keywords and you search your term like digital marketing course. Click get results. And then you are able to see digital marketing course. In the period of last one year in India, of course, you can change the country to US, Canada, Australia, anywhere. And you would see in the last one year, how many search queries on a monthly basis have come for this particular keyword. In addition, you see a lot of suggestions as well. Suppose we're just sticking around one keyword right now to understand the bid part and all. So we see that we got around 1 million searches in India for this particular keyword with the competition of medium. Competition medium means that most of the advertisers who are selling this digital marketing course been running the ad for the this, this this term or not. If this competition would have been high, then I should have ignored this or would have changed the keyword. But this is medium, so I would take this. And this uh, you know talks about the bid value. This is the low term and this is the high term. Like low price means this is the lowest price any of the advertisers would have paid this year for this particular term to show the ad and this is the highest bid price which any of the advertisers would have paid in this year for this term. So they doesn't tell which part of year it was, which advertiser it was, but at least we get a fair idea that our bid value would be around 46 to 195. So we go bit smart, we go on the average price, suppose a bit uh, 46, so I'll just go 30-40% over this price. So suppose I take 30% around 12 rupees or 13 rupees. So that makes it 15 and around 60 rupees. So this is the bid value I'm aiming 60 rupees. Plus what I do, I take some of the keywords, which I feel like from my naked eye at this moment are very important for my campaign. Just like I take this, I take this, I take this. You know, you can just take any of them. You can download this data into Excel and copy paste as well. So there are a lot of ways to do this. Okay. And then you can certainly just name the new ad group and they would be added to it. Or otherwise it is very easy that we just copy them from here. 
okay there are ways to do it so this is the simplest of the way suppose i just liked all these keywords from my product point of view and i like the pricing as well so what i would do i would just copy this copying this and then putting into maybe here so when there would be a space you know when the campaign would ask me please tell me for which keyword you want to run the ad certainly it would come here when we are done with these two settings then i don't have to waste time i will just go here and copy these keywords and paste in here under the keywords okay i can take more but before uh, you know uh, the time exhausts because i have a uh, you know in my head that i have to complete all the campaign settings and everything within one hour so that you are not bored of this and i want that energy level to be on a high side so uh, you can do this research probably and you can also you know add a lot of keywords you know dependent on how much uh, you know you want to actually leverage from them and as well more keywords means you end up in paying your budget uh, you know in a very quick basis so it's important that we segregate them from the monthly searches high monthly searches keywords are always important because the demand is high and then we always check the competition should not be higher okay so i probably would not take these you know because these are high ones okay i can delete and i can always aim the low ones like medium 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 and medium so i can just take this yeah. okay so copy and probably replacing these because i got the better keywords now as compared to the other ones because they had the high competition keywords as well so i'm just now aiming the medium keywords with the higher searches and i have just decided that i would give the bid value or a highest bid cap of a 60 rupees because i have just seen the average that if i have to rank for this particular one or probably this one or probably this one you know which are on the higher side then i should be paying 40 50% extra as uh, you know uh, compared to the low priced okay so that is how the bid value is calculated roughly okay anyhow you would only pay to uh, you know outrank your competitor that's how the algorithm works like you will not going to pay high amount it is like uh, if three advertisers are bidding on a certain term then if the next one to you is paying 2 rupee or 2 dollars so just to outrank him you would end up in paying some amount over it, like 2.1 or 2.2 it is not like that you would be paying 40 rupees so that's how the algorithm calculates okay you you put anything as an account uh, as a bid value but it will only going to take a uh, average cpc dependent on how the competitors are working and how their pricing is been given okay so just on a safer side we give a average price but moreover to save the cost of the cpc we work on the quality score or on the quality of our content and on the ad which certainly is a very important part okay so coming back to the campaign making we come here and we give a bid value suppose of 50 because this is what we have seen or other 60 from that particular uh, you know keyword sheet from here 30 40% over this particular uh, keyword which is the most important one for me and then i click next once this is done then i just select my google search network i don't have to select the display network because this will going to put my text ad on the different websites and apps display network are good when we are running the banner ad because we are just running the search ad so we'll just going to keep it around the google search result and google sites like google news google maps google shop google uh, youtube so all the text ad wherever the placements can be given so it will going to take directly we don't put on our search partners too because that is again going to lose the visibility search partners are like ask.com aol new york times.com okay so again you know it is my strategy that i don't want to increase the visibility outside google i'm very happy in showing my most of the impressions around google only okay or either on a google widgets like these wherever the text ad has a possibility just like you might be wondering how come i said youtube so if i just go here and if i just type again this so probably you would see text ads on the top okay nowadays there are a lot of text ads been running so this is a text ad okay this is not a video ad this is not a banner ad this is the banner ad this is the text ad okay so this is coming from here only google sites okay then comes your location you can run the ad on different locations by you know sitting anywhere suppose i want to run ad for the worldwide then i'll select all countries and territories if i want to select particular country like india or i want to select multiple countries like suppose united states or i want to select uh canada or i want to select india too so i can do this way 
okay then if i want to exclude any of these states probably suppose i want to exclude texas from here so i'll click texas and i'll click exclude i want to exclude probably uh, mumbai so mumbai as a city can be excluded and probably i want to exclude ontario from canada because of xyz reasons just to explain the settings i'm doing this so this is also done okay then we also can use advanced search where a beautiful setting of radius can be worked and the second advantage of advanced search tab is that you are able to see the map so whatever you have selected like we have selected canada and us and whatever you have deselected or excluded will come in red blue part included red part excluded the same way you would see in india as well blue part included and this small dot mumbai excluded okay plus we can do the radius targeting here suppose i sell something within the radius of 1 or 2 kilometers or or 1 or 2 miles so i have to just select that part suppose if i just deselect india right now and deselect the mumbai exclusion as well and consider that i have a restaurant or a cake shop in delhi and probably i will also add this keyword into my keywords so that that matches the term if anybody searches this i have to be seeing the character limits that's why you have to be always checking and changing things accordingly okay then digital marketing google then simply learn till marketing digital marketing on a course probably if we can get that space okay then going down and we can always see where we are lacking right now so we have uh, not very good headlines been added including popular keywords been there description works well so let's see what they give us the idea like so they say we are not given any online availability brand call to actions okay i'll just going to play with some of the terms now so let's just see CTA using the CTA now. You can see the strength has improved. Learn. I don't know. It is actually pausing my recording again and again, and that could be a disturbance for you guys. So I'm just taking some time so that this comes back to normal. Yes. Okay. so this is how you can add up to headlines 10 headlines and that would improve your ad strength and last not least you can add the descriptions which are very relevant to the ad copy okay try to get some headlines or descriptions here from the landing page okay once this is done you can just click done here and your ad copy is prepared you can see here very much and click next and then you can set up your budget so the budget which we were talking earlier in the excel if i have to show you so you got 100 clicks 
you have paid one rupee for every click so you have given 100 rupees per day so this is your daily budget which you have spent okay so you can always decide your daily budget by setting or customizing it you can put anything though it is showing dollars but this is INR you can see here this is kind of a bug which we are seeing since almost a month now so your average daily cost which they say like a weekly cost rather after 41 multiplying by 33 for every CPC price would come to 1382 but we are giving a daily price so we can always divide this by 7 or you know by 10 probably so I am just giving a rough number 100 okay or 1000 could have been given or 500 also could have been given okay so every day I would spend 500 and accordingly my clicks you know would come and then you click next And your ad goes to review like they would going to be checking your landing page they would be checking your uh, uh, you know uh, what else the ad copy everything can be checked and would take some time I think I just need to change that let me just keep it five a.m. This is simpler. And then just click next and publish the campaign from here. Publish. So once this is done, then your ad, which can be checked from here, would go into a review part and it would say under review. Once this is approved, then your ad starts showing and you start seeing the results like impression clicks and CTR, CPC, whatever we have talked about. Okay, so this is all about the ad making. Now we can see some of the important things there, like metrics we have discussed. All these we have discussed CPC, conversions, cost per conversions. CTR the only thing which you have not is the quality score so quality score is you know completely um, the part at the back end which works like to improve our ranking so quality score is something which has been given out of 10 and when we see an ad which has already been created like suppose for this campaign if I'll take you so if I just go to the keywords so every keyword been given quality score out of 10 okay so if any of the keyword has got 10 out of 10 it means there are three important elements like their CTR like how many clicks have come their landing page and their ad copy is relevant or not okay they see three elements how relevant the landing page is how relevant is the ad copy is and certainly they see how relevant being the ad copy with the search then only your CTR increases. Somebody searches something and the ad shows and if the clicks are high, then only CTR goes high. So that's why the CTR, the landing page and the ad relevance has to be above average. That's how, you know, they define, they don't give marks here. They give total marks out of 10 here, the quality score. So above average is going to be the highest, average is going to be the middle one and the below average is going to be the lowest one. Okay, so if you have any issues uh, in any of these elements, then your overall quality score impacts okay this is all the quality score so high quality score means you end up in paying less and you get a better value for your money okay that's i think the last part of it so google ad ratings of quality of your ads keyword and landing pages i think this is what I've been given here as well then you check i have already shown you you check the keyword you check the timing which which were the best timing you have shown the ad which were the best locations your ad has actually got the result from and then accordingly your ad can be optimized and can be changed you change your budget you change your bid price you change your location you change your timing you change your headline it all depends after your ad actually been shown and then you research or you do the analysis like you know we are seeing which keyword is working better which keyword is having the best of the cost which keyword is giving you the good impression to interaction rate like a CTR then we check the ad copy you know how the ad is working suppose if I have multiple ads to just compare if this ad works better or this ad works better or this ad works better so I would just going to 
be comparing these three ads which one has given me the better of the clicks as compared to the other one which has given me the better CTR or whose CPC was lesser whose CPC was higher that is how I will be checking it okay I can always have number of ads created under the campaign just like Abhi right now we have created one campaign one ad we can always test with the another ad copy by clicking this so that we can see which ads performs better okay that's why in this existing account you can see multiple ads so because we were testing which one works better so this is how you can also make one other ad copy and you can just click done and that would be added to the list of ads okay you can see now one more ad actually been added so out of these two which one works better would be only uh, diagnosed or checked if the ad starts running okay you can always add your account the you know money the the, the billing part into the student settings building summary and from here you just need to add your mode of payment okay you have to select your country you have to select the currency you know you are paying in and then of course you would have options to pay like debit money transfer net banking and india ptm wallet is also available very much available okay hey guys welcome to today's session my name is Sachin Segal and I'm here to talk about a very important tool, Google Ads. And out of all the ads we can create under Google Ads, today we would be talking about a very important one, Google Search Ad. So this is going to be very exciting. This is going to be very deep from my experience, I can say. I will going to take you through a lot of technical aspects and a lot of uh, optimization strategies where you can really bring down the cost down if you're really paying high for your clicks and conversion so please be with me and i would try to give you the best from my side great so let's just start guys google ads is something which we have discussed in the last class if you have seen my last session if you have not we will leave the link in the description where we talked about the basics of google ads and we also talked about how to create this beautiful ad account or a tool with a free gmail id okay we did talked about few more things that how many types of ads you can create just to give you the quick glimpse we are on google and when we type something like if i want to do a data analytics course so I would type few things like a word or a keyword or a query into Google search engine. And then Google as a search engine would show me few results. The results which we see on the top, we are talking about these today. You know, This is the topic or this is the kind of an ad which we would create today in this session. This is called text ad or this is also called Google search ad. Okay, so this is the first type of an ad you see or which you can create under the Google ads. There are a few more just like if you would go and search for any of the e-commerce product probably by winter jacket online. So then there would be results but in a different shape and color and different structure. There is an ad which is a text ad but on the top we are able to see some more ads but they are not just text they have a pricing they have a title they have a brand name they have an image of the product so they are called shopping ads or product listing ads in addition to that sometimes you know when you go to a product uh, a website like speed test and you see the product ads there but again in the different shape and color so they are called display ads because they've been displayed on different websites and different apps so why i'm going so fast in explaining you different type of ads because as i told you we have another video created uh, with the name of uh, google ads uh, for beginners 2023 you can just check the link in the description and you will be able to get all this type of ads and whatever the uh, you know bidding strategies to be used in basic in that particular tutorial or that demo just as to show you if you can see that ads by google so this is the display ad or a banner ad. So just quickly i have shown you three types of the ads but our focus as i said today going to be on a very specific ad which is the most important ad from the google ads family okay so let's just begin guys 
when I come to Google Ads, this is how the Google Ads structure looks like. We have a Google Ads account created. Again, I repeat, if you don't know how to create it, please find the link in the description to create the Google Ads account. Once a Google Ads account created, then you would have a dashboard like this. Okay. In this dashboard, you can see there are campaigns, there are ad groups, there are ads, there are videos, there are landing pages. So a lot of things can be confusing if you are just coming to this account or to this beautiful tool for the very first time. So to just keep it very simple or to explain in, uh, in a very simpler way, what I did is I just drawn this structure for you. Okay. So this structure says that you have a Google Ads account. Imagine that I am a simply learn Google Ads manager. So I am running the ads for all simply learn keywords like data analytics course, digital marketing course, or any machine learning course, Python course. So whenever somebody types this, so there is a ad which shows like from simply learn probably we have to just assume because currently I'm not able to see any simply learn ad here. So data analytics course, India. And then probably we can see if there are any, you can always change the keywords, but just to test time, uh, randomly changing the words, or I could have just written simply learn specifically because I want to go with simply learn only. I have researched a lot and I feel like this is one of the best. Okay. So probably there is no ad though. Still I would check. Probably I have to just change the codes. So I will go for the another course, which is by simply learn again, and then probably we can expect any of the ads running because this is not a very peak time. So we are probably, you know, saving some of the cost, not running the ads at this odd hour. Anyhow, so we can assume that this is the ad, you know, I am running for. So how we can create this ad, how we can get the best of clicks. As I said, it is not a very best time to run the ad. So this is also kind of a change, you know, we can bring into our ads by doing some research. So how all these things are done, we're going to be learning it. Okay. So when we come here to the dashboard, and then we see our dashboard looks like this a bit complicated so we can be confused we can be disheartened that i have created the account by seeing uh, the first video but now i am all stuck okay so probably i have to again wait so the wait is over now we are here to understand the whole structure okay so let me just take a very simple example suppose i uh, i'm someone who's selling a shoes okay because i have just said simply learn probably let's just convert it to any of the google ads account of a shoe seller probably i am nike okay and i am making the ad for nike shoes and i am selling uh, two types of the nike shoes today probably formal or canvas or probably i'm selling the casual or any sports shoes and what i did i created the campaign named it search ad uh, any month, you know, whatever the month you have started with, suppose November. So November 2022, that is the name which I'm giving. Name can be changed. Name is something which has been put it up for my reference so that after creating a lot of campaigns, I'm not confused in which campaign I have to check the results. Okay. So I'm running the search chat for shoes for the month of February or November or December 22, 23, whatever. And then I open two ad groups into it. Why I'm opening two ad groups under one campaign? Because I'm selling two kind of products. Under the shoes only, I'm selling formal also. Under the shoes only, I'm selling casual also. So what happens, suppose I would have just, you know, created one ad group and would have inserted or uh, submitted all the keywords of formal and casual inside one ad group. Then if somebody would have searched a term called formal black shoes, then this ad group would have got confused that should I show formal ad shoes or should I show casual ad shoes? Because what I did, I have just got all my keywords like formal, casual, cricket, shopping, jogging, party, office, you know, all the mix of the keywords from formal and casual family into the same ad group. The moment any of these six keywords been typed or been searched on Google, then this ad group would have got triggered. And then again, randomly, it would have shown the ad of a formal or ad of a casual because both of the ads would have been under this. 
okay but after doing uh, this bifurcation or after doing this segmentation what would happen all the formal keywords like party shoes office shoes formal shoes formal black shoes would go here this ad group would trigger if any of this keyword would searched and accordingly this ad which has everything related to only formal shoes will be shown and of course with that ad the landing page is connected which uh, yeah, would be opened you know when somebody clicks the ad okay and vice versa if somebody would have searched for a casual term like a casual shoes sports shoes jogging shoes running shoes then this ad group would have triggered and then the casual shoes ad with all the headline related to that casual keywords would have been shown and accordingly if somebody would have clicked then the landing page of casual shoes uh, you know would have opened okay so if this is clear actually you are very much ready to uh, dive into the google ads because many people takes a lot of time to understand the structure because uh, you know maybe they are uh, very much confused at the ad group level but i have just tried my level best by bringing this example why i am creating two different ad groups I, why i'm not just going with the same ad group you know mixing all the keywords second scenario could have been or a second permutation could have been i would have just you know probably created two different campaigns all together i would have named the campaign one with search ad formal shoes november okay then only the only this part would have belonged to the first campaign then i would have created a different campaign all together and i would have named it campaign search ad casual shoes november then this second campaign or a second campaign can be assumed here with a, you know with a green color would have been drawn okay so this is how on the structure it works like we can always now create inside so let's just see a few things uh, before we create the ad okay very important uh, requirement or rather i would say uh, if being the campaign manager of any 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 uh, company you name any startup you name or any client you work with or probably for yourself as well you have to be very much sure how these terms works like okay so this terms when i talk about is going to be bit inclined towards the search ad today only and when i talk about the display ad in the next video then i would you know take you through about the terminologies and all the kpis of display banner or a video ads okay so now if i talk about a search ad a very important um, term which we should be aware of is the maximum bid price okay because we all know when we talking about this ad which is called a text ad then we are paying on every click okay that's why this is also called ppc ad this is also called ppc marketing or you can understand in a very simpler words a uh, advertiser which uh, is emeritus this in this particular ad only has to pay when somebody like such in this moment clicking this ad i click this ad i reach to the landing page of this uh, particular university or this college and a certain amount is deducted from this particular ad account and that certain amount actually decides or decided on the basis of the keyword helped to show this ad okay so as an advertiser must have paid something to google ads for showing this ad for this keyword okay so when i say a maximum bid price it means it's a maximum bid price of a keyword that's why now this would be easier to understand by this example suppose i want to run the ad on the term called data analytics course 2022 what i did i have opened the google keyword planner you know i did talked about this in the previous session but i will take you through again how you use a keyword planner smartly so i have got this data from the keywords planner that the average price i have to pay for this keyword to show my ad is 5 to 10 rupees so what i did i just played a bit of maths and i have bidded something over the minimum bid price okay this is the minimum bid price this is the maximum bid price okay and this is what i have got from the keyword planner so rather than going for a very high price or the maximum bid price to secure my position i want to play safe and what i would do i would just take a 
chance maybe 30 40 percent over the minimum bid range and then i will see if the impressions or clicks are coming or not if this starts coming it means that my ad is accepted and my keyword is you know uh, winning in the auction and i am able to get the clicks but if it is not picking then certainly i have to increase my bid price but coming back to the terminologies what we're talking here is once i have set it up my maximum bid price of seven rupees then my ad would start showing suppose my ad shows for thousand times today and every time when my ad been clicked you know certain amount being deducted there is a competition there are other advertisers also you know who are running the ad and after showing my ad for the whole day google in the dashboard just shown that you have paid average cpc of five rupees only so i bid it for seven but by seeing different uh, you know factors like the competition the demand and how many times the ads got clicked what was the position where my ad was shown i ended up in paying five rupees for every click by the end of a day so the average cpc sometimes you know people get confused the average cpc and the maximum bid price is the same no so maximum bid price is something which i uh, you know submit to google that this is the maximum i can pay for my ad to show on certain keyword for every click and average cpc is something which actually you know i pay every day or you know in that average of the duration your ad got displayed or got clicks uh, for every uh, click on that particular keyword okay or the number of keywords if you have more than one keyword uh, submitted and suppose i've got 100 clicks then you know it's a simple maths that my budget which i have spent today is five rupees for one click 500 rupees for 100 click so daily budget would be 500 rupees and tomorrow if company says i need 300 clicks then of course my uh, average cpc which i have from the historical data of yesterday you know i would just do my maths and i will going to submit the daily budget of not 100 rather 300 today so that in 1500 i can expect 300 clicks at the cost of five rupees per click okay so this is a very simple of the example to just make you explain how things works you know you submit something then on the basis of a lot of factors you know google calculates and google gives you clicks and once you have the data then you know you can just understand how this all is working okay last thing before we dive into the tool is keyword planner so i just told you we have done in the last class how this works like so we go into tool and setting and then we go into keyword planner i'll show you in the account also the google ads account just after 30 seconds uh, the screenshots over so your keyword planner opens and then you discover the keyword suppose i am selling data analytics course so i would just put my search term data analytics course and then i'll click the get result and then accordingly it will show me lot of options and this is the pricing i was talking about it gives me the low price and the high price so i would take the 30 40 percent over the low bid price or the average price between these both and that would be my maximum bid price and after checking all the permutations google would show my ad or either it would not show my ad also there, there can be a chance so i have to just wait for my impression and clicks and the results by the end of a day and i would you know i would know uh, how much the average cpc actually i'm paying for each keyword okay so i'll show you all those reports uh, in a while uh, that's it right now let's just go and see a few things so the keyword planner will start with suppose i start um, you know in researching all these things my campaign is about data analytics course i'm making it for simply run probably and i would go and i would just try to you know search into planning my keyword planner and then i will write a term quickly here you know whatever i want to show my ad for suppose data uh, analytics course as i said okay probably let's say digital marketing because we would have more uh, results so it's easy to understand with a lot of results because i would be able to tell you how to sort and filter them down uh digital marketing course and you can just test it with any of the keywords i'm just doing a random check so once we are here we have a lot of keywords in addition to what we have submitted so the keyword which i have provided is this and the result shows that it had over 100k 
uh, you know um, monthly searches and uh, of course in the range of 1 million in the in the you know in the month of 2021 to september 2022 so this is actually the average monthly searches happened in between this period and uh, the advertisers actually paid as low as 44 rupees to as high 20, uh, 224 rupees okay that can easily be uh, you know converted to dollars uh, half a dollar or maybe more than half a dollar uh, 60 70 cents probably and uh, this is like going to be a three dollars cost okay so what we can do is we can see now there are a lot of keywords been given and we can easily sort them down here on certain you know uh, basis like you know suppose the monthly searches are high or the bid is low and all that stuff but this is quite you know difficult when we have to sort down here in the keyword planner so what i do is i'm just going to talk about the same you know like hi how i actually go when i am working for my clients okay i have clients here a lot of clients i don't want to show you but yeah i have and um, suppose i just go and download this data from here and then this would be you know uh, downloaded in the excel format and we can just save it anywhere suppose i just bring it here and then now i would open the keyword sheet and i would have a data in my excel okay so i need this this one so this is the most important column because i have to highlight uh, which column is important and what is not required right now so whatever is required i'm just I'll be keeping with me and what i feel like is not very important as of now i'm just not going to be taking them so now there are five column which i have kept with myself like these four where we talk about the results and the keyword okay uh, this is not required this is not required so i'm just going to be deleting or hiding them okay so when we talk about our competition index value so this actually tells us that a particular keyword is how much uh, you know from the competition point of view is difficult to rank suppose i talk about two keywords right now let me just take um, a one with a lower score suppose this one and i would take the higher or the highest one probably is this one okay so now when i talk about a comparison you know probably uh, or, or probably let's say this this one because this has a uh, monthly searches which are equivalent uh, you know from the uh, competition point of view they are way differ but the search has been same so if i would stuck to something of this sort that if i have to finalize between these two so what i would do you know that, that's something which we are talking here you know if we have a kind of a combination where we have to decide out of these two so both of uh, the keywords meaning very important if i would just check from my naked eye a quick scan they look very promising they look very great to me suppose and they have a equivalent number of searches in the last uh, you know one year on the average monthly basis but there is a difference between the competition okay now people can be confused what is this competition so i would just make you explain in a very simple way suppose there are 100 companies or there are 100 you know ed tech institutes or probably physical institutes who teaches uh, digital marketing because we are doing online marketing or a you know digital marketing course online so so let's keep it uh, online uh, institutes like simply learn and all okay so what they have done is in the last one year they all have used these keywords to run their ads you know to show their uh, advertisement or their digital ad on a google space okay when this data has been given so this is telling me that out of those 100 advertisers or my 100 competitors 66 or a 66 percent advertisers have used this ad okay or have used this keyword to show their ad okay and out of 100 33 percent or if it is 100 uh, then 33 advertisers have used this keyword to show their ad okay so it brings you know kind of a, a comparison to us that probably these two keywords are very much in demand you know like uh, equally from the searches point of view because both have been searched equally but whenever this has been searched then there has been a competition 
where 66 people or 66 advertisers or 66 percent advertisers are fighting to show their ad okay and when this keyword being searched as equally then only 33 percent or 33 people or 33 advertisers are fighting to show their ad on google space okay when i talk about 100 then that seems to be okay where my ad would look like you know where my ad would show because if i just go on a google space you know that only seven ads are shown when you know when we go on a google search engine one two three and four and then the rest three would be at the bottom if they are shown at this moment or not i'm not very sure so three would be here somewhere so total seven ads placement on the first page nobody goes beyond first we know that 97 of the worldwide audience don't don't go beyond the first pagination okay so we have to be on our first page so if i talk about from the first page seven positions point of view it would make more sense so let's imagine there are only 10 advertisers of digital marketing course so out of 10 if i take out 66 66 percent then it means almost like six to seven advertisers are fighting or have bidded or probably are trying to outrank each other to show their ad on the top or on the first four positions of google but when i talk about this then only three to four advertisers are fighting or have bidded for this keyword to show the ad on the first page so this actually is a very important data sometimes we just you know miss it because uh, it has not been uh, i think explained anywhere else that what exactly this value is we on only go by the low medium high which is the very first column i delete nowadays you know i don't you know go by this because they both come under the medium but there is a big difference you know seven out of ten would have been bidded for and only three to four would have been you know, bidded for this keyword so never go by the high medium or low just go by the index value because that's a percentage of the advertiser who are actually trying to fight for the same keyword to show their ad on the top okay this is how we you know shorten or we get the best keywords we try to get the best search keyword with the you know kind of a index value between 50 to 60 less than that and then we of course you know go for the bid value or a bid uh, price which is also on a very lower side not a very high price keyword we go with so this is the criteria you know i actually follow and that's something which you know we can see i have also mentioned here you can see that much uh, you know we go for the high search keyword and then we'll try to get the low medium competition keywords which uh, of course uh, less than 60 index value and then i put a price you know kind of a price of my price you know which is like if the low bid price is 10 rupees then i just make it 13 by adding 30 percent to it so if the pricing is 10 so i would add 30 percent to it that makes my price 13 and then i check you know uh, if the first day if the impressions has come it means my price actually been accepted but if any of the keyword my price is not accepted then i would again revise the price by 20 30 percent and then would wait for the second day report and that's how you know i keep changing for the first two three days and keep seeing the results and once the you know every keyword gets picked up and i get the you know uh, try, starts getting the stable results then i uh, just just allow the campaign to work uh, you know on the algorithm and uh, you know i i see uh, results actually moves in the positive direction when you give some time to campaigns to read and to learn uh, you know from the audience behavior okay so this is about the keyword planning which we have just seen now moving to again a very important aspect because campaign making is something which i've already given you the you know glimpse in the last class so i would again give you today but before that i really you know wanted today to speak on all these technical aspects you know which works at the back end so that's why my focus is more on this uh, presentation parallelly i would keep showing you the uh, you know uh, the uh, google ads uh, the demo and everything okay so now when we move to the next part next part is very important from the um, ad algorithm point of view so what happens or what used to happen uh, when when the quality score you know which i'm just trying to speak now was not there uh, what used to happen the one who used to pay the highest bid price used to get the first position and the second one used to get the second position and the third bidder used to get the third position so i have just brought into this table suppose a advertiser has bid it 8 rupee b 10 c 15 and d 20 and when the quality score concept was not there so they actually been given the very direct position 
this one first this one second this one third and this one fourth but they have realized or google has realized that the one who is paying the most is not having a very good quality of the ad uh, his uh, landing page or the website it's is not working or probably the pages which is which are connected are not very relevant and the keywords on which the ads been shown is nowhere near uh, you know when the landing page is opened so it it was like a very negative impact on google when the reviews been checked and people or the users who were clicking on those ads were not happy so what google did google brought us you know kind of a, a test score or a check uh, which is called quality score for every keyword we bid okay and this is only for the search ads that's why i said all the keywords we bid okay i'll just show you the result on a client site so when we submit our ad on the basis of uh, you know uh, different keyword we bid and the and the strategy we use and the landing page we connected the back end so what the system does is system starts analyzing and starts checking everything from top till you know bottom from the start till the end and i would just talk about the factors and what impact it brings is so the quality score the score which has been given out of 10 is then uh, been given to every advertiser on the basis of the keyword suppose every uh, advertiser here is bidding on the same keyword you know let's let's, let's um, assume that they all are running the ad for the digital marketing course so what would happen they would check and on the basis of the you know factors they would give a score out of 10 suppose the a advertiser who bid it for the least had the best of the quality score because of the reasons we're just going to talk about b got 8 out of 10 4 out of 10 and 2 out of 10 so the one who have bid it the most got the very least quality score probably the reasons uh, you know would be more clear once we talk so how this now will going to impact the whole position system is that their google rank not google position okay there is a google rank kind of a, a kpi can be understood or a matrix which is a, a product or a multiplication of what you bid and how much quality score you were able to get so 8 into 9 being 72 10 into 8 brings 80 15 into 4 brings 60 and 20 into 2 is 40 okay so the combination of a good pricing and a good quality score got b bidder as a first position okay and the one who got the best quality score but still paying very less from the average pricing probably is you know brought the google position or ad position to second and then the one who was spring very high but the quality score was below average which is of course five six is average price average score they've got into third position and the one who was paying so high probably would not get a position you know, because this is the maths uh, from the maths point of view have got these numbers if the quality score would have been below five then the ad would not have got any position rather because google always tries to you know show the ads which are the best uh, for the users you know because google always pays very importance to the users behavior and users um, uh, you know expectations so and why, when i said that I think you would be able to understand more now how the factors, you know, which which actually results in these quality score is um, like relevant score. Like by relevant score means when you type a query or a person would come here would type a query, so he doesn't know that this is called a keyword. We as a digital marketers know this is called a keyword. For them, it is a normal query because they are about to start a course where they would be taught about all these things, but right now so they are not very uh, aware you know very much aware of these things so they are putting a query when they put a query they want to see the ad or uh, ad extensions or uh, ad description relevant to what they have searched and when they see all these three things here with the search uh, you know with what they made they would definitely going to click more and google only earns when somebody clicks so it means google making revenue only when somebody is clicking so from that perspective also google always tries to pay you know uh, or rather give more score and uh, give a better position to the ads where all the components of the ads are perfect are relevant and the ones who starts getting more clicks in the very first hour or a first day okay so the important factor which after the click is the landing page so when somebody opens this so it has to be very relevant to the query and to whatever being shown outside they cannot just show anything here uh, which is not relevant to the ad which has actually been shown outside so all these uh, you know uh, factors uh, in combination gives the quality score very important factor is ctr 
which you must have understood when you know we uh, I, I did you know uh, explain the last session the basic one but if you do not aware of it so CTR is called click through rate okay and a click through rate is a ratio of clicks to impression okay it is a ratio of clicks to impression just a spell check okay so suppose today uh, when we are saying ABCD so let's see this are, this is a, a or this is B and this is C and they've got uh, you know equivalent quality score on the basis of all what they have done okay their landing page their uh, ad their description everything is very much common so Google in the starting of the day you know when the ad actually started to show for everyone uh, you know giving them a very good quality score probably of five okay and when this quality score of five been given to them then the other factor which actually adds on you know to that algorithm is the CTR so CTR is I just told you is the ratio between click to impression so now they all have a same quality score but this got hundred clicks out of the thousand impressions been given today this got 50 clicks out of the thousand impressions given today this got by any mean probably 200 clicks out of the thousand impressions given today okay every time this uh, the search is happening here digital marketing course so these three ads are very much visible equally so all got 1000 impressions 1000 impressions 1000 impressions but this got 100 clicks this got 50 clicks and this got 200 clicks in the very first hour or maybe in the next two hours okay so this CTR you know, when we are talking about 100 out of 1000 to 10 percent this is 50 out of 1000 it means this is going to be 5 percent and 20 uh, sorry 200 out of 1000 means 20 percent of the CTR so Google was actually benefited or made the most of the revenue when you know clicks have come from here because it is almost like a double or a four times of this so because of the high CTR the quality score of of course you know every every advertiser would improve but this one would be improved from probably from 5 to 7 and this would you know probably from 5 to 5.5 and this probably from 5 to 6 so because of that quality score has improved and uh, you know because of the high CTR this ad has got so this position will be changed and it, this would you know probably would get the first position the second position and at the end of a day this ad has to pay or advertiser has to pay lesser because its quality score increase we have just seen it is you know almost like the uh, you know inversely proportional the ones who are actually paying or the ones who are having the best of the quality score are paying the least or has to pay the least okay so this is all basically you know can be checked once your ad starts running so I will just open the clients account uh, where you can just see this with uh, you know with better understanding you would be able to get out of this hopefully I am able to show you from okay I'll just see because I have multiple advertisers you know but I cannot just show for all so let me just check if I can show you from any of the older one just wait it is actually asking you some verification it's taking too much time yeah it's just done now okay. so once this is done so I will just take you to one of the accounts where my main focus will be to just show you how the quality score report look like and then you know, you know you will get a fair idea about all the factors you have to be focusing to bring your quality score high or to take your quality score high okay so I'm just going to open the search ads because we're talking about a search ad here only and suppose if I just go into this uh, campaign which is of course you know not running right now but I just want to show you how you check the report and all suppose this is the campaign you have run for and you got 75 clicks at a you know um, average CPC price of 40 pesa and you have just given this much pricing and I have bid it for many keywords but I want to see which keyword had got the best of the quality score and how the quality score has been given and all okay so once you reach to the keyword report here you know at this level then you see um, uh, you know uh, the KPIs or metrics here which gives the quality score out of 10 okay you can see here very well and every keyword being given other you know if, if there are 10 keywords I don't know how many keywords we bid it for we bid it 50 keywords okay and um, you know you can see all the keywords here and every keyword been given the quality score out of 10 
okay because their ctr which was the last part which i have explained you the ratio between the impression to clicks got the above average so they give uh, below average average and above average so above average is best actually for any of the factors so their ctr is above average their landing page is above average and their ad is above average means all are perfect then they got the 10 the moment anything goes below average or probably to the average suppose you can see this is above average for them this is above average for them but their landing page experience from this keyword point of view is only average their quality score has come to eight okay if you go further down uh, let's see anything where two of them uh, yeah so here the kids ride on is a keyword where ctr is also not as high or as great you know to uh, as compared to the other keywords which we have seen and also the landing page is not as relevant to the keyword so there uh, two factors like ctr and landing page has come to average as compared to the ad relevance which is above average so their whole quality score got impacted which actually came down from 10 to 8 and then 7 for this particular keyword and last not least, if I just take you to somewhere where something is below average has come now, one is above average, one is okay, they are getting clicks, but probably the ad is still not very much relevant to the keyword. Okay, so they are below average, above average average has brought the quality score to 6 out of 10, which certainly would have, you know, impacted on the cost and also to the position. Okay, so this is something which you would see when you come here also you can check one more thing here suppose you have bidded for your keyword and your bid price where you are paying for is maximum bid price let me just see where that column is so otherwise i would just add that column so that you can learn that part as well okay just wait okay so this is basically CPC price is being given in the average cost 2.50 is the cost for every click and we got 249 clicks so got 623 you can just check the maths uh, it's always good to cross check so 249 clicks multiplied by the CPC price which is 2.50 rupee would give you 622.5 which is the cost you know or the keywords um, uh, you know we bid it for and the total clicks we have paid okay and the maximum bid price suppose you know you have got uh, the maximum bid price of uh, one rupee and you paid 17 pesa 1.66 and all and then what happens you wanna secure your position suppose the very first page bid you're seeing that you're getting the position but you're not getting a first page then here because this campaign is not running so i'm just giving you the hypothetical example so whatever the pricing you would have given for the particular keyword suppose we talk about these three keywords right now or particular one keyword uh, i suppose so this is something which i'm you know trying to show on a one rupee cost but to show on the first page it is saying that you have to pay 1.5 okay to show on the uh, first four positions here one two three four it is saying that probably you have to pay 2.5 and to get the absolute first position which is going to be the topmost it would tell you that you have to probably pay five rupee you know you're paying one it is asking 1.5 the first four it can be paid for 2.53 or this has to be five so you can always go and change your you know bid price for the particular keyword okay so there are ways to do it suppose if i'll just go here and i just go to the edit i can change my maximum cpc bid price for this particular bid uh, or a keyword like to five rupee okay because i'm not changing for all the keywords so i have selected that particular keyword and I have made the change to this particular keyword to five rupee. So if you know the average price was one and I was not getting the keyword uh, from this keyword, the position secured on the first page or a first absolute position, and I want because this is the most important keyword for me, then I would just come here and would check the pricing. Okay, this says five rupees you have to pay for the top position. So I will just go here, edit, and would change the bid price or a maximum CPC bid price of this particular keyword. You can do for all you know you have to just of course you know select all of course but 
if you would do for all then it it can really impact your whole budget okay so try to go for the keywords where you really feel like it is required and always go by the quality score it has you know it has a very good quality score so i should be paying or i should be ready in paying uh, the maximum price which actually google is asking me to pay to secure my first absolute position and uh, certainly that would increase the chances of clicks and certainly if clicks are there so conversions can be expected too okay so this is all <coughs> from what i've just taught you as of now now i would just move to the campaign making though we have done as i told you last time but i will try to make it again so that we can quickly see how the google ads search ads uh, or the search google ad created okay so if i just go to the campaign uh, my demo account so i have to just go to the google ads account the dashboard and then I would come to the campaigns. I would just click plus new campaign. And whatever the you know um, objective is, you can always go for website traffic or without a guidance because this would have all the settings inside the same. More important part is what we select next. So we select search campaign because we are making the ad for the search network. You can always test for website traffic that would not make much difference and click continue. I will talk about the conversions and remarketing in a separate uh, session altogether. So we are not doing the conversion and remarketing today. We are making a normal search ad with all the strategies we have just understood and with uh, adding the extensions to the ad as well today. Okay, website visit. And suppose my website is uh, just open simply learns uh, landing page so that I can make the ad for simply learn digital marketing as a demo ad, of course, not a main ad. So copying and just putting in here i have to just put a uh, you know website domain that's it i don't have to bring the whole landing page here and then i can just name it probably november search ad and then i would just go and continue start new and then i'll just select my bidding strategy which is going to be clicks and of course from my excel i would learn that okay my bid price which i'm going to be paying uh, you know uh, is certainly in the range of something like probably 50 60 and i have just told you that i bring my price kind of a thing into this like i always bring like this and then well, let me just delete all the other columns which are not required so this is the sheet which I did explain to you earlier with the index value and all. So my price, what is my price like? So I always pay 30%, 40% extra to the low bid price. So I can, you know, just get the formula here like this plus this 30%. Okay, so that is just going to make it 57. So you can just understand 44 plus 13 going to bring 57 and I can just drag it and now I've got the average suppose these are the you know keywords which I have finalized just assuming so these are the keywords which I have finalized probably because of XYZ factors searches and index value and all that and I see that my pricing is varying from 35 to 89 so maximum paying 89 so what I would do keeping that in my head I would going to give the limit to my bid price that i don't want to pay anything extra or more than 90 okay so this is something which you can do on this particular level and then you move ahead and you remove this because you just want to keep your ad on the google search and then you go down you select your countries you select your location if you want to show the ad in all the locations then you certainly can just go uh, and keep the very first option open which is uh, all countries and territories if you want to just show your ad um, uh, in a particular country like you know right now if i just go india so the whole india would see your ad and if you want to go for a manual locations like suppose i want to select any of the states or cities then what i would do i would just probably take delhi so delhi would be targeted like this okay or probably i just want to target the state of texas here so I just would go and target the whole state 
or if I want to target any of the provinces of Canada so I would just go and take the uh, provinces of Ontario Canada and I would just target the whole province and now if I also want to go for any of the uh, pin codes suppose I want to target to a certain pin code then I can just go and target the pin codes like this so it is up to us that we want to go worldwide or if you want to go for a country specific if you want to go for a state specific or if you want to go as a province or a pin code specific okay otherwise uh, if you suppose um, a restaurant or if you are a you know somebody who only delivers into certain radius then you can just leave all these options and you can go and advance search and then you can go into radius and you can just bring this uh, whatever you understand better in india we understand kilometers better maybe the person in us would understand miles better so we just go and take that two kilometer radius and probably i am the cake shop in delhi so i would just go into search my location this is my location and i was just going to target people around two kilometer because i don't deliver outside two kilometers so it's all up to us how we wanna go uh, this is called radius targeting or geofencing when we go to the location we can also learn one thing suppose i want to show the ad to the um, whole country india uh, i've targeted but at the same time i am not delivering in um, uh, in 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 mumbai okay or probably in uh, Karnataka, you know, Bangalore, where uh, the city is, okay, or probably I'm not delivering in any of the uh, northern states like Haryana, Himachal, Punjab. So, what I would do, I would just take Punjab, suppose, for example, and I'm just going to exclude that, okay. So, what would happen now? My ad would show in all the states and all the cities of India, but just not in Punjab, okay. So, I can save it. That's how you go about the location. Language is, you know, in which language the users probably uses the search engine and all. So you can keep it all languages. That's the best. And audience, we don't cater here much because we are doing the search ad, which actually shows the ad on the basis of keywords and location only. So in the display ad, we're going to ta talk about this uh, one. And that would be the next video I would create. So we're going to learn a lot of things from the audience segment in the next display ad and then the more settings comes where you talk about the ad rotation so ad rotation is uh, already default being selected as the perform best ad uh, if uh, because the nowadays the ad actually been created uh, responsive and dynamic so when we'll reach to the ad level i'll show you uh, the headline changes for every user the description sometimes changes for the user what i mean is if sachin is selecting or you know writing this keyword so probably this headline is shown to me and after one hour if i'll come again and put search the same term so the headline from the same advertiser could be different or the description could be different so that's how the dynamic ads works like okay so once you are done with this okay the start end date is important you know the basics from the previous chapter so i'm just going a bit faster in here so you would select the date and then if you want to schedule this campaign for a certain period like suppose you don't want to run on the weekends so you can just select monday to fridays and you know our timing whichever suits you suppose just like a very common time of 8 a.m to uh you know the late nights like 23 45 and you don't want to run the weekends if you want um saturday sunday to be you know 24 hours then you don't have to put any timing so that goes like 24 hours for saturday sundays and then you click next and you reach to the next level where it will just going to ask you for certain things like keywords you want to submit and the ad you want to run for and the ad copy you know you have to create okay so once you come here it uh, is the you know work you have done so you can just copy paste them and you know bring in there uh, and otherwise these all keywords are the ones which google has suggested you from you know the page which you have submitted okay so the landing page is this so i'll try to change the landing page first so that i can get more appropriate keywords and then it would going to search again or scan again for us update keyword suggestions of course we can always click on and now the keywords would be more digital marketing oriented because this landing page will be scanned by google and this would show us certain results which would of course going to be digital marketing oriented but why we don't just uh, you know use them because we don't know uh, 
वहाँ पर इज द प्राइजिंग ऑफ दिस की वर्ज इज वट इज द कॉम्पिटिशन ऑफ दिस की वर्ज इज हाउ मच द मंथली सर्च इज बीन सो वी गो बाई आर ओन मैथ्स वी वी कैलकुलेट वी डू ऑल दिस प्री होमवर्क ऑन द की वर्ड प्लानर शीट जस्ट लाइक वी डेट टू डेथ एंड देन वी ब्रिंग दैम हेयर बाई डिलीटिंग ऑल वट दे हैव एक्चुअली सबमिटेड और सजेस्टेड अस ओके एंड वंस दिस इज डन देन वी एनश्योर दैट आवर की वर्ड uh you know in the headlines and everything being used how the ad copy is created i'll just show uh, you some you know strategic part of it ensure that your landing page is correct and it is opening there you know otherwise your ad would not be approved secondly always give a display path display path is something which is added after the ad uh, or the landing page link suppose i am selling online digital marketing so i would just going to write whatever i want to show okay or probably i'll just keep it here marketing okay so that works okay so now it has come digital marketing and then the part comes where you know you have to be i'll just going to tell you the call extension once the ad is created so headlines and all so the headline is something which shows you know you know the basic so i'll be fast again under the landing page link this blue which actually uh, you know brings the most of the engagement or which actually appeals the user to click it is something in blue which is you know going to be the headline so we have to be focusing very much on bringing the best of the headlines here so that we can get the best of the clicks because you know once the click increases the ctr increases ctr increases the quality score would increase quality score would increase your costing would come down and your position would rise so you have to ensure that your headlines your clicks everything is in a, you know in a line whatever we have learned so your headlines right now has been given these of course they are not very relevant so we'll going to just bring the headlines which we feel like are more relevant to the ad we are showing okay and i'm just going to get the headlines as a suggestion been given okay and um, we can have more ideas from here by clicking this so they are not giving any so we can always have from the keywords which we have submitted so probably digital marketing course online try to get your best keywords here this is okay this is nice this can be changed in digital marketing course online is not taking so this not taking online probably i'll just take because course are already submitted and then i can take few more like social media marketing i just seen whatever the length it would accept i'll take otherwise i'll delete the rest this is the one and i should ensure that i have at least 10 headlines or 12 headlines so six been given and headline section actually you know been given like a half blue and then i would see headlines which are unique so unique you should have a uh, you know online availability ki benefits and the offers and all or call to action so enroll register today for free demo then we'll talk about you can see the moment i've added the headline this the strength has changed 100 uh, plus tools for free job assistance program okay so i'm just adding few random things i'm just not paying much attention but yeah of course we would have seen uh, these headlines in any of the ad tech companies ads uh, include some popular keywords popular keywords could be your brand name as well so simply learn courses online of hopefully the spelling is fine and um, weekend batch for professionals uh oh 
just a batch for professionals and that's it you know because i already added a lot of keywords a lot of headlines probably revenge so i would just not work on the headlines anymore uh and i'll see you know if description doesn't takes it high then I'll, I'll just add one more but right now the description is also not giving me the full uh tick like in the headline unique and the headlines been given so i'll just try to bring the description so simply in online to, to, to online that's great that's great so i'll just try to get something from google itself let's see what they have given so i'll just going to bring this one okay so that it is being taken from the landing page itself so that would make a difference to uh, the quality score simple digital marketing courses focus on so we're just going to put our courses focus on skills see you to do to do to do, do focus on skills like SEO PC analytics just going to bring this one here so that it has been picked up so now you can see this has also been picked up and the last thing i would do is now going to bring some headline uh, again you know i'll just check probably uh, digital marketing certification i'm not sure if this headline i have somebody earlier or not but i'm just going to test it out okay so certification so now it has you know come down to good and uh that's the best you know right now we can do of course so you can take it further but yeah that doesn't um uh, matter if you are just stuffing it to get this one completed you have to just ensure that all the keywords or all the headlines are relevant just do not overdo 10 to 12 are okay okay once this is done your ad is created you can just click done and you can click next and then your budget so we just discussed about the budget when i was explaining we'll just take you back so because you know that your average cpc price would be around 80 you know whatever the pricing you have just got from here if you know the sheet when i was explaining you so the 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 bid price which you have submitted for you know when i told you is like something which is in this range uh 80 90 whatever it is so you know that bid price would come down to 90 and you need um at least 100 clicks today so 90 into 100 is going to be your 9000 daily budget so because you know that you know you would end up in paying maximum 90 rupees per click because that's the maximum bid price you have submitted if that comes down to 70 80 60 then of course your clicks would increase but right now though being very uh, you know hypothetic hypothetically thinking that okay i would pay 90 rupees per click at max because that is what i submitted so to get 100 clicks i have to pay 90 into 100 it would be 9000 your you know daily budget has to be so you would have come here and you would just going to change it set a custom budget and you would going to bring down 9000 rupees here okay so on that yeah average cpc whatever it would be you would get the number of clicks if your average cpc goes down from 90 to 45 then of course you are not going to get only 100 you'd rather get double amount which is going to be 200 okay when that is done then you just click next and your budget goes uh, you know your campaign goes for a review and then you can add the extensions from outside okay so they're just giving you some of the uh, you know kind of uh, suggestions so let's see uh, there is one issue in the ad let me just check that first let me just see you can always fix it because that would again you're not going to give you the option of um, publishing you know till you fix it but it is not clickable or not no uh, what is the problem i'll just go from here you know sometimes those links doesn't work so let's see what is the issue one product contains an entire okay so because just to do that the character limit part i have not given the space so that is something which is not acceptable by them i'm just going to put like skills like this and now so these all small things you know they do 
take uh, care of so here only because we have come down so why not uh, you know just to see the extension here itself because that would uh, going to save our efforts by going from outside so when you see the ad you see some extensions here like you know when you have created the ad right now so you have created only till this limit okay this is the elements you have put it up right now the landing page the headline the description but in this ad by emirators you can see more links like uh, apply to iams learn how industry so one is landing page and three different uh, pages or a sub pages also been shown in this same ad how they are done so they are done through the extension called site link okay so you can see here if you go down after the headline there's an option to have the site links here okay so you can just click plus here itself I mean, i'm not submitting the ad because i wanted just to show you from here itself and then you can go down because in your case these would not be given because mine are already created yours or not so you would go down and you would create the new south new site link from here and you can just give a name suppose download brochure and then you can give a url of that download brochure page right now i'm using this url and i'm just going to be adding my own made page like this like this has to be the landing page which is workable for the downloading brochure of course so this would be added and then i can just go and probably add um uh, testy uh, and reviews okay so somebody wants to read the uh, you know uh, testimonials and reviews of when when they see the ad so you can see that on the desktop how that would look like so they would have an ad and then they would have these four links and all which you have just seen in the google when i shown you so final url of uh, reviews can be given which would directly take them to the page where the reviews been given and uh, site two could be anything you know which can just see um industry ready modules or the fee structure you know the fee structure is something which people always wants to just know from the uh, very first glimpse of the ad itself so i can just maybe take them to the page where fee is actually been you know talked about and the last could be uh, maybe tools provided the uh, tools and certificates you would get so that can also be one of the links which people would very much interested in you know clicking and checking okay so you would see the the ad in certain shape you would have a normal headline uh, the description which you have put it up and then four links where people can directly reach okay and then you know this had to be saved here and you can always see the preview which i've already shown you but yeah this is how that would look like so you add your ad and your four uh, extra links which actually been added okay so this is one which you can apply now and now your ad has the extensions in addition to that you might have seen somewhere that you know your ad has uh, the number as well you know, sometimes you see the number being given here up to right now it is not showing uh, any of the ads with the number but they you know uh, generally have and advertisers have nowadays the numbers in addition to the headline and everything okay so you can add that as well by just going up and you can see there is an option of calls okay okay let, let me you can add from here uh, certainly i can show you but you know you can just go down and add the number by clicking your country and you know giving your number here it will just be cross checked by some verification and all so that is done you can save it so you can see what actually i was showing you you know i would just show you um from outside also that if by any of the uh, you know um that is done that we have corrected so you don't have to be uh, you know uh, worried about so if i just click done so that should not be there if it is still there i have to check now which spacing it is actually talking about um actually i have unacceptable spacing contains comma and i think i have just corrected it but it is not taking maybe i have to just uh, um delete the whole description probably that would be something which and i would save our time okay so we're not adding that description though just click done so this is actually you know kind of a bug because that is something which has been deleted rather in front of you so this is not um 
taking but i would just click next and probably this would now be not the error in which we would see so you go for a review so what i was saying i did show you from outside the you know the the campaign was created from the ad itself how the site site link is connected and how the uh, call been added for now the publish campaign you can see because that ad error actually been rectified so if by mistake you know you just forgotten that you have to add the call number or extension you know which we just added so what you don't have to be worried because once you back to the dashboard you know where you would see all your campaigns certainly you would see your this campaign as well in which you had just created then you can just go inside the um ad group and then you can see there is add and assets let me just click that so there is an ad which you just created and there is an assets you know where you could see uh, the extensions and all like you know you just have added today now we just added this site link and this number so if i want to add again or if i would have forgotten then what i can do i can just go and take from here suppose if uh, that call extension was not added there you know when i just added you would come here in the assets you would click that plus button and then you would just go to the call and you would see the same kind of a preview which you have seen inside the ad when we were creating okay nothing different it's just like the you know way you do it you know either you do when the ad was created or otherwise you can just go uh, let the campaign be created published and you can come from outside you can click the add and assets you can go to plus and you can create any of these uh, extensions i will talk about more in the coming you know tutorials and demos uh, and the sessions but today you know we'll wind up here i just uh, you know wanted to give you the thorough uh, learning on the google search ad with the extensions and also the main uh, agenda for today was to make you understand how these you know terms works like and how the keywords can be researched how you can bring your own pricing to the keywords how you can save the cost and of course to understand how the quality score works like you can have a lot of videos on a youtube where you can find the quality score of google ads working though i tried to you know bring everything under this session but still if you want to go for a deep learning you can always search more and research more what is email marketing well email has been around for a very long time of course and in the very early days there wasn't an email marketing service that you could use yeah you couldn't easily send out hundreds of emails so what you did you were actually using the bcc or the blind carbon copy in your email system to send out emails to many people of course the it department of companies in those early days they didn't like that because it would block the email system of the company so they come up with little marketing uh, email marketing solutions on the company's mainframe but it was all very inflexible you had to take your email you had to take your mailing list give that to the guy in the it department and if you're lucky then maybe in a couple of days later your email would be sent you wouldn't get any data at all about those emails yeah you knew how many emails were sent but you didn't know who would have opened the email or who would have clicked on the email nowadays of course things are completely different yeah, now you have email marketing where you can use email service providers who offer you lots of tools and lots of analytics to manage and plan and measure your email marketing campaigns. So what actually is email marketing? It uses email addresses from people to inform your email list about your product or service. We call these commercial emails, which is completely different, of course, from the billions of personal emails that are being sent yeah, around the, uh, the Internet every day. So this is a commercial email that you send to an email list about your product, your service or a newsletter and what have you. Additionally, you can integrate it into your marketing automation. So you can, and it can help your customers to see your latest products and offers. And you can obviously use the email list to and, and persuade them to buy your book a demo or sign up for a trial or register for an event. 
Yeah, we call this email nurturing, where you can send a range of emails to take people through their journey to help them to make the decision. So what are the different uses of email marketing? It can be used in relationship building with existing customers who bought a product. For instance, send them a thank you email. It could be to boost brand awareness. It could be about promoting various pieces of content. It can help you in generating leads or to promote or market your products. And very important, you can use it to nurture leads. So what are the types of email marketing? There are a whole range of different emails that you can send through email marketing systems. We'll talk about welcome emails, newsletter emails, could be a lead nurturing email, a confirmation email, a specific emails to specific people, invitations, promotional emails, or an email to do a survey, or seasonal marketing emails. So a whole range of emails you have available that you can use for different marketing purposes. So now that you understand the basics of email, let's talk about how you get started with it. It's not that complicated. First of all, like with many marketing activities, you need to define your audience and establish your goals. Why do you want to use email marketing? And then you start with one of the most important aspects of your email marketing. That is about building your email list. And that is the most important, it's a very important aspect because if your email list is not up to date, yeah, there will be a lot of bounces on your email and your email service provider may get back to you, say, hey, your email list is not up to date, so we may actually block you because you may be spamming your customers. You then choose the, uh, the email campaign type that you want to run. You make a schedule when you want to send out the emails. And then, of course, you need to measure your results. So as I said, a very important part is creating your email list. And how do you go about that? There's lots of ways that you can create emails. The simplest ways is when you are at an event, just put a little box at your reception desk and ask people to leave their business card. And that gives you already um, a lot of emails that you can enter in your email list database. Yeah, there's other ways you can take your existing customer list and upload that in the email system. Or you can use two very powerful methods, which is a lead magnet and an opt-in form. Now, what is a lead magnet? A lead magnet is a document or a piece of content like an ebook, a white paper, infographic, or a report, or a checklist, or a template, or a webinar, or a tool, and you put it on your website, you promote it through your email, so you have those documents available on your website through your marketing campaigns, you drive traffic to your website where people will see the, tech, the checklist or the template, they will click on the link and before they download, they have to enter their email address. Yep, and then that email address will automatically be added to your mailing list. Yeah, now how do you design an effective lead magnet? Usually it's done by creating a landing page. And on that landing page, you have only one message. And that is the solution that you offer or the piece of content that you offer. You make sure that the asset is simple to use, yeah, that it helps you in promoting your offer. You can use it as a cornerstone to your paid solution. So maybe you promote a freebie that will lead to a paid solution and you make offers that are relevant for the phase that the customer is in, in the buying process. Yep, now the next form that we talked about was the opt-in form. An opt-in form is a form that can pop up on your website where people just need to fill in their name, address, email, contact number, etc. You can specify what fields you want to capture. Yep, and again, they can do that to register for something or if they have a question or if they want to have a conversation with you. Opt-in forms are important that you make sure that the header stands out visually and people will see it when they are uh, visiting your website. Yeah, often you see websites when as soon as you get to the homepage, that form will pop up. 
yeah and then make sure that once people have seen the form and they they clicked it away or they filled it in that they won't see it again there's nothing more annoying than every time you get to a home page that form pops up make sure that relevant copy is there to encourage readers to take advantage of the offer keep the form easy yeah make sure you have double confirmation enabled yep and make sure everything flows smoothly on your form so Having gone through those basics of email marketing, what we're going to do now is giving you a short demo of MailChimp, one of the leading email services. Now, what started off as a simple email marketing system, yes, so you put in your email addresses, you create an email campaign, you link the campaign to the email addresses, Yep, and then you send it out, MailChimp would take care of that, and then MailChimp would also give you the reporting. Now, this mail, the, these email marketing systems, they became more and more advanced. They knew that digital marketing is not only email marketing. There is now pay-per-click marketing, there is social media, there is, um, what's it, influencer marketing, there is advertising, you name it. So they had to enrich their services. Yep. And you will see that when we go into MailChimp, that there is now a whole range of additional services, even down to developing your own website that MailChimp can offer you. But at the core of MailChimp is its email system. So let's go and have a look into how to use MailChimp and how to set up your first email campaign. So if you go to MailChimp.com, yeah, you can see here a little uh, overview of what it does. Yeah, then um, again, we're going to go into automations. I'm going to show you some of the analytics. I'm going to show you how you can segment with, um, with MailChimp and how you can synchronize with other applications in MailChimp as well. So lots of stuff that you can do. Here is a little promotional video. Um, and here is the pricing. So you can see that a free version gives you limited functionality, but it does give you all the functionality you need to send emails to up to 500 contacts per month. Yep, and then it goes up to £11.70, and then the premium version gives you all the full features, $299. But let's focus on the free version. Again, that's what I kind of like of, um, of MailChimp. So let's go into my account. Yes, yeah, so I go on to... <clears throat> let's have a look. I'm logged in. Yeah, so here is my audience. So here you see the features that MailChimp has to offer. So First of all, there is create. You can create campaigns. Yeah, that is where you run your email campaigns and where you create your marketing campaigns. A very important part of your MailChimp is your contacts or your audience. Of course, if you don't have any emails in your database, as it were, then yeah, then there's not many people that you can send stuff to. So contacts are very important that you get an email list that you can connect with your campaigns. There are automations that you can do, which basically means you can send emails automatically. There is analytics, there is website, you can create your own website and modules of it. There is content, so that is sort of your uh, library of assets. And then there are different integrations that you can do. Here you see kind of your dashboard of the campaigns, and this is your audience dashboard. So the very first thing, of course, that you need to do when you are starting on MailChimp, that is create an audience. Yeah, and that's where you go into your contacts. So there is your audience dashboard, as you see here. You can have all, an overview of all your contacts. You can create sign-up forms that you can add to your website to capture people's email addresses. There are tags that you can set to content. You can group your content into segments. 
and you can do surveys and there is your inbox if people send you messages. Yeah, so lots of functionality, but your first challenge will be how to get your emails. And there's lots of ways to do that. First of all, there may be your existing customer database or your existing customer list. You probably have them in a spreadsheet. Yeah, so what I'm going to show you in a minute is how you can enter or um, import that spreadsheet into uh, MailChimp. Yeah, so that is one way. Second, you can actually set up on your website a form that people can fill in to sign up for your newsletter, for instance. Or you can run a campaign where people go to a landing page and if they download a certain piece of uh, documentation, then they need to give you their, um, their email address. Yeah, so there's lots of ways. Another really effective way, if you're at an exhibition, for instance, have a little box on your, uh, your counter where people can leave their, their, um, their, their business cards. Yeah, and then you can take all of that information and put them in your, uh, your MailChimp. So the question here then is, of course, how do I bring contacts into my MailChimp audience? So let's go to all contacts. Yep, and then you see I already have two contacts in my MyCo. That's the name of my audience. Yeah, so I'm going to add additional contacts. I can get an overview of my contacts. I can add contacts manually. I can add a subscriber. Yeah, and then I can just put in the name. Yeah, so that is Mark at uh, simplylearn.com and then it's Mark there is simply learn don't have to put in address I can get phone number I can get birthday I can get company name that would be simply learn I can add a tag so that would be training add or create a tag yeah that could be training there's my tag now very important what sim what what the mailchimp wants to know that the people that you have in your database that you that they gave you permission to email them yeah there are very strict requirements these days for people yeah, that you need to respect their privacy. You need to have permission before you send them an email. Yep, and there's different ways that you can ask that permission. You can ask it on the website before they fill in a form. You can ask it in your newsletter. Yeah, so make sure that you have those permissions because if people get unsolicited email through a commercial email campaign, yeah, in principle, that is not allowed and you may be subject to a fine. The, you may have heard of the GDPRS regulations in, uh, in, in Europe um, and there is also regulations in the United States, there's regulations in Asia. Yeah, there's a real tightening of those privacy regulations when it comes to email marketing. If this person for some reason is already in my audience, then I can update, it will update their profile. So let's click subscribe let's see <coughs> there's probably one field i forgot phone number that is oh seven five yeah so the phone number was a required um, item as well yep and then i click subscribe so if i now go back to all contacts you will see that mark at simplylearn.com is now has been added to my database. So that is one uh, way to get emails in your audience list. The next way is if you go to add contacts, you can import contacts. There are three ways how you can import contacts. You can import contacts from another service. Yeah, so where you connect with another piece of software, you can upload a CSV file or a text file, and you can even copy and paste. Yeah, so if I import from another service, 
you can see you can import for Salesforce, from Squarespace, from Shopify, and there's probably a lot more integrations that you can have. If you want to upload a file, it will then basically ask you to upload your file. So what we need to do, we need to create a spreadsheet that we save as a CSV file. So if I go to Google Drive and I'm going to actually I already have a file here. Yes, yeah, so let's open this file. So you see that I have these names in there. I'm going to take them out. Very important that you add first name, last name, company, email, and all the fields that are relevant for you. Yeah, so let's say telephone as well. So then we're going to say the first name is uh, Jacob. Uh, last name is Jones. Company is Bico and email is jacob at jones.com. Telephone number is 01234567. Yep, then the second name is um, Anne Marie, uh, Carol, and that is Carol. Dot com and that is n at carol dot com and that is nine eight seven six five four telephone number. Okay, let's take out that dollar sign. Right. <clears throat> yes, so now I have the file and this name is MailChimp or whatever. MailChimp one. So the first thing I'm going to do, of course, is to save this. I am going to download this file as a comma separated values file, which is a CSV file. And MailChimp wants me to upload this CSV file into this field. Yeah, so that's how I can upload my contacts. So I'm going to my uh, YouTube download here is my MailChimp CSV file yep so there it is I'm going to continue to organize now the first thing that MailChimp is going to do now if there were any existing contacts they will be updated the first thing I can add a tag yes yeah, so I'm going to let's say a member and I'm going to Continue to match. That is what MailChimp is going to do now. Remember the first line of our spreadsheet was sort of the field names, first name, last name, company name, and telephone. MailChimp is going to match those. MailChimp thinks that the first line was first name, the second name was last name, so these are correct. Company, it has picked up. It doesn't know what to do with telephone. Yeah, so what I can do, I can edit this column yeah and I can look at the fields that they have yes yeah, so is telephone in here I don't see yeah, here phone number yeah and I'm gonna link it with phone number so now it is okay and I can now see here five columns will be imported and I'm gonna say finalize import yep so now it has added two contacts to the list so I'm going to say complete import and if I now want to view my contacts you will see that my contacts have been added to my email list yes yeah, so now I have two additional contacts in my list I could also add a subscriber actually have done a copy and paste Go back, add contacts, import contacts. I could do a copy and paste. So I'll show you how that works. Continue. Yeah, so when I go back to the spreadsheet and I would copy these, just copy it. Command copy. I'm going back to my MailChimp and I can now just paste them here, just like this. And now 
MailChimp is going to analyze this, yeah, and it says, okay, this is what I think it is, and it goes back into that same stage that we saw in um, when we up the, when we imported the spreadsheet. Yeah, you see here, first name, last name, company name, and then the telephone. Yep, now I'm not going to import this again because we've already imported these contacts. But this is how you import your contacts. Okay. <clears throat> now, a few tips on your database. Yes, yeah, very important. Are you sure you want to exit this? Okay. Yeah, so you may build up a list of a couple of hundred contacts in your um, in your MailChimp, and that is fantastic. Yeah, the bigger your list, the more value that you will get from it. A very important aspect of this is to make sure that your database is clean. Yeah, people may ask to be removed from your database. People change businesses. Yeah, make sure your database is clean. When you run a campaign and you use your email list and there are a lot of emails that cannot be sent because there are a lot of wrong emails in your list, yeah, you will have what we call a high bounce rate. And if you have a continuous high bounce rate, MailChimp may come back to you and say, hey, why do you have such a high bound rate? And if you can't explain why you have a high bound rate, MailChimp may actually block your account. Because MailChimp wants you to work with a clean database. That is also the risk if you buy an email list that you don't know the source from. And if you import it and then run your first campaign, if you get a whole lot of bounces, on your emails, yeah, then uh, MailChimp may block your account. So be very careful. Make sure that your emails are correct, that your bounce rate is low, and never buy email lists because you don't know what the quality is of the list. Make sure that you segment your mailing list. And then you can, within one mailing list, you can send it to your different segments. Could be customers, could be prospects, could be uh, suppliers um, or what have you. Yeah, constantly work on growing your database. Make sure you don't spam people. Always get um, people's um, approval. Yeah, that they are happy for you to send them uh, emails and of course, Honor unsubscribes as well. If people ask you to unsubscribe them from the mailing list, make sure you do that. Okay, just a few tips when it comes to managing your database. So, now that you have your email audience set up, your contacts set up, let's look at a campaign. Let's, when you go into the campaigns, here you have an overview of all the campaigns that you've run. Now, we haven't run any campaigns. Here is a draft campaign. Yeah, but what you're gonna do, you're going to create a campaign. Yes, when you click here on the top right on the Create Campaign button, <coughs> you have then the different types of campaigns that you can, or can create. You can do a regular email, you can actually create a landing page, or you can also create an embedded form yeah, that helps you in capturing context. That could be part of your landing page campaign. But what we're going to look at is regular emails. Yeah, so when I click on email, I can just sign, click here, design email. Yeah, then there is a new email builder that you can use. And since you're probably new to uh, Simply Learn um, and new to, um, uh, to MailChimp, I click straight onto the new builder because that is a lot easier to work with. Yeah, so here you see it's time to design your email. Yeah, I put this little icon already in yesterday. Yeah, so there's different ways of doing that. Here you see 
sort of your editor for your email. Here you can preview the email. Here you see your editing building blocks, the layout, the heading, paragraph, button, etc. Here you can specify styles and here you can specify templates for your emails. So here you see a whole range of email templates. Yeah, if you click on the creative assistant, that is beautiful, but it will drive you to a premium account. Yeah, so I'm not going to show that. I want to show you the free features of MailChimp. So let's say we're going to go for a little design here. We're going to go for this one. We could do preview. That's how it will look like. Yeah, and then we're going to click apply. Continue with start with a clean template. Yes, yeah, so this is how it will look like. So what you can then do, start optimizing the text and the images. So let's do that. So here, view this email in your browser. That is always good to have. You can change your image. Yes, yeah, so if I click on that, yeah, you see here, replace logo. Yeah, so if I click on replace logo, I can then go to uh, the content studio and I can just upload different files here. And this is the image that I picked. Yeah, so let's stick with this particular image. Here then I can add a photo. So I can say add a photo. I can say upload an image. Yeah, so if I go to my YouTube, I go to... Uh, thought I had a, an image somewhere here, videos, banner. <clears throat> yeah, so here I've added a banner as an image. I can align it left, center, right, full. Yeah, I can just align it to the right. I can align it to the center, left. I'm going to do a full alignment, okay? And then here you see my text. It's time to design your email. So here I can say, um, welcome to this week's newsletter. In this newsletter, yep, so then and in this newsletter, we will be talking about, and then blah, 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 blah. Okay, then here you see a button. Yeah, and I've added that. I can then just click here first. I click done. Yep. So the buttons I can bring in here through my uh, my uh, build units. Yeah, and here I can change the button text. So I here is book now, for instance. So here I have my social media buttons. Yeah, and I can there put my own social media. Onto that, yeah, I can do the same with my Instagram. And I can do the same for my Twitter. I can add another social link. I'm going to leave it at like that. Here's my logo again. Then here, this will be picked up automatically. Every email will at the bottom have details about your company, about your address, how can people unsubscribe. Yeah, and because you're using the free version, there is this item, grow your business with MailChimp. Yeah, that is a little bit of MailChimp branding that will be added to your email if you're using the free version. So keep that in mind. Okay, so then you click preview. This is how your email will look like. Yep, and then you're going to exit preview mode. And if you're happy with this, you're going to save and exit. Now, here you kind of have your admin screen for your campaign. Yeah, so you see here the name. So I need to type in the name. So I'm going to name it is MailChimp Demo, for instance. And I'm clicking save. Then here I have selected all the contacts. 
So I can just go to my audience. I pick the audience that I've created. I can then have all my subscribers or I can pick certain segments or tags in my subscriber base. I can personalize the two fields. Yeah, and then I click save. Here is the from. So that is, it's from me, or you can edit that, have it present from somebody else. You can add a subject. Now your subject line, of course, is very important in email marketing. Because in the subject line, people will, when they read the subject line, people will decide whether or not they will open the email. Yeah, so the subject line always has to be catchy. So, and it could be five reasons why you should read our latest email uh, newsletter. Newsletter. Yeah, or any other subject line. But they are, they need to be short and sweet. Yeah, you could use emojis. You need to, in that one line, you need to give people the reason why they should open this email. Preview text appears in the inbox after the subject line. Yeah, so in today's newsletter, we will talk about social media and email marketing for instance and you click save <coughs> so that is your subject that is your content yep and then here is part of your contact you can send yourself a test email that is always useful to send it to yourself and check it on your desktop and check it on your mobile so I send myself a test email, send a test to any email. Yeah, so let me quickly check here my Gmail. That is uh, to me. That is tube for Mark. Okay, so I'm going to send that email to tube for Mark. Okay, I can send it to multiple people and I'm going to click send test. Email has been sent. Yeah, so let's check the email. <clears throat> so here we see the email. Test five reasons why you should read our latest newsletter. And then here you see the email and then you check it on typos. You check it on the links that are in there. Yeah, make sure that your social media buttons work, etc. And if you're then happy with your email, you can then publish it. Yeah, and there's two ways of publishing it. You can schedule it. When you schedule it, you can set a delivery date and a specific delivery time. But in order to use that feature, you need to upgrade to premium. Okay, so you can send it directly. So when you click send, it will go straight away. Yep, so very important. Or you can say finish later. If you don't want to share your campaign, you see here the link for the campaign. Yeah, and you could change that. Your default campaign URL, yeah, so MailChimp, generate randomly five reasons why you should read our email. If you upgrade to premium, you can turn this MailChimp into your uh, own URL. Okay, good. And then you can track your, uh, your, campaign, your email campaigns, but um, we'll, put, they will use, we'll cover that in a, in a, in a next video on, uh, on MailChimp when we go into more advanced features. Okay, so I'm just gonna click finish later. And if we're now having our list of campaigns, then here you see we have our MailChimp demo as a draft ready to be published. So that is the, so that is the campaign, how to create a campaign on MailChimp. Right, now let's have a look at a few more things. So first of all, a new feature in MailChimp 
is the analytics. When you send out an email campaign, you will get basic analytics here in your um, campaigns dashboard as well. But MailChimp now also has an analytics dashboard. <clears throat> and here you see the type of data that you will get in MailChimp. And it is using sample data so we can explore the dashboard. So here you see number of emails sent, whether it's up or down. You see the number of people or the percentage of people that opened the email. And very important, the actual percentage of people that clicked on the email or clicked on the link in the email. And that is very important. Yeah, so that's where you can really follow through on your email campaigns yeah, on who opened it, who clicked it to the form differences that needed to be filled in. So very useful information that you can get out of your campaign. And you can see that from various periods. Yeah, you can even actually in the other reports, you can actually see who are the people in my uh, mailing list in my audience who actually clicked on the email and who are the people who opened the uh, clicked on the link yeah, and then you can approach them separately yeah so here you see engagement email sent and the mm -hmm. click rate yep so here you see by email the, the number of recipients, the open rate, the click rate, the revenue that you made, if you had that set up. So lots of data that you can get on your email campaigns. Open rates are very important and they differ by industry. Yeah, and general and open rate, uh, anywhere between up to 15% and higher are usually good open rates. Okay, so that is the analytics that you can get. And then finally, what I really like in MailChimp is that you can use MailChimp to create landing pages. So if I'm going back to my campaigns <clears throat> and I'm going to click create campaign, then I can also decide to create a landing page. Name of the landing page is Myco. Select an audience, Myco, and I'm going to click Begin. Yeah, and here you see a number of templates that I can use for my landing page. Yeah, so very simple templates. So let's take this template, accept. I'm going into the editor. Yeah, so here is the editor for the landing pages. I can add text, I can do box text, I can add dividers, images, I can change the text. Yeah, you see here bandmates. Yeah, that is the logo. I can change the logo. Yeah, so I can replace the logo and I can uh, edit the logo and what have you. I'm just going to stick with this text for the time being. And here is my email address form yeah and the beauty about it when people fill in their email address in this form it will automatically be added to my mailing list in mailchimp so that is a very powerful feature i can also create this as a separate form okay so so here you see the available fields that I have, email, I can add first name if I want to. Yeah, I can add last name and I can add phone number as well. Yep, I can then go to the settings. I can do the style, different styles that I can have. So this is my sign up form. Yeah, the button text is subscribe. I can then also send visitors to a confirmation message. I can Preview the confirmation message. Success, you've been added to the audience. Yeah, exit preview. Yep, and that is my sign-up form. And again, it will automatically be added to my campaign uh, email list. And I click save and close. 
Yep, and here is the full campaign. Yeah, and when I'm happy with it, I can click save and close. So here is my landing page. And it's now, here I have the page title and site icon. Here's the social share preview. Here is the URL of my, my landing page. Here is the content. And I can then get my finish it later or I can publish it. And as soon as I publish it, this URL will be live. Yeah, so click publish. So this landing page is now live. So if I now go to this landing page. Yeah, so here you see email address. I'm saying um, cherry. Oh, <clears throat> cherry at henry.com. And that is Cherry Henry, and I say subscribe. So now let's check the litmus test. If I go to my contacts, and I'm going to all my contacts, and here we have Cherry Henry, the famous Arsenal football player who has just joined my mailing list. So that is the power of MailChimp. Imagine it's the year 2004. This is Phil. Phil's looking to release a book and set up a blog. He's sure that it'd be successful, but he's only worried about one thing. He doesn't know how to ensure that his book reaches the right target audience who could enjoy his book. During that period of time, however, there were only a few forms of advertisement available, like print ads, billboards, radio, direct mail, direct sales, and the television. All of these options were pretty expensive. Their effectiveness couldn't be accurately determined, and they didn't let him advertise his content to the appropriate audience. Phil's book would never find the audience it deserved. Now, let's have a look at the same scenario in the present day. Alongside traditional forms of advertising, Phil would have access to digital marketing, a form of marketing that's a lot more lucrative, inexpensive, and configurable. Marketing that would enable marketers to advertise their audience digitally using channels like search engines, websites, social media platforms, emails, etc. Among these types, social media marketing caught Phil's eye. Social media marketing would give Phil the opportunity to take advantage of social media platforms to advertise his content to a highly targeted audience. It would help more people learn about his book, increase the interaction with his audience. It's relatively inexpensive, unless he goes into advertising, and will help him get marketplace insights that might help in understanding his audience preferences better. Phil started by taking up a certification to learn about social media marketing. Since he was already familiar with the concept of social media marketing, his next step was to learn about the different types of content he could post on social media. Some of the most common forms of content that Phil could post would be images, text posts, polls, and videos. But over time, Phil began to notice that not a lot of people were being exposed to his content. Phil needed to advertise his content. For that, he would need to use the advertising options provided by the social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Most advertising platforms offer users with a number of different options like image ads. These ads involve the use of single or multiple images that are attractive and have the optimal amount of text. They also have a call to action that encourages user interaction. Phil could use images from his book, advertise websites that sell his book, and more. Then there are text and post ads. These ads could advertise posts or excerpts from Phil's blog or his book, further garnering interest from an interesting audience. He could also use video ads. Phil could use video ads that feature favorable reviews and customer testimonials to advertise his books. Phil could also use lead ads, through which he could collect information from users who are interested in a weekly newsletter or regular updates from his blog. But that wasn't the only thing Phil could do with social media platforms. He could create a brand for himself and drive audience interest to it. Engage with them, create an identity, engage with content, finding content that works for him. Social media platforms also allowed him the opportunity to target audiences based on demographics like their age, location, gender, and much more. 
And in time, Phil began to see an increase in the number of viewers coming to his social media page and by extension, his blog. He also saw an increase in the number of people who bought his book, greatly increasing his audience. Here are some things he learned. One, to set goals that were quantitative, smart, and follow a constant deadline. Two, to understand his audience by engaging and connecting with them. Three, to set up a social media calendar to plan competitions, polls, surveys, videos, and more. Four, using tools like BuzzSumo, IFTTT, Buffer, and more for lead generation, creating email lists, setting buyer personas, and more. Five, to perform visual storytelling with the help of images and videos. But how did Phil get so good at social media marketing? Before we find the answer to that question, let's have a look at a quiz. What can you do with social media marketing? A. Create a brand for yourself. B. Engage with an audience. C. Target users based on demographics. D. All of the above. Choose the right answer and have a chance to win an Amazon voucher. Now back to our question. How did Phil get so good at social media marketing? Phil had taken up Simply Learn's digital marketing course. It was thanks to this course that Phil had the skills and training to get good at social media marketing. And now, you can too, by clicking on the top right corner. And with that, we've given you an introduction to all the major concepts of social media marketing. What social media marketing actually means? What is it? Yeah, and we got to put this in the context of the definition of marketing. Yeah, I studied marketing in the very early days in the 80s and um, my main sort of uh, guru in marketing was Philip Kotler. And over the years marketing has sort of developed from traditional marketing to online marketing, but the basic concept has not changed. If you look at the definition of marketing, it's the activity of creating, communicating, delivering and exchanging offerings that have value for customers. Yeah, so you supply, you deliver, you exchange products or services that have a value for your customers. So two very important aspects here. There is value and there is customer. And that is what we capture in the marketing concept. You put the customer at the core of what you do. Yeah, because when you do that, you automatically will look at what value are we giving to the customer. Yep, so take social media marketing in that context. Then the second part of the social media marketing sort of term is the word social media. What is social media? When I explain social media, I'm using the three C's, the three C's of social media marketing. And they are content, their community, and campaigns. Content is the fuel of your social media. Content is the, um, the currency of social media. If you have really good content that you can share on the internet, yeah, using various multiple, multiple social media channels like Facebook, like YouTube, or like video, or like Instagram, or blogging, you name it, yeah, people will engage with your content. And then when people start engaging with your content, they may come back for more content that you supply and they will then become part of your community. So community is a very important aspect of your social media definition. With really good content you can create communities and then you can push that process by running campaigns. Yeah, And a campaign makes it relevant for businesses. Because when you run a campaign, you have a goal for your campaign, you have an objective, you have a start date, you have an end date. Yep, and that is what social media marketing is. It's all about running campaigns to develop your communities with really exciting content. 
And then you put it into the marketing context, you do that, it is a customer at, in the core of what you do. Yes, yeah, so if I then take that to a definition of social media marketing, is very basic, it says the use of social media to develop a company's brand, increase website traffic and boost sales. That is what we call social media marketing. Yeah, the most important aspect here is that you need to have an outcome. You need to have a result which is customer related. And that is where the sales element comes in. You do this to get the customer to do something. And in the end, that is buying your product or your service. Yeah, so social media marketing is not the tactical combination of your social media networks yeah, to, um, to reach as many people. There needs to be a goal to it. And when we talk about marketing, it comes down to selling your product or service with a value. Yeah, so that is the um, kind of the call to action, as it were, that comes out of your social media marketing. So keep that in mind. Everything you do with your social media marketing in the end comes down to reaching your goals or achieving your objectives of developing your company's brand, increasing website traffic or growing your sales. Now, a big benefit that you're getting these days in digital marketing and social media marketing is data, is intelligence, is knowledge. In the early days of marketing, the biggest problem has always been how to measure the success of your marketing campaigns. If I ran adverts in a magazine, how do I measure the effectiveness? If I do a PR campaign and uh, they write about me in a newspaper, how do I measure the effectiveness of that? How can I track that when somebody buys a product, it actually is as a result of the PR campaign that I ran? So in the early pre-internet days, yeah, we, the only way to measure customer engagement, as it were, were through loyalty cards or credit cards. Yeah, with a loyalty card, you had some basic customer data through credit cards, you could track transactions. But it's very difficult to relate that to your marketing. Then the internet emerged and all of a sudden I could track traffic to my website. Yeah, I could see how many people visit my website. Are these people that visit my website for the first time? Are they returning visitors? What are the most popular pages that they see? How long do they stay on my website? And are they actually buying my products? Yeah, so that was a major advancement of marketing in the early 2000s. And then when social media emerged, it all of a sudden became possible to measure engagement. How many people are having conversations with us? I could even measure sentiments. Are people positive about my brand? Are they negative about my brands? I could track the effectiveness of my marketing campaigns. I could measure the effectiveness of my advertising campaigns that I ran online. So today's reality is that we can measure everything. We can measure clicks, we can measure transactions, we can measure engagements, we can measure return on investments. Yep, and we can now even take that a step further through artificial intelligence that we can actually start making predictions how people may respond to campaigns that we're going to be running. Now, having learned about these sort of fundamentals of social media marketing, let's now have a look at how do you put together your social media marketing strategy? How do you set it up? How do you develop it? Now, with my over 40 years of experience in marketing, digital marketing and social media, I developed a simple five-step 
methodology to set your business or to set up yourself for social media. And it's called FLIRT. Yeah, and FLIRT is an acronym. FLIRT, the first letter, the F, is for focus. Yeah, and in the focus phase, what you do, you look at various things. The first thing you do in developing your social media marketing strategy is look at what is your niche. What market are you targeting? And the more you focus in your market, your targeting, your niche, the easier it will be to reach them. Yes, so it's very important that you focus on a very particular niche. Once you've identified that niche, you look at your positioning. Why should they buy from you? What is your unique value proposition? Remember the definition of marketing. Yeah, the value for your customer is key in this. And you put it in what we call a positioning statement. You also look at your customers. You create customer personas where you look at your customers and you kind of map their interests, their uh, pain points, the typical questions that they would ask. So you get a good understanding of your, um, your customers. Yes, yeah, so you look at your niche, you look at your positioning, you look at your focus, or sorry, you look at your customers. Yep, and then you're going to ask yourself, why am I going to use social media? Yeah, am I going to use it to build awareness? Am I going to use it to drive traffic to my website? Am I going to use it to generate sales? Am I going to use it to improve customer service? Am I going to use it to recruit new staff? Am I going to use it to communicate with my, um, my employees? Yeah, so lots of reasons why you could use social media and it's your challenge to identify one or two objectives for your social media. And then a very important aspect of your social media marketing strategy, even your overall digital marketing strategy, what are the keywords that you will be focusing on? In other words, what are the keywords that you want to be recognize, recognized for? Google wants to know, Facebook wants to know, LinkedIn wants to know, and it's all about repetition. The more often you use those keywords, the more those social media platforms and Google will associate you with those keywords. When people search for them, they will then show you higher up in the search results. We call this search engine optimization or search engine marketing. Yeah, so keywords is like a whole course in itself, but it's very important part of your social media marketing strategy in the focus phase. So that is the F for focus. Think about your niche, your positioning, who is your customers, why are you on social media, and what are your main keywords. The next is the L for listen. Listen is so important. Yeah, we tend to talk too much. Yeah, where social media can give you fantastic listening opportunities. And when I say listen, I mean read articles online, listen on Facebook and on Twitter, on LinkedIn, listen on Google, yeah? watch videos, listen to podcasts. There's dozens of ways that you can listen online. Because when you listen, you learn, and when you learn, you get better and you develop. So, what does that mean from you? Some practical tips when it comes to listening. First, you need to listen to where your customers hang out. 
are your customers on Facebook? Are they on Twitter? Are they on LinkedIn? And later in this session, when we go through the various social media platforms, I'll give you an overview of what type of people are on the various social media platforms. The next thing that you want to know when you listen is who are your top 10 bloggers or influencers in your niche? Do you know your top 10 bloggers? Do you know your top Instagram influencers? Because you want to learn from them, but you may also want to build relation with them, to use them in your marketing outreach. You also want to look at the trends in your niche. Google Trends is a really useful tool that you can check to find out what are the trends in your niche. And you're looking at your competitors and your customers. What are they doing? What are they talking about? Yes, yeah, so a very important stage. And if you're doing it properly, you would actually set up a social media listening dashboard where you bring all your listening channels together in one dashboard. And then instead of having to go to all those social media networks or websites, you let them come to you. InnoReader is a very good dashboard, online dashboard, a free dashboard that you can use for this. We're then looking at the I for integration. Yeah, so you know your strategy, you know where your customers are, you know which social media networks you're going to focus on, then you're going to integrate them. You're going to set up your social media networks, you're going to make sure the branding and the profiles are consistent, you're using your keywords, you're going to create your content calendar, and you're going to set up your blog. Blogging is very important in social media marketing because it is the easiest way to start creating content on your website and to start sharing that content through your social media channels that will then drive people back to your website. Yes, so that is part of the integration stage. And then once you've got that all set up, you're then going to reach out. It's very important that you reach out, because if you're not reaching out, then people won't find you, people won't see you. Yeah, the whole essence of social media marketing is that you create as many touch points as possible on the internet for people to find you, yeah, where they start engaging with your content, going back to your website, want to know more about you, want to know more about your content, and you start building a relationship that may then turn into a sale. So reaching out, you're going to start sharing your content, you're going to repurpose your content, so turn your blog post into a video or into a carousel, or turn your video into a podcast or what have you. Yeah, you're going to share other people's content. There's nothing wrong with sharing content from other people. And you're going to run campaigns. Campaigns to push your content in the channels. Yeah, and campaigns nowadays are no longer sort of just posts on social media. It is a combination of organic posts yeah, where you just share your posts on social media, it could be paid, like pay-per-click advertising, or it could be influencer marketing style, um, re reaching out. Yeah, so very important is the reaching out stage. And then, of course, tracking is the icing on the cake, as it were. When you track, you measure your online reputation, you measure your conversions, you measure your social media activity and engagement, you're meshing your ROI, and you plan for your next quarter. Okay, time to talk about the social media marketing platforms. Let's have a look at some of the most relevant ones out there. Now, but before that, let's make sure that you understand the essence of the social media marketing platforms. How do they work? Very simple, they all work according to the same concept. What you do, you create an account on the social platform, like Facebook for instance, you fill in your profile, 
on Facebook you put in a lot of data about yourself, on Twitter a little. Yeah, so you fill in your profile and once your profile is ready, you're going to connect with friends or follow and be followed. Yeah, some platforms, when you send somebody a connection request or a friend request, request when they accept, you're mutually connected, like Facebook and like LinkedIn. Other platforms like Twitter and like Instagram, when you follow somebody, doesn't mean that that person follows you. Yeah, so we're talking about followers and following, as it were. Yep, and then when you've got that, you're going to start sharing updates. And you're going to check your newsfeed where you will see the updates from your friends. Now, as a business, every platform enables you to create a Facebook page or to create a page. Yeah, and what you want to do, you create your page, you put in your company information, you brand it to your company branding guidelines, and then you get people to follow or like your Facebook page or your LinkedIn page. Yep, and then you start sharing updates. And people that liked your page, they may see your company updates in their feeds. And this is what we call organic reach. So you do a post as a business and then the people that follow you will see your posts on their personal newsfeed. Now in the early days of social media, this organic reach could be 40 to 50%. Which means that if you have 10,000 followers on Facebook, so 10,000 people liked your Facebook page, 5,000 of those people would see your update on their personal newsfeed, which is fantastic. And that was in the early days for social media. Many brands, they spent lots of marketing, building huge communities, because it was a fantastic free way of reaching out to your market. Nowadays, things have changed. Facebook has been driving this. Yep. Facebook wants you to advertise on Facebook. All these social media and platforms, they have to make money. So they have advertising sort of on their platform and they want you to use advertising. So over the years, Facebook has lowered organic reach to less than 3%. So again, if you have 10,000 people that liked your Facebook page, fewer than 300 people may see your updates in their feed. And Facebook says, hey, that's the way it is. We offer you a fantastic marketing environment and we need to make money as well. So, hey, yeah, start advertise on Facebook to reach your entire audience. And businesses now understand that. They now know that social media is pay to play. To reach your audience, it's no longer relying on organic reach. You have to pay to use pay-per-click advertising or PPC. But we're going to talk about that in the next videos. All right, so it's very important that you understand this concept of how social media marketing platforms work. So let's start with the first one, the biggest one, Facebook, with 1.9 billion active users worldwide. Fact is that over the years, the younger generation has left Facebook. Yeah, why have they left Facebook? Because it's not cool anymore. Yeah, and their parents are on it. Yeah, so if you want to reach the young teens, early, late teens, early 20s, don't go to Facebook. You want to be on social networks like Snapchat or TikTok if that's available in your market. Now, there's still markets where Facebook is enormous. Yes, yeah, so they are the leading social media network in your market. If that is the case, then of course you have to be on Facebook. But in general, we can say that the audience for Facebook is now a slightly older audience, Generation X or Millennials. It's still a really good network to reach these people particularly when you talk about consumer-type products. 
Now, what does Facebook offer you as a business to use? Facebook has the Facebook page that you can create to reach your audience. Nowadays, Facebook really would like you to use Facebook groups. Facebook groups is a fantastic area in Facebook where you can get really good engagement. And as a business, you can offer a group to your customers as a VIP area or a product knowledge area or a pre-launch area or just for your customers. Yeah, lots of reasons, lots of areas where you can use a group to reach your customers. Then there's Facebook Messenger, of course, that you can use for your business where you can set up bots. Yeah, so you can have sort of automated conversations with your customers on Facebook Messenger. And there is Facebook Live. Don't ignore Facebook Live. Facebook loves you to use Facebook Live. The beauty about using the Facebook Live, it gives you sort of buzz and engagement before the event, during the event and after the event. Yeah, we call this tent pole marketing. You can build up excitement leading up to the event and after the event as well. And then finally, of course, Facebook is betting heavily on the metaverse. Yes, so it's Mark Zuckerberg's vision that instead of engaging with your friends in the news feed, you engage with them in a virtual world. Now, the verdict is out if this is going to work, but fact is that although we've been talking about virtual and augmented reality for years, it is here now. Yeah, there's more and more apps becoming available on your mobile, on your desktop that use augmented reality and virtual reality. I can now download IKEA Place, I think it's called, where you just open up the app, you pick a product from the catalog, like a table, and then you can just position that table in your living room. Yeah, and then you can move it, change the color of it or whatever, yeah, using augmented reality through your, um, your camera. Okay, so that is Facebook. Let's look at the next one, Instagram. I love Instagram. Yeah, a lot of users from Facebook have gone to Instagram. Why? Because it is a visual social media platform and it has inherently higher engagement than Facebook. It's easier to reach the audience, not just your friends. Yeah, so lots of cool features in Instagram. One of the coolest features is the Instagram stories. Yep, and people now spend more time on the stories than on the, uh, the timeline where they see the posts. So Instagram started as a photo sharing app. Very simple, yeah, you made a photo, you put a filter on top of it, which almost felt like you're a photographer and then you share it with hashtags. And you saw immediately the likes coming in and people loved it for its simplicity. And now it has grown to a fully featured social media network that businesses can use to make their brand come to life via photos and via stories. The audience is slightly younger than the Facebook um, audience, but a more and more mature audience is coming on there as well. And it's, it, initially it had very much a business to consumer focus, but nowadays it's not just photos that you can share, you can share visuals. I can turn a blog post into a carousel of five visuals Yep, and um, in that way share really good content. So very powerful and very useful for businesses to reach the audience that hangs out on, uh, on Instagram. All right, so that is Instagram. Let's look at the next one and that is YouTube. Now, YouTube of course is not just for watching video. YouTube is a fantastic social media platform to build an audience of followers. Yeah, it's a great platform to monetize your video as well by enabling advertising 
to be shown before or during your videos. A lot of video creators, they do that. Yeah, and uh, YouTube has a program for that. If you qualify by um, number of views that you have on your video and number of, uh, and, the, and the size of your audience, you can participate in this program. And it is a really good way to make money on you, uh, for many content creators. Now check out, our earlier, check out our earlier video on how to create a YouTube channel to find out how you can set up a YouTube channel and how you can use YouTube as a social media platform. YouTube is great for brand awareness and since it's owned by Google, it's also really helpful for your search rankings, both on YouTube and on Google. Google. And there's lots of different videos, of course, that you can make. Yeah, videos that do well are typical videos like how-to videos, unpacking videos, vlogs, video blogs we call them, review videos, live videos, lots and lots of ways to reach the video, your audience yeah, on, um, with video on YouTube. So the typical audience that uses YouTube are basically everybody from young too old, but very important to understand with YouTube that people are there for a reason. They search for something. They may search for entertainment. They may also search for answers to their questions, which is different than the videos you would have on uh, Facebook, for instance. Yeah, so Facebook is very good for brand awareness, where YouTube videos are very good for, um, for lead generation, for instance, and for building relationship with your, uh, your audience. Good, a very interesting social media platform that emerged around 10 years ago is Snapchat. They have around 300 plus million daily active users. And let me tell you a bit about the history of uh, Snapchat. Snapchat was a response to Facebook's problems about 10 years ago in privacy and um, not being cool anymore. And particularly the privacy issue where in those days a lot of people said, who is owning my photos on, uh, on Facebook? Yeah, um, is it Facebook or is it myself? So a lot of people, and that there's always been a gray area. Yeah, combined with Facebook not being cool anymore, and you know how important being cool is for the younger generation. Yep, so, face, uh, so two guys who came up with the idea of doing something radically different. And they came up with a social media platform, Snapchat, where posts would delete themselves within 24 hours. They built a, an, a user interface around this, which was fairly difficult to use. Yeah, but that was for a reason. Kids, they love to explain to each other how it works. And if it's complicated enough, then their parents won't be able to get on it. Yeah, so kids love that idea. It's too complicated to use for my parents. So I really have my own social media world yeah, in Snapchat that nobody else has access to. So particularly the teens, the Generation Z yeah, was very uh, keen and they were very hot on, the, uh, on, on Snapchat. So it was the new place for Facebook users to go to. And they grew ever since steadily. Not huge, but they are there and they are a very powerful social network, particularly when you want to target the younger generation. Now, there are two major features that they sort of drove into social media land, which was the stories and second, the vertical videos. So you all know the concept of the story, it self-deletes in 24 hours, but it turned um, social media, instead of sort of scrolling through your newsfeed, you swipe from story to story. 
much more visual, much more fun, much more engaging. Yep, and you would swipe those stories vertically and that automatically led to using vertical video. And vertical video is a major trend in social media content, yeah, which is picked up by, um, by TikTok as the main format for, uh, for videos on TikTok. YouTube have shorts, so all social media now networks, they now have stories and they have vertical video as a key element. Yeah, so vertical video, particularly for short 10, 12 second videos, which we call snackable content, is very important. Why would you tilt your phone to watch a video? Why not just use it vertical? Which is also a quite an interesting um, sort of form factor to get a, a good engagement on your videos. Finally, Snapchat has very innovative advertising features. Yeah, they have lenses, they have stories, they have filters. You can put a filter over your face. BMW had a really good campaign to launch a new car where you could place the car through a lens anywhere that you liked in augmented reality and you could actually put a filter where you gave yourself a golden face. Yeah, so very powerful advertising. I think the, the WhatsApp advertising platforms is one of the best advertising platforms out there. It's also probably one of the most expensive um, advertising platforms of all social media networks. Right, so let's look at Twitter. I call Twitter SMS on steroids. Yeah, it was one of the first, besides Facebook, one of the first social media platforms that came out. And it was a very exciting platform when it launched. And Twitter relied heavily on celebs, celebrities using it to drive acceptance on a global scale. Yep, and many music stars, rock stars, actors, they started using Twitter and that drove the global adoption of the, uh, the platform. Now, what makes Twitter so powerful? There are three aspects on Twitter. First of all, you can retweet a tweet. Yeah, so when you send a tweet and I follow you, I receive your tweet. If I just click on retweet, it'll go to all my followers. Yeah, if somebody in my follower base retweets that tweet, your tweet can go viral without, uh, in, 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 in minutes. Yep, and there's various examples of tweets that went viral um, within minutes, yeah, like the, um, uh, which was it, a selfie tweet during the Oscar ceremony a few years ago. Yes, so it is, um, so the retweeting is very powerful. It also makes it instant. Yeah, because of this retweeting aspect, news f goes on, in, uh, on Twitter instantly and it shares to a global audience instantly. So that makes it very, very powerful for news agencies as well. And for businesses, a very powerful feature of Twitter is the Twitter search. Each tweet is indexed and you can search in all the tweets. You can search for the very first tweet that was ever sent. Yeah, so that makes it very powerful for brands to find content. So Twitter is really good for finding jobs, for instance, because lots of businesses, they tweet about, I'm looking for a marketing manager or a web developer. So if I search for web developer hashtag jobs, that tweet will show up in my search results. One problem that Twitter had is that they did not keep up with the developments in social media platform functionality. Yeah, so most celebrities went to Instagram because Instagram was much more visual, much better place for celebrities to engage with their, um, their fans. So Twitter lagged behind and in the last few years it clearly repositioned itself. So it now is seen as a great way for businesses to use as a communication and service channel with their customers and for media companies to share the latest news. 
So if you want to find out what is happening in the world now, or what businesses are doing now, or if you have a problem with a product from a business, Twitter is the best place to be. And for you individual, as I always say, you don't need to be on Twitter to tweet, but you must be on Twitter to find great content, to search. Whether you want to search for jobs or whether you're searching for opportunities. If you're a photographer yeah, and you and in London, for instance, and you go to Twitter and you search for looking for wedding photographer, London, you get a list of tweets of people who are tweeting, I'm looking for a wedding photographer. Does anybody know anybody? Yeah, so extremely powerful to, uh, to use for lead generation. Right, so what about Pinterest? Pinterest is a visual bookmarking platform. It's very cool. The concept is simple. You see a photo on the website that you like. Yeah, what you can then do, you can pin that photo on Pinterest in a board. Yeah, and you're not copying the photo, you're just copying the link in your board. So by the doing that, you can build fantastic collections of visuals that you like and want to organize. So I bought a house in Marrakesh a number of years ago in Morocco and we needed to design the interior. So we had a board with Morocco design, we had a board with Morocco Riyadh, we had a board with um, a tiling and what have you. And we just built up a whole collection of ideas that we liked. And then we got the people that helped us in making the things that we wanted and we could just share them the links on Pinterest of the ideas that we had. Worked really well. Now, because you can save those boards, of course, you can then share them as well. Yeah, so everybody can access your boards, which means that it becomes a great tool for getting ideas and inspirations from boards from other people. So if you want ideas for home design or your wedding or fashion, Pinterest is a fantastic place to get inspiration. Another major benefit for businesses is that you can put your product catalog on Pinterest as visuals organized in boards. Yep, and then when people find those products on, in, on Pinterest and they click on them, it will take them to the catalog of your website where they can buy your product. So it's a great way to drive additional traffic to your website. If you want to see a good example for that, go to the IKEA UK um, Pinterest page and look at their boards. You see boards for small living room ideas, back to school, Christmas, holiday celebrations, and then you get lots of ideas with, um, for instance, for small living rooms. And then you click on some of the products that you see and that takes you to the page on the IKEA catalog website where you can buy the product. Now Pinterest is very popular amongst women, amongst millennials, and it also has very powerful advertising features. And then LinkedIn. LinkedIn is serious. Yeah, I call LinkedIn Facebook with a tie. Where Facebook is fun, LinkedIn is serious. In Facebook, you can get away with a funny profile photo. In LinkedIn, your photo needs to be professional. Now, if you go to linkedin.com forward slash sales forward slash SSI, you get your social selling index. And that is a score between 1 and 100 of how good you are on LinkedIn. And you will see in the score, in the summary, that are four components that contribute to your SSI score. Or four components that contribute to how well you do on LinkedIn. So those four are your profile, yeah, your activity level in connecting with people, how much content you share, and your activity level in building relationships with people. 
Yeah, so the better you do in those four areas, the higher your score. Your profile, of course, is very important. Make sure that your LinkedIn profile is as complete as possible. Now, LinkedIn's biggest challenge, as I mentioned earlier, is to get people to engage and share content. So how does LinkedIn make money? Very simple. There are four areas where they make money. First of all, they allow people to upgrade their LinkedIn account to a premium account where they get more features. There is a whole section in LinkedIn specifically for recruiters. Yeah, so a recruiting version of LinkedIn. There is a whole area for sales. We call this sales navigator. Yeah, if you run a sales team that use LinkedIn, of course, you want to keep the customer data. So you're getting a sort of customer relationship management system within LinkedIn when you sign up for Sales Navigator. And then there is LinkedIn advertising. LinkedIn, of course, is best for business to business and it's really good for developing your personal online profile. As long as you share content through publishing articles and sharing, uh, sharing posts. So I've been operational on LinkedIn from the very beginning and I shared lots and lots of content and articles on LinkedIn and I got lots of business coming in through LinkedIn. Yeah, we're talking about serious amounts of business that I did by being on LinkedIn. So you got to be on LinkedIn if you are in business. Right. Now, one thing that I will not talk about here is, uh, is TikTok. Yeah, we haven't got a slide for that, but bear in mind TikTok, although it's not available in India, um, TikTok is a very important social media network these days, which drives a whole new format of, uh, of, of engaging and communication. But more about that, that later. Now let's go into the social media marketing tips and tricks. Number one, set up your goals. Now, what good will your actions do if you don't have a goal in mind? The goal of your marketing strategy may be the driving force behind every decision that you make. And this is exactly why setting up goals is very important. Moreover, your marketing efforts have to align with the goals of the organization. And here are some things that you need to keep in mind while setting up your goals. First of all, your goals need to be quantitative. For example, you need to have 1,000 conversions by the end of the quarter, or 5,000 followers on Instagram by the end of the month, and so on. Number two, you need to stick to a consistent deadline. This gives weight for each of your options. And number three, make sure your goals are SMART. Now, SMART refers to specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. Now let's go to number four. Like I mentioned earlier, your goals need to be aligned with the marketing strategy. And alongside these goals, there also needs to be the North Star metric. Now, what is the North Star metric? Well, this represents a main goal or a fixed reference point to ensure that your team is on the right course. This North Star metric will also give your team clarity and focus. Now let's have a look at some popular North Stars. There's increased engagement, greater conversion rates, more leads generated, app downloads, and so on. Now let's go to number two, understanding your audience. Social media allows you to interact, engage, and build relationships with your audience. By understanding what they need, want, and desire, you can deliver content in a way that makes your product or service the answer that they're looking for. There are also other ways that you can understand them better. This could be surveys to determine the issues that bother them, the age demographics of their audience, by conversing with them in forums, responding to their comments and blogs and social media, taking up their feedbacks of suggestions into consideration and acting on them, and so on. Now, Here's an example of different channels and the audiences that use them. Now, 
Here, well, we've taken a personal example. Here is Simply Learn. Now, Simply Learn's audience is predominantly working professionals and graduates. Unacademy has high school graduates, and Baiju App has high school students as users. Now, let's go to number three, determining the right social media platform. Now, when performing social media marketing, choosing the right platform is really important. When selecting them, you need to ask questions like why you're using that particular platform, who you will reach with this platform, what content could work best on the platform, and is there any content that was unique to that platform? Like, for example, YouTube, and then there's the video. Answering these questions will help you zero in on a platform for you. Now, while there are several platforms available for you to choose from, let me tell you about some of the major ones. There's LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. Now let's talk about the purpose of each of these platforms. LinkedIn is a professional network that's best suited for B2B audiences. For Facebook, well, just about everyone has an account on it. Content that is related to news or entertainment usually finds success on Facebook. And then we have Instagram. Visual content works best on Instagram. Now, although it works well for static images and short form video, it doesn't really drive a lot of traffic to your website. And then finally, we have Pinterest. Pinterest is also limited to static images. However, it's highly effective at driving traffic to your blog. Now let's go to number four, setting up a social media calendar. A social media calendar demands the message you want to convey to your audience. It also consists of information regarding the different kinds of content that will go up on the social media platform. Let's have a look at some of the most popular types of posts on social media. First off, we have competitions. Now, I'm sure all of you have seen posts like tag a friend who does this or comment or like to win something and stuff like that. Competitions like these provide great opportunities for engagement with the audience, and they can be used to increase your followers to share your content. It could also be for them to create their own content along with the predefined hashtag. And competitions help grow your presence on social media. Then we have polls and surveys. Polls can help you if you need a collection that also encourages followers to take action and interact. Polls and surveys also provide opportunities through which you can learn from customers to understand what they like about the product or service or what they don't and to receive their feedback. And then we have videos and live streams. Although we'll be covering this in a little more detail further on, visual storytelling, along with videos and live streams, goes a long way to drive engagement among your audience. These will help get your followers' attention, increase trust and credibility, and have a high response rate and has so much more to offer. Livestream, with its live nature, and having a human face alongside your business humanizes your brand and, by extension, helps increase customer loyalty and trust. And then there is infographics, articles, and images. So social media calendars are successful because of their ability to increase collaboration within the team, help understand what works and what doesn't, and in distributing resources in an effective manner. Next up, we have number five, using social media marketing tools. Social media marketing tools align to the goals of your organization. With it, you can create high quality content, attract new potential customers, and drive engagement. And it also helps you with the planning process. You can plan, create, and schedule posts on your social calendar. Now, some of the more popular social media tools include Buffer, Hootsuite, BuzzSumo, IFTTT, and much more. Now, these tools also help with generating leads, creating email lists, finding a relevant audience to show your content, creating buyer personas, providing you insights on what works and what doesn't, and giving you templates for different kinds of posts. Now for number six, visual storytelling. 
Visual storytelling involves passing out a lot of information in the simplest of forms visually. Using pictures and videos, your followers are able to grasp the message quickly and remember it for a long time afterwards. Visual storytelling is also not limited by language barriers, and this helps it become interesting and entertaining to anyone watching. It can also help your audience stay interested and engaged, grab the attention of potential clients, and so much more. But it also has some other advantages. It helps you build a bond with your audience. Visual storytelling connects with your audience. Methods like live streaming help humanize your brand and help grow customer loyalty and trust. It has the audience quickly grasp the intended message thanks to its simple nature. And finally, most importantly, content like images and videos are what go viral. With visual storytelling, you increase the chance for your content to be seen by more potential customers. So have a look at some of our videos. So here's what is machine learning, data science in five minutes, and AI in five minutes. Now these are some of our most viewed videos on our channel, and now you know why, visual storytelling. If you guys are interested in watching these videos, you can check them out on our channel homepage. And we also have similar videos on blockchain, DevOps, and Six Sigma. But now back to the list. Let's go to number seven, paying for advertising. This is a method that helps you find a target and reach your audience with ease. It can greatly help with achieving your organization's marketing goal. And this can help you improve your reach and improve your brand's visibility. It's pay-per-click model and shows cost-effectiveness by providing great results and return on investment. It also helps improve targeting by letting you control who sees your ad. You get to choose from a number of different factors like interests, hobbies, personality types, alongside the basic user demographics like age, location, gender, and so on. Now, since most social media platforms have native analytics, you also get to assess and define the performance of your ad campaigns. Now, as great as it sounds, there are certain pitfalls that come along with peer advertising. First of all, your audience could get exposed to your post too many times and tune out your content, disregarding it in the process. Second, it could get really expensive for small businesses or startups to manage a campaign to its maximum effectiveness. Third, people could pass off your content as irrelevant or unimportant. You also have to deal with a lot of competition. Smaller companies with lesser budgets have more of an uphill battle to deal with than better funded organizations. Next, we have number eight, newsjacking. Newsjacking is a method that involves using current events to promote your own brand's products and services. Now, it's a popular method that's used to improve brand awareness. Newsjacking uses the popularity of current events and drives it to your brand. It helps shine a spotlight on your products. And it also helps you show off that you are up to date with current events in the industry and that your product is relevant. And by extension, it also improves engagement and website traffic. Now for number nine, A-B testing. A-B testing is a popular method for comparing copies, creatives, and CTAs, or call to actions, of the posts that you put on social media. Now, since audiences would react differently depending on the content, A-B testing helps determine which of the variants your audience engaged with the most. A-B testing can also be performed on variations of location, age, gender, education, your audience interests, and so on. And next up, number 10, community and influences. Joining communities helps your brand link up with like-minded people and other companies belonging to your niche. It'll also help you establish your brand as an authority within the industry. Actively participating in these communities can help create your own audience of potential brand advocates to group up with. 
And on the other hand, partnering up with influencers helps promote your products or services to a brand new audience. It helps provide an additional layer of authenticity in YouTube, which is also a social media platform if you didn't know. Here are some very, very popular influencers. We have Marcus Brownlee, Unbox Therapy, Mr. Who's the Boss, and Linus Tech Tips. Each of them with more than 4 million subscribers. And finally, we're at number 11, measuring and analyzing results. Accurately tracking and measuring your marketing efforts are an important part of the process. It ensures that you're making the most out of your campaigns. Now, it's really important that you find key metrics that are crucial for your brand. And these metrics can be tracked weekly, monthly, or on a quarterly basis. And based on these results, appropriate actions can be taken. So on Facebook, you could look out for reach and engagement. On Twitter, you could look out for impressions. Clicks and impressions and interactions on LinkedIn, and likes, comments, and mentions on Instagram, and engagements and impressions on Pinterest. Some of the most popular tools used for this purpose are Sprout Social, Buffer, Hootsuite, Google Analytics, and so on. Welcome to Simply Learn's YouTube channel. And in today's video, we are going to be talking about Facebook advertising. We're going to talk about how businesses use Facebook advertising, how the, what are the benefits they can get from it. We're gonna show you with a demo on how to set up your Facebook advertising. And we will close today's session with a few do's and don'ts of Facebook advertising. But before we go into that, Make sure that if you like today's video or if you like the Simply Learn channel, don't forget to subscribe to the channel below. And if you like the video, feel free to like it and share it with your friends. So let's get started. Today's world has changed dramatically when it comes to reaching your audiences. Fact is that everybody is trying to get the attention of the million of prospects out there in the market. Everybody is screaming, try my product, try my product or try my product. But most businesses, they now have to realize that today's customer has changed. Yeah, today's customer is looking for instant gratification. They want a product now wherever they are, whatever their device that they're using. Yeah, and they can, prop, uh, they can source their products from everywhere in the world. Yeah, but it is your challenge to make sure that when they are in the buying mode, that you are there to help them. It's a new economy out there. It's a service-driven economy. Look at products like Uber or um, Airbnb, where a whole new ecosystem has developed of people offering their products, their services to a global audience. In marketing terms, we're using a term called SOLOMO, standing for social, local, and mobile. Yeah, when you bring those three elements together of social media, local marketing and mobile marketing, you stand a really good chance to connect with your customers at the right time. Google has um, summarized this in what we call Google Moments. On average, people have a couple of hundred moments during a day where they grab their mobile phone to do a search on their mobile phone. They maybe want to buy something, they want to book something, they want to share something, they want to learn something. All those little moments are opportunities for you to connect with your customer or your prospect. And that's your opportunity, but that's also your challenge to make sure that you are there when your customers are having those moments, when they scream, I want your products. And there are plenty of channels that you can use to reach those customers. Yeah, we know about social media, we know about your website, there's things like influencer marketing, there's email marketing, and there's more and more competition out there that are trying to use those channels to reach your audience. But fact is, 
there is one channel that really stands out of all these channels and that is pay-per-click advertising. Pay-per-click advertising is a well-established part of what we call the digital marketing trifecta. And this trifecta consists, as the word tri says, of three components. Owned, paid and earned. Yes, so the owned is your own website, are your own social media profiles and your social media pages. But owned is no longer enough. You need to supplement your owned media with paid media. And this is what we call pay-per-click advertising. And then the third element of the digital marketing trifecta is what we call earned media. And earned media is where you can still use the powerful um, effects of public relations in an online world or where you can work with influencers yeah, to help you develop your online presence and connect with your audiences. But one of the best ways to start getting to your audiences is to use advertising. Yep, and there are various platforms for advertising. There is um, Google, yeah, there is Google search advertising, Google display advertising, and there is Facebook advertising. Now to put these two in the context, Google did about $210 billion of revenue in advertising in 2021. Facebook is about half of that, $115 billion in 2021. And the most powerful models for advertising are search ads and display ads. Yeah, so a search ad is in the Google search, which is what Google um, uh, offers. The display ads and video ads are offered by Google and by Facebook. And we call this pay-per-click advertising, which means you're not paying for showing your ad, but you're paying when people click on your ad. Okay, so let's have a look between uh, to this advertising in a bit more detail. Yeah, Facebook advertising was introduced on around uh, 2007. Yeah, so um, in 2007 it was launched by Facebook. Yep, so, but it has grown drastically since then. In 2011, ads were being shown in the news feed. Yeah, Google, uh, Facebook called it sponsored stories. In 2012, ads came on the mobile. Yeah, mobile ads are now considered the most powerful um, forms of pay-per-click advertising. In 2014, uh, Facebook introduced a three-level advertising structure, which was very much introduced by Google as well. Where you have campaigns, you have ad sets, and you have your ads. In when you go and set up, and you'll see that later, your, your ads in Facebook, you will have to go through these three ad elements, yeah, campaigns, ad sets, and ads, to set up your advertising on Facebook. In, 26, in, 26, sorry, in 2016, Facebook introduced chatbots and ads in Messenger, which became a whole new area for advertising for Facebook, yeah, connecting with um, customers on Facebook Messenger and offering that for advertising as well. And in 2018, there was a whole range of ad formats available on Facebook, from videos, stories, Messenger, carousel, slideshows, collections. So a whole range of ads to choose from when you start your face, setting up your Facebook ads. Now, what is the future? Yeah, what does the future hold for Facebook advertising? As you may have read um, that both Facebook and Google are having a lower revenue in their advertising. Given the whole world economic uh, situation, we're slowly moving towards a, a recession even. Yeah, Facebook and Google and Microsoft, all the big tech players, are feeling the impact in that. 
Yes, so that is one element. Now, one of the other reasons why Facebook's revenue has gone down in advertising is the tracking uh, capabilities. And um, a lot of businesses, they track people when they visit their website and then you can target them with ads. We call this retargeting in marketing terms. Now, Apple has announced um, earlier this year that on iOS, people can say, which is on the iPhone, people can decide to not being tracked. Yep, so that has put a whole sort of kind of a, um, a, 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 um, a, uh, a different set of um, dynamics in Facebook advertising on the iPhone. And it is not as effective as it was before that announcement from, um, from Apple. So the future of advertising is all about security, it's about privacy, and of course, in the end, it all comes down to how good are your ads? How, what is the quality of the content in your ads? Are you able to stand out from the crowd? Yeah, so those are the big challenges in Facebook advertising. Now, you have to be aware that Facebook advertising is completely different than Google search advertising. <clears throat> yeah, to put it into a context. Google search advertising is what we call intent-based. Yeah, so when I have a question, or I'm looking for something, or I need a plumber, I go to Google search, yeah, and I search for plumber near me, and Google will give me some ads with plumbers near me. That is not the way Facebook advertising works. Facebook advertising yeah, is not intent-based. It is basically, it is your challenge when you advertise on Facebook is to stop the user from browsing and click on your ad. So it's more interruptive. You need to make sure that they stop what they're doing, which is much more difficult. Yeah, so you'll see that Facebook is therefore slightly more challenging to actually generate leads, yeah, to get new customers. F Google advertising is much better for that. But Facebook advertising is much better to reach a global audience, very targeted, yeah, and work on awareness, developing your proposition, helping your prospects to go through the buying cycle. Yeah, so Facebook ads, they help spread product and brand awareness in the news feed or on Instagram or on Messenger to a very specific targeted audience. Now, another element which is important to understand when it comes to Facebook advertising is to do with organic reach. When I have a Facebook post and I do uh, oh, sorry, when I have a Facebook page and I do a post on my page, the people that will like my that have liked my page will see my post on their newsfeed. That's how the theory is. Yeah, of course, not everybody will see those posts because that wouldn't work because then you would get way too much advertising in your feed. Yeah, so Facebook is very selective in the number of posts from advertising from businesses, or sorry, yeah, from businesses that will show on your newsfeed. Yeah, and in fact, that percentage of people that will see your post, your business post, on their personal newsfeed is less than 3%. So again, if you have a Facebook page, let's say with 10,000 followers, and you do a post on your Facebook page, less than 300 people will see your post. Now, businesses are not happy with that. Yeah, they said, hey, Facebook, why are you doing that? I want to reach my entire audience. And Facebook says, well, hey, you, you still can, yeah, but it's gonna cost you some money. And Facebook says, you have to go and advertise on Facebook to reach your audiences. So businesses now understand that Facebook is what we call pay to play. You, to reach your audiences, you have to 
supplement your organic reach with advertising. And the beauty about Facebook advertising is that it is a fantastic way to reach your target audience. And that is the biggest benefit that Facebook advertising can give you. It's all about the targeting. There are so many targeting options in Facebook and I'll show you when we go into the short demo on how to set up your ads. So what are the reasons why businesses go into Facebook? Yeah, what are the reasons, what are the benefits that they will get from it? And the first big benefit that they get is that they get access to an audience which is out there. Yeah, and it is not just a small audience. We're talking about Facebook at, as of today as close to 3 billion active monthly users. That is a massive numbers and most of these people they check their profiles at least once daily so it is a huge audience to reach and there is no better social media network to reach a global audience than on facebook yeah so that is one of the reasons why you want to start advertising on facebook the second reason why you want to start advertising on facebook is that facebook gives you a fantastic platform to advertise your products to people based on their demographics, based on their interests, based on their location, based on their, um, their history of browsing, based on so many different segmentation factors. Which means that you can make sure that your ads reach the right audience which is a really good benefit that you will get from Facebook advertising. The next benefit that you get from Facebook advertising it is that it is very cost effective. Yeah, you can just start with a small budget, you can slowly increase your budget, you can relate your bu budget to the returns that you're getting from it, so it helps you spend less and achieve more. It is one of the advertising platforms with the highest return on investment of your, um, uh, on your money. So very cost effective to advertise on Facebook. Here are some other reasons why businesses use advertising on Facebook. It really helps them with increasing brand awareness. As I said earlier, the difference with Google search advertising Facebook is not intent based. People are not searching in Facebook looking for content which could include your ads. They are actually browsing on Facebook and it is your challenge yeah, to, um, to be creative enough to make them stop browsing and pay uh, attention to your ads. So it really helps in increasing brand awareness. It let, it's an opportunity for you to showcase your brand and to help them add value to their lives. So by doing that, you establish trust, you establish credibility, yeah, and you provide recall value for your brand. So it is all about taking the customer by the hand and helping them in going through the buying cycle. Yes, so when the buying cycle is about awareness, is about building interest, yeah, then building that trust that they then will turn into buying your product. The second big benefit that you're getting from Facebook is to target people that have already expressed an interest in your service. We call this retargeting. You may also have heard about pixel targeting or pixel marketing. It basically means that if somebody visits your website, yeah, you can then retarget those people with an ad. From a technical element, as a perspective, it means that you need to put, Facebook will give you a piece of code that you need to put on your website. 
And then as soon as somebody visits that website that triggers that code, it automatically connects with Facebook and then Facebook will capture that user data that you can then use to target them with a specific ad. So a big opportunity there for the retargeting, but things will be changing here in the near future. Yeah, Google has announced that by 2023, 24, it will stop enabling third parties to leave cookies on the um, on on, uh, on websites. Yeah, to target people. So that whole retargeting area will go and will undergo some big changes in the near future. And then, of course, Facebook advertising can really help you increase revenue. As I said earlier, it is a fantastic way to, to connect with people and take them by the hand through the buying cycle. You can educate your audiences about what your product has to offer. Yeah, and the more people know about your products, the more likely they are prepared to make a purchase and to share their experiences. So lots of benefits that you get now let's dive a bit deeper into this and let's look at the different type of ads that Facebook has available. So first, there is the single image ad. These are single ads, single image ads that have an option, uh, optional text on the top and a link description that links to your website and a call to action. That is very important to have a good call to action in your ad. The ad images, they need to be 1200 by 628 pixels. So that's where you have an opportunity in the visual to stand out in the newsfeed and make people stop and then click on the link as you see here, for instance, sign up. The next ads are the multi-product ads. They are usually carousels. So it enables you allow consumers to see all the products or the services that you have available. They're very efficient, they're very um, visual, and they have lots of creative options um, in them. So they're very popular and they're lots being, being used lots by, uh, by businesses. So that's your multi-product ads, usually via a carousel. Then, of course, you have your video ads. <coughs> now, video ads are 30 second to two minute ads and they are amongst Facebook's most engaging, most popular ads. They get about 10 to 30% more views than other ads and not only views, also engagement. Why? Because people love to engage with video. When you engage with video, you have the opportunity to touch emotions of people, which is much stronger in building trust, building relationships with your audience. And particularly video on mobile yeah, works really well. So it's a high growth area of video advertising and one area that you definitely need to look at if you want to be successful with Facebook advertising. Then you have the lead ads. Lead ads, they offer a slightly different way to advertise your products. They let you get usernames, emails, phone numbers, actually without leaving Facebook. Yeah, and that's what makes them really powerful. Within Facebook advertising, you can actually create a sign-up form. Or you could even drive them through Messenger and have a communication with them to get their details through a chatbot. So people don't leave Facebook. You do the whole process of lead generation and lead capture within Facebook and it can be easily synchronized with your existing CRM system. And then you have collection ads. Collection ads blend video and product catalog photos. So they um, are really good if you want to advertise multiple products at once. Yeah, if you want to do this. So collection ads work really well. Okay, 
So that's a short introduction of Facebook advertising, the benefits that you get, why people would use them, why businesses would use them, and the different type of ads. So in the next section, let's go and have a look at how do you create an ad? What are the steps to create a Facebook ad? So here you see I am on a Facebook page and this is the page for Riyadh Farasha, which is a, um, a hotel uh, in Marrakesh and I am the admin for this page. And what I'm going to show you on this page is how to access the advertising platform and how to set up your ads. Yeah, so let me first, before I do this, show you what Facebook is trying to do everywhere, whether it's your desktop or your mobile, to make sure that you go into advertise creation mode. Yeah, so you'll see it everywhere. Promote, ad center, create ads, create automated ads, boost post, Wherever you are, you will come to sections like boost, post or go, please create an ad. On the mobile, it's even more obvious. Yeah, here is the same page, but then on the mobile device. And if I scroll down, you see on the first post immediately boost the post. So you'll see that Facebook is trying everything to get you to advertise. Yeah, and I think it is a bit annoying, yeah, but it's also you need to be aware that all the various places that Facebook will try to, to hook you into advertising, they lead to various subsections of the advertising platform. Yeah, so if I click here on boost the post, it will take me to a, what I call a quick and dirty boost uh, advertising module. Yeah, so I say I'm going to good morning from our rooftop. I'm going to turn that post into an ad. Yeah, it, I can immediately decide what goal do I want for my ad? Do I want to add a button? What is the URL? Yeah, do I want to edit the image? Who is my audience? Yeah, and then what is the budget? What is the duration? Where am I going to show these ads and how am I going to pay? Bang, 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 boost post now. Yeah, so it looks very interesting and very effective to do this. But what you see here is you will only get a subsection of what Facebook advertising can do for you. Yeah, and if you think, hey, if that's okay with you, that's fine, but you're missing 90% of the other features to make your ad as effective as possible. In other words, my advice to you would be, don't click on the boost a post button on your mobile yeah, or your desktop, because again, it leads you to a limited functionality of the advertising module and the advertising capabilities that Facebook can offer you. So back to the desktop. The same applies here if I click here on boost post. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with advertising for a post. You can take one of your most successful posts or for a video and you can create additional reach for that post through advertising but don't do it through the limited advertising functionality. Again, this is a quick and dirty module, everything on one page, and it will, um, you can click boost post now, and it's an easy way to start spending your money. Yes, yeah, so that is, if you click the boost post, the same applies if you go to the create ads or create automated ads. Yeah, so let me show you the create automated ads. It takes you through a very automated process of creating ads, which is great when you're a beginner, but again, it will only give you limited functionality of what Facebook advertising has to offer you. 
So again, my advice would be don't go to the automated ads. Click on create ads. That again gives you limited functionality, gives it all in one page. Again, you don't want to do that. Yep, and then you click on the ad center. That gives you again a summary of the advertising, slightly more tools. Yeah, but it's all to lure you in to spend money in a very quick way. So, then where do I go for my advertising? The place where you go is to the Facebook, or how they now call Meta, the Meta Business Suite. The Meta Business Suite gives you everything you need for your advertising. It allows you to manage multiple advertising accounts. Yep, and it gives you access to the full functionality of what Facebook has to offer you. So let's go there, the Meta Business Suite. <clears throat> so here you see everything you need for your advertising. Yes, so here you see it's your Riyad for Russia, and it's not only for your advertising. You can manage your posts here, you can schedule your posts, manage your inbox, your notification, manage your content, manage your shop, plan your posts. Now, we'll cover all these areas in future videos, but for now, we want to focus on the advertising. Again, even here, they have ads as a quick and dirty method to create your ads. Again, where I want you to go, click here on all tools, and now finally, this is where you want to go. It gives you access to the full advertising functionality to create your ads, to manage your ads, to manage your audiences, to set up events, when you want to connect, get, get data from your website and where you can create your forms. This is where you want to go. Yeah, so if I click here on the ads manager, that takes me to the full advertising platform. <clears throat> now, here you see, by the way, turn off ad blocker, yeah, which is important because in your creation of your ads, Facebook will obviously simulate your, uh, your ads. Yeah, but if you have your ad blocker on, the ads will not show in the preview. So it is important that you switch off the ad blocker so you create your browser environment exactly as users will have in um, when they uh, they see your ads so let me go into switching that off which is more tools extensions and you see here my ad blocker is on so i'm going to switch that off yeah let me do a review yes yeah, so here you have your account overview you have your uh, your desk uh, your sort of your dashboard now you see i haven't run any campaigns, yeah, so I'm not gonna, so there's not much to see here in this, um, this, this tool. So let's go here under my campaigns. Yeah, and this gives me the basic sort of structure of your advertising on Facebook. Yeah, and remember we talked about campaigns, ad sets and ads. Yeah, those are the three elements of your advertising campaign on Facebook. You create a campaign, and I'll show you what you need to set up in the campaigns. Then within a campaign, you can have multiple ad sets, and those ad sets within a campaign inherit the settings of the campaign. And then within ad sets, you have ads. Yep, and those ads, they inherit the settings of the ad sets and the settings of the campaign. All right, so you see here, we have three or two campaigns or three campaigns. There is a new leads campaign, there is a page likes, and there is a traffic campaign. So now I'm not gonna show you these campaigns, I'm actually gonna show you how to create 
a campaign. So let's go into that. Here is Create. If you have experience with advertising in pay-per-click advertising, you will recognize this approach. Google Ads has it as well. It is what we call guided campaign creation. Yeah, so when you start your Facebook ads and when you start your Google ads, you can select, do you want an awareness campaign? Do you want a traffic, engagement, leads, promote your apps or a sales campaign? Yeah, and basically once the, the campaign objective that you select will set a number of the settings, yeah, sort of specifically for that campaign objective. So it makes it easier yeah, to align it with your business goals and the whole setup will be done easier. Yeah, so here you see an awareness objective. So that is too good for reach, for brand awareness, for video views. Yeah, so it's showing the ad to, the, to as many people as possible who are likely to remember them. Traffic is to send people to a destination like your website. This is really good to get link clicks, to get views on a landing page, or get people get into conversations with people on Messenger or WhatsApp. Engagement ads is get more messages, videos, views, post engagements. It's good for Instagram, for messaging apps, good for video views, engagement on posts. Lead ads are collect leads for your business or brand. They're good for instant forms on Messenger, good for conversions and to get calls. Here is to promote your apps, like in app installs, app events, and here is sales, that is for your catalog sales, for instance. Yeah, we're gonna do a simple one. I'm gonna set up a traffic. I want to drive people to a landing page. Yeah, so here I'm gonna click on traffic. Yeah, and I'm gonna click continue. So now I'm going into the campaign settings. So here you see the three structures again, the new traffic campaign, new traffic ad set, new traffic ad that I'm going to use. Okay, so here is my traffic campaign. I'm gonna create a name, which is, I'm gonna stick with new traffic campaign. Am I going to use any ad, is, are there any ad categories? Yeah, so is it about elections? Is it about politics? Is it about employment, about social issues? Yeah, remember a few years ago, there was this scandal when there was Brexit and the Trump elections or the, the, in 2018, I believe it was. There was a lot of data being sold by this Cambridge Analytica that they data they took from Facebook and they sold that to the campaign teams of the US election and of the Brexit. Yeah, that had a big impact on privacy on Facebook and on um, advertising for, for elections and politics. So and now Facebook has set some extra sort of security guidelines for specific ad categories. Now, what are the campaign details? Here you see by default it is set as an auction. Pay-per-click works on an auction base. And this is not a pay-per-click course, but basically it means you will do a bit on your ad, how much you're prepared to pay for a click, yep, and that will then go into an auction and that will determine the position of your ad. We want to get more traffic. <clears throat> do you want to do a B testing? Yes, and we want Facebook to do that. Yeah, or you switch that off. And what is your budget? Do you want to create, distribute your budget across ad sets? Yeah, if you want to do that, you can switch that on and then you have your campaign budget. So we're gonna set a daily budget of 20 pounds. Yeah, so go back to the advanced setting. Yeah, and then what is your campaign bid strategy? I just want the highest volume. And there's more options. You can schedule your ads, so you can set it at specific times. My advice is to run the ads all the time. Yeah, particularly in the learning phase. When Facebook launches your campaign, it goes into learning mode. And then Facebook will see by itself when your audience will, um, uh, 
will, um, will respond and they will adjust the ad scheduling accordingly. So there is your traffic campaign uh, details. Then we're going to your traffic ad set. Where do you want to drive your traffic? To your website, to an app, to Messenger. We want to drive it to the website. Now, dynamic creative is an important one. Yeah, do you want, to, uh, want Facebook to create your ads or do you want to do it yourself? When you want Facebook to do it, you provide creative elements like images and headlines and then Facebook will automatically generate the best ads for you. Yeah, so I kind of like that. Yeah, so I always switch that on on. Here you see the schedule. When do you want to start? Yeah, so do you want to send an end as well? So that would be then, let's say, November the 22nd. And then here is some more options. You can set ad spend limits. And here is where the real meaty sort of stuff happens in Facebook advertising. This is where you can select your audience. You can save specific audiences in the audience manager. Yeah, so you can have a number of audience. If you have an office in one country or another country, you can just here select, select the audience for that particular country. Or you can just create a new audience. Okay, so you can exclude audiences, you can set the location, you can set the age, location. Let's look at that. If I click here on edit, people living in or recently in this location. People living, people recently, people traveling in this location. So this is really powerful if you want to target people who are visiting a, uh, an, an event like a football match or what have you. And you can include, and this is where you can search location. You can search by city, let's say London. Yeah, so London, England, or I can say, let's do for instance, Reading in England. Yeah, and I can even say, uh, give me, yeah, so I can search location, give me uh, RG7, I can do by postcode. Yeah, so I can actually, people doing in the Reading area by postcode, and I really like this. So if I say, for instance, RG76, yeah, so here you can see how you can target a specific area yeah, and this is particularly for your local marketing is very important. Yep, so that is the, uh, the local targeting is really good. So you can, and then by the way, here you see your estimated audience size. And when your audience get bigger, you see estimated daily results as well. And then you can do more. You can search by, um, where was this? You can search by detailed targeting, by demographics, by interests and behaviors. Yeah, so if I want to people who like Reading Football Club. Yeah, so here is the Reading FCE soccer team. Yeah, so here are, I can now send an ad targeting specifically people in that particular low area who like, and we have the UK as well. Yeah, so uh, in Reading and that particular area who like football, who like Reading Football Club. Yeah, or I can um, other, add other areas as well. There's also the suggestions. If people like Reading, they may also like these type of things, Neymar, soccer, or maybe they like Manchester United. Yeah, so this is just the tip of the iceberg, the whole segmentation in Facebook advertising and the targeting is extremely powerful. Okay, here are your placements for your Facebook ads. Best is to let Facebook decide where to place your ads, but to show you where your ads can be shown on Facebook, if you click on the manual placements, you see here, they can show on Facebook, they can show on Instagram, on Messenger, and on the audience network. Now, what is the audience network? Google has that as well, yeah, in the display ads, which are 
ads that show on millions of websites that Facebook has an agree or that Google or in this case Facebook has an agreement with. So it shows your Facebook ad outside Facebook on millions of websites. Okay, so that's the audience network. Then if you look at the, here's the feeds where your ad can, sh can show. Your ad can show in stories and reels. Your ad can show in stream videos, overlay and post loop ads on reels, on Facebook search, on messaging, in article, apps and sites. So there is tons of places where your ads can show. But the best thing is to let Facebook decide where your ads are going to show. Okay, so these are your ad set settings. So let's now look at the ad. So here you see the Facebook page. And in our case, it is the Riyadh Farasha page. There you go. Yeah, we'll make it, you can opt in for branded content tools. You can look at the ad setup. We can do manual uploads. You can get data from your product catalog. And here you specify what type of ad you want to show. Is it a single image or a video or is it a carousel? Yep, and then here you have your ad creative and your media, and the select images, select videos. And then here you have your primary text, headline, description, your website URL. This is where you can do your URL parameters when you want to track your campaigns. Yeah, here you see the ad preview. The ad preview is off and now it's on. Yeah, but of course I need to select media. So let's see. Find images, so here we're going to say, go to my website and create an image for me, approve. Yeah, so now it will actually show me some images. Select images, yeah, so here you see images from my Riyadh, yeah, that it picks up from my Riyadh or from my uh, website. Here's the website. Yeah, so let's take... Uh, da, da, da. Let's take this image and we'll say continue. <coughs> yeah, so... Select a destination link for your ad. Let me see where we're going to put that one. There you go. Yes, yeah, so now because I put in the destination link, you will see how the ad starts building up. But this is the photo that I selected. Yeah, now I'm not going to show you the details of, and I'm not going to use as an example here. I just want you to show you the fields where you can play and create your ad. Yeah, and then you see here in the ad preview, whether you see it in the feeds, there is a mobile preview as well. Yep, so you see here the feeds, you see here the stories and the reels, how they would look on Instagram, the in-stream, yep, and here in the search, in article, and on apps. Yes, so there you have it, that is your traffic ad. So we've now done our campaign, we've done our ad set, we've done our traffic ad, and then basically what you're going to do is you're going to publish your ad. Now, when you're going into publish, yeah, you can then go back to view the details and then you see that the ad is um, done and it is actually in review by Facebook. So if I now go back to my campaigns, yeah, let's close this one. You see here is the new traffic ad. Yeah, and you see here it's processing. And then here you see immediately the details 
that you can get from your campaign. Yes, yeah, so you see the processing, you see the ad set name, the bid strategy, the budget, you see attribution setting. So basically attribution is how you track the uh, results of your ads. Um, and then you see here the results in number of link clicks, how many people reached, how many impressions, what is the cost per result, what is the quality ranking, the engagement ranking, the conversion ranking. The higher these rankings, the better Facebook considers your ads and the more and the better the positions for your ads. Here you see your amount spent and here you see the end date of the campaign. Yes, so that is how you set up your Facebook ads as a kind of introduction to the Facebook advertising. Yes, so if I now go back to all my campaigns, campaigns, yes, so you see here, let me see if I have some, no, you see there's no, none of these ads actually run or did run in the past, yes, yeah, so I can't show you the, uh, the results, but we'll go into more details at a later, um, at a later session on, uh, on Facebook advertising. For now, this is, I think, the best overview I can give you, yeah, and um, if you wanna get more than details, then we'll go in a more in-depth session of uh, the Facebook advertising. Okay, now that it's all clear, let's look at the do's and don'ts of Facebook advertising. What should you do and what shouldn't you do with your ads? So there are various do's. The first of all, make sure you continuously test your ads. And the good thing is that Facebook will do this for you. Yeah, you can tell Facebook, please test my ads. You can give Facebook a collection of creative materials, a collection of headlines, yeah, and it will actually mix and match those headlines and it will use the ones that will give the best, um, the best conversions. So it's very important that you continuously look yeah, at your performance and see if minor changes to your ads will lead to a better performance. Second, make sure that your images and that your videos are engaging. Remember, there is no intent in Facebook advertising. You have to be very creative to stand out from the crowd. And you can only do that by making your ads engagement or then by making your ads engaging in images and videos. So the, not only the images or the videos, but it's also the messaging that you use. Use a message that will stay with your audience. Yeah, so it's the combination of the visuals and the key message of your ad that will make people stop. If by looking in a split second at your ad, yeah, they get it, then they will stop and they will click on the call to action. So make sure you use a message that is powerful and effective. Also, keep it simple. When we say kiss, keep it simple and stupid. Make sure that people easily understand the message that you're trying to convey with your ad. Don't make it too complicated. Don't use complicated visuals. Don't use complicated messages. Keep it simple. And make sure that you reach the right audience. Yeah, Facebook's biggest benefit is the targeting. You can target micro on micro level, targeting people in very specific areas. Yeah, so that is the do's and of course there are don'ts as well. So the first thing is be sensible with your budget. Don't spend your whole budget on one single campaign. Yeah, so start small and basically grow your budget based on the results that you're getting. Yeah, if you have to use visuals and messages that are um, appealing, then of course, don't make sure that you put 
too much information in the ads. Again, keep your ads simple. Don't clutter them with too much text and too many visuals. Make sure that you proofread your ads. Don't have typos in your ads. There's not a lot of text in your ads, so please make sure that you double check the quality of the ads when it comes to the language and the, um, uh, the grammar. Yeah, so don't forget to proofread your ads. Be sensible in the activity level that you have on your Facebook page. Yeah, up until a few years ago, it was, it was actually promoted by Facebook to do as many posts as you think are relevant for your business. People did four or five posts a day. Nowadays, it is not about the quantity, it is about the quality. So don't do too many posts on your Facebook page. Be sensible, think from a customer perspective. Also when it comes to your ads. Yeah, so too many ads or sh showing the same ad to the same people all the time yeah, may have an adverse result. And then finally, make sure that your image relates to your product. So don't put up an image that doesn't relate to the advertised product. Is literally content marketing? Um, okay, what is it? So content marketing is not a new concept. It's been around for over 100 years. In fact, one of the classic foundation stories of you know, the birth of content marketing goes all the way back to the Michelin brothers in France. And the Michelin brothers, you know, in case you haven't done your history, that's okay. You know, we'll refresh it right now. Were two brothers who made pneumatic tires and they were trying to sell them along with an innovative product at its time called the automobile. In an era where the roads were horrible, in a place, France, where frankly people didn't like to get outside of Paris and into the provinces because, my God, what was worth going out there for? You know, for Paris. It's all happening here. And what the Michelin brothers realized is if they wanted to sell more tires, they had to get people to drive farther and farther and use them. So what did they come up with? The concept that really is the birth of content marketing in my book was the Michelin Guide. And the Michelin Guide was unique in that it reviewed restaurants, not just restaurants nearby in Paris, but restaurants out there in the provinces. And the Michelin brothers are the ones who came up with the one, two, and three star rating system to say this restaurant, I know it's way out there, it's you know bad roads, uh, but guess what? To die for. The ratatouille, ah, oh, you, you gotta have it. This is a three star restaurant. You, you, it's worth making the trip. And oh, by the way, since we're gonna give you a guide and you have to get out of Paris in order to get there, we're gonna tell you where you can find gasoline along the way, uh, which hotels uh, you might wanna stay at overnight. And oh, by the way, just in case you have to, how to repair a flat tire, particularly if it's a Michelin tire because it's a pneumatic and you know what, it's, it's quite easy to repair. And guess what? That put Michelin on the map. Why? They weren't trying to sell you more tires. They weren't telling you about the features and benefits of round or uh, tire repair. I mean, that was in there, but it was only a how-to article, not necessarily a feature and benefit. What they were doing was they were speaking to their audience about what their audience was truly passionate about, which in Paris in 1900 was food. And by creating content that got the audience to get into their new innovative automobile and drive all the way out there into the provinces for that absolutely remarkable three-star restaurant, people got more flats, people had to replace their tires, but it was worth it. And oh, by the way, Michelin sold more tires. So that... <laughs> That's a great story. Every time you sort of, you know, hit a pause and like, well, we're doing content marketing and we need to come up with a concept. Think back to the Michelin Guide. It's 
It's a great foundation. So let's go to a modern definition. Where are we now in the 21st century when it comes to content marketing? Well, you can read the slide here and read the definition. And some people like reading definitions. I'm not going to read it to you. But I am going to highlight a couple of words in the definition that I think are absolutely critical to any definition of content marketing. The content that you create needs to be relevant. And it also has to be valuable. Now, if it's not relevant, then you're not actually meeting my needs or interests. You know, and why would I be interested in it? And we've gotten way too tired of screening out the commercial that comes on, um, you know, trying to sell us snow tires. And pardon me, we live in Florida. I don't use snow tires. What the, what the heck is this commercial doing? You know, interrupting what I'm watching. So relevance is important. Relevance means that this content isn't going to get screened out. And the valuable, the valuable can, can work in a lot of different ways. It can be interesting. It can be useful. You know, value is an interesting proposition all by itself. But that's the key to content marketing. Uh, it's not just creating more spam. It's not just throwing more trash over the fence and hoping something happens. This is something where if you've created valuable and relevant content, you know what? Your customers will find you. That's a whole different kind of proposition. I know there's some skeptics who are saying, oh, come on, come on, come on. Content marketing is just a fancy new name for social media marketing, right? And the answer is, well, there is some overlap, and we're going to deal with that in Module 3. But let me just be clear here. Social media content is part of what content marketing needs to create. But it can also create content for your website, and that's not the social media. It can also create content that uh, your PR people can share with uh, uh, reporters or bloggers, and that's not normally considered uh, social media content. And by the way, all of that content can be optimized. So it, maybe it actually is part of SEO, not social media marketing. In fact, that's the other place that content marketing really overlaps. And it's not coincidental. It so happens that around February 2011, when Google rolled out the first of its multiple versions of the Panda update, all of a sudden, even SEOs started to pay attention to content marketing. Why? Because Google changed the rules. And what Google basically said is, if your content isn't valuable or relevant, you know what? It's not going to rank very well in our search algorithm. And all of a sudden, people who had been used to like putting keywords in the right places realized it's content matters. You mean I've got to actually tell stories that are interesting? I've got to create information that's valuable? Yeah, you can make it relevant. That's the optimization part. But you know, if you're trying to optimize a piece of boring, irrelevant trash, God bless you. Good luck. So yeah, content marketing has grown. It's like tripled in terms of web search interest since the Panda update. And we're talking about Panda 1. Of course, there was Panda 2, Panda 3, Panda 4. I mean, come on. Google is driving us in this direction. And so content marketing is pretty relevant today. Now, one of the other things that uh, people in content marketing struggle with is, oh, but you don't understand. I do B2B content marketing or I'm a small business, or pardon me, I'm an enterprise. And so content marketing has to come in flavors, right? Well, possibly, maybe, on occasion. So let's just question that assumption for a second. You know, content marketing has been around now long enough, and enough people have done it, that some research has been conducted, and it's been conducted against B2C marketers and B2B marketers and small business marketers and enterprise level marketers. And when they start asking key questions like, okay, we're going to try to determine what is the difference between an effective content marketer and an ineffective content marketer. 
let's see the results. Well, first of all, the most important thing to be an effective B2C content marketer is you need a documented content strategy. Oh, okay, all right. I mean, people who are winging it aren't as uh, effective as people who actually have thought about this uh, and written it down? Got it, okay. No great insight, but, you know, interesting to note. Secondly, they've got to have somebody in charge who oversees content marketing. Oh, Lord, does that mean we have to have a reorg? Or maybe we just have to designate somebody who reports to somebody else. Whatever. But guess what? It really helps if somebody is driving this process. Third, they've got to be using more content marketing tactics than their less effective peers. And this is not an argument, more is better. This is just, pardon me, that's the way the data falls out. The people who are actually more effective are doing more different kinds of things, a broader range of tactics. And who knows, maybe it's that broader range that's part of the success formula. Same thing is true with social media platforms. The effective content marketers are using more than the ineffective ones. And last but not least, and this may be a sort of a result of the first four, by gosh, effective content marketers generally have greater percentage of the overall marketing budget in their organization. Wow, okay. That's the B2C marketing formula, but you don't understand. I'm not a B2C marketer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at the B2B content marketing formula. Guess what? You need to have a documented content marketing strategy to be an effective B2B content marketer. You need to have someone who oversees content marketing strategy. It helps if you are using more tactics and more social media platforms. And guess what? You spend a higher percentage of your overall marketing budget on content marketing. Well, that's similar to the B2C content marketers. But you understand B2B is different. Yeah, there's a couple of small differences, but guess what? Overall, the top five criteria are similar. And when you get to small business, here's what you're going to see. Same five criteria. And you're in an enterprise. I know. The world is different for enterprises. Actually, not so much. So, four different data points. Let's net it out. <gasps> there's a pattern. And the pattern is, is I don't care what flavor of content marketer you are. You can be B2C, B2B. You can be small business. You can be large enterprise. At the end of the day, there are five things that you've got to focus on if you want to be effective. We've already covered these. And are there differences between small businesses and large enterprises, between B2B and B2C? Well, sure. But they're all at the margin. What's the downside? If we don't do this, you know, is anyone going to come in and like whack us? And the answer is um, maybe not inside your boardroom, but it may happen on the next sales call that one of your salespeople makes. They may encounter someone I like to call the man in the chair. And the man in the chair actually refers back to a classic McGraw-Hill ad campaign from, I think, the 1960s. But basically, the guy in the chair asks theoretically, some questions from, quote, maybe your salesperson. Okay, I don't know anything about you. I don't know about your company. I don't know about your company's product. I don't know about your company's, you know, reputation or anything about you. And so what was it you were going to try to sell me? And that's the downside of not having a content marketing program. Content marketing has been around for over 100 years, but in the online world, customers are behaving in lots of new ways, and they're consuming content on various kinds and types of devices. That changes things. Content marketing is now about creating content that consumers will engage with and act upon, not just read or listen to or watch. So in this introductory module, we're going to provide you with an understanding of how content marketing affects 
the decision-making process when people are on the customer journey to making a purchase. And with a solid content marketing strategy, your customers' buying decisions can actually uh, happen faster. You can basically uh, sh shorten the decision-making process, and you can reach and expand um, to new prospects. So one of the things that we hope that you're going to uh, learn after uh, basically taking this module, uh, you should be able to do the following. First of all, you can define content marketing and other related concepts. Secondly, you should be able to explain why content needs to be relevant and valuable in order for it to be effective. Third, you need to describe uh, the overlap between content marketing, SEO, social media marketing. Fourth, you need to name five traits of effective content marketers. And last but not least, you need to explain the benefits of content marketing. These are our objectives, and hopefully they're going to be your learning outcomes. So content marketing is not a new concept. It's been around for over 100 years. In fact, one of the classic foundation stories of you know, the birth of content marketing goes all the way back to the Michelin brothers in France. And the Michelin brothers, you know, in case you haven't done your history, that's okay. You know, a little refresher right now. Were two brothers who made pneumatic tires, and they were trying to sell them along with an innovative product at its time called the automobile. In an era where the roads were horrible, in a place, France, where frankly people didn't like to get outside of Paris and into the provinces because, my God, what was worth going out there for? You know, we're Paris. It's all happening here. And what the Michelin brothers realized is if they wanted to sell more tires, they had to get people to drive farther and farther and use them. So what did they come up with? The concept that really is the birth of content marketing in my book was the Michelin Guide. And the Michelin Guide was unique in that it reviewed restaurants, not just restaurants nearby in Paris, but restaurants out there in the provinces. And the Michelin brothers are the ones who came up with the one, two, and three star rating system to say this restaurant, I know it's way out there, it's, you know, bad roads, uh, but guess what? To die for. The ratatouille, ah, oh, you, you got to have it. This is a three-star restaurant. You, you, it's worth making the trip. And oh, by the way, since we're going to give you a guide and you have to get out of Paris in order to get there, we're going to tell you where you can find gasoline along the way, uh, which hotels uh, you might want to stay at overnight. And oh, by the way, just in case you have to, how to repair a flat tire, particularly if it's a Michelin tire because it's a pneumatic and you know what, it's, it's quite easy to repair. And guess what? That put Michelin on the map. Why? They weren't trying to sell you more tires. They weren't telling you about the features and benefits of round or uh, tire repair. I mean, that was in there, but it was only a how-to article, not necessarily a feature and benefit. What they were doing was they were speaking to their audience about what their audience was truly passionate about, which in Paris in 1900 was food. And by creating content that got the audience to get into their new innovative automobile and drive all the way out there into the provinces for that absolutely remarkable three-star restaurant, people got more flats. People had to replace their tires, but it was worth it. And oh, by the way, Michelin sold more tires. So that, <laughs> that's a great story. Every time you sort of, you know. Welcome everyone. This is Rob Sanders from Simply Learn. And today we're gonna talk about affiliate marketing. So let's jump right into it and take a look inside an office environment right now. We have Chuck here. Chuck's doing a little bit of pacing. John walks in the office. Hey man, what's with all the pacing? Everything all right? Chuck, 
responded, hey, I'm just worried that I might have exhausted every way we can advertise our product. I mean, I've done SEO, I've done paid search, I've done email, I've done social. Man, nothing's working. I gotta come up with something new. ASAP. Well, John responds, hey, don't worry. I think I've got your solution for you, man. Hang tight, relax, take a load off. Here's my solution, affiliate marketing. First off, before you ask the question, What's affiliate marketing? Let's talk about why we need affiliate marketing. So let's dig into affiliate marketing. So John's just taken over now and he's gonna let Chuck know everything there is to know about affiliate marketing. So the first question, John answers for Chuck, what is affiliate marketing? So affiliate marketing is a form of digital marketing that involves a merchant. It involves a merchant paying commissions to a website or other entities. So if I'm selling a product, basically somebody else sells that product for me, I'm gonna pay that person a commission for selling my product. It's that simple. That's what affiliate marketing is. Okay, so basically what these merchants are doing or other entities, they're advertising your product. So they're advertising your product with a referral. So they're passing on their own customers to you so that they can buy your product. Product. And again, the exchange is you give that website or other entity a commission. That's more or less what affiliate marketing is. So John's gonna have us take a look at each of these components of affiliate marketing in detail. Take it away, John. So John says, first, we have the merchant, AKA the brand, the seller, the creator, the founder, the owner, the inspiration, the innovator. Hey, this is the person who came up with this brilliant idea. This brilliant idea has to get out there. We're the merchant. We're trying to get this brilliant idea out to the mass. So this is the component of affiliate marketing that creates the product. The merchant could be anyone, okay? So it could be startups to large multinational companies, international companies, nonprofits, for-profits, individuals, independent contractors, freelancers, a group of people who have a passion for something, okay? It could be anybody. There's no limit. The affiliate, AKA the publisher. So the affiliate, is basically that third party website or entity which promotes the merchant's products and tries to convince potential customers of the merchant's product's value. So this affiliate's going to represent the merchant on their behalf and try and get their clients to basically purchase that particular merchant's product. So the affiliate could be incentivized based on you know, registrations, email signups, sales, and subscriptions. So it doesn't always come down to you know sales you know if I'm just trying to get you know build my email list then hey I can incentivize that affiliate to push email signups if I'm got this big you know offline you know promotion that I'm doing at this particular mall and I want to get people there well I can get an affiliate and incentivize that affiliate to drive and help me drive registrations for this event. So it doesn't always have to be sales per se. So in effect, you the merchant and the affiliate work out some type of commission deal based on what you're incentivizing. So the relationship between the affiliate and the merchant is made possible with the help of an affiliate network. So that's the third component here. We need somebody to bring the two together. That merchant who has this brilliant idea and the affiliate who has potential customers that could potentially drive registrations, sales, signups, etc., to the merchant. So the affiliate network is the one who brings the two together. So the affiliate network, in effect, acts as the middleman, the person in between the merchants and affiliates. It allows merchants to find and collaborate with not just any affiliate, but the affiliate best suited for their particular brand and product because you wanna find somebody who is gonna be passionate, who's relevant, who has your prospective customers in mind because they're the ones that are gonna help those protective customers purchase your product. So that's what the affiliate network does. It helps bring the merchants and affiliates together so that the affiliate can help advertise and sell on behalf of the merchant. So with the affiliate network, merchants can use tools for tracking and reporting and processing payments for affiliates. So really that affiliate network is the glue that holds it all together. They're not just one to introduce a merchant and affiliate, they offer it all. So as a merchant, you want to be able to manage your affiliates. 
So you're not going to have one affiliate, you're going to have multiple affiliates. So you want to be able to use the appropriate tools available to you in the affiliate network to see and track how sales are going. And when sales happen, okay, or commissions happen, you want to be able to use that affiliate network to compensate that affiliate appropriately. And then finally, the customer. Customer, aka the consumer, is the most important component of all of this take it away john so the consumer is the final and most important component without customers to buy products the merchant would not have any revenue and the affiliate would not get any commission so we need customers hello everyone and welcome to this google analytics full course video by simply learn today we will understand google analytics which is the best analytical tool provided by google to check up on our website we will understand how Google Analytics works, how we can use it to measure the performance of our website. We'll also understand how to set up goals and create events that will help us keep our website on track. Next, we will look at Google Tag Manager and towards the end, we will unlock the mystery of how to rank at number one position on Google. It's not that hard as you think it is. We have Rob with us who has more than 15 years of experience in digital marketing and analytics and he will take us through these topics. Over to you Rob. Welcome everyone this is Rob Sanders with Simply Learn and today we're going to talk about Google Analytics. I'm very excited to be with you today because Google Analytics is one of my favorite Google platforms and my favorite topics. So let's talk about what we're going to cover today and we're going to start out with how to set up a Google Analytics account and so we're going to talk about everything that entails including creating your Google Analytics account we're going to talk about setting up a property in your account and what a property is we're going to talk about setting up a reporting view in your property and we're going to talk about installing the tracking code so those are the series of steps we're going to go through today in terms of setting up a Google Analytics account. So let's get right to it. And so really the one prerequisite here when it comes to setting up a Google Analytics account is to have a Google login and ID. So when you actually go to Google Analytics, you need to be able to sign up or sign in. And so once you actually sign in, then you're gonna go walk through a series of steps. But really, that's really all you need to get the account going is a Google ID and login. So if you have a Gmail account or an other email account that you use for other Google products, then you're good to go. That's all you need to do. So when you actually go to sign up for Google Analytics, you're gonna be asked to set up a new account. And these are the series of steps you're gonna walk through or go through to set up a new Google Analytics account. So you're gonna choose an account name and then you're gonna choose a property name. Okay, so the account name can be anything you want it to be, the name of your company, your name, whatever you wanna name it. The property name is really the website name. So what website are we talking about? So here I'm gonna set up a fictitious website name for now. It's called Demo Simply Learn. So the URL for this website, Demo Simply Learn, is gonna be demo.simplylearn.com. So that's the property. When we talk about properties in analytics, we're really talking about what websites we wanna measure. And then you're gonna be asked to choose an industry category. And so for Simply Learn, we're in jobs and education. But you have a number of different industries that you could choose from. It's as important, go ahead and choose the most relevant industry that your particular business is associated with. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about why that's important here in a minute. And then you're gonna choose your time zone, and the time zone's also important because that's when the day starts in analytics and the day ends based on that time zone. So the data that Google Analytics collects starts and ends with that time zone. So very important to choose the time zone your business is located in. Okay, and then you have some additional options here. Okay, so you have some settings. And so the first setting is to allow Google products and services. So if you opt into this, then basically what Google's going to do is share some products and services with you. 
via email. I would go ahead and opt into that. That's of course recommended by Google. It doesn't hurt to hear from Google on related products and services that may enhance your business. The second is benchmarking. So benchmarking to me is something you should opt into. So going back to that industry and category, we chose jobs and education. So by opting into benchmarking, basically what Google's going to do is share your data that it collects on your website. In this case, demo.simplylearn.com. It's going to share that data anonymously with others in the industry in this case jobs and education and because you've opted in it's going to do the same exact thing for you it's going to share anonymous data on other websites in the same industry and the benefit of that is we get to see what other websites or how other websites are performing compared to ours what's the benchmark in our industry and so the benchmarking to me is important and i'm gonna go over that in a few minutes when we go over the different reports but to me i would always opt into benchmarking because this is the only report google provides in analytics about how others in your industry is performing versus your website okay so it's a way to compare your website performance against others in the same industry the other options here technical support and account specialist I would also recommend you opt into those because then it allows you to basically Google allow Google access to your account and they'll be able to help you if you occur or run into any issues so these are the options in setting up a Google Analytics account. It's very simple, very easy to do. You're just entering in a few fields. Note that we talking about a website right now, so I'm talking about demo.simplylearn.com, but just know that if you wanna track a mobile app, Google Analytics will allow you to do that as well. You just choose the option mobile app. So we're tracking a website, we wanna know how users behave when they get to my website. And that's what Google Analytics is going to allow us to measure and look at. We just need to do a couple more steps in the process. So once we fill out these fields here, we're gonna click Get Tracking ID. Now, I'm going to accept the terms of service. I'm going to accept another terms of service in relation to data protection. I'm gonna click Accept. Once I accept, I'm gonna be able to get some tracking code. The tracking ID is the ID associated with your account. And so this number is going to be associated with your account. So your account ID starts with UA and it's gonna be this number here. Now the dash one is the property you set up. So in this case, I set up demo.simplylearn.com. If I wanted to track multiple websites under that same account, then I can certainly set up multiple properties. Just know that every property I set up in that account is going to have a dash one, dash two, dash three, dash four, et cetera, depending on how many properties I set up. So by default, I set up one property. So my first property ID is dash one. If I set up a second property, the same account number, it's just gonna have a dash two. And that's important because that ID, that account and property ID is going to be associated with that particular property or website. So again, once you finish setting up the account settings, then you're gonna be asked to add some tracking code to your site. And that tracking code is gonna be related to the account and the property. So notice my tracking ID up here. Notice the tracking ID in the snippet of code. Now. This snippet of code needs to go on every page of your website that you want to track. And you don't have to put it on every page, but if you want to track website behavior on every page of your website, then it needs to go on every page of your website. So if you're using a you know platform like Drupal or Joomla or even more popular platform like WordPress, adding the tracking code site-wide is as easy as maybe adding a Google Analytics plugin in to WordPress, for example, and then just simply plugging in the ID. Now there's an alternative to adding the Google Analytics tracking code to your site, and that's Google Tag Manager. So Google Tag Manager is the way I would recommend going. So if you're not familiar with Google Tag Manager, I would recommend watching the 
YouTube video we have on Google Tag Manager. You can just go to YouTube, type in Simply Learn Google Tag Manager, and this will give you a nice overview of you know, what Google Tag Manager is and how it works. But basically, this is the way I would go, and I would recommend that in addition to having Google Analytics, you set up a Google Tag Manager account. And then that way, you can put the tracking code in Google Tag Manager. So if I go to Google Tag Manager, and I just go into an account on Tag Manager, I can just simply put in the Google Analytics ID right into Tag Manager. And so if I have it in Tag Manager, then Tag Manager is going to be the place that holds the code and fires page view when somebody comes to my website. So that way I don't have to add the tracking code to my website if I do it in Tag Manager. So that's the recommended method for me is to add the Google Analytics ID associated with Tag Manager. If you can associate it with Tag Manager, then that's the easier route to go versus putting code on your website. Okay, so again, take a look at the video we have on YouTube for Google Tag Manager. That's the route I would go. Now, once you do get the tracking code on your website, whether that be through Google Tag Manager or through a plugin or, you know, just simply adding the script to your site, to pages on your site, then what's going to happen is you're going to start collecting data. So that's ideally the way it works. You need to add this code to your website. Now, if you're not ready to do that and you simply want to basically understand how Google Analytics works, then I would recommend getting access to Google Analytics demo account. And so if you just type in and search Google Analytics demo account, basically what you're going to do, you're going to choose the first listing there and you're going to go to demo account. So if you have a Google Analytics or Google login, then all you need to do is click on access demo account. And so what Google's going to do is put this demo account into your account. And so it's going to look something like this. So if I click on demo account here, it's going to add to my Google Analytics account. So I'm going to have then access to the demo account from Google in Google Analytics. So I would recommend going this route here if you're not familiar, you're not sure what you're getting yourself into. So think of the demo account as kind of a test drive. You're test driving Google Analytics before you even add any code to your website. So again, all you need is a Google account. And if you have a Google account, and you add the demo account to your Google Analytics account, you're going to be able to see how analytics works. Okay. And so that's what I would also recommend. So if you're not ready to start adding code to your website, then what you can do is just simply add the demo account. And then once you add the demo account, you're free to peruse around Google Analytics to see the different types of reports that it has to offer. Now, when you do actually set up a Google Analytics account, you're going to have some settings that you're going to want to pay attention to. So when you set up the account, you have the account name and then you have a property. So under each property you have by default, you're going to have one view. And so here you can see this view here. So if we look at the account we set up, we set up a demo simply learn account property is demo simply learn. So that's associated with the website we're going to track. And then again, by default under each property, you're going to have a view. And so by default, the name of the view is going to be called all website data. And so in that view is where all your analytics data is going to be stored. So you can see my screen here. There's a lot of different settings you have. You have settings under the account, you have settings under the property, and you have settings under the view. So we're gonna talk more about these settings in future webinars for advanced Google Analytics users. But for now, know that there's a bunch of settings that you have that you can play around with when it comes to Google Analytics. Anything from adding users to your Google Analytics account, your Google Analytics property or view, you can actually set up goals, you can set up filters, you can set up segments, you can link up Google ads, you can you know, set up remarketing list. There's a lot you can do 
in terms of the settings as it relates to Google Analytics. But so know those settings are there. They're located right down here in this little sprocket icon. That's the admin icon. So if you need to get to these settings at any time, you could simply just click on the sprocket or the admin icon, and then you'll be prompted to choose any one of these settings here that you want to edit or alter. So now let's take a look at some Google Analytics reports. So once you've actually set up your account, you have a number of different reports that you have available to you in Google Analytics. So we're going to take a look at, you know, customized reports. We're going to look at real time audience reports, acquisition, behavior, and conversion. So these are all the different reporting buckets, if you will, that you have available to you in Google Analytics. So if I'm an admin and I'm looking at the Google demo account, Let's start out by looking at real time. So if I click on the real time report and I just click on overview. So basically what this is going to do is show me at this point in time, how many users I actually have active on the website. Okay. So that's why they call it real time reporting because it allows you to see the behavior of users who are currently on your website. And so this is the overview report under real time. And you can see here, I can see that 79% of my users are coming from desktop, 18%, 20% are coming from mobile, and then approximately 3% are coming from tablet. Here I can see how they actually came to the website. So this is the referring source. If they came from, say, search or social, I can see the source there, and I can see what pages they're active on. And then here I can see what locations, where they're located. And so if I want to see a breakdown of everything in the overview, I can certainly do that. If I go to locations under real time, I could see a majority of my users are coming from the United States. Okay. Where are they coming from? I'll just click on traffic sources and here I could see the different sources and mediums. Medium is the means in which the traffic was driven. So if it's Google, it's either paid search or organic search. So I could see here it's organic. Then I can actually see what content they're looking at on my website. So I could see currently I have three active users on the home page, two active users on the Google's women's white tea page, so forth and so on. Now, most importantly, if you have event tracking set up, so if you've taken a look at our Google Tag Manager webinar, you know that you could set up event tracking in Google Analytics to measure engagement on your website, whether that be a form submission or somebody clicking on the play button of a video. So if I click on events, I'll be able to see what events are firing. So here I can see we have event tracking set up and I can see how many different events are firing on my website in real time. So here I can see e-commerce, somebody clicking on the quick view click, some you know, couple of users clicking on add to cart, a couple of users clicking on the promotion click. And as these events are fired, you're going to be able to see them highlighted. So if something gets fired, it's going to get highlighted. And I could see that these are the current events that I have currently firing on the website. And that's what's currently fire now. If I want to look at the events that have happened in the last 30 minutes, I can just click on this link here, last 30 minutes, and it's going to give me an overview of the events that have happened over the past 30 minutes. Okay, so that's event tracking. And then more importantly, we can also look at what conversions are happening in real time just by clicking on conversions. And so now I could see I had one active user who entered the checkout. So that's goal number four. So in analytics, you can have up to 20 goals. And so here I can see we have goal number four has already had one active user. And so if I look at the last 30 minutes, I can see I still have only one goal over the last 30 minutes and that was somebody who entered the checkout. So that's real time reporting. In summary, it just gives you an idea of what's currently happening on your website. And so for me, ideally, if I'm launching a campaign or let's just say you do a new website redesign and you want to see how users performing and behaving, then real time is a good option for you. So you could see how things are happening in real time. Now let's jump down to audience reporting. So if I click on audience, this is just right underneath real time. 
I'm going to see a number of different reports available to me under audience. And so let's click on the audience overview report. So audience reporting basically allows us to get a sense of who is coming to our website. When I say who is coming to our website, it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific person. In fact, Google doesn't allow personally identifiable information in Google Analytics. Personal identifiable information such as a specific name, a social security number, credit card information, etc. However, we can still paint a nice picture on who is coming to our website, meaning what country, city, or state did they come from, what language, what device did they get to our website from, how old were they, okay, were they male or female or other, what interest did they have? What browser did they use? So we can paint a nice picture based on all this information that Google Analytics is providing us under audience. So if I go to audience overview, here I can see I have all these different options available to me to get a basic understanding of who is coming to our website. So for example, I could see a majority of the people coming to our website speak English and are from the United States. Okay, in fact, that represents 61% of the users. And so Google Analytics does a great job of giving me an overall percentage. So if I have 100% of the users, I could see 61% of those users represented English speaking users from the United States. 7% represented English speaking users from Great Britain. And so when it comes to analytics, we have users and users are broken down into two categories. They're either returning or they're new. So when you add the Google Analytics tracking script to your website, what's going to happen is if a user or when a user goes to your website, they're going to get cookied. And if it's the first time they've been to your website, what Google Analytics is going to do is store a cookie in the browser. So when that same user comes back another day in the same browser, Analytics is going to recognize that that cookie is in the browser. And so then Analytics is going to categorize that user as a returning user. Okay, so that's how Analytics is able to differentiate new versus returning. So if that user doesn't have a cookie in the browser, then Analytics is going to recognize that, store the cookie, and then count that user as a new user. And so when you're looking in Analytics, you're going to be able to see a breakdown of new versus returning. So here I can see over three quarters of my traffic over the past week. Here I can see April 6th through April 12th, three, over three quarters are new users to the website. Here I could see about 23, 24% are returning users. Okay, so I can get a good breakdown of what type of users are coming. Am I driving new traffic? Am I driving traffic that's been to my website before? What language are they speaking? Okay, I can also paint a bigger picture. How old are they? Are they, what gender are they? Do they come from mobile? So let's take a look at some of these different reports under audience. And so if I skip down now to demographics, I can click on overview. And when that report loads, I can see now under demographics overview, I can see the breakout of age ranges. And so here I can see the majority of the traffic coming to my site again over the past week. Now, if I want to change this date range, I could simply do that. I can change the date range just by clicking on the date range and then maybe going, say, the last 30 days. And I can even compare it to the previous period or the previous year. I'm going to choose the last 30 days. I'm going to click apply. Now I'm looking at data over the last 30 days. And again, you can change the date range to any range you want. You can only go back as far as when you actually created the Google Analytics account. You can't go prior to that. So here I'm looking at the last 30 days and I can see almost 47% of my users were in the age range of 25 to 34. Now, when it comes to gender, I can see 66% represent males. So I can get a breakout of gender and age as well as interest. I can click on interest and look at the overview there and see what the interest is of the users who are coming to my site based on in-market segments or affinity. I can also choose language and location. 
So if I want to know exactly where my users are located when they're coming to my website, I can click on location and here I can get a breakout. 43% of the users of the last 30 days were from the United States. More importantly, I can align my audience with goals. And we'll talk about goals here in a minute, but here I can see if I have an e-commerce website, I can see of those 43%, 0.29% of those converted or purchased something. And that equates to 94 transactions. So I can get a good sense of not only how many users are coming from a specific country, but are those users converting? If I click on mobile, and mobile to me is one of those reports I tend to spend a bit of time on because I want to know what devices users are coming to my website. And so for my website here, or this is the Google demo website, I can see mobile represents approximately 27% of the traffic. So desktop still represents a majority of the traffic. So for you, you want to keep an eye on mobile because mobile is definitely a majority of what people use nowadays. That's how people start their day. That's how they transact via mobile, whether that's purchasing something, communicating, or searching. It all starts with mobile. So you want to keep an eye on mobile, and more importantly, you want to keep an eye on behavior. So Google Analytics is telling me that, yes, I have approximately 27% of my traffic of the last 30 days came from mobile. How are they interacting with my website? So if I look across this report, I'm going to be able to see different metrics. So if I'm measuring specific metrics against my dimension, in this case, the dimension is what we're measuring. And in this example, we're measuring mobile. I can see that the bounce rate is approximately 48%. And bounce rate means that if a user, in this case from mobile, landed on a page, they left the site without going any further. So they consider it a bounce. If they don't go to another page, if they leave the site from the page they landed on and they don't go any further, that's considered a bounce. So a bounce rate is the percentage of people who come to the site and leave the site without going any further. So in this case, we have 48% bounce rate. That's almost half of our users who come from mobile leave the website from the page they landed on. So is that good? Is that bad? Well, it's open to interpretation. It's definitely subjective, but you want to keep the bounce rate as low as possible. You want to keep people on your site, especially if you have an e-commerce website. You want people who come to your website to purchase. And so here we can see 48% mobile and desktop it's a little bit lower at 41%. Now, if I look a little bit further at engagement, I can see how many pages on average do mobile users look at. So versus desktop, it's a little bit lower. You can see 3.86 on desktop, it's 4.5. Now, if I look a little bit further in engagement, I want to be able to measure how long somebody from mobile stays on the website. If they're bouncing at 48%, but they're also looking at 3.8 pages, 3.9, almost four pages per session, then that means in this report, analytics is telling me they're spending about two minutes on the site. And interestingly enough, I can see that mobile over the last 30 days had more transactions. So 51 transactions versus 34 transactions from desktop. And interestingly enough, the e-commerce conversion rate is at 0.29%. That's higher than desktop at 0.07. It's lower than tablet, but it's higher than desktop. And mobile has the most transactions. And since they have the most transactions, they have the most revenue at 2,380. So yes, the engagement isn't exactly as great as it is as desktop, but we can see that people are still purchasing with their mobile devices. So it's something to keep an eye on. And mobile is something I definitely look at. In fact, since it's such an important report, one thing you can do in analytics is if you actually like a report and you think you're going to look at that report multiple times, then you can simply just go ahead and click save at the top here. So if I click save, I'm going to enter a name for this report. I'm just going to call it mobile. 
report and click OK. And then what's going to happen is it's going to be located under save reports and save reports is located under customization. Customization is located above real time. OK, so if I close that up, you can see audience real time customization. If I click on customization, if I click on save reports, I should be able to see my save report here and I do. So here I can see mobile report. If I click on it, I can simply go to the report I was looking at before I saved it. So save reports to me is a good feature in analytics because it allows you to quickly access a report that you've saved in the past. So let's take a look at one more report under audience. And let's go to benchmarking. So remember when we were setting up our analytics account, we had the option to opt into benchmarking and I recommended you do so. And so if you did actually opt into benchmarking, then you're going to be able to see how your site compares to others in the same industry. So if I click on benchmarking and then click on channels, what I'm actually able to do now is compare my website with others in the same industry. So if I go back to say jobs and education and I choose education, all education as my industry vertical, I should be able to see websites that are in the same particular industry and how I compare with those websites. So I'm choosing all countries. I can narrow that down if I wanted to. I can just search for the United States. I can choose a specific state and then I can choose a particular site size. So here I'm choosing sites by daily session. So these are sites that have an average of 5,000 to almost 10,000 sessions a day. And so in this vertical education in the United States, sites that have 5,000 to 9,999 sessions per day, that means that there are approximately 310 web properties contributing to this report, okay, based on this criteria I chose. Now, if my site is similar, meaning if I'm in the United States, if I'm in education, and I'm receiving 5,000 to 9,999 sessions per day, then I'm able to compare my site against 310 other websites. Now, Google sharing this data anonymously from the other websites and they're doing the same with your website to those particular websites benchmarking reports okay so it's a shared data anonymously in particular industries and verticals and so now I'm looking at a channel report so if I want to see how I compare to others in my industry then I can go ahead and see by channel, for example, am I driving as much traffic as others in my industry? And you can see I'm not. In fact, I'm 76, 77% worse in terms of the amount of traffic being driven from organic search. So anything in red is going to show as a negative result, a negative comparison, whereas something in green is a positive comparison. So if I look at engagement, I can see that I might not be driving as much traffic, but I can see that the pages per session are better than the site average or the industry average. I can see if I go over again, looking just at organic search, I can see the bounce rate is better than the industry average. So the channel report under benchmarking allows you to measure how you compare to others in your industry. And you could do so by looking at location and devices. So if you opted into benchmarking when you set up your account, then you'll be able to compare your website against others in your industry, in your country, region, and based on the size of your website in terms of how many visitors or sessions you're getting per day. So let's go from audience to acquisition. So if audience is who is coming to your website, acquisition allows us to see how the traffic was driven to your website. So how did these users get to our website? And so under acquisition, if we click on overview, we'll be able to see an overview of how users, whether they're returning or new, came to our website. And so what analytics does by default is they have a number of default channels. And when we say channels, we mean analytics is grouping different channels based on how users got to your website. Meaning how did users get to our website? Did they come via organic search? Meaning did they type something into Google and find you in the organic listing? 
Analytics also groups users based on whether they came to your site directly, meaning did they type in the URL directly into the browser or did they bookmark your website and come back via the bookmark? So they're grouping users under direct. They also group users under referral, meaning did they come from another website? They group users by social. Do they come from a social media platform like Twitter or Facebook? If you're running paid search, meaning if you're running paid search on say Google, then do they come from paid search ads? Now, if you're running display ads on say Google's network, Google's display network, that's a default channel. So analytics will group users there. So if they don't recognize a channel, then they're gonna group it as others. So by default, Google Analytics groups users on how they came to your website via these default channels. And so I can see how many users came to the site from each channel. Now, if I wanna drill down on this report, I can click on all traffic. And then if I click on all traffic, I can go to channels. I can look specifically at the channels report. And so now I can see organic search Again, over the last 30 days is the number one channel driving traffic. And they represent approximately, again, you can see this number here in parentheses next to the raw number of users. I can see that number is about 56%. So 56% of my traffic over the last 30 days came from organic search. And so those are the number of users. Again, as a metric, you're also gonna have sessions. And you'll see sessions a lot as a metric. So users are broken down between new and returning. So every time a new or returning user comes to the website, basically what they're doing is initiating a session. So you can have a user who can come back multiple times. Every time they come back to the website, it's a session. So session is simply the start of somebody coming to your website and the session ends when they leave the website. And so just like we looked at with the audience reports when it came to mobile, we can also look at engagement by channel. So just like mobile, we looked at bounce rate, pages per session, average session duration. We can do the same thing here with our channel report. More importantly, in addition to behavior, we can see conversions. And since we're running an e-commerce platform, we could see what the conversion rate is by channel. So organic search did drive the most traffic and they did have the most transactions over the last 30 days. And the conversion rate in this case is 0.17. Okay, so how Google determines the conversion rate, they basically take the number of transactions and divide that by sessions. So that means that over the last 30 days, organic search drove 38,123 sessions. And of those 38,123, 64 actually turned into a transaction, which equates to 0.17, which also equates to 3,000 in revenue. So I'm able to determine not only how users are getting to my website, by looking at the channel report, I can actually see if they're engaging and if they are converting. And notice when you look at a report in analytics, you can look at it by channel, you'll also get a summary. So here I can see a summary or a total based on my date range. So I could see over the last 30 days, I've had 54,000 users, 49,000 of them were new. Okay, that meant that out of those 54,000 users, I had 70,000 sessions. I could see my average bounce rate was 43%. The pages per session were just over four. And the average session duration, how long did somebody stay on my website on average? About two minutes and 55 seconds. The average conversion rate was 0.14 and I had a total of 97 transactions, totaling $5,500. Okay, and that's all over the last 30 days. So any report you look at in analytics is gonna have a summary. And note that any report you look at in analytics is gonna allow you to save it. So if it's a report you think you're gonna go back and look at at a future date, then you simply just have to click on the save button. Conversely, if you don't wanna save it, you can simply just export it. So you can export it as a PDF. If I click on PDF, it's going to allow me to export that as a PDF. Now you have other options available to you as well. 
you can do a Google Sheet, you can export it as an Excel, or you can export it as a common delimited file. So here you can see I can save it as a PDF if I want to, and if I click OK, it's going to save to my desktop or location of my choosing, and then I can go back and look at it in that format at a later time. So that's the export feature available to you in analytics again if you you could save it as well or you can export it okay some other reports under acquisition if you're running google ads note that you can connect google ads to analytics and this is key because now i can see how many people are coming from google ads to my website and are they converting now this is important because with Google Ads, I'm actually paying for the click. So you can see here, I'm running a report based on campaign data. So I could see what campaigns are driving traffic, how much I'm paying per click, and you can see on average, I'm paying 34 cents per click. And then more importantly, I wanna be able to see if they're converting. So you can see I've spent $810 over the last 30 days and received $858 in revenue. So you want to make sure that you link up your Google Ads account to your Google Analytics account. For this very reason, you want to be able to see how your Google Ads campaigns perform once the users get to your website. And so I want to see if they're engaging and I want to see if they're converting. So there are all sorts of reports under Google ads. So you can look at it by keywords, by search queries, by hour of the day. If you're running display campaigns, you can look at display targeting. So there's all sorts of reports under Google ads. You just have to link it up and you link it up under the admin. Now there are other reports that you can look at. So if I go to campaigns, I can look at all campaigns so if you're running all sorts of different types of campaigns whether that be on Facebook whether that be email whether that be you know other types of advertising let's just say Twitter or Instagram you're gonna be able to see those campaigns here and that's under all campaigns and again you'll be able to see the campaign name and you'll be able to see metrics associated with those campaigns and more importantly you'll be able to see your e-commerce if you run an e-commerce platform or if you have goals set up so you'll be able to look at how your campaigns are not one not only driving traffic but two are they converting let's go from acquisition reporting to behavior so behavior reports are going to actually show you how users behaved once they got to your website once they landed on a page on your website how did they behave so when we looked at audience, we got a sense of who is coming. With acquisition, we get a sense of how the traffic got to our website. Did they come from organic, direct, social, etc.? The behavior reports allow us to actually measure how that traffic behaved once they landed on a page on our website. And so if I go to overview under behavior, now I'm looking at this graph here, it's showing me how many page views I've had. And a page view is simply, once a page is viewed, it's counted as a page view. So if a user comes to my site, they're initiating a session. And if they look at a page, then that page is going to have a page view. Okay, so a user can look at a page multiple times in a session. And every time they look at that page, it's going to count as a page view. So here I can see in this graph how many page views I've had again over the last 30 days. And if I look further at my overview report, I can see the specific pages and how many page views they've had. And I can also look at some other metrics. Okay, the average bounce rate, the average time on page. I can look at the exit rate, which means how many people actually exited or the percentage of people who exited from that page. So I can dig deeper into my behavior reporting. So if I click on site content and I click on all pages, then I'm going to look at a report by page. This is my dimension. This is what I'm measuring, my page. And now I can see how many page views each page had over the last 30 days. Now note you also have something called unique page views. So unique page views is equivalent to one per session. In other words, if a user came to my site and looked at the home page, then the home page is going to have one unique page view and one page view. Now if the user in that same 
same session looks at other pages, then every page that user looks at is going to have one unique page view. However, if the user goes back to a to the same page in the same session, then it's still going to be one unique page view. But in this case, the home page, if they look at the home page a second time, then the home page is going to have two page views. If they look at the home page five times in one session, then the home page is going to have five total page views and one unique page view. Okay, so that's why unique pages is equivalent to one per session, where page views is an accumulation of how many times the page was viewed in the same session. So in other words, you're always going to have more page views than unique pages. Okay, so this gives me a sense of how my page is performed. So again, I can look at total page views and then engagement. So ideally what you want to do with a report like this is if a user is not engaging on the page, then that should tell you something about the page itself. If they're not engaging, if the bounce rate's high, if the time on page is low, if the exit percentage of exit rate is high, then you probably want to do something with that page. Now, these are all pages, but if I jump down to landing pages, my landing page report is showing me how many people actually landed on that page. And so here I can see under my landing page report, I can see the home page had 36,017 sessions in the last 30 days. That's how many people landed on the home page. So here I can see 71% were new sessions, meaning that I had a lot of new users who landed on the home page. In fact, 25,000 or 52% of the people who landed on the home page were new. I could see the bounce rates about 42%, but of those who didn't bounce, they went on to look at about 4.5 pages per session and spent about three minutes on the site. And the one thing I like about the landing page report as I can also see whether that particular page, in this case, the home page, did it help contribute to a goal or conversion? And in this case, I can see of those 36,000 sessions, I had 22 transactions, totaling 1,200 in revenue, and that's an e-commerce conversion rate of 0.06%. So the home page over the last 30 days contributed to 0.06% of the revenue. So this gives you an idea of when somebody lands on your website and they land on a page, is that page helping to move that person along? Meaning, are they not bouncing? And is that page helping to move people towards converting? And so that's what the landing page in effect allows us to measure is the engagement. And in this case, we're measuring transactions. Okay, so analytics also gives us some other reports under behavior, including site speed. So site speed to me is an important report to look at, just like the mobile report. To me, site speed is important because what Google Analytics does is they take a sampling of pages. And in this case, you can see over the last 30 days, they sampled 2,835 page views. And of that sample, they came back and said, the average page load time is about four seconds. Now, ideally you wanna keep it as quick as possible. I would say even under three seconds. Okay, now there are other factors involved with page load time. The browser you're using, the country that you're actually browsing that page from might not have the best infrastructure. You may not even be on the best internet network, meaning you're on a cell network or the Wi-Fi is not that great. Or you can be on a page that just has a lot of images or a lot of code that may slow it down. So there are other factors involved. And so, what Google Analytics does is show you what those factors are. So here I can see by browser what the average load time is. If I want to look at country, I could see what country is contributing to the load time. Now, the great thing about the site speed report is if I go to speed suggestions, okay, what speed suggestions is going to do is it's going to show me the page load time by page. And then it's actually going to provide a link where I can actually click on to get suggestions on increasing the page load time. So for example, I can look at this particular page here, this Google redesign shop by brand slash YouTube page, line number five. If I look at line number five, I can see the average load time of this page is eight seconds, almost nine seconds, okay? That's an eternity to some people. 
Now notice this link next to it. So Google's recommending seven total suggestions. So if I click on seven total, what it's actually gonna do, it's gonna open up a new window and it's going to open up another Google report called PageSpeed Insights. And PageSpeed Insights is gonna give me some information about what I can do to create correct correct the page load of that particular page so look at the site speed report it's important because there is a correlation between site speed or page load time and user behavior of that page and there's also a correlation between page load time and a page ranking organically on search so page load time is very important it's so important that i'm even going to save it so i'm going to click save and click on speed site speed suggestions as my name and click ok and now that report is going to be saved under customization under save reports let's jump from behavior to conversions now conversion reporting is arguably the most important section in, in Google Analytics because what the conversions reporting allows us to do is see how people are converting or if they're not converting on our website and so in Google Analytics we have the opportunity to set up goals now you have the opportunity to set up 20 goals in your Google Analytics view and so to set up a goal, okay, so you're gonna click on admin and under the view, you're gonna see goals. And so if you don't even have goals, the first step is to create goals. And so you have four different goal types in analytics. So you have pages per session. So how many pages per session is, so if your goal is set to say three or two, if somebody actually looked at two or three pages per session, it's gonna count as a goal. Okay, so if I look here, I could see I have pages per session set at 10. So that means that if a user came to the site, looked at more than 10 pages per session, then it's going to count as a goal. Another goal type is destination. So destination means that if somebody actually went to a specific page, then it's going to count as a goal. And in this case, I can see here that the goal is set to this particular page here. And so when somebody actually lands on that page, it's going to count as a goal. Now, there are two other goal types we can look at. One is duration. So just like pages per session in our previous example, if somebody looked at 10 pages per session, it's going to count as a goal. With duration, it's based on time. So in this particular case, if you set up a duration goal, and the duration is set to say one minute and 30 seconds then that means if a user comes to my website and they spend at least one minute and 30 seconds then it's going to count as a goal okay and then the fourth type of goal in google analytics is an event-based goal so when you set up event tracking you could turn that event into a goal so if somebody clicks on say the submit button of a form you can turn that event into a goal so here you could see the category equals contact form so you can always verify if a goal works just by clicking on verify this goal and in this case this event is turned into a goal so anytime somebody fires this event it's going to count as a goal so you have four different goal types in google analytics you have pages per session destination event and duration and so once you've set up a goal then you can measure goals under conversions so now if i look at goals overview i can be able to see how many total goal completions i've had so if i want to look at it by goal i can just choose the goal option here so if i want to look at for example goal two engaged users this was the pages per session i can see that i had a conversion rate of 10 percent meaning that i had 7,000 of all the users who came to the website 7,000 goal completions meaning 7,106 users looked at 10 pages or more on my website. And so that's how you wanna be able to measure whether users, where they're, ever they're coming from, whoever they are, whatever pages they look at, you wanna be able to look at the conversion reports to see if they're actually converting based on the goals you've set up, whether that's pages per session, duration, destination, or event, goal conversion tracking reports can help you measure who is actually converting. And the great thing about Google Analytics here is that 
I can actually see by segment. So the default segment in a segment is just looking at a specific user set. So the default segment is always all users. However, I can choose a different segment. So if I want to choose instead of all users, if I want to choose mobile traffic, I can select mobile traffic, hit apply. So I'm actually now looking at a subset of data. I'm looking at mobile traffic. So if all the mobile users have come to my site, I can see 1400 engaged or looked at 10 pages or more. Okay. And that's a 7% conversion rate. So the great thing about Google Analytics is you have the opportunity to set up four different goal types. Okay. Based on those goal types, you can go to goals overview and look at the conversion rate of each goal, but you can also change the segment of that particular goal to see who exactly converted. Okay, another report I like under conversions is the multi-channel funnel report. So if I click on multi-channel funnel, basically what this allows me to do is see how different channels work together to convert. So remember the channel reporting we looked at under acquisition. Here I can see now how different channels work together to drive the conversion. So if I look at three channels, direct, organic, and referral, I can see all three together drive 2% of the conversions. If I look at direct and referral, 12.5%. If I look at direct and organic, 12.24%. So I can see how different channels work together. And so if I look at top conversion paths as an example, I can actually see what channels, how channels work together to drive the conversion. So in this example, I can see over the last 30 days that my top channel grouping was direct times two, meaning that somebody came to the website directly, meaning they typed in the URL in the browser or they bookmarked it and came to the site. Okay, they came the first time but didn't convert. But then they came back a second time via direct and then converted. So that combination is my top conversion combination of the last 30 days. My second best conversion grouping is organic search and direct, meaning that a user came to the website via organic search first, did not convert, and then came back via direct the second time and converted. So basically what analytics does is give credit to the last referral, meaning if you came to the website via referral or referring website and converted, then the referring website's gonna get the credit for the conversion. But analytics does a good job of showing you how different channels work together. So a channel may drive a lot of traffic like organic search, but that traffic may not convert the first time around for a number of different reasons, whether it could be brand recognition, price shopping, reading content, whatever the case, analytics is able to measure if that channel actually did contribute at a later point. And in this case, we could see organic search drove traffic that didn't convert, but that traffic came back a second time via direct and did convert. So that's our second best channel grouping. And so the multi-channel funneling report, top conversion pass, to me is a good report to look at. So you can actually see not only how channels work together, but you can see sources and mediums and campaigns and how all that, all those different campaigns and different sources work together to convert. So that's just a good report to look at. There are so many different reports available in analytics. There's so many that we haven't even gotten to yet. So my advice, if you look at the demo report, you can get a feel for each of these reports under each section, whether that be audience, acquisition, behavior, or conversions. Take a look at these reports, see what makes sense to you, see what you can use to improve your website performance. For this particular webinar, we're gonna jump into Google Analytics directly and spend all of our time there because it's about learning practical applications. So goals are important. Goals, uh, let me just say this, goals are in analytics, something that should be aligned with your business. And we call goals that are aligned with your business, KPIs or key performance indicators. So it's very important as a precursor that you know how to set up goals in Google Analytics, because if you're using Google Analytics, you want to measure everything against the goal. So without further ado, 
Let's jump right into Google Analytics. So if I go to Google Analytics and I log in, okay, what I want to do is go down to admin, click on admin here, and admin will take you to basically a screen that looks like this, where you have a account column, you have your property column, and then you have your view column. Now, the view column is where you're gonna go to set up goals, okay? So every view, in every property has up to 20 goals. Okay, so by default in analytics, you're gonna have at least one view for your property. So if I have a property, I'm gonna have at least one view. But if I happen to set up multiple views like you see here, then I know for every view I set up, I have 20 goals to work with. So where are those goals? So under the view, I'm gonna click on goals. And now I can see I have 20 at my disposal. Now, you could see here by clicking on the recording column, I could see I have in this particular property, this particular view, I have five goals that are active. So you can use up to 20, but you don't have to have 20 active, okay? You can have one active, two active. My recommendation is at least have one goal. Again, when you set up a goal, you're gonna measure everything in analytics against that goal. Okay, so in this case, we have five particular goals we're measuring. So we have five active out of 20 total. So if I don't no, no longer wanna use a goal, I can simply just turn it off. If I wanna continue using it, just turn it on. Okay, it's that simple. You could turn on and off goals. So here I already have five set up. So if you wanna set up a new goal, the one thing you need to know in Google Analytics is in order to set up a new goal, okay, you need to have edit access, at least the view level, I would say at the property level. So you wanna make sure whoever's in charge of Google Analytics for your organization, or if you're in charge, okay, you simply just wanna to go to user management and user management, you wanna make sure the email address you're using to log into Google Analytics has at least edit permissions. So you're gonna need edit permissions to add new goals. So I have edit permissions, I'm gonna to go to goals, and I wanna set up a new goal. But before we jump in and set up a new goal, what is it that we want to achieve? That's really the question we wanna ask ourselves. What is the goal of the website? Well, if it's somebody downloading something, okay, are you measuring that download via an event? Okay, are they filling out a form submission before they download? So if they submit that form submission, is that the goal? Or do you have an e-commerce site? Is somebody purchasing something? So these are things you wanna ask yourself before you actually set up the goal. What is it that I'm trying to measure? Now, when you actually do go to set up a goal, you're gonna click on the red CTA button that says new goal. So analytics actually has some templates set up for you. Okay, you can see them here. Okay, if you're somebody's registering online or creating an account or reading review, downloading something, sharing something, you could choose all of these options here. What I normally do is choose custom. 99% of the time, I'm just gonna choose custom. It doesn't really matter if you use the template or not. It's just a template is basically some free, pre-filled configurations, but my recommendation is always just go with custom. You want total control over how to set up your goal. So we already have in mind what type of goal we wanna set up. So for example, if somebody goes to fill out a form submission and they go to a thank you page after that, well, what's the URL of that thank you page? We wanna be able to track how many people go to that page because we know if somebody does type in or fill in a form submission and goes to that page, we know that they filled out the form. And so for example, if I go to continue, I'm gonna name my goal first. So I'm gonna say thank you page. As an example, notice analytics is assigning an ID. So notice this is goal ID. 15. That means that that's the next available goal. There are 20 goals available in analytics. And so what analytics does is they group goals together. So one through five, six through 10, 11 through 15, 16 through 20 into goal sets. So for example, 
goal 16 through 20 as part of goal set four. And why does Google Analytics combine these goals into different goal sets? Well, because it's easier to ma measure and look at data by goal sets. So for example, if I jump into any report here, if I go to all traffic channels and I wanna measure how many goals by channel, I can look at it by goal set. So if I have goal set one selected, then I know any goal I have active in there between goal ID one through goal ID five, I'm gonna be able to see those goals in goal set one. And now I'm gonna be able to measure every goal I have active in goal set one against the channel. So if I choose goal set two, whatever goals are active there, goal set three, et cetera. Notice I don't have any goals 16 through 20 active that are in goal set four. Therefore, I don't have that option available to me. So back to admin, the bottom left navigation, again, goals. Okay, we want to measure somebody going to the thank you page. We have edit access. We're going to choose custom as our goal setup. We're going to type in a goal name. I'm just going to say thank you. Okay, this is goal 15. Now, this is the important part. Google Analytics has four different goal types, destination, duration, pages per session, or screens per session. So screens per session is related to mobile because Google Analytics measures mobile app activity. And then you have an event. So we're gonna cover all four of these, but for the sake of this simple example, I'm gonna choose destination. Why? Because if somebody goes to that thank you page, we're gonna go ahead and put in the thank you page as the goal, the goal URL. So for example, destination is my choice. I'm gonna click continue. Now, this is where I'm gonna put the URL. So if my URL is just simply thankyou.html, I can just go ahead and put thankyou.html. Or if it's just thank you, then I can just do thank you. Depends on the website, depends on the URI structure. So whatever that URL is, that's what you're gonna put in. And when you're done, you can verify it. So what Google Analytics does is actually will verify over the last seven days if anybody's actually gone to that particular page. So if we click verify, we could see 0% conversion rate. So that tells us that if this is the correct URL, then we've had 0% people go to that page. This is just an example. However, if you didn't see a conversion, then you might wanna make sure you check the URL here that you put in. And if you do see a conversion rate, then you know it's working. So Google Analytics actually has options. So we're saying thank you is equal to, so the destination URL is equal to thank you or thank you.html or thank you.asp or whatever that thank you page is. Okay, you do have options. So if you have a long URL, you could say begins with, and you could say begins with say thank you. So this is the logic. We're gonna say, hey, if anybody goes to a URL that begins with thank you, then count it as a goal. Or you could say equals to. So if anybody goes to a URL that equals to thank you, then count it as a goal. You have one more option here, regular expression. So Google Analytics understands the language of regular expressions. So regular expressions are just special characters used to communicate with Google Analytics in order to hone in on exactly what you're trying to track. So we can always say, you know, starts with or ends with. So we can, you know, use characters like the dollar sign, ends with or begins with. So we can always do that. So you can use regular expressions as well if you're familiar with regular expressions. If you're not, then you don't have to use them, but there are special characters where that you can insert in that are used as regular expression. So if you're not familiar with regular expression, don't choose that option. You could choose the other option of equals to or begins with. Now note that on all three of these options, I didn't put the domain. So if my domain is ama-foundation.org slash and then thank you, I don't need to put the domain because analytics is already, already knows what domain we're tracking. So you don't have to put in the domain here when you're entering in, in this case, the goal URL. So you can omit the domain. So when you put in that URL, you know that you have three options to work with 
And then you always, always want to verify that goal URL. You always want to verify it because if you see 0% conversion, and in this case of the last seven days, then that should tell you something. Either your goal is not set up correctly or you just don't have any conversion. Either way, you want to double check that. Now, when it comes to the destination URL goal, you do have an option here for funnel. So if I turn on funnel, then that means I have the ability to track how people went through my funnel. So if I have a cart and I want to be able to track how many people go in and out of the cart, then I have the option of adding specific pages as part of the cart. So we could say, you know, step one, which is basically cart. We could say step two is billing information. That could be slash billing. We could say step three is shipping information slash shipping. And then step four could be, you know, confirm. And that could be slash confirmation. So whatever your URL structure is for your cart, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a cart. Basically, all I'm doing is putting in a series of steps with URLs as each step. And why do I want to do that? Because I can then track how many people go through my funnel that I've created. Okay, so here I could see this is my funnel that I've created for this particular goal. Okay, and the funnel is only available for the destination URL. So the funnel is available if you want to see traffic through the goal. Okay, and how it, people go through the funnel and where they drop off. Now you have an option here to make the first step required. So if you make that first step required, then that means you're measuring the funnel through the first step only. Now, if I turn that off, then I'm measuring the funnel through each step, meaning that I can measure people as they drop in and out of the funnel, where if it's required the first step, then I'm only measuring traffic as it enters in the top of the funnel. So you have that option available to you, the funnel. And then for all goals, you do have a value. So if somebody did actually convert, okay, Google Analytics is going to count it as a conversion and you can assign a value. So if you're not an e-commerce website, then you may want to think about assigning value. If you are an e-commerce website, then analytics has the ability to track e-commerce revenue for your website. So you don't need to add a value. But in this case, let's just say you're a nonprofit organization and you're collecting donations. And on average, over the past year, every donation that somebody contributed was equal to $5. Well, you can just go ahead and put $5 in there as the value for that goal. So that means that if somebody did go to, in this example, slash thank you and convert, Analytics is going to count it as a goal and then assign $5 value alongside that goal. So if you're non-e-commerce, if you're, say, a nonprofit like this organization or you're B2B and you want to track some value, then you have that option there. So with the destination URL goal, you have the option of adding a funnel. With all goal types, you have the option of adding a value. All goal types, and we're going to go through the rest of them, you have the option of verifying that goal. So that's the structure of setting up a goal. Destination URL is just one goal type. We're going to talk about the other three goal types because in Google Analytics, there are four goal types. Again, destination is one of them. With destination, as you do have the option with all goal types, is you have to be able to choose your logic here. So we're going to cover that with the other three, but just know when you set up a destination URL goal, you have the option of adding a funnel. Now, when you actually do set up a funnel, What's going to happen is analytics is going to measure traffic as it goes through the funnel. So where do you look for that funnel information? Well, you want to get out of admin. You want to go to the left side navigation. You want to click on conversions, then goals, then funnel visualization. So based on the funnel you set up, you're going to be able to see traffic as it goes through the funnel. So notice on this particular funnel, we don't have the first step required. Why? Because I could see traffic as it goes in and out of each step of the funnel. So let's go through this funnel and see how people react. So here I could see the first step is the storefront page. 
So over this particular period of time, I had 84 sessions enter the storefront page. So out of those 84, I can see 21 left the storefront page. 63 went on to the next step in the funnel, which is the cart page. I can then see 24 people went on to the cart page directly and five exited the site altogether. Okay, so that gave me 87 total. And from 87, I saw that 82 went on to the next page with the next step. What analytics does is they give you a percentage. So in the first step, we had 63 move on to the cart page. Out of 84, that's 75%. So from the cart page to the create your account page, we had 94% move on. So we didn't have anybody enter in the create your account page. We didn't have anybody leave the create your account page. So we have 82%, 82, create your account, and then we have 82, move on to the payment page. So that's 100%, okay? We have one exit, so we have 81 that proceeded to be on the payment page, which was purchase. So 81 of 82 is 98%. And we started with 84, so that gave us, plus the 24 that we accumulated along the way, so that gave us a 75% funnel conversion rate. So 75% of the people who entered in the funnel went on to purchase. Okay, so don't be confused with the overall e-commerce conversion rate. So 75% is the funnel conversion rate. The overall conversion rate for this particular goal is 18.45% over this particular period of time. Why? Because that takes into account all sessions that have won to the website. So 18% of all traffic went on to convert, but those that did go into the funnel, 75% converted. So that's a look at the funnel. So if you set up a funnel, that's what it's gonna look like. You have the option to measure everything from step one and beyond, or measure as traffic goes in and out of the funnel. So the purpose of this, is we're gonna be able to see where traffic drops off, how effective our funnel is, what pages we need to address in that funnel. Okay, so that's the whole point of the funnel, and the funnel is available with the destination URL goal. So if I go back to admin, if I go back to goals under the view, I can actually see what that funnel looks like. So here we chose regular expression. So this is what the URL is. Okay, you can see our funnel in each of the steps we have set up. Notice we're using regular expressions here. And then if we verify this goal, we could see over the past seven days, 19% conversion rate. So that tells me something's working in this particular, with this particular goal, because we do have a conversion rate. Okay, so that's the destination URL goals. Let's now talk about the other three types of goals. So the next goal type we're gonna talk about is pages per session. So if you're not sure what type of goal to set up for your website, at the very least, you should try and set up either duration related goal or pages per session related goal. So let's talk about the pages per session. So basically what this goal is going to allow us to measure is for example, if we set the goal to three pages per session, then we're gonna be able to measure if how many people went to the site and looked at three pages per session. So let's take a look at that goal. So if I open up the goal, here I can see three pages per session is what we're naming it. So basically what we're asking analytics to do is anything greater than two pages, which would be three and beyond, count as a goal. So if anybody comes to the site, looks at more than two pages, three pages or more, then it's going to count as a goal. And so here we can verify it. So if we verify it over the last seven days, we could see a 4.12% conversion rate. And that tells me that 4% of my traffic over the last seven days looked at at least three pages or more. So you're probably asking yourself, well, what number should I put in for the actual variable? So in this case, we see two. Well, what you wanna do is you wanna look at 
on average, let's just say year to date, you want to make sure you have statistical significance. So you want to look at a period of time. So if you go to analytics, go to audience, okay? And then if you go to overview, and if I change my date range to year to date, I could see on average right now, I have 1.21 pages per session. So that's on average. So we don't want to make our goal one page. We don't want to make our goal two pages. We want to make it three. So we want to be able to basically measure at a higher rate. Okay, why do we want to measure at a higher rate? Because if 1.21 is the average, then two pages per session really isn't moving the needle. So what we really want to do is get people to stay on the site longer, look at pages more uh, during their session. So look at more pages. And so we want to be able to see what segment of the audience is looking at more pages, what channels driving traffic that's looking at more pages, what pages are contributing to more pages per session. So the whole idea is you want to hone in on what your goal is and see what's working and then see what's not working so you can make adjustments. The whole idea behind Google Analytics is to improve website performance. And so if our average is 1.2, then if we change it to just two, it may not be good enough. So in this case, you know, we want to up the bar a little bit. So we're going to choose three. Now you can choose four or five. That's perfectly fine. Just know if your average is 1.2, I wouldn't choose one page per session as my goal. And I probably wouldn't choose two. So I'd set the bar a little bit higher. Now, the third goal type available in Google Analytics is also engagement related, and that's duration. So just like pages per session, we can measure how long somebody stays on the website, and we could set up a goal for that. So in this case, I have a goal set for 1 minute 30 seconds. So my goal type is duration. So if I click continue, then basically I'm asking analytics, in this case, Anybody who stays more than one minute and 30 seconds on the website count it as a goal. And so before you actually put in the number of hours, minutes, and seconds, you want to look at that average. So if you go back to audience overview, here I can see a minute and seven. So do we want a minute and 30? Maybe we could do that. Maybe we can go with two minutes. So again, the whole point is you want to set the bar a little bit higher than what the average is. And so here I can see over the last seven days, if I verify this particular goal, I can see 8% of my traffic over the last seven days stayed on the site at least one minute and 31 seconds. Okay, they stayed greater than one minute and 30. And so the whole point is you can hone in because this is a goal. I can go in, this is goal, okay, this is a goal here. And so I could see that this is goal 13. So now I can go to acquisition as an example. I can go to channels as an example. Since this is a goal, this is goal 13. So that would be in goal set three. So I can actually see what channel is basically driving that goal. Okay. In other words, what channel is driving traffic that is staying on the site at least one minute and 30 seconds. And so that's the whole idea behind goals. So likewise for pages per session, we can go into channels and here I can see we've have a th over this period of time, year to date, pages per session, we have 3% conversion rate. And here I could see, for example, organic search has a 13% conversion rate. Here I could see social media has a 10%. So I could see that or people coming from organic search are staying on the site longer or they're looking at more pages than any other channel. So just like duration or destination or any goal you set up, you can measure that goal against any dimension. Just because it's engagement doesn't mean you can't, you absolutely can. And so the whole point of engagement related goals is to figure out what's driving traffic to the site, but what traffic is engaging. So you want to be able to pinpoint that so you can improve website performance. Now, the fourth goal type available in Google Analytics is an event. So if you click on new goal, you click custom, click continue, you have the option 
to choose an event. So an event is something that you can measure on your website that analytics can't measure by default. So if you want to measure PDF downloads or clicks on buttons or clicks on play buttons on a video or click on a submit button or click on an external link, I mean, you can measure pretty much anything with an event, then you want to be able to turn that event into a goal. So let's quickly summarize what an event is. So again, we want to be able to measure a particular event that happens on the website. So in order to do so, we need to identify that event. So if I go to, for example, this particular website here, and I want to measure how many times somebody clicks on the donate now button. Well, if I met, I can measure that as an event. So when you set up an event in analytics, you have to actually assign a category and an action for that event. So that's the first thing you need to do when you identify an event related goal. First, you need to set up the event. And in order to set up the event, you need to assign a category and action. Okay, so once you identify what you want to track as an event on your website, you're actually going to go in a tag manager or have your webmaster go in a tag manager and set up a tag. And in that tag, they're going to assign that particular category and action. And so here you can see we have this set up. Our category is named donate now and our action is click. And that's what we want to do. We want to measure how many people click on that donate now button. So anytime somebody does that, then the category donate now is going to appear in analytics with the action click. So when you actually do set up an event, you can go into analytics and you could test that event. So if I go to the website and I click donate now, Okay, the reason why I have this as an event is because I'm taking to a third party website to handle the donations. So here I can go into analytics and now I can see a category is being fired for header donate with the action click. So that's my category and that's my action. So that category and action is what is firing after somebody clicks on the donate now button. So if I want to turn this event into a goal, I can easily do that. Now that I've set up the event, now that I've identified the category in action, I want to go back to admin and set up the event with these parameters in place. So it just turns out we already have the goal set up. So let's go through how this goal was set up. So first we chose custom, we chose event, we gave it a name. So as a best practice, when you actually set up a goal as an event or turn an event into a goal, I would add the prefix event colon to it. And then that way, when you're identifying goals and you're reporting, you know it's an event. So I'm going to click continue. And now that I've actually have set up the event already in Google Tag Manager, I've given it a category, I've given it an action. Okay, see here you can see we have a regular expression set up. So anything with the header donate or donate is going to fire this goal. So over the last seven days, I have a 0.81% conversion rate. Okay, I could have easily put in equals to and put in whatever the action what or the category which is donate now or i could have put action equals click i could have done that as well so let me show you another example here so if i do this custom continue events donate now here's my goal id it's going to be an event so all i need to do is put in the category and action so donate now and then click so that's all I have to do. And that's my goal. So I can verify it. Okay. To see if anybody's fired it. And basically that's what I need to do to turn that event into a goal. Okay. So you need to set up for an event. First, you need to identify the event, set it up in Google Tag Manager, which is another platform. And once you've done that, then you have your category in action. Once you have your category in action, you're again going to go into analytics and then simply put in that category and action into the appropriate fields to set up your event related goal. Now, all events don't have to be turned into a goal. If you actually do set up an event 
and you're not worthy of a goal, meaning it's not a KPI or doesn't align with your business goals, well, don't fret. You can always just go to behavior. Okay. You can always go to events. You can always go to overview and measure your events that way. So here you could see all of our events that are fired. Now we do have this one turn into a goal. So if it's important for our business, then we want to make sure we convert that particular event into a goal. Okay. If it's not important, for example, somebody's just clicking on a social button, then you don't necessarily have to turn that event into a goal if you don't want to. Know that it's sitting here under events, under behavior. So the point I'm trying to make here, if it's important to your business and you're already tracking it as an event via Google Tag Manager, then feel free to turn it into a goal. All you need is that category. All you need is that action. And so, so one final note on that event related goal, just like any other goal, you can add a value. Okay. So if I have an event set up, I can choose to add a value here or in Google Tag Manager, if I've assigned a value to that event. So if I go back to the actual event in Google Tag Manager, you could see I have a value set up for $1. Then I could just go into analytics and say, you know what? I already have the value added. So go ahead and use the value added in Google Tag Manager. Okay. So I'm going to choose yes. Now, if I choose no, I have the option to add the value here, just like I would with any other goal. So just keep that in mind. You can add a value to any goal type with an event related goal. You can add the value right into the tag in Google Tag Manager, just as I've done here. So remember when you actually set up your goals, whether it's a destination, pages per session, duration, or an event, you can just go ahead and choose that goal set that it's in and measure any dimension against that particular goal. So here I can see e-newsletter signups by channel. I can go into another goal set here. I can see contact form submissions. Okay. I can see what particular channels driving contact form submissions. Okay. So just know that you can align a goal against any dimension. So if you have e-commerce, you don't have to set up for goal for that. That's separate. But if you want to take a look at your goals and analytics on its own, you can just go to conversions, goals, overview. Here, I can actually get a good sense of how my goals are performing over a period of time. So again, if I choose, for example, year to date, now I could see based on the goals I've set up, how many total goal completions, value, which takes into account the value we've added into these goals. Okay, the total conversion rate. And here I can see it broken down by the goal I actually have set up. And I can see it by page or I can see it by source and medium. So I can see Google Organic is driving the most goal completions, then Google CPC, direct, and then I could see some others in here as well, contributing to goals. Now, I do wanna point your attention to another report in Google Analytics that does take into account goals and that's multi-channel funneling. So again, under conversion goals, multi-channel funnels. If I go to assisted conversions, I can actually see what channel in this example is assisting with the conversions I've set up. And so what do we mean by assisted conversions? Well, that means that if a channel, let's just say organic search drove traffic to the website and that traffic didn't convert when it arrived at the website and left. But it came back a week later via another channel, let's just say email. And when they came back via email, they did convert during that session. Well, what analytics does is they give an assist to organic search because they help drive the traffic to the website. So it's similar to the game of basketball. If I have the ball and I pass it to my colleague and my colleagues, the one who scores because they had the ball last, well, they get the credit for the point, i.e. the conversion, but I get an assist. And so analytics works the same way. They're always going to give credit to the last click or direct conversion, but they will give credits to the channel in this case that assisted with the conversion. So that's under assisted conversion. 
and that's based on the goals you have set up. You can highlight any particular goal here. If I want to hone in on, say, the donate clicks only, then I'm going to be able to see what contributed to that particular goal. So there's another report in here, top conversion pass, that I think is important. So after you set up your goals, you can actually see what channels in this particular example help to drive conversions. Again, this is year to date. So I can see all the different combinations of channels that work together to contribute to a conversion. So again, I can choose a specific goal or I can choose all my goals. So those two reports are under multi-channel funneling. There's also another report that I think is good and that's time lag, meaning how long did it actually take somebody to convert? So here you can see most of our conversions, 265 year to date, happened on the day somebody arrived on the website. But I could see I did get some conversions a day later, two days later, etc. So you have time lag, top conversion paths, assisted conversions. They're all under multi-channel funneling and they're all available after you set up at least one goal. And so if you're not sure what goal to set up, Okay, don't fret. You can always at least set up an engagement related goal. So that's available to you. Duration, pages per session. You also have destination and event tracking. And they're all available to you. You have 20 available per view. Now, if you're not quite sure exactly what type of goal to set up, there is an option available in analytics and that's the gallery. So you can always import a goal from the gallery. So in other words, we could take a look at what other people have set up in terms of goals. So you just have to click on the button import from gallery and it'll take you to the gallery and you'll be able to see what other goals others have set up. Today we're going to talk about how to set up event tracking in Google Analytics. So let's get started. So many of you out there have a website similar to the one I'm looking at now. This is a nonprofit that I work with, Ama Foundation. And like this website and probably like your website, you probably have some interactivity on there that needs to be tracked. For example, buttons. Uh, if you have buttons like this one that says donate or newsletter sign up or there's a PDF download or a video that needs to be, you know, tracked based on the amount of people who click on the play button. So, I mean, all sorts of interactivity on a website. Have you ever wondered how to track that? Well, there is a way to track that because by default, Google Analytics can't track interactivity and engagement on your website like you probably want to have your website tracked. So if you have buttons and videos and things of that nature that you want to have tracked, well, you're going to need event tracking. And if you're in analytics and you're always wandering around the data and you happen to find yourself under events, well, if you want events on your website and you want data to populate under behavior top events, you're going to need to set up event tracking. So event tracking is a two part process. And we're going to talk about that two part process. The first part of that is to identify what you want to track. Okay, so if we go back to our example website here, I'm a foundation. Again, we noted there's a lot to track here. We got a donate now button. We got a newsletter sign up. We have some social icons. Okay, we got a donate now button here. We got a play button here. We got all sorts of interactivity. You know, we got a button here that says, you know, purchase tickets for an upcoming event. I can go throughout the website and find different buttons and things to, to, to track. Let me just say this. There's no shortage of what you can track on your website with event tracking. So event tracking is just basically in layman's terms, tracking engagement on your site because Google Analytics by default is only going to track page view data, meaning how somebody got to your website, what page they looked at, how long they stayed on that page, what page they left from. More or less their timing, how long somebody stays on the website and what pages they look at. So there's more to a website than just how long somebody stayed on a page. And so in this example, we want to be able to track everything here, not just the donate now button, but everything, because once you get the hang of event tracking, then it's very easy to set up. Okay. So step one, identify what you want to track. 
Okay, so there's a lot we want to track. We're just going to use one example to start off with, and that's going to be this donate now button. Okay, so this donate now button we want to track. Now we have a newsletter sign up, we have Facebook, and, and that's fine. You could track all that, but for the sake of going through a step by step process today, let's just focus on the donate now button. Let's focus on the donate now button, then we'll come back and start tracking these other things. But this is what we want to track to start out with. Okay, so step one, identify what you want to track. Now, when it comes to tracking events on a website, you want to identify those events. So we did that by choosing this donate now button. Now, once we identify what we want to track, we need to assign two parameters for that event. So with event tracking, you have three parameters, but one is actually optional. So you have two mand mandatory parameters that you have to assign to everything you want to track on your website. And that's the category and then the action. So event label or label is the third parameter. But again, that's optional. Okay, so basically, when we identify an event on our website, we want to assign it a category and an action. Okay, so why do we want to assign it a category and an action? Because when we are in analytics, under behavior, under events, top events, we could see we have different categories here and we have different actions, we have different labels. So if I click on any one of these dimensions, I'm gonna be able to see some of the parameters I've entered in for previous events I'm tracking, okay? So the whole idea is you wanna be able to group different events together into a category and assign an action and assign a label to it. That's really what you're doing. You're just grouping and identifying the events you're trying to track. And so in this case, I have this donate now button sitting in the header. Okay, in fact, I have a lot of things sitting in the header. So if I wanted to, and I wanna track all these buttons, I can create a category called header. And then if I track all these buttons, all these buttons can sit in that same category if I wanted to. Or I can create a separate category for each of these buttons. It's up to you how you organize your categories because basically all you're doing is giving a name to what you're trying to track and the name is equivalent to a category. So in this case, the donate now button is very important. I'm just gonna call it category header donate. Now, I need to give an action to each category. And so in this case, I'm just gonna say click because that's what the action is doing. It's, it's somebody's taking the action of clicking. Now, if it's a video and it's a play button, I can assign an action of play. It's up to you whatever you name these parameters. You just need to be organized and methodical about what you name it, that's all. And so in this case, header donate and then click, okay? And so that's our category in action. And so that's clearly step two. So step one, identify what you wanna track. Step two, assign a category, action, and or label. But remember, label is optional. So if I go back in analytics here, I could see some categories. And if I click on action, I could see some actions that I've named. Now, step three. So we've identified in step one what we want to track. We've assigned a category and action. So step three is going into Google Tag Manager to set up the event. Okay, so if you're not familiar with Google Tag Manager, then you can easily just you know, do a Google search for Google Tag Manager, and basically you'll have all sorts of information on it. There's a good video overview of Tag Manager here that you can watch. So Tag Manager basically is what we want to use to set up event tracking. Now Tag Manager is used for a lot of different things, but the main thing we're doing here is setting up an event for our website. And so I'm logged in to the same email address I'm using for analytics, okay? So now I'm in Tag Manager and I want to set up my event for this Donate Now button. So what do I need to do? Well, for every event I wanna set up, I need to set up a tag, okay? So if I go to Tags, I can see I already have some tags set up and some of these are events. And so when you actually set up a tag, I recommend having a naming convention. So here you can see any event we set up, we start out by calling it GA-event-whatever it is we're trying to set up. 
And so in this case, we want to set up a new tag for the Donate Now button on our website. So we're in Google Tag Manager because Tag Manager is what's going to fire that event. So if I click on New, okay, and I click on Tag Configuration, I'm going to choose Google Analytics. And then I'm going to choose Event as my track type. So we want the data to show up in Google Analytics and we're tracking an event. We're not tracking a page view, we're tracking an event. And so now remember in step two, you identified what you want to call that category, you identify what you want to call that action, and you have some optional parameters like label. So first things first, header donates the name of our category and our action is click. And if you want to add in a label and a value, so if you want to assign a value, you can. If you want to add in a label, you can. Okay, those are optional. So you just need to focus on category and action. And then the last setting here that's probably worth mentioning is a non-interaction hit. Okay, so this is automatically set to false. And why is it set to false? Because it's a non-interaction. No, that's false. We want this event, if somebody clicks on the header donate, to be an interaction. So for example, if I land on this page here and I click on that donate now button that I'm tracking as an event and I actually leave the site, because I have my settings set to false, I want that click to be an interaction, then analytics is not going to count a bounce. If I change it to true, so from false to true, then that means it is going to be a non-interaction if somebody lands on the page and if somebody clicks on the button. So I don't want it to be a bounce. I want it to be an interaction. So my advice is leave it set to false. We're going to choose Google Analytics as our setting here. This is our variable for Google Analytics. So in other words, that variable is set to our analytics property ID. And more or less, that's what you need to do to set up the tag, okay? You need to, in step two, identify the category and action and or label and or value. Now, value can be anything you want. You're assigning a numerical value. So if you just assign one, anytime that event fires in analytics, it's going to have a value of one, okay? And so we have our non-interaction set to false. So anytime the event fires, it's going to count as an interaction and therefore not count as a bounce if somebody landed on that page. So that's more or less all you need to do to set up the tag in Google Tag Manager. Now, if somebody else is setting up the tag for you, then again, you want to revert to step two. You want to be able to give that person the appropriate category action and or label and or value. Why? Because you're the one that's going to be going into Google Analytics and you're the one that's going to have to go to behavior, events, top events, and look for the particular at category and action and or label. So you need to be able to communicate that information to whomever is setting up the tag. Now, if it's you, great. You already know what it is because you're entering that information into Tag Manager. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and choose a variable for my label parameter. And why do I wanna do that? Because in Tag Manager, I have something at my disposal called variables. And variables allow you to see specifically things that are being tracked. So in this case, I chose page path. Okay, so page path is a URL. And why did I choose page path as my variable for the parameter label? Because if somebody does click on the header donate button, and the header donate button on our website is on every page. So if I go to the children's page, I'm still gonna see that header donate button. And so for me, I wanna be able to see what page somebody clicked on that header donate button. And so this allows me to actually see in Google Analytics what page somebody clicked on the header donate down button. And so now if I go back to GTM, Google Tag Manager, I have a category, I have an action, and I have a label, which is a variable. Okay, so note that in Google Tag Manager, you have a lot of different variables at your disposal. And variables are there to help you identify specifically what is being tracked. So take a look at all the variables at your disposal in Tag Manager. In this example, I'm using PagePath. So now, once you set up your tag, pretty straightforward again. 
tag types, Google Analytics, track type is event. You are assigning the category action and or label and or value. You're changing or leaving the default in place for non-interaction hit. And then you're choosing the variable for Google Analytics, which is your property ID. So once you've done that, you have a tag. The second part of setting up a tag is to assign a trigger to that tag. So tag manager needs to be able to know when to fire that event. And so here I'm going to look at a trigger I've already set up for this particular event. And so if I click on it, I'll be able to see that what it is is a click on some links, not all links, but some links. I'm actually saying, hey, Google Tag Manager, fire this event when the click ID equals header donate button. Now, it just so happens that if somebody did click on this donate now button, they're going to go to another website, in this case, networkforgood.com. So in Tag Manager, I could have set the trigger to equal URL equal instead of click ID, I could have said URL equal networkforgood.com. So that could have been my logic for my trigger. In this case, I decided to go with the click ID. And so in this case, that button has an ID associated with it called header donate button. So if you wanted to use click ID for your event, for your button, you could simply just go to the website. You can right click on that button and click inspect element. And so when I actually inspect the element, I can see now the button here. You can see it's highlighted in the upper pane and in the lower pane. I can see where it's linking to. It's linking to networkforgood.com. But here you can see if I hone in a little, I can see ID equals header dash donate dash button. So that's the click ID. Notice there's also a class. I could have set the trigger to equal this class. Or again, I could have set the trigger to equal the URL or the page that this button is pointing to. I could have chosen any one of those, but I decided to go with the ID. So this is the ID I chose and that's the ID I have in my trigger okay so that is what's going to fire that event so if somebody clicks on a button that equals header dash donate dash button it's going to fire that event which is going to equal category header donate action click and then the label is going to be page path so now that we've set up our event we want to test to see if it actually works so there's two ways to go about testing an event and the first way is through Google Analytics. So if we go to Google Analytics and then we go to real time, okay, we can go to events and here you can see one is already fired. So let's go ahead and go to and test this and go to the website. So if I go here, for example, and I click on Amagar alumni. Okay. So if I click on that, you can see I'm under our family. And if I click on that button, then go back to analytics and look at real time, I should be able to see this event fire. So if I click on it, I'm going to go to network for good. Now, if I go back to analytics here in real time, under real time, under events per second, I can see that event firing category equals header donate the action equals click. Now, if I click on the category, here I can see the label. The label, remember, was page path. And here you could see this event fired on the Our Family page, which was the page I was just on. So that's one way to test to see if your event works. And in this case, analytics recognized the event. So it works, it fired. And so therefore it's going to show up under behavior, under events. You can go under overview or top events. Okay, and what am I going to look for? In this case, I'm going to look for header donate. Okay, if I click on header donate as my category, I'm going to be able to see my action. And if I click on action, I'll be able to see my label. In this case, homepage. And then later on, when the data propagates in analytics, I'll be able to see under label the page that I clicked on that header donate button, which is slash our family. Okay, the second way in which you can test to see if an event fires 
is if you preview. So if I click on preview in Tag Manager, okay, I'm gonna go into preview mode, okay? And preview mode allows you to see in analytics and Tag Manager and on the website what tags are firing. So here I can see I'm in preview mode now. So I'm gonna go to the website and I'm gonna refresh and in my browser, same browser I'm using for Tag Manager, I can see the tags that are being fired on this page already, okay, because I'm in preview mode. So here I can see remarketing, I could see page views, I could see Google Optimize, I could see some tags that are already firing on this page. Now, if I click on this button here by holding down my Shift Command and then click on that button, I'll be able to see that the tag fired in preview mode. There's my event, header donate, and I could see it fired. So now I could see it fired in the preview mode. So in addition to Google Analytics, in preview mode, I could see that that tag is fired and I know that it's working. So there you have it. You have two ways to test to see if the event fires. Again, you have real time and analytics. Okay, so in real time, if you just go up to real time, all you need to do is go down to events, go to your website, click on the button. If you see it firing in real time, then you know it works. The second version or second way to test your event is through the preview mode. Okay, if you see it firing in preview mode, then you know it's also working. Okay, so let's rehash our steps. First step is we wanna be able to identify what we wanna track. Okay, so it could be this newsletter sign up, it could be click on a Facebook, it could be anything we want to be able to track. An image, a click on a CTA button, whatever we want to track, identify it. Second step, identify the category action and label because that's what's going to show up in Google Analytics. Remember, label is optional, variable, or excuse me, value is optional. Third step, go into Tag Manager, actually set up your tag and your trigger. So if you set up a tag and it's an event, name it GA-Event. That way you can see in your list of tags in Tag Manager what event tracking you have already set up. So when you set up your tag, you set up your trigger, your trigger is based on logic. That can be a URL, it can be a click ID, it can be a class ID, whatever you wanna to use to fire that event. And then once you do that, you wanna test it, you could test it in GTM or you could test it in Google Analytics. If it doesn't fire, you wanna tweak your trigger. If it does fire, then great. And then one thing I would recommend is if you're setting up various events for your website, as a best practice, what I would recommend is set up a spreadsheet. And in that spreadsheet, you know, you want to put a note. What's firing? What are you doing to fire? It could be, in this case, when somebody clicks on the Donate Now button in the header. You want to put the tag name in here, the type. Okay, then you wanna record your category, action, and label. And then the great thing about events is you could turn those events into goals. And that's as simple as going back into analytics. Okay, so if I go in analytics and I go to admin and I go to goals, if you set up a new goal, okay, all you need to do is choose custom, click continue. You're going to choose event as your goal name. And then from a naming perspective in Google Analytics for your goal, I would definitely put event first and then click on header donate. Okay, so if I click now continue, what is my category? It's equal to header donate. My action is click. And so I can verify to see if this is working. And here I can see in analytics that the goal would have a 0.22% conversion rate. So that tells me that the goal is working and I can turn this event into a goal. And when you turn something into a goal in analytics, then you can measure it across all dimensions. That's what I would recommend if the event is equal to a KPI or a business goal or it's of importance. It's something you really want to measure. Okay, if it's just a click, say on a Facebook button, I wouldn't recommend setting that up as a goal. Okay, so once you've set up your event, you've recorded it in your spreadsheet, it's firing, you wanna be able to then go back into behavior, back into events. Okay, you can go to top events, 
Okay, so top events tell you by category as a default what events are firing or what category is firing the most. Okay, so if I choose my date range here, I can just go to here to date. So here I can see my enter donate button, fortunately for me, has the most total events. Now notice in analytics, you also see unique events. And so the difference between unique events and total events is that unique events are equivalent to one per session, where total events means that somebody can come to your website, initiate a session and click on that button multiple times in the same session. So if I go to the Alma Foundation website, okay, I can click on that donate now button three or four or five different times in the same session. So what analytics is going to do is actually in that session count it once, but accumulate the number of clicks as a total event for that session. So you're always gonna have more total events than unique events because in some cases, users may click on the button more than once in the same session. And so here I can see total events, unique events, and if I added a value to that event, I should be able to see it here. So if I added a dollar as an example to this particular event, because it had 164 unique events, I should be able to see 164 as my value. But since I see zero, that means that I did not assign value. And so average value basically is just giving me how much average I have per event. So it's taking into account the number of, or the value, the total value divided by the total number of unique page views or sessions. And so because I don't have value, I'm not gonna have average value. But here you could see, because value is optional, here I can at least see how many events or how many clicks I received for a particular button. Again, it could be a video. If I clicked on this video as an example, I can see how many people actually started it. I could see the unique and the total events. And if I click on label, if I have a label assigned, then I'll be able to see what page triggered that event. So if we go back again to our header donate button, back to category, we click on label as our primary dimension. Here we can see the home page had the most unique events, then followed by the children's page, the contact form, etc. So what you can do in analytics, you can also look at the pages that have driven events. So here I could see the home page has accumulated the most total events followed by the contact us. So that's how you would look at the data in Google Analytics under behavior, under events, and then under top events or overview is where you can start analyzing your event tracking. So first you need to do, identify it, assign a category, action, and or label, set up that tag and trigger. Once you do that, once you test that it's working, this is where you're gonna go to analyze the data. Let's start out with YGTM. So let's just say you're Sam and you have your own e-commerce website and you want to understand how people are interacting with your website well sam today's world of websites contain a lot of interactivity everything from videos to pdf downloads to commenting to form submissions uh to all sorts of chat functionality interactivity going on throughout the website so there's just a lot that you need to track outside of just page views. And so really what GTM does is they help you track all these things I just mentioned. Everything from somebody clicking on the play button of a PDF to somebody clicking on the submit button of a form to somebody entering in something on a chat function. So that's what GTM is. So why GTM? Because it helps us track all that interactivity. So all GTM is is really allows you to really place a piece of Java code, which is just script, and the script that's added to a web page to collect information. So that's really what a tag is. It's just some script that gets put on a web page in order for you to collect information, like page views, clicks, etc. And they send it to third-party tools. Okay, so that's what GTM does. It, it basically allows you to take all these tags that collect information and you can use them in GTM. So if you want to, for example, collect 
how many people you know enter a chat functionality and start chatting well you're going to take that script and you're going to put it in gtm and gtm will then allow you to start tracking that information so that's really what gtm is it just allows you to put tags into a container or think of it as a toy box you have all these toys and you want to track well you can put all those those toys or tags in a toy box or container and we're going to talk a little bit more about that but before we get into gtm let's just say you know you're communicating with your developer and there's a new user request on your web page and you want to update the tag well your developer considering it's probably a small update to your website is probably going to not um hesitate and is going to go ahead and turn around and do it normally and so normally what happens is the developer is going to go to the website and update the tag well what if you have a few things that you want to track all those things i mentioned before from downloads to clicks to you know somebody checking out to watching a video well your web master your web developer is going to go well hold on a second now, all these requests are gonna take time. I need to put them into the work queue, so to speak. Well, what happens is when they go into work queue, usually it's gonna take some time. And in some cases, you as a marketer need to launch a campaign. And you wanna get that tracking uh, added to the website in time for the campaign launch. So you wanna go ahead and quickly turn around the tracking for that particular campaign. Let's just say you're launching a campaign and you're sending people to a landing page that has a form submission. And you wanna be able to track how many people click on the submit button of that form submission. Well, if you need to turn that around, your developer's like, well, I need to put that in a work queue. The timing isn't going to always work out between you and your developer is my point. And so that's where GTM comes in because there is a solution update your tags faster and that's google tag manager so when we say gtm that's what gtm stands for google tag manager it's a place for you to add tags quickly and easily so tags remember are just snippets of code that allow you to track things on your website interactively interactive actively and basically when you have gtm you can bypass the webmaster and do it quickly and easily so that's what gtm is all about so why gtm because we just identified two benefits one you could track all the interactivity on your website and two you can bypass your web developer or web master and so that's the benefit of gtm so the benefit you get those tags updated very quickly via google tag manager okay so that's what tag manager is so what we're going to talk about today is specifically what tag manager is and what it does we're going to list some of the benefits of tag manager we're going to show you how it works and then we're going to show you how to get started with tag manager tag manager if you're not familiar with working with webmasters and dealing with javascript and tags and all this jargon is just new to you today okay well don't fret sit back we're going to take it slow this is an introduction into google tag manager again let's start out with what is tag manager so we've already introduced it to some degree because we already introduced it as a tool where you can put all your tags into a toolbox toy box or container so to speak right and we already already mentioned that hey you can bypass your webmaster so you're probably thinking well if i'm if you're not familiar with tag manager how can i bypass my webmaster well first of all it's a free tool and it's a google tool hence the name google tag manager and it helps you really that's the main point is deploy and track tags on your website bypassing your webmaster so that's tag manager and so examples of tags that can be deployed via google tag manager are numerous these are just some examples like google analytics facebook pixel tracking or google ads there's no limit into the number of tags you can track in tag manager there is no limit you can add any number of tracking tags in tag manager Okay, so some of the benefits, well again, I we just listed two. You can put any tag into Tag Manager and track that onto your website. And we know you can bypass your web developer or webmaster. And what it also does is it also allows you to test and deploy your JavaScript codes quicker. So remember, these JavaScript codes or snippets of codes are just 
there to track certain things on your website, whether that be a page view or somebody clicking on a play button or tracking somebody who converts or even just goes to your website. So the biggest benefit is you can take that snippet of code, let's just say Facebook. Let's just say you're growing Facebook marketing and you wanna put that Facebook pixel on your website so that you could track people who come from Facebook and convert. Well, you don't need to put that Facebook pixel on your website. You can go right to Tag Manager and you can put that snippet of code right in Tag Manager really quickly. And the other benefit here is all tags are managed in one place. And that's that to me is really a good benefit because when you start adding tags on your website and you have some tags in Tag Manager, it just gets very confusing. So ideally, all the tracking code you have on your website needs to be in Tag Manager. Think about that, all the tracking. So if you're doing Bing, or you're doing Facebook, or you're doing Twitter, or you're doing LinkedIn, and you're doing Google, you're doing all this type of marketing on all these different platforms, you're gonna have tracking code for all these different platforms. And instead of putting all that code on your website, return gonna slow down the slow, low time of your web page and website. You wanna put them all in Tag Manager so they can be organized, and you know exactly what you're trying to track. And the other great benefit of Tag Manager is there's a versioning control. So let's just say you have added tags to your website via GTM for the last six months. Well, and let's just say you add another tag yesterday. If you added that tag yesterday and something doesn't work, well, you can just roll back to a previous version. It's that simple. So you have versioning and that's, that's a good thing. When you have versioning, you can control what gets published and if something doesn't work after it gets published, then you can roll back to a previous version. So it, it's a, a peace of mind, so to speak. Just because you've added code to your site, there's no guarantee it's gonna work. And so you can always control what version you're dealing with in Tag Manager. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the biggest benefit here to me with Tag Manager is you have event tracking. And so we talked about some of the things you could track on your website from videos, from play buttons to somebody clicking on the stop on the video or pausing it all the way to somebody again chatting or let's just say somebody clicking on that purchase button on your website. Okay, and you wanna track all these different things, these different interactivities and buttons. Well, event tracking is what you're going to use to track all those buttons. And to me, this is the biggest benefit of Tag Manager. And I'll show you some examples as we go along. And if we didn't mention it already, I'll mention it again, it is free. Tag Manager is free, there's no limit. So once you have Tag Manager going, you can add as many tracking codes as you want. There's no limit on the number of tracking codes you can add to Tag Manager, okay? So it's free and you can use it to its fullest advantage. Okay, so it's also high security, meaning that it has different levels of permissions, okay? So you can have uh, somebody just go in and look at the different tags and tracking codes you have in GTM. Or you can ask somebody who is very familiar with Tag Manager and can go in and add the tracking code to Tag Manager and then publish that tracking code when it gets added. So those are all the benefits. Let's talk about how it works now. Specifically, how does Tag Manager work? Because you're like, Rob, okay, again, a lot of jargon. You know, you, you, you got tags and JavaScript and, and versioning and publishing and all this other stuff. Well, I know I'm throwing a lot at you at once, but just bear with me here, okay? So let's start talking about how it actually works. So you have a website. Okay, whatever that domain is, you have a website and there's chances are on your website, you have some form of interactivity, whether that be a video, whether that be a blog, whether it be a form submission. You have a website with some interactivity. And let's just say you're even thinking about getting ready to launch some type of campaign on maybe Google or Facebook and you wanna drive traffic to your website. Fair enough. You're joining the millions of other websites that are out there that have interactivity that also drive traffic to the website. So in comes Google Tag Manager. And so Tag Manager is important because again, we know we wanna track people coming from that Facebook campaign or that Google campaign and interacting with our site. So if you are running Facebook and you are running Google Analytics, well, guess what? You wanna put that tracking code in Tag Manager. So 
Google Analytics being a Google product works very nicely with Tag Manager. Facebook has its own tracking code, but you still want to be able to track people who come from the Facebook campaign to your website. So you're going to get that tracking code from Facebook and put it in Tag Manager. That's generally how it works. So here information from your website is shared with another data source through Tag Manager. So think about that. If I add Facebook tracking code to Tag Manager, or let's just say I add Google Analytics tracking code to Tag Manager, Tag Manager is the one that's pushing out and doing all the heavy lifting. They're the ones that are controlling what code gets fired and what code doesn't. So if you're putting the code in Tag Manager, Tag Manager's controlling the code. Think about it that way. And let's show you an example of what that looks like. So here I am, I'm in Tag Manager. I just went to tagmanager.google.com and here I could see a list of tags. So in our conversation, we're talking about tracking Facebook and we're talking about tracking Google Analytics. Well, Google Analytics is easy because it's a Google product. So here, if I look at all the different tracking code I have on my website through Tag Manager, let's just take a look at Google Analytics. So if you're gonna use Tag Manager, you might as well put the Google Analytics code in here. So here I can see I have Google Analytics as a tag in Tag Manager. Now, for Facebook, if I'm running a Facebook campaign, well, I can take that pixel tracking and put it in GTM as well. And here I could see Facebook pixel. That is, that code is added to GTM. I just basically took what Facebook gave me and put it into Google Tag Manager. So you could see I can add Facebook and Google Analytics. And again, I can't stress it enough, any tracking code from any platform I can add to Google Tag Manager in order to track the behavior from those sources. So let's take a little bit deeper dive into how Tag Manager works. So I just showed you an example of how you could take Facebook and Google Analytics code and put it into Tag Manager. But if you're not familiar with Tag Manager, then how do I do that? Well, let's talk about the structure and how Tag Manager works. So when you have a Tag Manager account, you have a container. Remember, I mentioned toy box earlier. You have a bunch of toys if they're their code and you're tracking different bits of code from different platforms like Facebook. Think of those as toys and you have a toy box. Okay, well that's what this code is and that's what a container is. The code is the code and that's gonna go into the toy box or container. And so the way Tag Manager works is you have tags, triggers, and variables. So if I take my Facebook tracking code and put it into a container, I need to set up a tag and a trigger. Okay, so let's take a look at what that is. So first, if I go back to Tag Manager, I'm gonna have an account and if I have an account, I'm going to have a container. So here I'm just gonna click on an account with a container and a container is nothing more than what website you're adding the tracking code to. Okay, that's all the container is. We're just letting Tag Manager know this is the website we're adding all this code to. So you have tags, triggers, and variables. That's the structure of Tag Manager. So tags are just what it says, tags. What are we trying to quote unquote tag? Well, if it's Google Analytics, that's easy. Here I could see I have Google Analytics added. So if I click on Google Analytics, here's my tag. And if I take a little bit of a deeper dive there, since Google, Analytics is a Google product. It integrates already with Tag Managers. It's pretty easy. I can just choose Google Analytics. Then I'm gonna check page view and that's my tag. Now, every tag needs a trigger, okay? So I need to tell Tag Manager how or when to fire the Google Analytics tracking code. So in this case, I'm gonna tell Tag Manager to fire on all pages. So if I get somebody, a visitor to my website, Analytics is firing on all pages. So whatever page that visitor lands on, Google Analytics is gonna fire. So that's really what it comes down to is I have a tag and I need to tell Tag Manager when to trigger that tag. That's really what the structure of Tag Manager is. It's tags, triggers, and variables. And variables, what we're gonna talk about here in a couple minutes. But you have a piece of code, you're gonna go ahead and put that into Tag Manager, you're gonna tag it, and then you're going to fire that trigger. So let's take a look at another example here. If I go back here, you can see Facebook. Well, here's my Facebook pixel, okay? That's my tag. 
So when is it gonna fire? Well, it's gonna fire on a specific domain or subdomain. That's basically what we're doing. We're trying to tell GTM when to fire that particular tag. So those are the three main components, a tag, okay, which is going to contain the JavaScript code that you get from say Facebook, the trigger. So you're going to go into Tag Manager and tell Tag Manager when to fire that code, that's the trigger. And then you have variables. And so variables are basically just additional information that Tag Manager may need for your tag and trigger to work. So that's what a variable is. It's there to get the tag and trigger to fire. So variables are divided into built-in and user-defined variables. So common user variables include say page path or page URL or host name or click class again they're there and these examples I just gave you are there to get your tag and trigger to work think about it that way they're just that's a component and if I go into tag manager here and here on the left side I can see variables so remember I have built-in and user defined so built-in means that tag manager already built these for me so in case I need to get my trigger to work with my tag I can use a variable so those are built in and then I have user defined. So these are what I define. These are what I created. And again, the variables are there to get the tag and trigger to work. Okay. So that's the job of the variable. The job of the tag is to host that JavaScript code. Okay. In the case of Facebook or analytics, that's where we're putting our code. So here, if I click on AdWords remarketing, again, it's a Google product. So I don't really need to even deal with code. I'm just going to select Google AdWords remarketing. Okay. So you could see GTM integrates nicely with some of the other Google products, but let's just say you have a Facebook pixel tracking code. You're going to choose custom and you're going to put the code here. So that's part of the tag. And then the trigger again is there to get the tag to fire. So you're telling GTM when to fire the tag and the variable is there to help you make sure that that trigger and that tag work together. So that's how all three kind of work together. You need the tag to put the code. You need the trigger to tell GTM when to fire the tag and code and the variables there to help you define when that tag and trigger should work or how it should work. So again, a review tags are they're just small codes of JavaScript or tracking pixels on your website. And so tags are allowed to manage events like scroll tracking, remarketing, clicks, downloads, files, play buttons, you name it, even clicks on external links. For example, let's just say you have a click uh, or a Facebook uh, icon on your site. And when somebody clicks on it, they go to Facebook. You want to maybe track that. You're going to create a tag. Okay? The trigger is there because you need to tell GTM when to fire that tag. So it's a certain condition, whether it's, you know, fire the tag if the URL equals facebook.com or some other condition. So the tag cannot be created until the creation of the corresponding trigger. So tags and triggers go together. You can't just create a tag and not have a trigger. Otherwise your tag will never fire. And then the variable is there again. It stores the information when defining a trigger or transferring data to tag. So a variable has a variety of data. Okay. So you pick and choose the variable you want to use with that trigger. Okay. So you're making sure that by defining a variable, you're making sure that you're telling GTM how that trigger should be fired. So let's take a look at another example here of how all three play together. If I'm in this account, I'm in this container. If I look down here, I could see Google Optimize. That's another Google product. So what I'm doing here is I just chose Google Optimize as my tag. It's already integrated. So what does that mean? I don't even need to deal with any code. I'm just going to select optimize. Well, we have the tag Google optimize, but we need to tell GTM how to fire that. And so here we're going to tell GTM to fire it on all pages. So that's basically a very simple example because we're firing it on all pages. So if I want to look at something specific again, Facebook, Here's my tag, here's my code. What's my trigger? Well, my trigger is it's gonna fire on specific pages. How do I know that? Well, if I look at the trigger, 
Here I could see the trigger is a page view, but I'm telling it to fire on this particular host name. So the tag and trigger go hand in hand. <laughs> So how to get started with Tag Manager. So first things first, you have to create that account. So you're gonna go to tagmanager.google.com or you can do a search for Google Tag Manager and you're going to create your account. And then when you create your account, what's gonna happen is you're going to set up a container. And when you set up a container, you have choices. So you could set it up for your website, for an app on iOS, or maybe Android, or you can even set it up for AMP, an accelerated mobile page. So most people by default are probably gonna set up Tag Manager for their website. And so when you do that, when you actually select website, what's gonna happen is you're going to get some Google Tag Manager code in return. And so the whole idea here is you're going to do a swap. What you're doing is basically you're saying, okay, Google, I'm gonna take this Google Tag Manager code and I'm gonna put it on my website. I'm gonna put it on every page in my website. So notice Tag Manager has two scripts. One goes in the head as high as possible. The other goes into the body tag as high as possible. And so what you're doing is you're making a deal. You're putting this tag manager code on your website and in return, every code you deal with, whether that be Facebook or analytics or optimize or remarketing or whatever it is, is gonna go in GTM. Okay, it's gonna go into the container you created. So you need the tag manager code on your website in order for tag manager to work. Okay, so when you add this code to your website, then you're free to start adding all sorts of tags to your container. But if you don't have this tracking code on your website, then none of the tags you add to your container are gonna work. So that's the idea behind the container. And then one thing I wanted to mention on the account is it's a Google account. So when you create your account, then make sure it's the same account you use with say Google Analytics or some other Google product. That's a good best practice is always use the same email address when you set up your account so that it integrates nicely across all the different platforms. Meaning you can go from say Google Analytics right to Google Tag Manager in one browser without having to log out or log in. Okay, so when you create the account, you're gonna create your container. If you choose web, then you're gonna be asked to place code on your website. And when you place that code on your website, then you are free to start using Tag Manager. And that means you're free to start adding tags. Okay, so if you wanna know more information about installing Google Tag Manager, then what I would recommend is visit the Quick Start Guide website of GTM. So again, if you're curious as to where that code is located in Google Tag Manager, well, when you create an account and you create a container, that container is gonna have a specific ID. So if I click on that specific ID, here's where I can get my code, okay? So again, when I'm logged in to Tag Manager, I'm gonna click on Workspace, but in the top navigation, I'm gonna see my unique GTM ID. If I click on that, that's where my code is gonna be located. And so again, your code needs to go in the header, and there's another script that needs to go in the body. And if you're not sure how to add the code to your website, well, you can always click on the quick start guide here, okay? And that'll take you to a quick start guide page, a reference page related to Google Tag Manager. So let's talk about creating a tag. So once you get Tag Manager installed, I'm sure you're excited to get going and create that first tag. So let's talk about how to create a tag in Tag Manager. So when you're in Tag Manager, all you need to do is basically you're looking at all your tags. If you click on tag in the left side navigation, you'll see all your tags and there's a new button there. So you just click new. And so basically what you're gonna do is you're going to create your first tag. And so what I would recommend once you get Tag Manager installed on your website, I would recommend setting the first tag up as Google Analytics. So that will get you going with tracking page views on your website when, some, when somebody visits your website. 
okay? So ideally, that's what you wanna do. You wanna get Google Analytics as your first tag and tag manager. So what I'm gonna do is because Analytics is a Google product, it's already integrated nicely with Tag Manager. So I'm just gonna click on Google Analytics. It's going to be a page view, that's what I'm tracking. And now I have to set up a variable. And so what it's going to do, it's gonna ask me to set a, select a variable. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna select new variable. And what you're going to do is you're actually gonna go and add your tracking ID here. That's gonna be your variable. So where do I get my tracking ID in analytics? Well, if I'm in analytics, I'm gonna to go to admin. And then under property settings, I'm gonna see my tracking ID. And all you need to do then is go to Tag Manager and paste copy. First, you gotta copy over that tracking ID. Then you're gonna to go to Tag Manager and gonna paste it. And then that's gonna create a variable for you. And then when you create that variable, you're gonna see it in the drop down here. So I've already created it. And basically, that's your tag with a variable. Then what are you gonna do? You're gonna set up a trigger. So see, I have some triggers already set up. You're gonna see a default trigger already set up for you, and that's gonna be all pages. So ideally what you wanna do is you wanna select all pages in order for analytics to fire on all pages. So that's what we're doing. We're setting up a trigger. We're basically telling Tag Manager, hey, if I get a visitor to any page on my website, then I want you to fire Google Analytics. So that's basically, in summary, how to set up your first tag. And my recommendation is your first tag should be Google Analytics. And when you set up analytics, you're gonna have to set up a variable for the tracking ID. And so you get the tracking ID again from admin, property settings, copy and paste that tracking ID over, save it, you have your variable, that variable is gonna be included in with the tag, then your trigger is gonna be all pages. And there you go, you have your first tag, you have your first variable, you have your first trigger. So that's basically what you wanna do. And once you've added that tag, once you've added that trigger, then the only thing you need to do now is basically publish the tag. And so anytime you save a tag, you're going to go ahead and submit it so that way it gets published. So again, what you're gonna do is let's take a step back here. You're going to choose new tag. You're gonna choose analytics from the drop down menu. You're gonna choose page view. Then basically you're going to add your tracking ID so you could set up the variable. And then basically that's what you need to do. Okay, you're gonna add that tracking ID and then voila, that's your tag with a variable. And then once you've done that, then you're going to click submit. So when you click submit, you're basically saying, hey, I want this tag to go live now, this tag and trigger. And once you've done that, then analytics is ready to go. And anytime somebody goes to your website on any page, Tag Manager is gonna fire Google Analytics. So the great thing here is you have something called Google Tag Assistant, and that's a, an extension that works with Chrome. And so when you've actually added Tag Manager to your site, or you have analytics running in Tag Manager, you can confirm if those tags are firing properly. So let's take a look at how Google Tag Assistant works. Okay, so if you just do a search for Google Tag Assistant, you're gonna see here that it's basically just an extension that works in Chrome, and it unfortunately it only works in Chrome browser. It doesn't work in any other browser. So go ahead and install that extension into Chrome. And when you do that, you're gonna see this nice icon here in your browser. And now, if you go to any website and I click on Google Tag Assistant and I click on Enable, okay, so basically I'm loading Google Tag Assistant. And now once I refresh the page, I can see that this particular site has Google Tag Manager installed. And not only does it have Tag Manager installed, I can see that it also has Google Analytics running, I have also Google Optimize running, and I have Google Ads Remarketing Tag running in Tag Manager. So that's what Tag Assistant does. It allows you to see if one, Tag Manager is on the site, and if it is, great, what other tags are firing on this particular site? So Tag Assistant's telling me I have these particular tags firing on that site, and they're firing within Tag Manager. So Tag Assistant is a great way to confirm if one, Tag Manager's on the site, and two, what other tags are firing on the site. Now. 
Another way you could confirm if Tag Manager is firing on the site is you can go into preview mode. So even before you submit and publish your tag and trigger, you can click on the preview mode. So if I click preview in Tag Manager, so basically that's going to put me in preview mode. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that now I'm free to go to my website and see if those tags are firing. And so let's take a look at what that looks like. So if I go to the website and just click refresh, then what's gonna happen is Tag Manager is gonna load in preview mode, just as you see here. Okay, so that's gonna take a second, couple seconds to load up. And now what can I see in preview mode? I could see that I have GTM firing, but I also have some other tags firing on this page. Remarketing, I have Google Analytics, I have Google Optimize. I have some other tags firing as well. And so the preview mode shows me what tags are firing on any given page. And I can also see what tags did not fire. Okay, so here I have a number of tags already in GTM, but they didn't fire on this particular page. So let's just say I clicked on the donate now button. I'm still in preview mode. So I'm gonna be able to see what tags fired. Now I could see I have a couple of tags that have fired on this particular page. And then I could see what tags did not fire on this page, okay? So that's the preview mode. You can use the preview mode before you even submit a tag and trigger to see if it fires. And that's the great benefit of Tag Manager. So if you're not sure if something's going to fire or not, then you can always go into preview mode. Um, and if you are sure it's gonna fire, then you can go ahead and submit it. So you can leave preview mode and just go ahead and submit that particular tag and trigger. So here I'm gonna leave preview mode. And now once I'm done and I'm sure the tag is gonna fire and go ahead and submit all my changes that I've worked on in terms of setting up tags and triggers. So that's really GTM in a nutshell. So I have my tags, okay, my tags are just snippets of code that I'm going to put in, whether that be Facebook or vet tracking or any other Google product like Optimize or PageView. Then I have my triggers. My triggers are there to tell GTM when to fire that tag. And the variables are there to help those tags and triggers work together. So remember that particular variable we set up for Google Analytics, okay, so here it is right here because we want to tell GTM what property to specifically fire in Google Analytics. So that's why we set up that variable. But there are all sorts of variables. Google Tag Manager has built in or variables already created for you or you can specifically define a variable. So variables are there to help the tags and triggers work together. So when you set up a tag, you set up a trigger, you use a variable, you can always go into preview mode, preview it by going to the website, seeing if it fires. If it fires, then voila, you can go ahead and click submit and that will publish the tag and trigger and you're good to go. That's pretty much how Tag Manager works. And again, I can't stress that there is an unlimited number of tags you can add to Tag Manager. There's no limit. So you got everything from anything from Google to non-Google to event tracking, okay? To Facebook, to anything that you wanna track, you wanna be able to put into Tag Manager. And again, there's versioning. That's one of the great benefits of Tag Manager. So if I wanna go back to an older version, I can simply do that. So here you can see I'm on version 32. That's how Tag Manager works. And I can't stress that, you know, Tag Manager is there to help you track interactivity on the site. Because if you have a site that's interactive, that has a video, that has a download button, let's just say, you know, you have all sorts of newsletter signups, Facebook, YouTube buttons on your website, just like this website does, and you wanna be able to track how many people click on that particular button, well, you're going to need Tag Manager. And when you have Tag Manager, you're going to be able to track all of these button clicks and interactivity on your website. Without Tag Manager, it's going to be hard to do that. So that's an introduction to Tag Manager. In the age of digital marketing, it is very easy to get lost in the sea of information. If you are a beginner, you will probably spend a lot of time reading and researching. Even if you are an expert, you will still need to keep up to date and know what's going on in the marketing world. But how do you find the time to do that? 
How do you find the time to stay on top of trends and innovations? We have compiled a list of 20 plus digital marketing tools to help you make your life easier. Some of these tools might sound familiar to you and some might sound new and interesting. We believe all of them have some value in your life and can assist you in staying on top of trends. Hey everyone, I am Tushar Badiwal. Welcome to Simply Learn's YouTube channel. In this video, we will understand 20 plus digital marketing tools to grow your business in 2022. But before we begin, if you enjoy watching tech related content, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and hitting that bell icon to stay tuned. So without any further delay, let's get started with the plan for today's session. First, we will look at the research part. Next, we will explore tools to build or host a website. Content is king, so next we will have a look at some of the best content creation tools to grow your business. Moving forward, we will discuss designing and graphics tools. Once designing is done, it's time to promote and hence we will look at the best promotional tools. After that, we will discuss some great email marketing tools, user behavior and competitor analysis tools. And finally, we will end the session by understanding the communication tools that will help your business operate smoothly. Research Research is one of the most essential parts of getting your business to the next level. It's what turns an idea into a real business. However, it is hard to do research without the right tools. Luckily, there are many tools out there that do the job perfectly. Here are just few that you need to know about. Ubersuggest Ubersuggest is a free tool that produces fresh keyword ideas. It is among the best free tools available on the market. However, it has a premium plan for advanced features but it is best if you are starting out and it has some good features like you will get the search volume for free keyword ideas and content ideas. Keyword Planner It is one of the best free tools and the best part is that it's a Google product so that the data can be trusted. You can use Google Keyword Planner to do keyword research. Google Keyword Planner will show you the monthly search volume of keywords and phrases, the average cost per click in your selected country and how difficult it is to rank for the keywords. Some of the best features are you will get the custom time-based keyword data and get to know the competition on that keyword. Hrefs Hrefs is one of the most advanced tool available for keyword research. It is also used for competitor analysis, rank tracking and site auditing. Hrefs main features are geared towards marketer but you can also use it to find keywords for Google, YouTube, and Amazon. The tool is paid but suitable for businesses looking for in-depth information. It has some features like Rank Tracker that will help you know your existing website ranking. And the second one is Alert. You will get important information or stats by mail. After doing the research part, you need a website for your business. Let's have a look at how to do that. The first step in creating a website is to find a place to host it. There are many options out there and depending on what your site will be used for, you may need different tools. Web hosting tools have evolved to meet the online community's need better. It can be challenging to select the right one through many options. Here are the few of the best tools available on the market. WordPress It will help you create your website by just drag and dropping. No coding is required. Also, it has a lot of plugins that can be used according to your website needs. Blogger You can create a beautiful blog using Blogger for free and it is also has free themes which you can use. Still, it is always recommended that you use tools like WordPress to build your website because businesses need a website with lot of functionalities and WordPress makes this process easier. The website requires hosting as the next tool we have is Hostinger. You need to purchase a domain and hosting to host a website. There are other companies also available that you can use to host your site such as GoDaddy, HostGator, etc. Hostinger provides automatic backups that will ensure that your website data is secured and allows you to create unlimited subdomain which is also necessary for a business website. For free hosting and free domains, you can use Infinity Free. But for a business website, it is always recommended to go with the paid hosting because this will give your customer a good experience when they visit your website. But for a beginner just wanting to learn how website hosting works, you can use Infinity Free. Every business website and its social media platform need content 
and content is the oxygen of the internet. There is no surviving without it. But meeting the demand of a content hungry world often means that you are forced to pull your hair out only to throw more into the fire. From research to creation to distribution, content is now 24 by 7 job requiring many internal resources or costly outsourced help. If you are looking to cut down the cost and streamline your efforts, here are some content creation tools to take your business to the next level. Headline It is an AI tool that will create a landing page automatically. No writing, designing and coding is required. You need to give information about the product and it is also has built-in templates to use. It became famous because of this feature. But now it is upgraded and you will see a lot of other features that will help you create excellent content. It is a paid tool but you can try its free version. PepperType It is a one-stop AI solution tool for all content needs and the best part is you will get 10,000 word limit to try out this fantastic tool. The specialty of this tool is that it allows you to create content for specific social media platforms and long-form content. Grammarly Grammarly is a free online tool that finds mistakes in your writing and suggests improvements. As you write, Grammarly will underline any mistakes you have made and offer suggestions on how to fix them. Additionally, it has a plagiarism checker and a punctuation checker. However, for additional features, you need to go with Grammarly Premium. The best way to create excellent content is to have good visuals. This is why we have listed the best designing tools that you can use to get stock images and videos. Canva You can design your website using Canva for free. It is the best tool to make your website content more engaging. It is a simple drag and drop tool that allows you to create beautiful graphics, flyers, infographics, social media posts and more. You can also use it to create more engaging images for your posts. Furthermore, it gives you free templates and allows you to collaborate with your business team using team functionality. Pixabay Pixabay is a free website or a creative community that shares copyright free photos, illustrations, music and videos. All Pixabay content are licensed under the Pixabay license. You can use them without asking for permission or crediting the artist, even for commercial purposes. You can download these stock images, videos, musics and illustration without signing up. Shutterstock Although it also comes with the same feature, the key difference is that it is paid. You might wonder why to use this Shutterstock since we already have a free tool like Pixabay. Well, it depends on your business needs. There are some images and stock footage that you will only find on Shutterstock. In addition, Shutterstock has powerful editing tools and custom size options that attract people. Now we have a better understanding of the content part. In order to attract more visitors, the content needs to be promoted. The following tools will help you promote your business, drive traffic to your website, convert visitors into leads, build brand awareness, etc. Google Ads Google Ads are a powerful tool that can help you reach your target audience. It is small but significant step towards online success. Through many people believe that Google Ads are not as effective as they used to be. There are still more benefits than drawbacks. The only thing you need to know how to use it. Your website can be advertised via Google Ads and your product and services can be promoted on YouTube. It has an excellent feature lead form extension that allow users to provide their contact details directly through the ad without visiting your landing page. Additionally, live events targeting, for example, graduating from a college, is also a great feature since it helps you reach the correct type of audience. Facebook Ads Manager It allows you to run Facebook and Instagram ads and it's an excellent way to promote your business. A feature like Facebook Analytics will give you a good grasp of data. Feature like Audience Insight will better understand who is interested in your product and services. Google Ads and Facebook Ads require you to spend money on ads by setting up a daily or a custom budget. Bassumo is a content marketing tool to help you find the best ways of engaging, creating and spreading content across social and search channels. Two of the best features is finding an influencer that will help you to find the right influencer and a content discovery feature which will help you to discover new content ideas. 
Email marketing tools are the most effective means to stay in touch with your customers. You can nurture leads, rearrange with your audience and build a subscriber base through email. Businesses today recognize the importance of email and marketers are investing heavily in email marketing tools. However, in the overwhelming sea of email marketing tools, finding the right fit can be tricky. We have selected some of the best email marketing tools to help your business get started and grow through 2022. MailChimp MailChimp is a comprehensive marketing platform that lets you keep track of and communicate with your clients, customers and other interested parties. But it is popular because of its email services. There is a free plan of MailChimp. The free plan is often more than enough for small businesses. Up to 2000 subscribers can be added and 12,000 emails can be sent a month. It supports multiple integration to integrate other third-party softwares. And MailChimp also allows you to update or remove the subscriber profiles, which is also one of the best features of MailChimp. SendInBlue It is very similar to MailChimp. Both have excellent and similar features when it comes to email services. One unique feature of SendInBlue is that it has an option of a drag-and-drop builder that is accessible by mobile. Analysis and Optimization Businesses need to analyze and optimize their processes to grow. Furthermore, you should analyze the data to develop a solution to the problems in your industry. Several tools can be beneficial here. Let's discuss that. Google Search Console This tool will help you understand how your website performs on Google searches. By ranking on top, you will have higher chances of attracting more visitors. The index coverage report will help you understand which web page have problems. Moreover, it has a very useful URL inspection tool which gives information about Google's indexed page version. VidIQ Many YouTubers majorly use it to analyze their performance on YouTube and optimize their channel. If you are looking to rank your video on YouTube, you need to optimize the title, description and tags. This tool helps you to do that. The tool includes a thumbnail generator that lets you create customized thumbnails that generate good views and it has trend alerts which will notify you by email of popular content. Google Analytics Using Google Analytics, you can track the traffic on your website and find out where your visitors are coming from. It also allows you to track your sales performance and traffic sources. Google Analytics is a tool that will let you know if your website is performing well and also if you need to make some changes to improve its performance. It has outstanding features like funnel analysis and smart goals. A funnel is a method for determining which steps are necessary to achieve the desired outcomes and with smart goals you can identify and count the most engaged users on your website. User Behavior User behavior tools help you understand user behavior on the website. User behavior tools are very effective tools used in digital marketing to track the behavior of visitors and make the business more effective. Below are the some of the user behavior tools used in digital marketing. Hotjar Hotjar is an insight tool that lets you analyze your customer behavior and get feedback to understand them better and come up with new business strategies to grow your business. This tool gives you visual feedback, which you won't find in other tools, and it also offers surveys, which is also a unique feature of Hotjar. Smart Look It is mostly similar to Hotjar, but it has some additional features like customizable dashboard and conversion funnel, which means the visualization of how people follow the path. Competitor Analysis Many businesses start their competitive study when planning their digital marketing strategy and then abandon it. It is essential to make adjustments after competitor analysis and use great tools. Here are some of the best. The tool is completely paid. You can use this tool to improve your PPC campaign as it gives you insight into what your competitors are doing. Keywords can also be imported as well as downloaded. Social Blade It is used for social media monitoring and influencer tracking. For example, you can get lot of information about the performance of other competitors and how they are doing on YouTube and other social media channels. The best part is that many features are available in the free plan. SimilarWeb It is also an excellent tool to analyze competitors' website traffic and you can also get the Google Play and Apple App Store data. href We already covered this 
in the research category but we wanted to mention it here because Ahrefs will also be viewed as one of the best tools for analyzing competitors communication starting and building a successful business require better communication within your team we must ensure that our task has been clearly communicated to the team so that we will be able to perform the work as we intended thus one needs a tool to accomplish that so now let's check out some of the best tools for communication slack the app is a chat room that brings together all of your team's communication in one place meaning there is a no longer a need to use email skype or multi chat room apps slack can be used with both work and personal accounts and it can benefit businesses in several different ways microsoft teams it is also similar to slack but it offers unlimited app integration and unlimited chat messages there are free plans for both but you can upgrade if your business need aren't met here what you have learned so far initially we discussed research then tools to build and host the website Next we discussed content creation and graphic designing tools. After that we discussed tools that will help in the promotion and then the email marketing tools. After that we discussed analysis and optimization tools. Next we discussed user behavior and competitor analysis tools and finally we discussed the communication tools. Greetings everyone. This is Rob Sanders from Simply Learn. Happy New Year and today we're going to talk about digital marketing skills. So, digital marketing allows business owners, regardless of the business, nonprofit, for-profit, large or small, national, local, international, to really expand their business. It allows them to personalize their content, they could save money, and most importantly, they can measure the results. And so that's what we're going to focus on today when we talk about digital marketing skills, focusing on measuring those results. So, Suppose anybody wants to work in marketing or grow a company or help grow an individual's company or ensure to keep up with the appropriate skills. This is what we're going to cover today. So we're going to cover a few channels and so let's get right to it. Today we're going to start off with search engine optimization or SEO, also known as organic search. So SEO is an interesting channel. Uh, it's probably the premier channel for most companies. In fact, HubSpot confirms that 57% of B2B marketers stated that SEO generates more leads than any other marketing initiative. So it's really important for not only just generating traffic, but it's also important for generating leads and, and generating more business including e-commerce. And so what does SEO entail? And what skills should you acquire in order to manage SEO as a marketing channel? Well, if you think about it, SEO is really divvied up into two pies. One pie is called on-page, the other pie is called off-page. And so on-page consists of things you can do to the website to help you be found in organic search. So what are those things? Well, it could be anything from, you know, page load speed to 404 errors to sitemaps. And so the point here is if you're going to manage SEO and you know that you got to make sure your website's in tip top shape or your client's website's in good enough shape for Google to recognize it as a legitimate site, you have to have some technical skills. Now, I'm not saying you have to be a developer. But at the same time, you have to know what a 404 error is. You know, have to know where and how to generate a sitemap and upload that sitemap. You need to know how to edit a robot's text file. So those are, you know, what I call soft technical skills, but they're all valid for SEO. So you have to have some technical background. Staying in the on-page pie, okay, you need to make sure you have not only skills to write content but skills to optimize content so you need to be aware of all the different elements on a page in order to optimize that page so again that entails you know some copywriting skills but more importantly and probably more challenging is to take those copywriting skills and enhance them for seo okay so making sure that you're able to understand 
what it is that you need to do to get a page optimized so it can rank higher in the search engine results. Okay. So those are on page skills. And then you got the other piece of the pie, which is off page. So understanding you know, what it takes to make sure your site is relevant. So it's understanding different metrics, off page metrics like page authority, domain authority, external links, internal links. And so generally most SEO managers have a third party SEO platform that they work with like SEMrush or Moz. So it's understanding how to work with those platforms to measure off page results. So we always say that SEO as a digital marketing channel is an 800 pound gorilla. Well, it is because you have on page and off page to worry about. So the two of those together, you know, is, is quite a task in order to rank. And so what brings SEO and all digital marketing channels is understanding the metrics and understanding what you're seeing in order to measure results and improve upon those results. So that's really the theme for all these digital marketing channels we're going to talk about today. It's really about, okay, what metrics and how do I measure the results? And so we look at SEO in terms of measuring results on the on-page side. Okay. You're going to have to do some keyword analysis. You're going to have to understand, okay, what volume is, you're going to understand how to get the competition numbers. Okay. And you're going to have to understand what keywords to choose. Okay, so that in itself is a skill, being able to choose keywords based on several metrics. Then you're gonna have to be able to ascertain, you know, what pages and what keywords are driving traffic and how those pages are performing. Okay, and then again, the off page, you got different metrics like domain authority or page authority. You have external links, internal links, you have no follow and follows and, and you know, all these little metrics related to off-page SEO. So you're going to have to understand what those metrics mean. And if you can understand what those metrics mean, and then more importantly, act on those metrics, then that's what's going to help you improve your results in terms of SEO. So again, that's going to be the common theme here. So I'm just going to highlight again, those metrics that you're going to need to understand in order to better manage SEO as a channel. Again, on the on-page side, you need to understand the technicalities involved, but for example, page load. What's a good page load time? What's a bad page load time? From a keyword perspective, what's good volume? What's bad volume? What's good competition? What's bad competition? So if you can understand the intricacies of the measurements related to SEO, then that'll help you improve upon this big channel called organic search. So SEO is the practice of getting relevant traffic to the website, okay, from organic search results. So it really is essential to stay up to date and have a complete knowledge of the latest algorithm updates and factors that affect search engine ranking. Okay. So that's SEO. Let's transition to search engine marketing, also known as paid search, sponsored search, Google ads, Bing ads, pay per click, cost per click, a lot of acronyms, a lot of ways to describe it. At the end of the day, search engine marketing means that, hey, you as an advertiser have the ability and have the opportunity to rank at the very top of the Google search results. Now, it's different than SEO because you're actually paying for the placement. And so to be found at the top of the search engine results, as a paid placement or sponsored ad means that if somebody clicks on your ad, you're gonna pay Google X amount, okay? So unlike SEO, SEM is very fast moving. And so when we talk about fast moving, we mean that you're collecting a lot of data very quickly. So sticking with the theme of what skills should I have for search engine marketing? Well, if you're gonna collect data, then that means you need to measure the results of that data. And so sticking with our theme of measuring results, you need to understand first and foremost what all the different metrics mean related to search engine marketing. Okay, so I'm just gonna rattle off, if you will, a few of the metrics, but the commonality here is, yes, you can learn what those metrics mean, but you have to act on those metrics. 
So one of the, the main metrics involved with search engine marketing is impressions. So impression is just basically how many people have seen your ad. Okay. So if your ad shows up on the search results page, regardless of whether somebody clicks on it or not, you're going to get an impression. Okay. So if you're getting a lot of impressions, that means a lot of people have seen your ad. What's a lot of impressions? Well, it's subjective. Okay. So it could be a thousand impressions or 10,000 impressions. At the end of the day, that's how many people have seen your ad. Now, more importantly, you have another metric called clicks. Clicks means how many people actually saw your ad and then clicked on your ad. Okay, so if you have 100 people that have seen your ad and one person who clicked on your ad, then you have a click through rate of 1%. Now, when it comes to Google ads and search engine marketing in general, you want to have a high click through rate, especially on Google because that does impact quality score. So, quality score is another metric you need to be aware of. Okay, so quality score is simply a number between one and ten that's assigned to each keyword. Okay, so what impacts quality score? Click through rate is one of the factors that impact quality score. So if you have 200 or 300 or 500 or a thousand impressions and very little clicks, that means your click through rate is going to be low. And if your click through rate is going to be low, then your quality score is going to be low. And in order to pay less to Google, you need to make sure that your quality score is good. So you need to understand the factors involved with quality score. You need to understand impressions, clicks, click through rate. Because if you don't have a good click through rate, then how do you improve that? So it's about measuring the results and acting upon the results. Those are the skills involved with search engine marketing. And that's just on the click side. You've got the conversion side of the house. So you need to be able to understand how to get conversions and how to maintain a high conversion rate. So for example, if you have a hundred clicks and only one conversion, that is a 1% conversion rate. Okay. Fair enough. But what are you paying per conversion? What's the cost per conversion? Okay. And if that number is high, like say $20 and you're only selling a product that's say $10, well, then you got a problem. And so there's a lot of different metrics involved with search engine marketing. You're collecting this data very quickly. So you need to be able to react to the data that you see. So that's the skill set really involved with search engine marketing. If you're getting the data, if it's a low click through rate or low conversion rate or high cost per conversion or very low impressions, you need to be able to understand how to react to what you're seeing and what your data you're collecting. That to me is the primary skill, bottom line, with search engine marketing. And there are other skill sets involved, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's nice to be able to write copy because with search engine marketing, typically the ads have very few characters involved. So you need to be able to write a compelling ad to convince somebody to click on your ad. And so writing copy, being able to understand your target audience, um, those are all things involved with managing search engine marketing. But really the key component here is again, measuring the results. Okay. Let's switch over to a traditional marketing channel, email marketing. You know, one of my favorites, you know, listen, we're all bombarded with emails. Uh, and you know what? It, it becomes cumbersome at times. I mean, it's easy to just, to just regard an email. And so to me, the key here, if you're going to do email marketing, you need to have a certain set of skill sets. And so what that skill set is, is really understanding your audience. Because if you send an email to a certain set of recipients, you need to hope that that email is relevant to that audience. Okay. So you need to be able to really identify who it is we're sending this email to. And a recent study done by Statista uh, stated that 49% of consumers really like to receive promotional emails from their favorite brands. So if you have a very strong brand, then email marketing is probably a good channel for you. If you don't have a strong brand or nobody really knows about your brand or your product or your business, then email marketing could be a little bit of a steeper hill to climb, if you will. But really, Email marketing is, it, it involves 
emails that promote the brand's products and services. And if you could target the right audience or making sure you have the right audience, then you got a good chance of having successful email marketing campaigns. But when it comes to emails, you know, it's like having a blank canvas. You can be as creative as you want as long as you're talking to the audience. So the big skill set here again is copywriting and having some, you know, creativity involved with that copywriting. Saying the right things, but not saying too much. At the same time, making the email aesthetically pleasing as possible so that when somebody does open the email, they're going to be able to react to it. So, you know, writing copy with strong call to action or really relevant copy that really talks to the audience. I mean, those are all keys for email marketing, in my opinion. Also, one thing we didn't bring up in search engine marketing, but it certainly holds true with search engine marketing as well as email marketing, and that's A-B testing. And so A-B testing is simply taking an original and creating a variant and testing the two to see which one performs. Well, you could certainly do A-B testing with email marketing. That means taking a subject line that has traditionally worked for you or is relevant for that audience and then creating a variant or different subject line. So if I'm going to send an email to 100 people, I'm going to send 50 people, one subject line, and then the other 50 is going to get my variant subject line. And why is this important? Because I want to be able to see what people to react to. Okay, so if I see the open rates higher for the variant versus the traditional or the original subject line, then I know that this subject line works. And therefore, I'm going to apply this subject line moving forward. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to take it and test it against another variant. So you should always do A-B testing on subject lines. So the concept of A-B testing should not be lost on any digital marketer, okay? whether that be SEO, search engine marketing, or email marketing. Okay? So you should have an understanding of A-B testing. And of course, going back to measuring results with email, you have a different set of metrics. We already mentioned open rates. So if you send out 100 emails, how many people open the email? Okay, you want that open rate to be as high as possible. And then when they open the email, the people click on that CTA or any of those links in the email. Okay, so you want a high click through rate. And then more importantly, when they click on a link in the email, they're going to go to a landing page. You want that person to engage with that landing page. So what's the engagement rate of the landing page from the email? Okay, so it's really important that you have an understanding of all the different metrics involved with email marketing and again, how to react to that data. So if you're getting a low open rate, could it be the subject line isn't that good? Possibly, that's why you have to do testing. If you're getting a low click through rate on the emails, that could be because the copy may not be that great or the design or the call to action or it's not compelling enough for the recipient of the email. And then again, the engagement rate on the landing page. If you have a low engagement rate, a low conversion rate, you gotta look at that and figure out how to improve that. Okay, so you can apply A-B tests in the landing page. So there are always ways to react to the data regardless of what campaign or regardless of what digital marketing channel you're working in. Okay, so that's the commonality here. One point on email marketing is if you're going to measure the results of the campaign, whether you're using, you know, vertical response or MailChimp or, you know, some other email marketing platform, you want to make sure you have what we call a UTM tracking. And if you're using Google Analytics, having UTM tracking or understanding what UTM tracking is allows you to measure the results of that email marketing campaign in Google Analytics. So that's another skill set you should have, being able to apply you know, tracking to your digital marketing campaigns, including email. Okay, Because if you don't, it's going to be hard to measure the results in Google Analytics. So let's focus on one more marketing channel here, and that's social media. So we all know social media isn't going anywhere. It's becoming more and more popular. In fact, you know, an offshoot of social media is really influencer marketing. 
uh, you know, if somebody, an influencer has millions of likes on say TikTok or Instagram, you might want to engage with that influencer and help you promote your brand or your product. Isn't that really what social media is? It's a platform, whether that be, you know, Facebook or, or Twitter. It's a, it's a platform to help you promote your brand, your product, your services. And it's a chance for you to get to message your user base, your community, prospective clients, people who don't even know about your brand. It's a chance to build awareness. So social media holds a lot of different uh, strategies, if you will. In fact, nearly almost 4 billion of the world's population uses social media. Let me see, there's seven something billion people in the world. Well, that's a large percentage. A majority of the percentage of the world uses a social media platform, okay? In fact, just like SEO, when you need an SEO platform, there are plenty of social media platforms. There's Later, there's Sprout Social, there's Hootsuite, there's Buffer. In fact, Buffer confirmed that 73% of marketers believe social media marketing has been somewhat effective or very effective for their business. And that's promising because social media, in my opinion, having been in this industry a while, it can be a very fickle channel. Meaning if you're trying to promote a product or service on Facebook, and it's very, very gonna be very hard to pull that person away who's engaged with their Facebook feed. Not only just to get them away from the Facebook feed onto your website, but then to turn around and allow that person to try and convert, okay, based on what you have on your website. So it's challenging enough just to get them away from the social media platform, let alone converting. So that's why when I say very fickle, but you know, it's somewhat encouraging if Buffer's telling us that marketers believe that social media marketing can be effective. And it can be effective. You just have to have the right strategy. So to me, one of the skill sets you should have if you're gonna be a social media marketing manager is being able to understand, you know, what is the strategy here? What are we trying to achieve when we set up a social media platform or enact a social media campaign, okay? And so that's really the first thing. It's really understanding what platforms, what's the strategy here? Because if the strategy is brand awareness, then what channels or social media platforms, if you will, work best for us? Is that Twitter? Is that Facebook? So it's being able to kind of formulate a strategy, a plan, if you will, for social media marketing, because the last thing you want to do as a marketer is endlessly just post content for the sake of just posting content. Because just like any other marketing channel, you're going to have metrics. And social media is not shy on the metric front. Okay, so you have reach, you have impressions, you have engagement rate. In fact, every social media channel has its own set of specific metrics, whether that be likes, followers, shares, uh, uh, reviews, stars, if you will. So it really depends on the social media platform that you're using. But at the end of the day, you need to be able to measure the results. If you're posting, let's just say on Facebook, and your whole job or strategy is to entice engagement, meaning get people to share that particular post or act on that post, then you need to be able to measure the engagement. How many people saw the post? How many people engaged with the post? Okay. And so just like any other marketing channel, you're collecting data and you need to react to that data. But more importantly, it's about being able to, you know, put a strategy together first. And then I would, you know, a skill set I would recommend you have is understanding all the different social media platforms that are out there. You know, I just named Buffer or Hootsuite or Sprout Social. They're all good in their own right, but they're all going to have different features. So to me, understanding what social media platform works best for you. You want to choose a social media platform that you know allows you to control what posts you schedule, when you schedule them, how they're scheduled, what platform they're scheduled on. At the same time, you want a social media platform that's going to help you understand the engagement that you're getting from that platform. 
And you probably want a social media platform that allows you to quote unquote listen in, if you will, on what users are you know, reacting to in terms of hashtags or what's trending on that particular platform. Okay, so you want a listening tool, if you will, uh, as part of that social media platform. So it's understanding what platform you want to use when it comes to social media marketing. It's understanding what strategy that that platform is going to help you when they enact. Okay, and then it's also that social media platform that's going to help you understand the data so you can react to the data. Okay. So those are all to me the skill sets you need as a social media manager. And then an offshoot of social media is paid social. So just like search engine marketing, you can advertise on say Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook on a cost per click basis. Meaning if you're showing your ad on LinkedIn and somebody clicks on it, you're going to pay for that click. You're going to pay LinkedIn or you're going to pay Twitter. You're going to pay Facebook. So it's understanding, you know, the skill sets involved with paid social is understanding what assets you can have when advertising on these platforms. You know, can you use video on LinkedIn or Facebook? Um, you know, can you use what type of images and, you know, how big do those images need to be? And can you have wording on those images or what are the guidelines involved with having images as part of your ads? So having a full understanding of the types of assets that you can run in terms of your advertising on social media is very important in my opinion because it's always changing and you want to be able to put the best asset, the best message, you want to put your best foot forward when advertising on social media. And of course when you do advertise, again a whole nother set of metrics. You know, how many people saw your ad, how many people clicked on your ad, how many people engaged with the landing page, how many people converted, what was the cost per conversion. So all of those are metrics that we covered in search engine marketing, they apply with paid social. So. You have the opportunity on paid social, you have the opportunity on social media to, to really get your message out there. It's really understanding what kind of data you're collecting, what are the results of the ad or the post, and how do you react to that. And that's really the common theme with digital marketing skills. If you're not a big fan of numbers, you're not a big fan of Excel, if you will, or spreadsheets, if looking at a mountain of data scares you, well, then you might want to think otherwise when going into digital marketing. But if you want to embrace the data, then digital marketing is really a great career because if you can get the data and you know how to react to the data, then you can be successful in any campaign you run. Greetings everyone, this is Rob Sanders with Simply Learn. Thank you for joining and today we're going to cover digital marketing interview questions and answers. So thanks for joining again and here's how it's gonna work. So we broke out a few questions and answers uh, in different categories. A lot of you are going to be interviewing for some jobs out there and some of the jobs may be an SEO manager or or search engine marketing manager, or email marketing manager, or content marketing manager, or social media manager. So we broke up those questions into those areas. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start with SEO, we're gonna go through some questions, and I'm gonna explain the answers to those questions. So if you have any questions to these questions or answers, feel free to just comment right below this video and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. So let's get started and we're gonna start with SEO, search engine optimization. We're gonna go through a series of questions and I'm gonna answer those questions for you. Okay, so the first question that you might be asking in an interview is differentiate between do follows and no follows. Okay, so if you've taken or listened to my SEO courses on YouTube for SEO, we, we talked a lot about do follows and no follows. And, and simply put, I mean, do follows are just signals to the search engines to follow the link. So there's a link on site A pointing to site B. 
we're gonna basically tell Google, Bing, and some of these other search engines, hey, go ahead and follow that link. Now, a nofollow is just the opposite. So nofollow link doesn't allow the search engine crawlers to follow it. So if we have a link on our site, site A pointing to site B, we could put a nofollow tag in there. And what that's gonna do, it's going to signal to the crawlers, hey, don't follow this link. So in the end, if the crawlers don't follow the link, then there's not going to be any link juice passed. And so Google is not going to give you credit or give that site credit for having a link pointing to it or pointing to another site or from another site. And so it's all about linking. So we can control if there's links on our site, whether we want the crawlers to recognize those or not simply with no follow tags. So just a reminder, link juice is the reputation or equity passed from one website to another. So if you have a link on another website and that website is of high quality, meaning their page authority, their domain authority is high, they have a lot of content, you know, they're not spammy, they're really rich and they're relevant, then you may want to make sure that the link pointing from that site to your site is a no follow so that way that Google can recognize the link from that site to your site and basically that reputation is going to be passed on to you okay so that's a do follow versus a no follow and why would we do a no follow well it just depends it really depends a lot of social media platforms like Facebook have no follows if you have a lot of content you may not want to be pushing out a lot of do follows it could actually look bad from an external linking standpoint and so a lot of sites are really particular about who they want to pass link juice on to and give credit for the link. So it's a business decision at the end of the day. There's really no hard, fast rule here, except from an SEO perspective, if I have a site and I have a lot of external links pointing outward to other sites, I'm going to be particular about who I allow the search engine to follow and what links I allow not to follow. Okay. So here's an example of what they look like. So do follow is simply just the href. Notice the no follow has the the tag appended to it, the href tag with a no follow. So if the search engine's crawling your site and they see that no follow there, they're not going to follow that link and vice versa. If there's a link on another site pointing to yours and there's a no follow there, you're not going to get credit. The search engines aren't going to pick up that link. Okay, so question two, what is 301 redirect and how is it different from a 302 redirect? So 301 redirects tell users in the search engine specifically that an original page has been moved, and this is the keyword here, permanently. So permanently moved. We're gonna explain that in a minute. So it's just moved from one page to another. And so if we don't have a page anymore, but we have a new page. Let's just say you built a new website with new URLs. You want to make sure the old page is pointing to the new page with a 301 redirect. So if a 301 redirect is permanent, then a 302 is temporary. So we want the search engines to recognize that we have 301 permanent redirects in place. Why? Because if we have temporary, then it might alert Google to not keep that page in its search engine rankings because it's temporary. So why would Google want to keep a temporary page or even a page that is pointing to another page on a temporary basis? So they re may remove both pages from its index. Okay, but if we have something permanent in place, Google may say, okay, this page is permanently linking to another page or redirecting to another page. Therefore, it's stable, it's permanent, we're going to keep that new page in the index and eventually remove the old page. So really something permanent is more stable in the eyes of the search engine. Something temporary may not be as stable in the eyes of say Google. And if they don't see it as stable, then they may remove both pages from the index. Okay. So the idea is we want to be found in Google search index and we get it. Sometimes pages go away for a variety of reasons. And if it does go away, just make sure you have a new page for it. And that new page is a 301 permanent redirect. Okay, so question three, why are backlinks important in SEO? Well, we kind of hinted on that a bit with the no follow, because if we have a link from another website pointing to ours, and that link from that other website is really relevant, and, and it has a high page and domain authority, then it's gonna benefit us. 
And so backlinks are important because if we have backlinks from high quality sites, it's going to improve the credibility of our site, especially if it's a do follow tag. So the search engines are going to recognize the relationship between the site that has a link pointing to us. Okay, so it's just going to build our credibility. It's going to increase, increase our domain authority. And then the net effect of that is if we're credible and we have high domain authority, then that's going to increase the rankings of our pages. And when the pages increase in ranking, then we're going to get a more of a lion's share of the traffic for certain keywords that our pages are found for. And if our pages are found and getting traffic, then because we have increased rankings, we're likely going to have increased traffic. And then it's just a snowball effect. So more traffic leads to more engagement and conversions. So the whole idea for SEO is remember, you have an on-page strategy and an off-page strategy. Building external links is part of an off-page SEO strategy. And we want to make sure that you know we are relevant in the form of a link or in the form of content on other high quality sites. Being on a high quality site only benefits us because again, increases our domain authority. Google sees us as more relevant. Therefore, our pages are going to benefit by ranking higher. And therefore, when we rank higher, we get more traffic. So it's a snowball effect. So having backlinks is important because it snowballs all the way through to conversions. Okay, so what are the best practices to rank your videos on YouTube? This is a great question, really great question. Given the importance of videos, especially with SEO because videos are found, YouTube in itself is a search engine. So if we have a video, how are we going to get it to rank on YouTube? Well, first things first, you never want to put a video out there and want it to rank if it's not engaging or informative. So make sure you go ahead and follow the best practices of having engaging and informative content in your video. Now, once you have that video in place, you wanna optimize it. And then some of the key factors for optimizing the video are, you wanna choose a title that has high search volume and low difficulty, just as you would keyword, for example, for a web page. You wanna choose a title with a keyword in it that has high volume and low difficulty, i.e. low competition, okay? So you want a nice ratio there. And you know what, you wanna choose a title that's gonna get people to watch the video too. So it's not all about just choosing a title just for the sake of high volume. You also have to choose something that's relevant that's gonna be catchy as well. And then with that title goes the description. So you want a description that's very relevant to your title, okay? Because most people aren't gonna click on a video just for the sake of the title. They're gonna to wanna to probably get a sneak peek via the description of what it is. So again, you wanna optimize that description, but Make sure the description is, is just as snazzy as the title, okay? You also want to use accurate and relevant video tags, just as you would on Twitter or Facebook. Tag these videos, okay? So make sure your title tag length doesn't exceed 100 characters because it will get chopped off. So again, that goes back to just writing something really short and to the point that's going to grab somebody's attention, okay? You also want to upload a captivating thumbnail something that's relevant, then that's gonna grab somebody's attention. And then again, we set it similar to the video tags. We wanna use relevant hashtags. Again, just as you would with Twitter and Facebook, go ahead and throw some hashtags in there that people could see because people search via hashtagging. And then this goes without saying, you did all the work, created a really great video. It's engaging, it's informative, you optimized it. Feel free to promote your video on other social media platforms. Okay, don't just stick with YouTube per se. So the benefit here is if you post it on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever platform of your choice and it gets engagement, people click on the link, go to YouTube, they're gonna like it and then other people are gonna see that engagement. They're gonna see how many people liked it or how many subscribers you have. So promote your videos to help you with the ranking of the video on YouTube. So that does play into it. So go ahead and promote it so other people can watch it, like it, comment, etc., and that's gonna engage other people to want to do the same. So what is mobile first indexing? This is a really important and timely question. Mobile first indexing means Google's just using mobile friendly content for indexing and ranking websites. So in other words, Google, for example, has two bots. They have the traditional desktop bot and they have a smartphone bot. 
and eventually everybody that has a website is going to be migrated over to the smartphone bot and so if that smartphone bot goes to your website and starts crawling what do you think they're looking for their smartphone bot they're looking for mobile friendly content if it's not mobile friendly meaning the page isn't designed for a smartphone browser or let's just say the images are way too large or you have to expand the text just to read it you know a lot of these these issues that somebody would have just simply trying to read something on a web page on their mobile device Google's not going to grab that content. So you want to make sure it's mobile friendly so it gets indexed. And so if your website has a responsive design, Google will rank your website based on its performance on mobile devices. Okay, so you want to make sure that your website is mobile friendly. And if you're in an interview and somebody asks you this question, you could even take it a step further and say, look, I'm going to measure how friendly my, my website is for mobile devices in Google Search Console because Google Search Console has a report that will show you what pages on your website are not mobile friendly. And it's not a guarantee, but I could tell you if I'm Google and I'm crawling your site with my smartphone bot and that page or one of my pages is not mobile friendly, I'm probably not going to index it or rank it. So you want to leverage that report in Google Search Console to see what pages are mobile friendly. So that's a little bonus for you to really impress the interviewer who asked you this question. Because how are you going to know if one of your pages is mobile friendly or not if you don't look at a report? So keep an eye on Google Search Console's mob mobile usability report. Okay, number six, list down the most important local SEO ranking factors. Okay, so organic local ranking is just as important as anything else in organic search because if you have a local business you want to use the likes of say Google my business to show up when somebody types in you know looking for a florist or you're looking for a coffee shop so what you want to do is you want to create a web page for every product and service okay? you also want to opt for your business listings on Google my business and and there are plenty of other local business directories out there like Yelp for example or Bing even has one. So go ahead and also make sure you have a business listing as well. But since Google in the United States has a huge market share, you wanna start with Google first. You wanna update your NAP citations on your website, maintain consistency of your NAP. Okay, so NAP is name, address, phone number. So you wanna make sure that that's current and consistent. So if you have a number on your website, make sure it's the same number on Google My Business. Okay, you can embed a Google map on your website. You could certainly optimize the meta tags and content, not only on your web pages, but within your Google My Business directory. So you can add your business to other local directories, like I mentioned, Yelp. And then also, just as important, opt for reviews and ratings. Okay, so the more reviews the ha you have, the better off you are. Okay, so I always say this with, uh, with local search. Three of the main factors in showing up for local search on, say, Google is obviously the keyword. The second is the proximity of where that person is. And then third is the reviews. So you can't really control the proximity, but you can control the keyword and you can control the reviews to some degree. So work hard at getting reviews for your business, but at the same time, you can certainly work in some keywords, let's just say for your product and service pages on your website, but also you can translate that over to Google My Business. Okay? So working in those keywords, making sure your, your number, your address, your name, they're all consistent and and really just spreading your the the business out on other directories that's really all these are really key factors for local seo okay so question number seven how to avoid duplicate content getting penalized for duplicate content so for example if you have two different versions of a web page you may result in a duplicate content issue so it's just seo 101 you never want to have two two or more pages with the same content so what do we do? Well, we can avoid this in having Google penalize us by, again, setting up a 301 redirect. Remember, 301s are permanent. We can also use what they call a canonical tag. And a canonical tag basically alerts the search engines as to which page is the original. 
Okay, so if we have an original page, we want to point to that page with our canonical tag. And then the third option is opt for preferred domain in Google Search Console. Okay, so if you have multiple known names, make sure you set up a primary one in Search Console. So those are ways to work around it. Of this three, I would always go with the canonical tags because that's just a tag that's going to sit on the page. It's going to alert Google as to what the original is just in case they get their hands on the duplicate. So all the pages that have the same content are going to have the same canonical tag pointing to one page. So again, three ones are permanent. You could simply just redirect one to the other if you end up having duplication, or you could just tell the search engines, hey, this is the original page, or you can go through Search Console. Okay, number eight, what are the tactics to increase a web page speed? Okay, so what are some of the tactics? Well, when you build a site, especially for mobile, you wanna keep it as simple as possible. I mean, what I mean by simple as possible, really I mean, hey, use a simple website design. Don't get overly creative, if you will. Most websites, all websites have images. You're not gonna be able to get around that, but just make sure you optimize your images. In other words, don't have such a large image size. If you don't need something very large, don't have it. Okay, you wanna improve server response time. And what do we mean by that? Well, your site's sitting on a server somewhere. You can own that server or you can be renting it out from say Amazon Web Services or let's just say GoDaddy as your registrar. They also have web hosting. Well, if you have it on say GoDaddy's server, you may be sharing that server with other businesses. And at certain times of the day, other businesses may get a lot of traffic and suck up a lot of bandwidth. What is that gonna do? That's going to reduce the server response time for your site. And so you wanna make sure you have a, an idea of you know, what server your web page or website is on. And you wanna be able to can have some control over that. Because if your server response is slow, that's gonna slow down everything else in terms of loading in the browser, and that's not gonna be good for SEO. Okay, optimize your code. We mean by optimize, minimifying. When we say minimifying, we mean get rid of some of the redundant code. If you have CSS, you know, get rid of chop some of the, get rid of the JavaScript you're not using. So that's what we mean by optimizing code. Reduce redirects. Okay, ideally you just wanna have one redirect in place. You don't wanna create a, a daisy chain, so to speak, of redirecting and redirecting after that. That's never gonna bode well, and it's gonna slow things down as well. Enable browser caching. So if you enable browser caching, basically if somebody comes back to the page they've been on, say, two days ago, they're probably gonna see a cached version of that page. And then opt for the content delivery network as well. So these are some of the ways to reduce page speed. Now, if you're curious about the page speed of your website, you can always go to Google's PageSpeed Insights tool. And all you have to do is just Google PageSpeed Insights or even just something generic like Google PageSpeed. And you're gonna get this tool, PageSpeed Insights. And all you need to do is just plug in a URL. When you plug in the URL, Google is gonna analyze the URL for both mobile and desktop. And so here we could see Google gives a score. So we could see the score for mobile and we could see the score for desktop just by clicking on desktop. And so here I could see some of the issues that the site may be having in terms of page load time for their desktop. If I flip over to mobile, you know, here I can see some other issues. For example, they have a server static assets with efficient cache policy. Now, if you're not sure what the heck that means, you can always just click on it and you can see some specifics here and or you can just always Google it as well. Uh, here you got the reduce the impact of third party code. Okay, so that's another thing. Uh, reduce JavaScript execution time. So again, going back to a lot of some of the comments we made about coding. Okay, so sometimes too much code or code not functioning as well as it should will tend to slow down the site. Okay, so you can use PageSpeed Insights. You can always get a glimpse of how pages are loading simply by also going to, for example, Google Analytics. Under behavior, okay, you can go to site speed and if you click on overview, okay, Google, what Google does is they do a sampling of pages over time. And in this case, based on 89 page views, they have an average page load time. And so you can get a sense of how quick 
specific pages load or your site overall simply by looking at the site speed overview report in Google Analytics to get a sense of how quick your pages are loading. Now, there are certain factors that do affect load time. So obviously the way the page is built with the code, the images, etc., but also the browser. Each browser loads differently. Okay, so you want to take a look at it by browser, also by country. Every country has a different network. Okay, you can be in the United States and have worse network service than you do, say, in you know coast, uh, Ivory Coast in Africa. Okay, so it really depends on the network you're on. So, and also the page, every page is built differently. So you want to get a sense of what pages are loading quicker and which pages are not. You can simply just go to page timings in Google Analytics and you get a sense of what pages do not load fast and which ones do. And maybe hone in on the pages that aren't loading fast and address those pages first. Okay, so you have two tools at your disposal, one Google Analytics and one PageSpeed Insights. Okay, so let's look at question number nine here so when should an individual target short tail and long tail keywords okay so remember short tail are usually one to two keywords very broad in nature long tail keywords are maybe three four keywords in a query or maybe an entire sentence those are considered long tail keywords so usually short tail keywords have higher volume but also higher competition. Longer tail keywords usually have lower uh, volume, but also lower competition. But the great thing about long tail keywords, the conversion rate will tend to be a little bit higher than say a short tail because it's less vague and more specific. So you can use short tail keywords if you're trying to drive a lot of visitors because those keywords are gonna be vague or broad in nature. Long tail keywords are used for targeted pages such as product pages and articles. So if you have a specific product with a long name, you can certainly optimize that page for that product name. Again, the product name may have low volume, but if somebody types in exactly that product name, you show up, the chance of you them converting are gonna be very high. So you don't have to always be that specific with the product name, but try and be as specific as you possibly can in order to get somebody to click on your link in the search engine results and get them over to your site to, to convert. Okay, so those are really the big differences. Short tail, very broad, very vague, a lot of volume, but also a lot of competition. But hey, if you're ranking for short tail keyword, you're probably going to get a lot of traffic. The conversion rates may not be as high as something, say, long tail, where, hey, maybe you're just honed in on a few set number of products and you're not care, you don't care a lot about the traffic. You just care about getting the relevant traffic to your site to convert. Okay, number 10, what are the important elements to focus while developing a website? So we're talking in terms of SEO. Okay, so if somebody asks me this question in an interview, what am I gonna focus on when developing a website? Well, the answers are right here. Yes, we talked about mobile. Mobile is so important because a lot of websites are going to be indexed with Google Smartphone Bot. So mobile usability is very important. So we need to make sure our website is responsive for mobile. Just some basic practices when it comes to site architecture and navigation. We wanna have a simple URL structure, okay? no overly cumbersome the navigation should simply be clean and neat okay if you have five products okay maybe you have uh, in your navigation you have something called products with all five listed or you have all five products in the main navigation the key is you just want to make it clean and neat and easy for somebody to find the the rule of thumb is if it's good for the end user probably going to be good for google but if complicated for the end user it's probably going to be complicated for google you always want to create a sitemap. Now, what is that sitemap? A sitemap is simply just a formatted file with to, that includes all your URLs and assets, your images and your videos. They're going to be sitting on your server as well. So you want Google or these, these bots to be able to find your pages and assets. And by the way, you want to take it a step further and make sure you upload that sitemap, which is sitting in the root directory, meaning domain.com slash sitemap.xml okay you want to take that sitemap and make sure you input that sitemap location in google search console that way google search console has a one-way ticket to grab the elements in the sitemap 
Another important element to focus on while developing a website is having a robots text file. And all a robots text file is, it's like a lock, I always say, to a house. So if you lock a door in your house, nobody's going to be able to get in that door. So that's all a robots text file is. You're telling Google and these other bots that are coming to crawl your site what's locked and what's not locked, meaning what they have access to and what they don't have access to. So you want to be able to make sure you have a robots text file if you're trying to not index specific pages of your website. Because if you tell Google, don't crawl these pages or this directory, they're not going to get crawled. And if they don't get crawled, they're not going to get indexed. So robots text file is an important element to focus on while you're developing your website. And while you're developing your website, it could be on a, you know, in a directory just called new website. So you probably want to have new website as the directory in the robots text file and just to let Google know, don't go into this directory because it's my new website. I'm not ready to go live yet. So you don't want it indexed. So there are a lot of reasons to have robots text files. That's the main reason. Sitemap, you want Google to get these pages and assets quickly. Okay, you want to make sure that your site architecture navigation is in order. You want to make sure your site is mobile friendly. And you also want to make sure you have content on your website. That's the key because that's what's going to keep people on the website and engaged. And when I say content, I don't necessarily just mean words. I also mean videos. I also mean images, you know, something interactive. Okay. You want to keep people engaged. That's the key behind it. Trust me, if, if an end user finds your site engaging, Google is likely going to find your site engaging. Okay. So those are good brownie points to bring up if somebody asks you this question in an interview. So just a recap here, it's important to have a better site structure so the bots can easily access and mix the content. Okay, with a responsive design, helps to make your website mobile friendly and user friendly. Would also increase the amount of time a user spends on your website, which may improve your site's ranking. Sitemap is simply just a file that helps search engine bots to understand the structure of the website. Okay, how many pages are on your website and where are they located, along with the videos and images. Okay, and then the robots text just instructs the search engine crawlers to understand what pages should not be indexed. Okay, this is simply just a text file and it's added to the root directory. Again, think like a door, think of a lock. Okay, you can tell, you can lock whatever doors you want in your house. Then give it that way. So with this, we have come to the end of this digital marketing bootcamp by Simply Learn. I hope this session was informative and interesting. If you have any queries regarding any of the topics covered in this bootcamp, or if you require the resources like PPT, code documents, or anything, then please feel free to let us know in the comment section below, and a team of experts will be happy to resolve all your queries at the earliest. Until next time, thank you so much, stay safe, and keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.